A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Makati Productions presents an original Star Wars novel. Interregnum, Book 3, Imperial Justice. Written by Admiral Byzantium and Dr. McKay. Prologue. Under ordinary circumstances, Chaswa was a pleasant enough world, heavily populated by galactic standards. With some three and a half billion inhabitants, mostly human, it had the good fortune of falling squarely in the middle of the Perlemian trade route, which meant easy access to goods and services of all kinds. Over the years, it had eventually become a central shipping hub of its region, serving as a safe landing zone and respected port of call for most of the ships that serviced the Perlemian, not to mention many of the smaller vessels that wandered even further afield. But that centrality made Chaswa a strategic target. Imperial rule on Chaswa has shattered after Endor. Its dense population of smugglers, free traders, and prospectors meant it had greater than its fair share of anti-imperial sentiment, and the New Republic had occupied the world with relative ease. It had even become a major New Republic stronghold, which had made it one of Grand Admiral Thrawn's first targets and first reconquests. Now the New Republic wanted it back, and Admiral Nadasi Dalla, late of the Imperial Star Destroyer Gorgon, was running out of ideas for how to prevent them from taking it. Admiral, Commander Kratis greeted her as the ground shook. Kratis was the former commanding officer of her late, lamented flagship. He was solidly built, with dark coloring and a keen tactical mind. Aggressive and ambitious, but bone loyal, like so many of her officers. He dragged her off the bridge rather than letting her go down with her ship. He had realized that attempting to rim a superstar destroyer, with his massive tractor beams able to deflect large incoming objects, was unlikely to be successful with or without her hand on the helm. Thanks to him, she had lived to fight another day. She couldn't even tell Kratis was fleet anymore by looking at him. Like many of Gorgon's survivors whose escape pods had set them down on Chaswa, he'd adopted stormtrooper armor and a blaster rifle and had become, through necessity, one of Dalla's ground commanders, dusting off long-forgotten academy lessons as men died around them. I'm not sure how much longer we are going to be able to hold the remaining shield generators, sir. The enemy Vicstart deployed another squadron of bombers. The pounding grew more distant and Dalla moved from the center of her makeshift command room, an old apartment building located in Chaswa's capital city, Iritsa. The building was a hostel for down on their luck spacers, rough and down at heel. Its only redeeming characteristic was it hadn't been bombed into rubble like their previous two command centers. She strode over to a nearby window and hunkered down behind a makeshift barricade, risking a quick peek upward to survey the city. Streets had been blasted to ruin, buildings collapsed or tottering. The entire city smelt like smoke and vaporized permacrete. The rebels had made their first landing attempt a month before, only to find that the Imperial garrison was not yet willing to surrender. Ground-based turbolacers had shredded rebel transports, and Dalla herself had led the stormtrooper squad that surrounded and eliminated the one rebel commando team that successfully made landfall. The second landing attempt had been more cautious. Instead of trying to come down in the city proper, the rebels had landed miles outside the city then made the slow march to the coast where Iritsa was located. But Dalla had seen that landing attempt coming too, and the dense minefield that she'd laid along the main roads had stalled the enemy until her men could rip their guts out. It was after the failure of the second landing that Iritsa had first been bombed. The rebel commander, Dalla could look up and see the victory-class star destroyer hanging in space above them with his damnable rebel crest marring the perfect imperial white, had decided that bombardment was the only solution. The rebels were clearly trying to be careful and minimize civilian casualties, but Dalla had dispersed her forces through the entire city, assembling anti-fighter batteries in camouflage locations. Each time one of her mobile batteries fired, the Vicstar in orbit pinpointed it and hit it with a few turbolaser blasts, but usually not before the battery's crew dragged it to safety to repeat the exercise a few hours later. It had only taken a few days to blast the city to rubble. Not for nothing, Nadasi Dalla appreciated the rebel squeamishness for brutal action. An imperial battle group could have melted the entire area in hours, civilians, and all. 
Now, with most of her anti-fighter guns gone, the rebels had grown bolder. White contrails from B-wings and X-wings had pressage passes over the city for the last day and a half, searching for Imperial bunkers. It'll only be another half a day, maybe less, before they try another landing, she decided, thinking aloud. Assuming they have ground forces on hand for it. Any other demands for our surrender, sir? She shook her head, glancing at the dust-covered communications unit. It was still lit letting her know it still worked, but it hadn't made any noise in a few days. I think they've decided it's a waste of air to ask. Yes, sir, Crida said, offering her a surprisingly cheerful smile, one she hadn't seen since dawn. To the last, then. She checked her blaster rifle. Until I am dead or rendered unfit to serve, she reminded him. Yes, sir, Crida repeated. She stared up into the sky at the enemy star destroyer. Tell Lieutenant Zappalo that when the next landing is attempted, her voice trailed off, and she gave Kratos a meaningful look. I'll tell him, Kratos promised. Anything else? Sir, find me another e-web. I'll get right on that, sir. It was dark when the rebels attempted their third landing. The comm unit in the corner blinked to life, then crackled with a single short burst of static. Jamming may get in actual words difficult, but the jolts of static were hard to miss. Dalla grabbed her macro binoculars and stared up at the starry sky. The enemy star destroyer was still there, and she tracked under his open hangar and saw the Sentinel-class landing craft that was now descending towards the city. It was attempting to make the landing under cover of darkness, hoping to set down and disgorge his troops before Dalla was ready for it. It would have worked too if Dalla had not had her last car to play. The rebel sentinel descended through the thin cloud cover and had made it down to the altitude reached of the average Coruscanti space scraper when the bolts of green shot across the sky. The first two missed, but the third and fourth both struck the sentinel directly from the side. Dalla swung her macro banalers along the trajectory the fire was coming from and saw the Gamma class assault shuttle edict, the last of Gorgon's surviving small craft. Even as she watched, trails of concussion missiles rocketed out from Edict, multiplying, and no fewer than six warheads locked onto the Sentinel which carried, if Dalla had to guess, about 75 rebel troops. The Sentinel dodged the first missile, and his blaster cannons knocked down two more. The fourth slammed into the shuttle's right wing from behind, ripping through the back of the shuttle, and then the sixth missile punched through the Sentinel's fuselage, and it exploded illuminating the sky in brilliant red. But the Sentinel was not alone. Two X-Wings were already arrowing and on Edict proton torpedoes leaping out from their launch tubes. Edict fired back, but lacked the speed or maneuverability of an X-Wing, and just a few seconds after the Sentinel died a second explosion erupted in the sky. Dalla tracked her macro binoculars back over the enemy Star Destroyer and saw four additional Sentinels launching from his hangar. That's it, then, she said. She was all out of tricks, all out of tools. The only thing that was left was to take her remaining stormtroopers and what was left of Gorgon's crew and fight until it was over. She checked her blaster rifle's power back and then slung additional power packs and gas cartridges over her uniform. She lacked any armor of her own. The Empire didn't make stormtrooper armor for women, but that was no matter. It wouldn't be fair for her to have that kind of protection when so few of her men did. Dalla tracked her macro binoculars back up, wanting to see where the sentinels would be landing. She frowned in surprise as she found one, because its trajectory was no longer towards the ground. All four of the sentinels were now turning back towards the sky, racing towards the enemy star destroyer with impressive haste. Her comm unit crackled. Dot. Stormhawk, aerial forces, Report, prepare for immediate evacuation. Dalla adjusted the unit. She took another glance to make sure that the rebels really were withdrawing and saw the bright green bursts of turbolaser batteries. She swung the binoculars around, adjusted their magnification, and was rewarded with the glorious sight of an Imperial Eichlis Star Destroyer coming above Chaswell's horizon out of the just rising sun. Stormhawk, this is Admiral Dalla, commanding officer of the Imperial forces on Chaswa. Repeat your last message, she ordered, 
adjusting the unit further. Kratis entered the room, pointing in the direction of Stormhawk. She waved him off. Stormhawk, this is Admiral Dalla. Repeat your last message, she repeated. Dot, Aldala, this is a Stormhawk. We've discouraged the enemy from attempting their landing, but there are two Mon Calamari star cruisers on their way, sending our landers down to pick up you and as many survivors as you can gather together on short notice. Please send us landing locations. She turned to Kratis. Order each of the teams to set up landing flares immediately, she ordered. Fifteen sites if possible, assuming they have that many landers. We want to be gone as soon as we can. It will be done, sir, Kratis acknowledged, and was gone again. She reactivated her comm. Stormhawk, this is Dala. We're setting out landing flares to mark safe landing zones. How long before the star cruisers arrive? Estimate 30 minutes, Admiral. The voice on the other end of the line had a nice, crisp Coruscanti accent that felt like a cool breeze of reassurance. We are not alone. The Empire has come for us. We'll be ready in 10, she replied. She took one look around the apartment that had become her command center, but there was nothing here she wanted to keep other than maybe her rifle. She grabbed it in the comm unit, then started the trek down to the ground floor. The sun was just coming up when the Delta-class stormtrooper transport that Stormhawk had sent to get her lifted off the surface of Chaswa. The transport's pilots were obedient and respectful, but they all watched her with that same kind of hidden curiosity that so much of the Starfleet possessed. She was an admiral, an authority figure, but she was also Natasi Dalla, and there was no one in the fleet who did not know that Natasi Dalla had once been Grand Moff Tarkin's lover. Her lips firmed together but she'd long since learned not to let the opinions of fools linger in her mind. They made the trip from Chaswa surface to Stormhawk's hangar and close to record time. Even as she exited the Stormtrooper transport, she saw the survivors of Gorgon's crew, gathering together, laughing and smiling at the unexpected reprieve, and then saw them straighten to attention as they noticed her. These men had been her crew for a long time. Gorgon and the rest of her squadron had been dispatched to the Outer Rim, with unceremonious haste after Tarkin's death at Yavin. Dala had been a problem for the fleet, and they had dealt with that problem by sending her away. Dala had known not to expect anything else, not after everything that had happened, but the Starfleet had not exiled her alone. Gorgon's crew and men like Kratis had followed her into exile, and together they had spent years hunting pirates and the occasional rebel that stumbled out into the outer rim. When they finally, finally, been called back, her squadron had been utterly mauled in a matter of weeks, with three of her four-star destroyers destroyed at Doran and Chaswa. Unlike the rest of the fleet, they respected her and she owed them nothing less. Admiral Dalla, welcome aboard Stormhawk. She turned tiredly towards the voice. A small ceremonial boarding party approached, led by a lanky, amber-complexioned man in a captain's uniform. Thank you for your timely intervention, Captain. She greeted him, tiredly obeying the dance of rank and etiquette to request his name. Captain David Markanian, Admiral. A small smile appeared beneath the captain's hawk nose. He offered her a callous hand, and she could tell he was trying not to stare. She doubted she looked anything at all like the story said. Dalla had spent the last weeks in the dirt and muck. Her clothes were torn and tattered, and she had suffered multiple blaster grazes during the rebellion's first landing attempt. She'd cut her copper-colored hair short enough to match Stormtrooper regulation. It stood out less that way, and she was sure she didn't look anything like the wanton seductress the more salacious stories about her said she was. What's our status, Captain? She asked. He straightened, responding immediately to the implied authority in her tone. We've departed the Chaswa system ahead of the arriving rebel forces, Admiral. We're on our way into securely held Imperial space. She frowned. Securely held Imperial space. Markarian looked around the hangar, then took a step closer, lowering his voice. Much has happened since Chaswa, Admiral. Please accompany me, and I'll brief you. She stared at the map of Imperial space. Karita has fallen. She asked. Hearing the astonished dismay in her voice, how could this have happened? 
Carida has indeed fallen, Sir Markarian said with a sigh. Dalla watched as he manipulated the controls of the holodable that was in the center of his office, the projected map of the galaxy whirling and scintillating as he magnified the space around Carita. And Reaper's gone. But beyond that, the truth is I just don't know. Stormhawk was at Arenda and never made it to Carita. He pressed his lips together. The Council of Moths has announced that Admirals Deshorn and Pelian betrayed us to the rebellion. They claim that Admiral Pelian opened fire on the Academy. What? Dalla stared in disbelief. She was about to rebut the statement, to say it couldn't possibly be accurate. She knew Gilad Pelian and had served, if briefly, as his second in command. He might not be the finest strategist the fleet had ever had, but he was stalwart and loyal if ever an Imperial officer was. Markarian's expression matched how she felt. I know. Stormhawk was part of Thrawn's personal squadron during the campaign. I serve with Pelian. It sounds unbelievable, but he shook his head. I don't know, Admiral. I don't know what is going on. It wasn't a puzzle that she was going to be able to solve right away. What are your orders? Honestly. Markarian folded his arms across his chest. We don't have any right now. With the Horn and Pelian both gone and Reaper destroyed, the command hierarchy is in chaos. The last word we got from Entrala was that Captain Brande had been promoted to Admiral and put in command of the fleet, but Judicator went missing before that order even came in. So you decided to bring Stormhawk to get my people out on your own initiative, Dalla said. Markarian nodded. Yes, sir. She nodded. Many Star Destroyer captains in the Starfleet wouldn't go out of their way even for their own crew. She would remember what he had done. My men, and I appreciate that initiative. Where are we going? She asked. Entrala, sir. It seems only logical to rally the fleet there, and we can assess the situation when we arrive. He deactivated the holo table, and the map of the galaxy faded. I'm assigning your crew to quarters and, if you don't object, I'll also be giving them duty shifts. Stormhawk is short of crew, and we could use all the skill crewers we can get. Good. He hesitated. Will you be taking direct command of Stormhawk, sir? No, not at this time, Captain. Stormhawk is your ship. Once we arrive at Entrala and figure out what in the Nine Hells is going on, I'm sure to be given something. Markarian tried to hide his relief, but Dalla could see it anyway. She didn't begrudge him that. She wouldn't want some admiral coming onto her ship and taking it away from her either. Yes, sir, he said. If you don't object, I've assigned you the admiral's suite. It hasn't ever been occupied, so you can make it home until we reach Entrala. Home. It was an odd word, and an odder thought. The admiral's suite aboard Gorgon had been home of a sort. The Comner Orphanage on Badajev had been home. So had her dorm at the Academy on Carita, but never her quarters on Executrix when she served on Tarkin's staff. It will do, she said. She took a deep breath, feeling a sudden surge of fatigue. How long had it been since she slept? If you'll excuse me, Captain, I believe I'll make use of those quarters now. Every Star Destroyer was the same, and the Admiral's quarters were always close to the Captain's quarters. So barely five minutes later, as soon as Commander Kratos assured her her crew was taken care of, she collapsed on the bed, still in her tattered uniform, and slept. Their arrival at Entrala brought remarkably few answers. Much of the fleet was still scattered around Imperial space, not counting the substantial fleets loyal to the warlords in the Deep Core, and it became clear almost immediately that no one knew more than Captain Markarian had. Dozens of Star Destroyers were all receiving repairs, some more serious than others, and Stormhawk settled neatly into a docking berth next to her sister ship Nemesis, a fellow veteran of Thrawn's personal squadron. Dalla mostly stayed out of Captain Markarian's way. Stormhawk's Admiral's quarters were plain, which suited her just fine, and had a direct hollow net link to the Entrala node, which permitted Dalla access to the Imperial net. She had already spent hours going over everything the hollow net had available, all of which was remarkably uninformative, barely more than Markarian had already told her, when it occurred to her that her channel selection was limited. Access hollow net, 
Karuskin Public Broadcasting Service, she ordered. Karuskin Public Broadcasting Service unavailable. She frowned. Highlighting the service announcement, she read deeper. Karuskin Public Broadcasting Service is a non-imperial outlet. All information generated from this source is deemed unreliable by ISB censors. Clamp down on information, have they? Dala mused silently. She went through a dozen other news sources, some based on Karuskin, others based on planets like Brentel. All of them were blocked. As best she could tell, even sources on rebel-held but imperial sympathetic worlds, like Kuwait, were blocked. What was going on? There was a chime? Commander Kratis to see Admiral Dalla. She deactivated the holodable. It wasn't like it was providing any actionable information anyway, and swiveled her chair towards the entrance to her office as she sent the command to open the door. Commander Kratis stepped in, looking significantly better groomed than he had when last she'd seen him. She supposed she probably looked better herself. A fresh uniform did wonders. Admiral, he said, clearly happy to see her. Commander, she replied warmly. She had few friends, but Kratis had stuck by her despite years in the Starfleet's outer rim purgatory. By all rights he ought to be a captain. He had long since done the job of one, but like most members of the fleet who had stuck by her, his career had stalled. I hope the crew is settling into their duties aboard Stormhawk. Indeed so, Admiral, he confirmed. But that's not why I'm here. He stood at attention in front of her desk. Ma'am, you have received a request for your presence from Grand Inquisitor Hamir and the Council of Moths. They're waiting for you on Entrala. Stunned disbelief rendered her mute for a long moment. Then she stood, straightening her uniform. Is there a shuttle waiting for me? Captain Markarian is preparing one as we speak. Ma'am, he gestured at the door. The tower hangar will be ready when you arrive. The hangar was busy. Stormhawks most seriously wounded were being moved into shuttles to be transported to the base for treatment and recovery. She saw a cluster of wounded survivors from Gorgon among them and briefly stopped to wish them her best. Then she boarded the provided shuttle. The headquarters on Entrala was nicknamed the Bastion. The exterior was heavily fortified against any potential rebel snub fighter attack, so the shuttle descended through a gauntlet of light turbolaser and laser emplacements that Dalla thought sacrificed a great deal of function in favor of looking impressive. A handful of proton torpedo strikes would take out multiple weapons each, which was a recipe for disaster. If she were put in command of the planet's defenses, she would demand an extensive refit of the entire apparatus. But then, if the rebellion was attacking Entrala, the Empire had much bigger problems. And she very much hoped that she wasn't about to be given that job. The reinforced hangar doors opened, and the shuttle descended through them. Below was a deep, chasm-like hole that descended deeper and deeper into the ground, under layers of armor and rock. After long minutes, the Lambda-class shuttle settled into a large, brightly lit hangar, filled with shuttles and freighters, pilots and stormtroopers and engineers going about their duties. To her surprise, there was an honor guard standing and waiting for them. She straightened her uniform, gave Kratis a severe nod, then strode down the landing ramp. The line of stormtroopers and officers saluted. In front of them were three men, none of them in a formal military uniform. Two of them wore Moff's uniforms. The last man bore no rank insignia, but he was clearly the man in charge. Cloaked in a flowing, hooded black robe, with a white cuirass that hung, apron-like, to provide additional protection, he was flanked by two enormous bodyguards. Both of the guards were at least seven feet tall in their armor, wearing helmets with glowing red eyes. She realized as she got closer that they weren't men at all, but droids. She strode until she was standing before the trio of superior offers, then twisted on her heels with parade precision and saluted. Admiral Dalla reporting as ordered. At ease, Admiral Dalla, the robed man said. His voice was deep and calm, and as he spoke all the men behind him relaxed to parade rest. Yellowish white cloth was wrapped around his head, covering his hair and mouth. Whether it was functional or decorative, Dalla didn't know, but it did serve to largely hide his expression. All of him she could see were his dark eyes and high cheekbones. Admiral Dalla, 
said the moth beside him. He was much older, practically geriatric, but with amateurishly dyed hair that suggested he did not wear his age gracefully. I am Moth Villain Disra, and this is Emperor Regent Hamir. Her eyes widened in stunned surprise, and she instantly dropped to one knee. Beside her, Kratos did the same, with a moment of additional hesitation. Emperor Regent, forgive me, I did not know. You may rise, Admiral, Hamir told her, his voice calm and steady. My new position has not yet been fully announced, and you could not have known. I am honored that you summoned me, Dalla said as she stood, straightening her uniform. How may I serve? Tell me, Admiral, had Captain Markarian not come to your rescue at Chaswa, what would the outcome of that battle be? Hamira's question had that same, almost preternatural calm and there was a hint of power and presence in it. The line of officers and stormtroopers stood shocked still behind him. The two moths moved between her and Hamir, watching them both. My men and I would have fought for another few days, Dala explained. We could no longer prevent rebel landings in the city, and the battle would have been street to street and house to house. We would have fought until the end, but my men were largely survivors of a Star Destroyer crew, and not trained for urban combat. She watched Hamir levelly, not allowing herself to break the joint gaze. Within two weeks we would all have been dead. You would have fought until the bitter end. We would. You would have, Admiral Dalla. She straightened. Yes, Emperor Regent. I would have fought until I was dead or unfit to serve. You won the Battle of Doran, Hamir continued in that same calm tone and you saved Admiral Pelian from his own incompetence at the Battle of Chaswa, at the willing cost of your flagship. I must look into what exactly happened with Pelian the first moment I have time, she promised herself. I swore an oath to the Empire, Dalla said aloud, to serve with all my heart. Yes, Hamir agreed, and for that you shall be rewarded. Admiral Dalla, effective immediately, you are in command of the Imperial Second Fleet. Your orders are to protect the Empire's holdings in the core and crush all rebellions against our legitimate rule. You will be given every resource available to accomplish that mission. Do you accept this commission and these orders? Dalla stared at him in stunned surprise. What had he said? Discipline was the only thing that permitted her to render the proper response. Yes, sir, I do. Hamir gestured at the second man in a moth's uniform. This is Loyalty Officer Siridi. All Imperial officers in command of a mobile unit have been assigned a loyalty officer by the Imperial Security Bureau to ensure better collaboration between the Starfleet and ISB. A watchdog, Dalla thought distastefully. She eyed the man. He was younger than either Hamir or Disra, much younger than Dalla herself. Suridi stepped forward, offering her his hand. It is my distinct pleasure to make your acquaintance, Admiral, he said. Speaking in a clipped, perfectly precise diction of a native Coruscanti. Of course, she said, more to Hamir than to Sariti as she regarded the Emperor Regent. Thank you for looking after my wounded, sir. Rest assured, Admiral, Hamir said, parting his hands in a beneficent gesture that echoed Palpatine's speeches. The Empire takes care of its own. Thank you, sir, Dalla said, and meant it. Now, come with me. Hamir ordered. He turned, his two enormous combat droids keeping to his flanks, and Dalla fell into step with him, Suridi and Disra trailing behind. The Inquisitorius has been working on finding a solution to the fleet's problems with manpower and material, Hamir said as they walked, the officers and stormtroopers did not accompany them, through the hangar. Disra pressed a button on his wrist com, and in front of them one of the hangar's bulkheads parted, allowed them passage and then closed behind them. A difficult task, Dalla commented, trying to determine what the proper protocol was for addressing an emperor regent. And if Hamir was regent, did that mean there was an emperor? For those of mundane talents, perhaps, Hamir said coyly. His words were slightly muffled by the cloth wrapped around his head. They entered into a second hangar, just as large as the first, but this one is entirely empty of people. Maintenance droids rolled through the expanse of space, tending to row after row of cruelly angled TIE fighters. Dalla had never seen this design before. 
Like TIE interceptors, they had a cutout in their solar panels, but unlike the TIE interceptor, their panels were entirely rectangular. The cutout gave them a blocky, narrow U shape. There were hundreds of them in this space alone. The Starfleet has long complained about not having a proper counter for the Rebellion's accursed snub fighters, Hamir continued. And so I have given it one. Admiral Dalla, let me introduce you to the next generation of Imperial Starfighter. Impressive, she said, and it was. Ties were rarer and rarer as Imperial manufacturing dwindled and shipyards were captured one after the next. Do they also have pilots? Hamir laughed, a dry, unamused sound. Tell me, he asked. Do they need pilots? Dalla frowned in confusion, then jerked in surprise as all of the ties in the hangar suddenly beeped in unison. As one, they sang an electronic chorus of the Imperial Anthem, an eerie, artificial version without any of the verve of a human chorus. The TIE droid, Hamir explained with grim satisfaction. She recovered from her surprise. How many will I have? The Inquisitorius will make delivery of the first 1,728 TIE droids by the end of the year. The pace of construction should only accelerate from there, Hamir answered and now she could hear the relish in his voice, even as the staggering size of the number registered. They may take some time to fully reach the quality of veteran pilots, but they do learn and adapt. Rest assured, Admiral, I will give you however many you need. Twelve wings of ties. Enough to give 24 Imperial-class Star Destroyers full fighter compliments. Even if they did not perform as well as human pilots, the sheer numbers would utterly change the calculus. She looked again at the two massive human-like droids that flanked Hamir, and wondered if there would be a similar change in fortunes on the ground. So, Admiral Dalla, do you think you can defeat the rebellions, once and for all? Dalla smiled slowly. Oh yes, Emperor Regent. Yes I do. She chose Stormhawk as her flagship. Captain Markarian deserved no less than to host the fleet's new commanding officer and she needed to focus fully on strategy while someone else handled commanding her flagship. She lamented that Kratos was without a ship, but her longtime XO had taken the news well. It helped that he was enthusiastic rather than put out when she told him that he would be staying as her chief of staff until she found him a command. Her second task was putting out feelers to become fully briefed on the actual state of the Empire. Whatever had happened at Corita, it was now clear that Admiral Pelian and a hefty chunk of the former garrison fleet were in open rebellion. Moff Faroz's Kandora sector was definitely in revolt with him. Scuttlebutt was that Faroz had been Grand Moff Kane's chosen successor, not Hamir, but Kandoras did not have the kind of military infrastructure to be a serious threat. She didn't want to fight Pelion, he'd been one of the only officers in the entire Starfleet who hadn't treated her with overt disrespect, but at least for the moment she didn't see that she had much choice. Luckily, it seemed she wouldn't have to right away. Hamir was still looking for a commander of the forces he would use to defeat Faroz and Pelian. Her concern was the New Republic. General Antilles' Fifth Fleet was already moving towards Corellia, preparing for an extended campaign, and she would have to get her forces into position to fight them off as quickly as she could. Her most pressing concern was not Antilles, however. It was her new subordinates. The position she had been given meant nothing if it was not respected by the fleet, and respect was not something she was accustomed to receiving from the fleet. But as fleet admiral, well, she had new options for redress. Stormhawk stewards waited on her with attentive patience, and the fitting for her new uniform had been done in no time, at all. An entire valise of new admiral's uniforms arrived with remarkable speed, clearly. They had been prepared in haste, but the cut was crisp and it did not lack for quality, and she fastened the seals of the star's fabric with no small amount of pride. Once, when she'd had Tarkin's patronage, whatever it had cost her, being fleet admiral had been an inevitability. After Tarkin's death it had seemed a pointless fantasy, one she did not even allow herself to daydream about. Now, unexpectedly, she had been cast into the role she had long dreamed of. She straightened her tunic, and then strode from her quarters. Officers and troopers snapped to attention as the battered, broken in boots she insisted on keeping clicked through Stormhawk's quarters. 
It was a short walk from the admiral's quarters to the briefing room, and a pair of stormtroopers stood outside, holding their E-11s at attention. There was the click of boots behind her, and she turned to see loyalty officer Ceridi arriving. Ah, uh, admiral, he greeted her. I hope you do not mind if I join you for the conference. As if she had any choice, she lifted an eyebrow at him. Tell me, loyalty officer Ceridi, where does your position stand in the imperial hierarchy? The young man had an impressive combination of a smile and a sapphic face. Above an admiral, but below a moth. But you are outside of the Starfleet's chain of command. She pressed. He held up both hands in a gesture of surrender. I am not here to interfere with your military command, Admiral. I am merely Commoner's representative on your staff. He smiled winsomely. I'm here to make your life as easy as I can, I promise. Dalla gave a noncommittal hum, then turned towards the troopers outside the conference room. Have the captains arrived? She asked. Yes, ma'am, the senior trooper announced. Captain Markarian joined them just a minute ago. He stepped to the side and the door behind him opened with a hiss. She entered, and the troopers entered behind her then stopped just inside the briefing room to flank either side of the door. Suriti followed behind, nearly silent. Fifteen captains, fourteen with their own ships, and Kratis, lined the long rectangular table. They stood as she entered. Some wore perfectly blank expressions, others curious, some outright disdainful. She kept her own expression carefully professional, though her jaw set stiffly. Be seated, she ordered. They sat. Once again, the motion was revealing. Some sat quickly, others more casually. Captain Nalgul of Tyrannic sat last and folded his arms across his chest like a petulant child, outright glowering at her. She stayed standing, folding her hands behind her back. By the order of the Emperor Regent, I now command this fleet. My orders are to protect Corellia and the Empire's holdings in the core. To that end, once the ships here at Entrala have been fully re-equipped, we will be... Re-equipped with what? Interrupted Nalgo bitterly. My escort and TIE squadrons were destroyed by the rebels at Castell. The system is now in their hands, and that traitor Pelian is practically collaborating with them to keep us from taking it back. Dala kept her mouth closed. The silence lingered as she gazed at Nalgo with calm, emotionless eyes, willing the man to feel the molten fury simmering beneath that gaze. The captain stirred as she did not speak, glancing at one another, then at Nalgo. Admiral. Nalgo prompted, finally looking uncomfortable. Oh, I was listening, Dala told him calmly. I was just waiting until you were finished. You are finished, aren't you, Captain? Nalgo stiffened, leaning forward, both his hands on the polished table. He rose half out of his chair as he loomed forward, but though he was tall enough, she loomed taller. I did not join the Starfleet to be toyed with by the likes of Fial. He lifted his hands, gesturing out at Ceridi, as if imploring the ISB operative for reprieve. Is this what we have come to? To be treated like Rodians by Tarkin's whore? How can? There was a whisper of metal on leather and a crimson bolt from Dalla's blaster took him in the heart. He pitched backwards mid-sentence and toppled into his chair, the once perfect uniform over his chest smoldering around a decidedly imperfect crater. Nalgul's corpse regarded her, his jaw still set in fury, his stunned, white eyes vouchsafe in a fatal shock. Dalla lowered her pistol to her side when the light left his eyes. I do not care what you say about me behind my back, she said, the words deceptively calm, hiding her fury boiling beneath the surface. But I will not tolerate insubordination. Her captain stared at her, stunned into silence. She let the silence linger until Ceridi cleared his throat. It seems Tyrannic requires a new commanding officer, he said with remarkable aplomb. Kratos, you are without a command, aren't you? Congratulations, Captain. Slowly, gingerly, the other captains settled back into their chairs, attention squarely on Dalla, as in two of her stormtroopers, battered breastplates and carbon mark pauldrons marking them as survivors of the late Gorgon, entered to drag Nalgul's body unceremoniously away. As I said, Dalla continued coolly, once the ships here at Entrala have been re-equipped, we will be dividing our forces into two groups.
Chapter 1 Six months later The now massive droid brain at the heart of Silencer Station had once been the size of an extremely inexpensive Kurosan T apartment. But in the months that had passed since Cray Mingla had been kidnapped from her office at the McGrody Institute, the brain had steadily grown to the size of an apartment that would be near impossible to acquire, and Cray had no idea how it was doing it. Silencer Station consumed the resources of the K3-947 system with the greedy appetite of a hungry hut, sucking an asteroid after asteroid. It was one of the most remarkable things Cray had ever seen and would have been her proudest achievement if she had been responsible for it. But one of her many, many problems was that she wasn't responsible for it. Even worse, she still barely understood anything that was happening in K3-947. Since she hadn't caused any of it, and didn't understand it, she had no idea how to control it, and she needed to figure that out to give her captors what they wanted. She had to give them what they wanted. She had to do it as soon as possible, because Nietzsche's life hung in the balance. That thought was not one conducive to productivity. Instead of a clear mind and intense focus, it brought a pound in heartbeat and a panicked ache and Cray could afford neither. Determinedly, she forced Nietzsche's back out of her mind, refusing to think about how badly his hands shook or how hard it was for him to find words sometimes. She couldn't think about the pain she saw in his eyes, his anguish about being used to compel her service to these imperial thugs. All she could think about was making the interface work. Make the interface work, she told herself furiously, wiping a tear from her eyes. Make it work. Cray knew she was working herself too hard. Creative thinking couldn't be forced, and the harder she pushed herself, the more difficult the leaps and in insight she needed became. Logically, rationally, she knew that. Emotionally, though, emotionally, she saw Nietzsche shaking hands and his apologetic, tired smile every time she closed her eyes. And so she pushed, using the kind of rote, brutal trial and error that her teachers had always discouraged, because that she could force herself to do even when she was bone tired even when it had been so long since she had gotten a full night's sleep that her own hands shook. This version of the interface wasn't as invasive as the one her predecessor had designed. That lack of invasiveness made the connection between the person using it and the silencer a less immersive, but it also meant that Cray didn't need to perform brain surgery on herself in order to test it. She finished the last attachments on the helmet and took a deep breath. I hope we're both having luck today, Nietzsche's, she thought to herself, and settled it onto her head. There was a sense of electricity cackling in the air, tingling her skin and making all the hair on her arms stick up. Then the pressure started, building in her ears and her brain as the connection was made. Her heartbeat quickened, hoping that this time, this time, the damn thing would actually work. Her eyes went wide staring into the interface as information suddenly started scrolling much too fast for her to read over the screen on the interior of the helmet. The sense of electricity grew, grew past pressure to pain, and her brain recoiled against the sudden sense of invasion. And then it all stopped. Pain receded back to pressure, electricity still cackling, and the text scrolled slow to a halt. The last line of text stayed on the screen, hovering in front of her eyes and it took her a long moment to bring herself back to focus and let the words be processed by her exhausted brain. Command interface established. Silencer 7 awaiting interlink. Cray swayed, her forgotten arms gripping her chair. Command interface. Does it work? She hadn't slept in days, but she knew, she knew, that the ultimate purpose of what she was working on was to provide a human mind the ability to interact with and command Silencer's AI. The AI itself was still developing and growing, taking all the resources it collected and utilizing them to expand its capabilities, but its imperial masters, Cray's imperial captors, wanted the ability to control and direct it more precisely. That was why they had come in the night and taken Cray, after all, as the McGrody Institute's foremost expert on cybernetics, she was uniquely suited to create the command interface. But now that she had, she realized that she might have found more than just a reason to keep Nietzsche's alive for a little longer. She might have just discovered a means to seize their freedom. Start with something simple, she told herself. Then she concentrated, 
triggering the cybernetic interface. Give me a systems report, she ordered. Information started to flow once again on the monitor. Resource stockpiles, manufacturing abilities, construction and progress. It appeared that Silencer Station had the ability to build more than just itself, she thought. Give me a map of Silencer Station, she thought, sending the new command and a list of all internal security mechanisms. Both pieces of information appeared, and she did her best to commit all the information there to memory. A plan started to form itself in her head. She needed to get to Nietzsche's, use the command interface to override the station security, and hijack a ship, report on system defenses. Her heart fell. Silencer station wasn't alone. TIE fighters, a design she didn't quite recognize, swirled around it in enormous numbers, maintaining precise squadron formations. They circled tirelessly, hundreds of them in swarms. Wait, are those droids? She hadn't meant to ask the command interface that question, but it promptly responded nonetheless, providing her with a full schematic of a TIE-D, complete with its performance profile. A little note at the bottom mentioned that their programming was incomplete and required more human input before they would reach optimal combat performance. Were they all under the command of the silencer AI? She frowned in concentration, adrenaline fighting off her fatigue, and tried to order the AI to alter the formation of the ties. To her astonishment, it immediately did so. Formation theta confirmed, the AI dutifully reported, and the little green dots representing Tai swarmed as they adjusted their relative positions. She couldn't afford to wait. The moment one of her keepers put on this interface, they would have control over the AI, and they would never let her put it on again. If she was going to use it to escape, it had to be now. Determined, she commanded the AI to prepare her and Nietzsche's a ship and put the station's security under her control. Warning, attempted command exceeds user authorization. The pain was back, driving into her skull. It exploded like a nova just behind her eyes, sending her vision blurry and making her thoughts chaotic. The headset crackled with electricity, and Cray felt as if the AI was pushing back now, trying to use it to infiltrate her mind. There was a swell in her brain, and the voice grew louder. Command interface intended for Designate Emperor. You are not Designate Emperor. The pain grew and Cray felt as if her head was swelling, pressure growing, and with a despairing, desperate cry she flung the headset off her head and everything went instantly black. Cray woke suddenly, her entire body aching and the toe of a pointed, polished boot nudging her face. She flailed, rolling onto her back and covering her face to protect it, staring up into pitiless black eyes surrounded by the sharp, angular features of the project's director, Raganda Eismarin. It took Cray a moment longer to come back to full attention, her brain sluggishly recovering from the battering it had taken while attached to the command interface, the command interface which was currently in Raganda's hand. The older woman's eyes sparkled with a quickly hidden glint of curiosity as she examined the helmet. I see you made it work. Raganda's accent was that of the ideal imperial aristocrat, precise and condescending. I hate you so much, Cray thought bitterly. Just thinking made her head hurt. Raganda's eyes shifted from the headset to Cray herself, and she tried to sit up, but she found her limbs rejecting her commands, reacting only weakly. She felt like a Reposorbus had landed on her legs. Raganda watched her twitch, imperious in a sharply cut civilian outfit that echoed the uniform gray of the Imperial military. Most curious. Most curious. Cray snarled as she forced her body into obedience. Slowly, slowly it began to obey, her arms and legs moving with more alacrity. She took a deep, even breath, but she never took her eyes off Raganda, never let her stony facade drop. Raganda had kidnapped her from the Institute, had taken her and Nietzsche's, and locked them up, had ruthlessly exploited Nietzsche's worsening illness to compel Cray's cooperation, and Cray Mingla would be damned if she showed that shudder so much as a flash of weakness. You should not have been able to send in any commands, Raganda replied forthrightly, offering Cray a straightforward answer for perhaps the first time in the, however long it had been, since Cray had been brought to K3-947 and Silencer Station. How many months had it been? Raganda knelt down, 
bringing her face closer to Cray, still watching her. Her black eyes were cool and intense, lingering. Somewhere in the back of Cray's brain there was a pressure, not unlike that of the silencer AI trying to force his way into her thoughts. Instinctively Cray flailed, rejecting the pressure, nearly hitting Reganda in the face. Lashing out would only hurt niches though, so Cray kept her fist from making contact, no matter how satisfying it would have been. Reganda smiled slowly. Most curious, she repeated, and most fortuitous. I did not know you are Force-sensitive, Dr. Mingla. What? Cray asked, confused. What do you mean? You see, Silencer 7 is not just an artificial intelligence, Reganda continued. Her smile was still there, stiff and frozen, as if adorning a mannequin. Silencer 7 is the product of two decades of careful research and study and service to the Emperor, the combination of the work of Bevel Limelisk and myself. The Imperial which lowered her voice and Cray had to strain to hear her, the lingering pain in the back of her head finally starting to subside. The ancient Sith performed many experiments on artificial life. Much has been forgotten of their successes, but enough remains to achieve some small breakthroughs. If you were not Force-sensitive, Silencer 7 would not have responded to you at all. Reganda regarded her with something worse than just sheer contempt. Now she was interested. The older woman reached down and caressed Cray's face. Cray had to fight the urge to bite at her fingers. Congratulations, Dr. Mingler. You may take the rest of the day off. I am told that Dr. Mar had an accident and has been. She paused, and there was hardness and menace in those eyes, suffering greatly in your absence. You may go attend to him. Cray's heart pounded in her chest. Niches but she refused to give Reganda the satisfaction of seeing her beg. She had done that enough already. Instead, she forced herself to her feet and took no small satisfaction in the fact that she was taller and more athletic than Reganda. She looked down on her captor, her expression offering not a single hint of submission, before she turned and left, keeping her pace unhurried despite the panic in her heart and the aching in her legs. Nietzsche's Mar was dying. This was no new revelation. Niches had known he was dying for almost a year. He had just asked Cray to marry him. They'd gone on vacation, taking some time away from their work at the McGrody Institute, where they had met, when the first symptoms had manifested. It had started with nothing more than a tingle in the tips of his toes. He thought nothing of it, attributing it to stress or to the way he sat when he programmed the new droids. But then it started in the tips of his fingers as well and quickly the odd tingling turned to pain. Quanet syndrome had no cure, only painkillers to address the intensity of his symptoms, and those were at best a limited ameliorative. When he took the painkillers, the pain was reduced back to tingling, but his mind became a soupy thing without any of his normal precision of thought. Nietzsche's was used to being the clearest I'd been in a room, his thoughts regimented and meticulous. That was what made him such an excellent programmer, among other things. But with the painkillers, he lost that clarity, that meticulousness, and became less than himself. He tried to limit how much of the painkillers he used, both because he hated their side effects and because he didn't trust the Imperials who were now the only ones who could provide them. Worse than dying, far worse, was having his condition held over him by the Imperials. When Reganda Eismarin arrived at the McGrody Institute and presented herself as an interested potential customer requesting a prospectus for a lucrative contract fulfilled by their best researchers, the money had seemed almost too good to be true. In hindsight, her only real interest had been knowing who to target for kidnapping by an ISB whisper team, and his brilliant, beautiful fiancé and her exquisite mind had been far too tempting for Eismarin to ignore, especially when threats to Nietzsche's well-being would easily compel Cray to comply with Eismarin's wishes. And so each day the Imperials came and gave him just enough perigen to make life bearable, unless they wanted to make a point. On those days they dispensed none, and he spent the hours writhing in agony knowing for each moment of that pain that Cray was elsewhere in Silencer Station, frantically trying to earn him even a single moment's peace. He hadn't told her what he planned. She would have objected, would have told him not to take any risks that it was too dangerous, but he was already dying, and the only chance she had to survive was to escape. 
He meandered along through the corridor, his cane clicking against the polished, industrial floor as he took heavy steps, aided by a powered braised truss of his own design that kept him steady. The pain jolted through him with each step he took, but that was all right. It was just pain. His existence had become a kaleidoscope of pain since his diagnosis. He kept on, his gait halting as his cybernetic truss and cane kept him upright. This part of the station was technically off-limits, but the Imperials barely noticed him. As their oath went, they were expected to serve until they were dead or unfit, and they all considered Nietzsche's Mar unfit. Incapable. An invalid living on borrowed time. Someone? Something to be exploited to force Cray to comply. They didn't ignore him, exactly, as he made a stumbling, cane-carried walk. They simply moved around him like he wasn't there, not looking at him as if the very act of making eye contact would contaminate them. The sound of a dozen pairs of booted feet made him stop and shuffle to the side. Ten droid troopers walked into rows of five, and between them was Emperor Regent Hamir and a man in an Imperial Moff's uniform. Their conversation was not entirely drowned out by the sounds of the boots surrounding them. Dala has been able to prevent the New Republic from advancing on Corellia up until now but she needs more ships and more men. It's only a matter of time before Antilles Fifth Fleet is refreshed and prepared to resume action. When will? Hamir stopped short, causing all ten of the droid troopers guarding him to come to an abrupt, precise halt. The officer with him stumbled a pace farther before turning to face him. Nietzsche did his best to hide his head against the wall of the corridor, trying to make himself small and innocuous. There were some things he had not accounted for in this plan. Stumbling across the Emperor region himself was one of them. Hammer's voice was quiet, but the edge of anger was plain. Admiral Dalla has so far declined to use the Tide droids I sent her. Why should I hurry to send her more? The moth swallowed. You promised her 2,000 by the end of the year, Emperor Regent, he said, and Nietzsche was impressed at how well the man kept his voice calm. She hasn't even received 200. She says if she uses them too soon, she will lose the element of surprise. There was a pause before the Emperor Regent replied. Very well, Sariti. You may tell Admiral Dalla that I have heard her request, and the Emperor's hand assures me that she will be able to bring Silencer Station to full operational capability in the next few weeks, Hamir said, and Nietzsche was surprised to hear the concession concession was not the thing he expected from the Emperor region of the Empire. The station is as yet incomplete and is still missing its core. She has finally found a lead on the final required artifact and will be traveling to an AR Shada to acquire it within a week. An AR Shada, M. Lorp. Hamir turned and resumed his march down the hall, his robes swirling impressively around his feet. The droid troopers immediately matched his cadence the officer's voice getting lost in the sound of the movement. Nietzsche's let out a long, slow breath. That was hardly the first time he'd seen the Emperor Regent, but it was the first time he'd been so close to a conversation. Thankfully, the entire party seemed to have overlooked, or at least ignored, his presence. Only after the echoes of boots had faded did he resume his slow, plodding trek down the hall. Pain seemed to subside as the overheard conversation repeated in his memory, and Nietzsche reluctantly decided to change his plans, ever so slightly. Once he was within 20 feet of his intended target, he stopped. Fumbling with his jacket, he carefully withdrew a computer rod. Trembling fingers gripped the rod, and he ignored the way the tightness of the grip sent tendrils of pain up each of his fingers and along his forearm. Gripping it harder than he'd held anything, he carefully inserted it into one of the myriad of droid ports that were common all throughout Silencer Station. The Empire may think him useless, but Nietzsche's Mar was a doctor of cybernetics and programming at the McGrody Institute, just like his fiancée. Nobody there had ever doubted his brilliance, and this was not a very complicated program. Ten seconds after he inserted it, an alarm started to blare just down the hall. In his head, he started to count. One, two. Confused Imperial officers emerged into the hall, looking at one another and chattering. He ignored them, continuing his steady countdown. Four. Five. One of the officers had noticed him and was coming towards him. Hey, you, what are you doing there? 
As Dr. Marr, sir, he's one of the prisoners, the sick one, a second officer was saying. Seven. I know who he is. Nietzsche's Marr was dying, but he wasn't dead yet. He had spent months building up the fiction of just how weak he was. He was plenty weak, and he knew it but he wasn't nearly as weak as he'd been letting on, and a cane could be used for more than helping someone walk. Just as the officer was reaching for him, Nietzsche's pivoted and slammed the end of the cane into the Imperial's jaw. The imp toppled backwards, knocking over the two other officers behind him like a trio of shock ball players, and then with all the strength and energy Nietzsche's had he broke into a run. Every fallen step was agony, the same tendrils that shot through his fingers aching through the marrow of his legs into his lungs, making it hard to draw breath. He fell through the door into the lab and collapsed in a heap on the floor. Ten. Behind him the door slid shut and the last part of Nietzsche's program executed, locking it in place. He heard the banging on the door, officers demanded to be let back in. His legs felt both fragile and heavy, and he had to drag himself to the console then pulled himself unsteadily to his feet. He withdrew the second computer rod from his pocket and pushed it into the port. With all his strength, he recorded the message then activated his program. Ten seconds after that someone shot him in the back, and, mercifully, the pain faded as everything went dark. The Imperials took Cray to the room she shared with Nietzsche's. In a near panic, she had torn the door open, only to find the room empty. Frantic, she had pleaded with the hall guard to tell her where Nietzsche's was, realizing a few minutes later that the guard was another droid, one of the dozens that patrolled Silencer Station's interior halls. They had left her there, her terror mounting as she wondered what they had done to Nietzsche's, if he was all right, for nearly an hour. That was enough time for her to realize that this was probably her fault, that her attempt to hijack Silencer Station's droid brain had been deemed worthy of severe punishment. If they had killed him before of her, because of her stupidity and her. The door hissed, and she jumped off the bed. Into the room walked two of the patrol droids, carrying Nietzsche's limp form between them. Behind the guards were Reganda Icemarin and Emperor Regent Hamir. Over there, Reganda pointed lazily at Cray, and the droids obediently dropped Nietzsche's at her feet. His body folded in half as he fell, totally limp and it was all she could do to catch him before his head hit the floor. Her hands were trembling badly as she pressed her fingers to find her fiancé's pulse, and she let go an excruciating sob of relief as she located it, weak and thready though it was. She cradled his body, finally tearing his gaze away from his thankfully peaceful expression, and snarled at the two Imperials who had destroyed their lives. What did you do to him? Stunned him, Raganda replied breezily after he broke into the primary computer center. Played hell with that truss of his. Like you, he attempted to infiltrate our security network. Like you, he failed. Once more, Reganda loomed over Cray, and the Emperor's hands' eyes were dark and empty. The only reason he is not dead, Dr. Mingla, is I still need your expertise. But if you do not help me to my satisfaction, I will have him killed. Slowly and so painfully that not even his disease will inure him to the pain. Speak if you understand. Cray sobbed, cradling Nietzsche's fallen form. I, I understand, she gasped between sobs. In her heart she felt a fury building, a fury married to anguish and fear, and she could almost see Raganda's throat restricting as something in the air around Cray responded to her rage. The back of Raganda's hand whipped across Cray's cheek, sending her sprawling. A word of advice, dear girl, do not meddle with powers you do not understand, Reganda hissed, and Cray saw one of the woman's long fingers stroking over her throat. Hamir finally spoke. Our time, doctor, is running out faster than we had previously anticipated. I must have this station fully operational. The Emperor's hand will be departing on a mission to acquire its last component, but when she returns I expect that you will make it fully operational. In the meantime, you will ensure that the Emperor can command Silencer 7 once it is fully operational. You will begin his education at once. Hamir did not have the same sense of malice that Reganda carried so easily, but the flatness of his expression was almost more disturbing. And of course, the time you have with your lover is finite as well. 
If you succeed in the tasks you give us, we will see to it that his last days with you are peaceful ones. Cray no longer had the strength to argue. She nodded, broken. They left her there, sobbing in the center of her cell with Nietzsche's body in her arms. Chapter 2 Tempered metal came out of hyperspace far beyond the edge of Dathomir's hyperlimit, just to be safe. While the Imperial presence in this part of the galaxy had been broken with the death of Warlord Singe, Dathomir remained an uncertain world with multiple interested powers. Mara was not interested in getting into a shooting match with the Happen Battle Dragon if she could avoid it, and certainly not because she did something as stupid as startled him. Beside her, Luke leaned forward peering down at the computer readouts. Any sign of the happens? There they are, Mara pointed at the heads-up display, which blinked with the trio of friendly green dots. Happen knives. R2, make sure we're using our real life, who constructed. I want them to know who we are, so don't sub it out for another one of your fakes. R2 blatted at him rudely. He better not have, Mara growled as she kept her ship speed at a leisurely pace giving the Happens plenty of time to see them and react before she got too close. I've told him before that he shouldn't change out the ship's beacon without telling me first. The droid's dome did a full rotation. Then he made a sound that sounded half resigned and half indignant. You always think it's for the best, Mara retorted after a quick glance at the ship's translation unit. But it's still my ship. It doesn't matter in this case, Luke intervened quickly. He hasn't changed the beacon. The comm unit crackled to life. Unknown vessel, this is the Happen Battle Dragon Grand Beldum, Happen Royal Guard. By the order of the Queen Mother, this world is under our protection. Announce yourself. Happens, Mar muttered. She keyed her comm. Grand Beldum, this is tempered metal. We have aboard Jedi Knights traveling to Dathomir for the purposes of recruitment. She lifted her finger off the pickup and glanced at R2. Send our credentials, R2. The droid whistled his agreement. It was nice of Tenny Neil to make sure we'd have the appropriate flimsy work, Luke commented. Mara looked at him sideways. How many other ex-girlfriends do you have hidden around the spaceways anyway? Luke blushed nicely. Tenny Neil isn't an ex-girlfriend. No, but from what Solo told me it wasn't by much, and she did declare her intent to pursue you. That drew a smile from Luke. One that didn't quite banish his blush. Rather dramatically. I let her down easy. Mara was a Jedi Knight now, so of course petty concepts like jealousy were beneath her. Definitely, definitely beneath her. She could feel Luke's embarrassment, which never failed to be endearing, and also his enduring, though platonic, affection for the Dathomiri witch who had become the Queen Mother of Hapes. She allowed her ship to coast and system towards the planet growing in front of them. It was a beautiful world, she thought. With limited development, Dathomir had none of the stretches of illuminated land visible from orbit that most inhabited worlds did, from a distance. Some newcomers would mistake Coruscant for a star, but instead had only enormous stretches of greenery, stripe, and mountains, and bordered with oceans and seas. If not for the planet's hostile native life forms, including but not limited to his witches, Dathomir would no doubt have become host to a much larger settlement centuries ago. Tempered metal, the female voice of the happy communications officer came back, more respectful, but there was just a bit of an edge to it. Welcome to Dathomir, Jedi Knights Jade and Skywalker. We've ordered the main landing pad on the surface cleared. You'll be free to land at Solo's Folly in a few minutes. Luke and Mara looked at each other. Did you say Solo's Folly? Asked Luke, fighting back a laugh. That's the name of the settlement on the surface, came the response. We're sending you its exact location and landing instructions now. The comm clicked off, and Mara's screen flashed as the indicated instructions appeared upon it. Luke leaned towards Mara. Do you want to tell Han or should I? He murmured, smirking broadly. Oh, let me do it, Mara said cheerfully as she began preparations for landing. I still owe him for that time he called me a nursemaid. Solo's folly turned out to be a small settlement that had grown out of Warlord Singe's former prison garrison. 
The buildings were largely clustered within the standing fortifications, complete with substantial and seemingly well-maintained defensive guns capable of striking both ground and aerial targets. At the center of the compound was a large landing field with several pads capable of holding a mid-sized bulk freighter and one smaller pad for four Happen X wings. The landing pads were one of the only places on the planet it was safe to land a ship without risk from the roving native wildlife, and given that the roving native wildlife included rankers that could grow up to 10 meters tall and strong enough to smash starships, as best not to take any chances. Mara had never been to Dathomir before, but Luke and Han and Leia had told her about his previous time here. It's changed a lot in the last few years, Luke commented. It seemed Solo's folly. He choked back a laugh, and Mara couldn't quite prevent a smirk from crossing her lips, has a permanent population of a few hundred. He pointed at a large, gleaming structure which overlooked both the landing pad and the rugged, forested terrain beyond the city's fortifications. And that looks like something that happens built for their garrison. I guess closer to a thousand, Mara said. She pointed in the direction of the nearby mountain. You can see additional structures out in the valley. She cut the throttle back and kicked in the rempel sore lifts, bringing the ship down onto the cleared landing pad. It was in excellent condition, practically brand new, complete with nearby construction droids, which seemed to be building a new, identical pad next to it and provided nice, bright lights and lines which made the landing easy. Her piloting droid, Slips, beeped his normal relieved sound. He did that every time he watched someone else land the ship, always wishing to do it himself, as Mara put tempered metal down with the slight sag of the landing gear hydraulics, and then the slight flexing, rise as the ship's landing struts leveled out. She leaned back in the pilot's couch. The ship's all yours, Slips. Keep an eye on things while Luke and I meet the Singing Mountain Clan, and don't let anyone aboard. And remember, R2, Luke said, almost chidingly, Slips is in charge. No modifications. R2 made a rude noise, and Mara's pilot droid tootled out an insouciant affirmative as the two humans departed. Asterisk. There was a party of happens waiting to greet them. Three men and women in the flashy yet surprisingly practical uniforms of the Happen Royal Guard, though still thick with plenty of gold trim and gewgaws, stood at attention not far from the end of Tempered Metal's landing ramp. Mara strode towards them. She wasn't wearing anything nearly so flashy, just one of her typical spacer ensembles, with sturdy pants and a jacket with sleeves loose enough to easily hide her holdout, but she did have her lightsaber swinging from her belt. Behind her, Luke was dressed in his typical Jedi outfit, a brown cloak covering a comfortable set of white Jedi robes, created in the style of his first master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. The outfit had become nearly a uniform among the growing number of young Jedi, but Mara preferred less flowing and less conspicuous garb. The lead happened. A middle-aged woman whose outfit had even more gold than the two men flanking her greeted her and Luke with a severe nod. Welcome to Dathomir, she announced with a lack of ceremony that starkly contrasted her outfit. I'm Colonel Nellison, commander of Happen Forces in the Dathomir system. Luke Skywalker, Luke replied, then nodded at Mara, and this is Mara Jade. We're here to meet with Ogwen DJO of the Singing Mountain Clan. The Queen Mother's mother, Colonel Nellison replied. That's correct. And the purpose of your visit? As we told the commander of the Grand Beldum, Mara cut in, and indicated on our travel documents, we're here for the purposes of recruitment. Of Jedi, Colonel Nellison said blandly. That's correct, said Luke again. We're here to see if any of the witches wish to train as Jedi. Nellison's face pinched, just a little. The two men flanking her kept impressive Sabbath faces, but Mara could feel the hint of tension in the air. Nellison herself clearly wanted to say something more but resisted the impulse. Your flimsy work is in order. You may proceed. The gates in and out of the settlement are locked from one hour after sundown until sunrise. Given your previous history on this planet, I don't need to warn you of the native dangers. And with that, the happen turned on her heels and walked away, the two guards following with a gait that would have been appropriate for the heights of formal ceremony. I don't think she liked us very much, Mar said, 
planting her hands on her hips. No, Luke sighed. I don't think she did. I'm not sure why she was upset, though. Could be anything, Mara shrugged. Maybe she doesn't like being stuck on this backwater instead of back home with the pomp and performance of hapes. Maybe she doesn't like the idea of the Jedi Order returning. Maybe she's protective of the Queen Mother's family. Maybe, Luke agreed. Come on, let's go. If we don't have Ranker Transportation, it's a long walk. Ranker Transportation, Mara muttered. Life with you is never boring, Skywalker. Asterisk. The road they were traversing was marked with many signs of recent travel, human-sized, and much larger. Clearly this has become a major trade route. Mara mused, scanning the horizon and stretching out with her senses, feeling the web of life left by the witches and others who regularly traveled between the settlements of the Singing Mountain Clan and Solo's Folly. Up until now, Mara had only ever seen the Rinker at Jabba's palace. That had been an impressive creature, though at the time Mara had been more impressed by the Rinker's bait than the beast itself. Beside her, Luke smirked, and she glared at him sideways. But from the footprints on the path, the Rankers that lived here made Jabba's look like the runt of the litter. But Mara spent only a fraction of her attention on imagining Dathomir's Ranker population, because while the road was empty in both directions, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. Luke moved a bit closer to her side. Danger sense, he murmured under his breath. She merely nodded. Her hand moved instinctively towards the lightsaber she had on her belt. Anakin Skywalker's old blade was a comforting presence, but she didn't draw it just yet. If they were being stalked, better not to provoke their stalkers into attacking them. Night sisters, she asked. I don't think so. Luke closed his eyes, and she could feel him concentrating, extending his force sense out in all directions, searching for a foreign presence. There's a group of witches shadowing us, he murmured quietly, writing rankers. Mara closed her eyes, pushing her force sense out to mingle with his. He greeted her welcomingly, his presence warm and affectionate, but also alert. He guided her outwards, showing her what he had already found. The trio of minds, all strong in the force, and their trio of shockingly intelligent, massive rancor mounts. She opened her eyes once again and met Luke's, noting that while he looked alert, he did not look concerned. Hostiles? I don't feel any overt hostility, Luke said with a slight shake of her head. But the witches. He stopped suddenly, and she too felt the sudden shift in the force. Energy swirled within it around the trio of witches, and Mara could feel them calling upon his power. Their power was unlike any other force user Mara had ever encountered. Nothing like Palpatine, or Tion, or Luke. It felt primal somehow, different from the more subtle, ancient traditions of the Jedi and Sith. The world around them responded to it, the trees almost quivering as the forest offered the witches its power, animals scrambling out of a sudden sense of haste. The witches were as one with their world, and their world was as one with them, and the forest was both at once. There was a sudden howl of wind, and a gust battered against them, making Luke's robes seem to fly all around him. Mara braced herself against the wind digging her combat boots into the hardened mud at her feet and taking her lightsaber into her hand. But the howl wasn't just the wind. To her astonishment, Mara saw a creature rise up out of the forest. The ranker's maw dripped with ichor, its dark, stunningly intelligent eyes staring at the two Jedi from its vantage high above them, high above because the ranker was at least 20 meters tall. Its massive claws were the size of airspeeders and the whole planet seemed to shake as it took a step towards them looming even taller as it took another step forward. The creature's eyes never left Mara. She and Luke stepped closer together, adopting a mutually protective defensive stance. She opened herself, to Luke and to the Force, and felt all the depths of Dathomir's primal power flow into her as it flowed into Luke, their consciousnesses mingling as they faced the sudden threat. The rancor hunched forward towards them, his maw opening as it screamed at the two Jedi, the sound one of rage and challenge. As one, Luke and Mara ignited their lightsabers, green and blue appearing with twin snap hisses, and then the ranker charged. It moved with impossible speed, and... Mara. Luke's thought pressed into her mind, with a sense of both revelation and urgency. 
She didn't understand what it was he had realized, but without hesitation, she followed his guidance. The two of them stood together as the ranker closed, 30 meters becoming 10 then 5, the beast's massive claw swiping towards them. Follow. Mara and Luke closed their eyes and disengaged their lightsaber. Reaching into the force, they found the spell that had weaved itself around them, the power of far more than three witches there empowering it, and ignored it. They stepped forward into the claws of the beast, its deafening anger echoing in their ears, and continued stepping forward, untouched. The ranker's howl of rage became nothing more than a gust of wind, and then not even that, as the illusion dissipated. When their eyes opened once again, they stood in the middle of a quiet road, and the ranker footprints were all of very normal size. The three witches they had sensed in the forest, and their merely eight meter tall mounts, appear from the forest a few minutes later. Their leader was a tall woman with brown skin and darker hair. Her mount lowered itself closer to the ground, and she jumped down, holding a deadly spear in her hand and dressed in leather armor, and Mara was struck by the sheer predatory physicality of the woman and her strong presence in the forest. I am Karana T, she announced herself, her voice carrying strongly of the singing mountain clan. You have seen the mountain sing, and still you stand. The witch quirked a smile. Truly, the powers of the Jai are as our mothers say. Come. Your arrival has been foretold. The rest of the trip was fast and unlike any other trip Mara had ever taken. The experience of being picked up by a ranker and put on his back, where there was a saddle, played havoc with her expectations of normality. Luke, who had done this before, was more comfortable, but they were also separated. Luke rode with one of the other witches, who looked alarmingly happy at the arrangement, Mara thought, with just a hint of possessive annoyance, while Mara was placed with Karanity. Standing next to the warrior which made Mara feel annoyingly short. Traveling by ranker was loud and conversation was difficult, so Mara spent the ride mostly watching scenery and memorizing the local geography. From high up on the ranker's back she could see easily for a long distance, and the miles of trees became increasingly thick the farther she looked until they were walled off by a line of not too distant mountains. They traveled through that forest and up into the foothills, following a valley along a shallow stream. It took about three hours, but eventually they came upon signs of human settlement, and shortly thereafter they arrived at the settlement of the Singing Mountain Clan. Witches gathered around, staring mostly at Luke, and though it made her feel self-conscious about just how possessive she was acting, Mara stepped in close and glowered at them and was extremely satisfied when they drew back with obvious alarm. The witches were not alone. Farther back, standing near the twig and clay structures of the village, were the clan's men. I wonder how many of them are force-sensitive, Luke murmured as he saw her regarding them, but can't admit it because of the cultural expectations here. Probably nearly as many as the women, Mara replied, glowering at the Oakland witches some more. To make the point clear, she put her hand possessively on Luke's back and was satisfied to see the more persistent of the witches look first surprised, then disappointed. Her scowl could will West Jansen. If it worked on him, it would work on anyone. The only person it didn't work on was Luke, but his immunity was unique. She could feel Luke's amusement, and also just how glad he was that she was there to protect him from the potentially dangerous courtship rituals of Dathomir's witches. I don't think we'll be able to recruit from the men on this trip, though, he continued as if Mara's battle of wills had not taken place. It would be too disruptive to the clan's social norms. Sometimes it's good to be disruptive, Mara countered. Sometimes you have to disrupt before you can change. Whatever Luke's response to that would have been, their exchange ended abruptly. The witches gathered along the village's main road parted, and in the vacuum left behind stood an elderly woman, still regal, and strong despite her age. Next to her was a much younger woman who nonetheless seemed somehow frail. Welcome, Luke Skywalker, the elder woman said. You once arrived at our village in a time of war, now return to our village once more as a bearer of peace and justice. Luke approached the trio of women and bowed deeply. Thank you for your welcome, Ogwendijo, he said respectfully. You bring another? Your mate, I presume. Alguin approached Mara, 
and the evaluative expression in the older woman's pale eyes sent a nervy shiver down Mara's spine. The reference to her as Skywalker's mate was to be expected, and if she corrected the misperception, she'd only invite the witches to pursue him. So she allowed it. Mara Jade, she said coolly. She ignored Luke's blossoming grin beside her. Don't get cocky, Skywalker. You would make a fine witch, Mara Jade, Ogwen replied. Mara wasn't sure what to make of that, but it sounded like a compliment so she just nodded. Ogwen returned the nod, then turned to address Luke once more. You remember my daughter, Baraka, the older woman said, gesturing at the frail, younger woman. I do, Luke said. He stepped forward, and to Mara's surprise he extended his hands to Baraka. The other woman, clearly nervous and carrying to her a hint of shame, hesitated before clasping her hands to Luke's. Mara could feel him reaching out with the force, gently probing Baraka. Your clan has accepted you once again, Luke said, almost too softly to be overheard. You have healed, but you still have much healing to do. Come, Ogwen interrupted, turning and gesturing back at the largest of the wood and clay huts. We will discuss the Jai, and Master Yoda's promise that someday they would come to teach our children. Asterisk. Within the hut, Ogwen sat them around a simple round table, with chairs covered in furs. Baruka sat at her mother's right, and Karana T sat at her left on the far side of the table. The warrior woman propped her spear up against the wall behind her then sat, her expression calm. Baruka's eyes lingered on the table, in front of her refusing to make eye contact with either Luke or Mara. She fell to the dark and became a night sister. Luke whispered an explanation to Mara through the force, the close proximity making the telepathic communication easy. She began her path to recovery many years ago. From her appearance, Mara thought that the woman still had a long way to go, but she could not feel any or of darkness from the once fallen witch. Mara doubted that Baraka could hide it from her so that was a good sign. When I was last here, Luke began, Mother Rel told me that my master, Master Yoda, promised her that the Jedi would return to Dathomir someday to teach your daughters about the Force. We too wish to learn from them about your traditions. The Jedi Order is still growing, but we are ready to accept apprentices if there are any among you interested. Dathomir has been alone for far too long, Ogwen said softly. And so have we. Her expression grew serious. The Happens have been trying teachers, but we tolerate my daughter's husband's people, and they teach us what we ask to learn. They are, however, not suited to teaching witches about the Force. She used the word hesitantly, and we would welcome your teaching. I hope that someday you will teach my granddaughters. When the time comes, I will teach Tenno Kai as I will teach my own niece and nephew, Luke promised. But I cannot stay on Dathomir to teach your daughters. It is not yet time for me to settle in one place to teach in that way. The Force still calls me to travel the stars. We know, Ogwen replied. We have many auguries of the future among the witches, and in none of them do you stay to live among us, though there are many possibilities. She turned and nodded at Kirana T. But one of us will travel with you, to learn the ways of the Jai, and to teach you the ways of the witches. Mara was vaguely surprised at the degree of nervous uncertainty that Karana T's force sense revealed, but however the woman had been volunteered to this duty, by her own will, selected by Ogwen, or chosen by the singing mountain clan seers, she was clearly determined to think. I will come with you, to the stars, Karana T said, and become a Jai, as was foretold by Mother Rel. Then I will return here, to my clan, and teach my sisters and daughters as well. Luke smiled. That is all I could have asked. The lessons can wait until morning, Ogwen said with a nod. You have arrived at the time of planting, and the witches have many spells to cast before the day is over. Her smile became coy. And we must test the maid of Luke Skywalker, to make sure she is up to the standards of the Singing Mountain Clan. Luke woke the next morning and found Mara tucked in against his chest, sleeping calmly. She made a soft sound of annoyance when he stirred, then snuggled in closer against him. Smiling, Luke settled back down onto the comfortable cushion of furs and blankets the Singing Mountain clan had made available. The remainder of the day before had been surprisingly celebratory. 
They had not expected anything specific of their arrival, but arriving during the planting season was apparently seen as a good omen by the villagers of the Singing Mountain clan. The impromptu festival had become something of an early holiday, with witches casting spells of various kinds, none of which Luke fully understood, but all of which he had watched closely in the hopes of future understanding. The witch's use of the force was so totally different and alien to the traditions of the Jedi, utilizing singing and gestures to guide the force in ways that were precise and known to them. The Jedi's traditions and use of the force was more flexible, but also more difficult to teach, relying as it did on each Jedi's personal connection to the force. He wondered if the Jedi might, someday, start by teaching spells like those of the witches, things more easily defined and then transition into the more individualistic and personal connection to the force of the Jedi. Or if perhaps some Jedi would always use a mix of spells and their own Jedi powers. He didn't know, but the potential was tremendous and he was excited to find out. His only problem was that the witches were reluctant to teach their spells to men. That, though, was a limited issue of the new Jedi. Many were women. Mara and Tian, of course, but they had also recently added Tyria Sarkin to their ranks, and the Mon Calamari healer Silgul. Perhaps the spells would be useful for Tyria, in particular. Luke made a mental note to ask her if she would be interested in coming to Dathomir to learn from the witches. There was joy in the air around him and Mara. Not just their own shared happiness, she stirred but did not wake, her hand gently grasping at his chest, but also that of the witches and the villagers beyond the clay and what Huddy and Mara shared. Dathomir was a beacon in the force, lush with life of all kinds, and the Singing Mountain Clan lived in harmony with the world. This time of year, the planting season, was one where their connection with Dathomir felt at its highest, as they, and their rankers, which made remarkably effective motive power for their scrap metal plows, went about planting the fields, using their spells to encourage them and crops to take root. But there was something else in the air, too. Something else in the force, he closed his eyes, stretching out with his feelings. It was easy to do on Dathomir, with the villagers and their rankers and other animals, the forest and its plants and busy creatures. He felt Mara stir, saw her green eyes blinking brilliantly up at him. She had that sleepy, not yet awake look that only appeared when she felt perfectly, completely content and safe, a look that he would never have imagined her ever having when they first met. What is it? She asked, her voice hazy with sleep. I'm not sure, Luke said, stroking her hair with a gesture of affection that, years before, would have cost him his left hand. Help me. She made a mildly exasperated sound, then joined her four cents to his. Together they reached out, and gasped together as sudden agony reached back. Mara sat bolt upright, her tiredness completely banished, and Luke grimaced as he swung out of bed. The sense of pain lasted only for a fleeting moment, replaced by piercing sorrow, and then it faded, leaving only a lingering sense of anxiety which might be Mara's own. What was that? Mara asked, already reaching for her clothes. I don't know, Luke said, and the joy in the air around them was now, sadly, in the past. There was a knock on the door, then it burst open. The tall figure in the doorway was framing with the light of Dathomir's rising sun, and it took a moment for Luke's eyes to adjust to reveal Karana T. What is it? asked Luke. Karana T glanced at Mara, then at Luke. She seemed largely immune to Mara's glare. Another ship has arrived, out of schedule. It is called the Pulsar Skate, and someone named Ela Wessery wants to talk to Jedi Jade at once. It sounds urgent. Chapter 3 Luke and Mara emerged from the hut that Ogwen had provided them into the Singing Mountain Clan's village. The main square was busy, where the day before had been one for celebration and festivities, clearly today was a day for work. Men moved through the streets with carts carrying supplies for planting from the village's warehouses out towards the fields. A handful of the men had pieces of technology that would make the tasks easier. That had not been the case the last time Luke had been here, and there was the occasional rumble as a ranker tromped through the village, helping with the most difficult labor. The clan mother sent our speeder to Solo's Folly to fetch your friends, Karana T said. She stood tall, 
gazing out over the work with a look of focused concentration. It is faster than traveling by rancor, so they should arrive quickly. Luke looked towards Mara. She still seemed vaguely discomfited. He could feel her lingering annoyance at Karanatis barging into their hut, but that was fading quickly as she contemplated all the reasons that Ela would come out to Dathomir to find her. Ela had become Mara's closest friend, and the Pulsar Skate was Merrick's Terex ship, another personal friend of Mara's. If every minute mattered, Ela and Merix wouldn't have landed the Pulsar Skate the settlement, she said. They would just have landed the ship right outside the village. Skate is smaller than metal and doesn't need as much space to set down. She frowned at Luke. So whatever it is they're here for isn't that urgent. But that leaves a lot of possibilities. He nodded. But if it wasn't urgent at all, they could just have waited until we were back on Karuskin, he pointed out. So even if each minute doesn't matter, each day might. Point, Mara said with a nod. Karanati looked between them. Your friends will arrive within the hour, she said. Let us eat. The witch led them down a short street to the main village square. The ground was not paved, but it was grassy and firm despite all the feet that trod upon it daily. Four long wooden tables were laid out along each side of the square, and men and women were all eating and laughing together boisterously. The good mood that had been established at the celebration the day before had not abated, it seemed. The people noticed immediately when Luke, Mara, and Karanati entered the square, but they did not stare as much as they had the day before. Food was already laid out upon the table. Luke took from it unhesitatingly, and Mara did after a moment. She clearly was more skeptical about it than he was. He knew, despite her protestations, that Mara had a taste for fine dining and could be fiercely, but quietly, judgmental. But despite the lack of care for presentation, the village man who had prepared breakfast really both knew what they were doing and had a fine palate for using spices. Just as clear was they had begun to incorporate imported spices from a world into the cuisine, because there were several flavors that Luke didn't remember from his last trip to Dathomir. I can't taste calorantrum, he murmured to Mara, stirring his dish together before taking another bite. That's a new import to Dathomir. Mara shrugged. Card once told me that the galaxy invented trade just to make food taste better. She took a bite, seeming amenable to the taste. Luke smiled at her. There were days, and those days were often, that the reality of their relationship hit him hard. The morning sun gleamed against her hair, and he was struck yet again at just how brilliant she was. How did I get so lucky? He thought, feeling his smile grow. Her eyes met his and he watched with a grin as she rolled them at him. Skywalker, you're such a sap. He snuck his hand to squeeze hers under the table. She hid a smile, he could see her hiding her smile, and feel the way her mood lightened, the way affection swelled in her heart and mind, and turned her hand to briefly squeeze his back. Then, subtly, they disentangled their hands and went back to breakfast as if the exchange had never occurred. Tell me of the jai. Karanati asked. She was a tall, imposing woman, with obvious physical prowess and he had yet to see her without a spear near to her hand. But Luke also could feel her strength in the Force. She was the first who would join the new Jedi from entirely outside of the traditions of Jedi and Sith, and had her own traditions and practices for using the Force. That meant she had a lot to learn, but also that they had a lot to learn from her. In the larger galaxy, we're usually called Jedi, Luke began. For generations, Jedi served as protectors in the Old Republic. At our height, there were tens of thousands of us at any given time. Many of the records of what the Jedi did and how we did it were destroyed by the Empire, but what we know tells us that the Jedi were negotiators and peacekeepers. Mostly we served as a neutral party for negotiations or the settlement of disputes. But when the Clone Wars broke out, Jedi were forced to become the Old Republic's first line of defense, fighting the Republic's enemies. Then the Jedi serve much as the witches do, Karana T said, nodding. We are the warriors for our clans. We use our spells to enhance each clan's prosperity, and we fight off the evils of the fallen Night Sisters. She tilted her head. Will you take me from my own clan only to have me serve your Republic instead? 
Look and more share the glands. This remains the point of contention between Luke and Mon Mosmo. Some time before Luke had made the deliberate choice to separate his nascent order from the New Republic, Mon Mosmo continued to believe this was a mistake. No, he said. We are not capable of doing any of the things that Gideo Folk did. They had tens of thousands. Even with you among us, Kirenetei, we do not even have ten. He shook his head. Our task is simply to learn and share what we know of the Force and let it guide us to help others. Do you mean to practice prophecy, as Mother L? Kirenetei asked uncertainly. That has never been a particular skill of mine. There are other witches more skilled at augury than I. Luke smiled at Mara. Why don't you take this one? He prompted. Mara put down her spoon. Prophecy can be unreliable, she said. The future is always changing, and a vision does not present what will be, but what could be. But the Force does offer less spectacular guidance. The sensation of pending danger, or an instinct to be in a certain place at a certain time. Luke and I believe that the Force is at its most potent in the moment, guiding what we do now. The Living Force, Luke added with a nod. Karana T seemed curious. The witches do not usually think about the Force in this way, she said after a moment's contemplation. What about the Dark? The Dark Side is the one foe we must oppose, Luke said seriously. Those who have fallen are a danger to themselves and to others, like the Night Sisters here on Dathomir. The single obligation that belongs to the Jedi is to fight the dark, both the dark we find in ourselves and the dark we find in others. That is why Alguin chose me, Karana T said, without pride. She actually looked vaguely abashed. I was not the strongest of us, when last you were here. Compared to Tinny Neal, her voice faded as she shook her head. I was lesser, then, in every way. But Alguin says that I was never tempted by rage. She says that to become a night sister on Dathomir is a dire thing, but to become a night sister among the stars is something far worse. Luke thought about the night sisters of Dathomir he had fought when last he had visited this world, of what Jephzirian might have done if she had been loosed upon the galaxy, and shuddered. I think Odwin is very wise, he said. There was a commotion from outside the square and people looked off towards the outer fortifications of the village. A minute later the sound of humming repulse or lifts was followed by the arrival of a speeder. A witch was in the driver's seat, comfortably maneuvering the if-world technology, and in the back seat were Ela Wessiri and Merrick's Tarek Horn. Luke could feel Mara's swell of comfortable affection for them as they came into sight. Ela and Mara had worked together, helping the Smugglers Alliance grow into a fully functioning intelligence and transportation business with close ties to New Republic intelligence. Then, when Mara had made the transition from Smuggler's Alliance to Jedi, she had recruited Merix, the daughter of the well-known smuggler Kingpin Booster Tarek, and also the wife of one of Luke's novice Jedi, Corrin Horn, to replace her. While Luke had sought other Jedi and settled other new arrivals, Ela, Mara, and Merix had traveled together off and on for some months, had a few adventures, been banned from two different sectors, and come out of the experience with a fire-forged friendship. When Ila caught sight of them she waggled her fingers in a playful wave and sent them a small smile before she and Merix disembarked. The two women were both dressed in nondescript spacers garb with work-worn flight jackets lending them an air of professional credibility, but Merix is hung a bit looser around her frame than was typical. Luke caught a hint of hesitation from Mara, of old defensive patterns kicking back into place demanding reserve and caution. But then she overcame them and greeted Ela with a friendly embrace. Interesting planet you found here, Ela said with a wry grin when the embrace ended. She looked around the village, curiously taken in her surroundings. I knew there were tame rankers on Dathomir, but seeing them pulling farm equipment still outdid my expectations about the place. She paused, looking at Karana T, the Dathomiri which was dressed in her native lizard armor and carrying her spear. Ila Wessery, New Republic Intelligence, she introduced herself, offering a handshake. Karana T looked a bit uncertain as she shifted her spear to her left hand to accept the handshake. 
Karana T of the Singing Mountain? You look good, Mara, said Merix with a grin. Mara hugged Merix too. So do you, Mara responded. She stepped back and looked Merix over. How far along are you now? Merix practically glowed with happiness at the question. Almost three months. Corin keeps trying to get me to take it easy, but he knows better than to press me. So what is so important that you had to come out and talk to me in person? Asked Mara, the jovial feel of the reunion dimming to something more serious. Her seriousness infected both Merix and Ela, and Luke could feel how their own emotions shifted to concern. Mild concern, rather than acute, Mara had been right. Whatever it was that was wrong, it wasn't an immediate problem, but they both were evidently concerned about how Mara might react to whatever they had to say. Is there somewhere we can talk in private? Asked Ela. Karana T gestured towards the central structure at one side of the village square, the same structure that Ogwen had used to greet them the day before. This way. Asterisk. Once they were inside, Ela Wessery produced a data pad and handed it to Mara. She took it, turning it on and starting to review the information, but Ela preempted her review with the hand. We'll brief you, Mara. I'll let Merrick start. A week ago, the Smugglers' Alliance picked up intelligence about the Inquisitorius. Specifically, we were told that the Inquisitors have begun an intense search for ancient force artifacts. The Smuggler began. She paced a bit as she talked. Merrix was a bundle of energy and hard to contain, and was often in motion, gesticulating as she did. This isn't all that unusual. The Inquisitorius has been poking around such things dating back to the first days of the Empire, usually as part of their efforts to destroy anything related to the Jedi, which has made Jedi artifacts quite lucrative, I might add. Looking for what? I don't know, said Merrix with a shake of her head. It could be something else like that amulet of Exar Kunz you destroyed aboard Chimera, or something altogether different. But there's something else. Her expression grew just a bit worried, and Mara could feel Merrix's matching concern. Mara, the reports were that the person spearheading the search was the Emperor's hand. The blood drained from Mara's face. Not from surprise, because there was a part of Mara that had long expected this. She had been the Emperor's hand his servant and agent. She had carried out his will throughout the galaxy and been his dupe. For her entire life, Palpatine had told her that she was special and unique, that there were no others like her. The idea that Papadine had lied to her about that, as he had about so many other things, was all too plausible. Do you know anything else? She asked, hearing the slight hoarseness in her voice. Luke stepped closer to her and put his hand on the small of her back. Part of her resented that he thought she needed comfort, but she did not reject the comfort that he offered. After Merrix first discovered these reports, Ela took over, and R.I. started his own investigation. We didn't come up with anything more than she did at first, but in the last week we discovered something new. She nodded at the datapad in Mara's hand. Our assets within the Empire have been trying to untangle the top of the New Order's hierarchy ever since it proclaimed Hamir as the Emperor Regent. We know that the new emperor is a child, supposedly Palpatine's heir, though we have no way of verifying his parentage. We haven't found out much, but we have discovered two titles used to refer to the emperor's mother, emperor's dowager, and the emperor's hand. Mara's face was pale as she reviewed the data pack. There wasn't much in the intelligence reports, just snippets of conversations overheard, recorded, and transmitted back to NRI. But on no fewer than three occasions, there was a clear reference to a member of Emperor Regents in a circle, and someone named the Emperor's Hand. She sat just as Luke provided her a chair. To her surprise, her first reaction was anger. Despite the fact that she had known there might be others who claimed the title of Emperor's Hand for themselves, despite the fact that Thrawn had outright told her there had been others, despite the fact that she now knew Palpatine for the manipulative, lion fraud he had been, the revelation that there had been others, the proof of their existence, still made a dark piece of her heart flash with anger. How dare he? How dare he use her the way he had? How dare he? But Luke was there, with her in her mind, and at her side. 
and even if he had not been, Mara neither claimed nor desired the title of Emperor's Hand any longer. She was a Jedi. She served something greater than Palpatine, something that she knew would never lie to her. She served the Force, and she served it alongside Luke, who had taught her to trust and love. The others were looking at her with expressions ranging from compassionate to wary, all except Karana T, who just looked confused. Mara took a deep breath and let it out again, and with it she released the anger that had threatened her Jedi calm, and the dark peace of her heart was still once more. I had wondered if anyone would emerge and claim the title, she said. Ela's pinched expression relaxed just a bit. Mara offered her a thin, reassuring smile, and the NRI agent's expression relaxed a bit more. We don't know anything else, Ela explained. Only that someone using the title has been given instructions at the highest levels of the New Order. What is an Emperor's Hand? asked Karana T. I was the Emperor's Hand, or an Emperor's Hand, because I had a gift. Mara grimaced. No, that's not right. I was told I was the Emperor's Hand because I had a gift, specifically the gift of being able to communicate telepathically with Palpatine across any distance. We're not sure if I was capable of that because of something unique to my own talents, though I do seem to have a talent for telepathy, or if it was something that Palpatine did to me that he could have replicated with another. So you think this other Emperor's Hand had the same talent? Mara snorted. The only thing I know for sure is that I was an Emperor's Hand because Palpatine made me one. Maybe this other Hand also served him, but was special in a different way that also made her useful. Or maybe Palpatine had dozens of us running around all over his empire. Do you think there were dozens of hands? Asked Ela seriously. No, Mara said bluntly. No, at least some of the people in the palace knew I was Palpatine's hand. Isert, for instance. And if there had been many hands, I doubt it would have taken so long for one other than me to emerge. They would have been scattered around, serving all the warlords the way the Inquisitors did. She shook her head. No, we must have been few in number, and I imagine each of us served some particular role for him. Well, New Republic Intelligence wants you back on Coruscant, said Ela apologetically. General Kraken wants to interview you again. Mara blanched. Again, she sighed, leaning back in her chair. Is that really necessary? Asked Luke. Mara could hear the defensiveness and protectiveness in his voice the way he moved almost to put himself between Mara and their friends, as if to shield her from the message. It wasn't necessary, and there was a part of Mara that recoiled in annoyance at Luke not letting her fight her own battles. The rest of her just loved him. It's not going to be anything invasive. It's all right, Mara cut Ela off with a sigh, then placed her hands back on her lap. It's all right. Of course they want to ask me questions. They probably want me to go through my memory and think of anyone I would see at the palace often who might have been another hand in disguise. It's nothing I'm not going to do anyway. She looked at Karana T. Though this does mean we'll be leaving Dathomir earlier than we expected. The witch nodded, her expression firm. When I agreed to learn the ways of the Jai, I agreed to share their burdens as well. I will come. Merix gave the warrior witch an appraising look. We're going to have to find you something to where that will blend in better, Merrick said with a grin, gesturing at Karana T's matte green lizard skin armor and the leathers below. You'll stick out traveling around Karuskin dressed in that. Karana T looked defensive. This is the armor and garb of my people. Mara let the conversation fade out. She felt Luke beside her, his hand shifting to rest comfortingly on her leg, and closed her eyes. An emperor's hand. Mara wondered if this hand, like her, had been taken as a child and raised for the Emperor's service, or if, like so many of the Inquisitors, they had been recruited as a grown adult. The fact that the hand remained in Imperial service suggested that they, unlike Mara, had not abandoned the Empire after the Emperor's death. But at the same time, it had been a long time since Endor, where had the hand been for all this time? What had they been doing? which a Palpatine secrets had the hand kept when their master had been sent to his grave. They made the trip back to Tempered Metal and were in the air less than two hours later. The witches had marked their departure with a spell intended to strengthen them during a long journey, 
and a gift basket of traveling food which Luke had been too polite to decline. Then they settled Ela into her normal room aboard Tempered Metal and got Karana tea situated. The witch had done her best to be strong and undaunted, but space clearly left her dizzy and uncertain, and the transition into hyperspace had made her more nauseous than most. Miserable, she'd retreated into her cabin. Luke had faith she'd adapt, and under other circumstances would have spent the time with her, helping her meditate and find her calm, but Mara was even more rattled than Karanity. She tried not to show it, but he knew that Mara had long dreaded the possibility of other Emperor's hands, and that she needed his support and reassurance and love. So he offered it to her, unreservedly. She didn't speak, he could feel her mind, busy, ticking away at all the possibilities, smoldering anger at Palpatine lingering underneath it all, but she did cuddle into his chest as he wrapped his arms around her from behind. Her hands rested atop his, stroking his fingers gently as she nestled in against him. She was vulnerable, she hated feeling vulnerable, and in her past that vulnerability was something she would have faced and defeated alone, but she was no longer alone. She had him. Together, Mara. Always. She exhaled slowly. I doubt this emperor is really Palpatine's heir, she said, snuggling in against him. Palpatine always wanted to give off the illusion of physical strength despite how infirm he appeared, but it was always just an illusion. She sighed and shrugged. Unless that was a lie for my benefit as well. I don't know. She squeezed his hand. But true or not, Within the Empire being Palpatine's heir is a powerful claim to imperial authority, a tool Hamir, and an emperor's hand could use to convince the Moths to fall in line, and ensuring the Empire, what's left of it, will fight to the last. That makes sense, Luke mumbled against the back of her neck, clearly not wanting to discuss it further just now. Mara, however, was far too practical to let her distaste disrupt her analysis. If the new emperor's mother is a former emperor's hand, she likely knows many of Palpatine's secrets, as I do. I'd expect that we know different secrets, though, that Palpatine used me for some tasks and her for other tasks. And I would expect that she was more secret than I was, too. Part of my job was being publicly visible, at least to some people, some of the time, but I never got wind of a second emperor's hand, and the NRI reports on the emperor's hand were all references to me. You read in our eyes reports on you? Luke asked. I asked Madine for them. I was curious. She stilled for a second, then put one of her arms around his back. I hate this, she confided softly. I hate the reminder that Palpatine used me. I hate the reminder that we still haven't eliminated every bit of his legacy. I hate wondering what Palpatine's other hands might have done and what dangerous secrets they might know. Mara. Hmm. You think too much. That made her laugh and the sound lightened Luke's heart. He felt her close her eyes, deliberately immersing himself in Jedi meditations meant to relieve tension and stress. He felt her disquiet fade, felt her attention turn fully upon him. He felt their consciousnesses mingle, the serenity that the Force offered them, that they offered one another, descend upon them, a brief gift from the galaxy. So what did you think of Dathomir? Luke murmured, enjoying the languid, shared sense of calm. Mara turned onto her side to face him. I'm getting soft. I'm not sure I could survive on instant calf for longer than a few days anymore. The witches seem to like you. She shrugged. I like them too, for the most part. Theirs is an interesting forest tradition, and it will take some time to see what we can take from their spells to enhance our own understanding of it. There was an almost predatory gleam in her green eyes, as for all their men being slaves to the whims of their women. That was mildly intriguing, but then I thought, how is that any different from the moonstruck farm boy I already have? That, and her self-satisfied smirk, tore an astonished laugh from Luke. Yes, he thought, maybe I started it, but I'm still going to have to pay her back for that little quip. Mara arched her eyebrow at him challenging. I look forward to seeing you try, farm boy. Chapter 4 If not for a semi-strategic location and just enough resources to be worthwhile, Paul Major would have been a total backwater. But it had a semi-strategic location and just enough resources to be worthwhile, 
and that was enough for it to become a sector headquarters. Its capital, Whitestone City, had been aptly named. The governor's palace was raised on a large mound of white stone, making it rise up above the surrounding city, and the building itself was constructed of still more of the substance. In the daylight it gleamed to the point where anyone in its proximity had to wear glare-reducing glasses, which consequently had become a focal point upon Major's fashion. Admiral Gilad Pelian himself wore a pair of glare-reducing glasses, though his were strictly functional, violating no element of the official rules of Imperial Officer's decorum. So too did the man who accompanied him to their meeting at the palace, Admiral Terran Rogers. The garden surrounding them was well-ordered, cultivated with precision by a team of experts, no doubt. It was vaguely maze-like, providing a series of wide, winding routes that led from the city to the palace beyond. This is all a reminder that the outer rim can be spectacular. When given the opportunity, Ragra said, gesturing in the direction of the governor's palace. The Kandora sector has been well-governed, Pelian replied, a bit gruffly. Unlike so many of the Moths, or senators of the Old Republic before them, Moff Faraus's interest was always the prosperity of his people and the empire. Ragra's chuckled softly. It is liberating to be able to say freely what we all thought for so many years, isn't it? Rogris said that with such casual comfort, Pelian thought uncomfortably. It was remarkable the change he saw in the smaller man. When they had served together last, during the Lingury campaign against General Garn Bell Iblis, Rogris had been haggard and exhausted. The lines in his face had drawn tight with tension, and Pelian had rarely seen the man without a bottle near to hand. But since they had been forced into insurrection against the new order that now ruled the Empire and its illegal attempt to seize control of the Imperial Starfleet, Rogris had changed. He seemed less burdened and looked visibly younger, and while he still often had a bottle close to hand it was much rarer for him to have a glass. But for Pelian it was not so simple. Yes, of course he had been aware of the foibles of the Moths, their excesses, and their corruption but they still represented the Empire and had been owed loyalty for that reason alone. The tension must have showed on his face. Gilad. Rogris probed. Pelian turned towards Rogris, wincing. I'm sorry, Terran, he admitted. I'm still grappling with everything that has happened. I know, Rogris said with a nod. We all need to do that. But I want you to remember two things. First, Grandma Faraus is the rightful ruler of the Empire. He was Kane's handpicked successor, and the Imperial Security Bureau had no right and no authority to seize control of Kane's territories from him. Legally, we are the Empire, not them. Pelian nodded firmly. That much he could get behind without any question. Second, Hamir and his goons are coming here. Rogris turned towards the palace. From where they stood on the garden grounds, the two admirals looked up at the looming white structure, gleaming in the noonday sun. Spectacular. They are coming here to crush Paul Major, and to crush Grandma Faraus, and to crush you. That was all too true. And all the propaganda that had come out of the New Order since the Battle of Corito Pelian had been cast as the worst villain in Imperial history. The worst of the clips accused Pelian of butchering his own students, likening the act to a mother strangling her baby in his cradle. He still had nightmares about that clip. So we fight. Rogers finished. We fight, with the knowledge that this time, at least, there are no doubts about the cause for which we fight. But that was the whole problem, wasn't it? Pelian had never had any doubts. The corruption had been but a flaw in the system, but the system had been just. More just than the Old Republic, certainly. It had been better than any possible alternative, at least. Those lifelong certainties had fallen away. Somewhere, deep in his gut, he now knew he had been wrong, and yet to see Rogris so casually say so, so confidently say so, say so as if Rogris had known all along. How had he missed it? There was the hum of a speeder, a simple open-air speeder, with an imperial pilot sitting in the driver's seat and a woman, one who looked far too young to be wearing an imperial captain's uniform, sitting in the back seat. As it approached them it came to a stop, the engine going quiet amidst the palace garden so that Pelian could once again hear the song of the local birds. Admirals, Captain Asori Rogris greeted them, hopping out of the speeder, 
and offering a precise, academy-grade salute. I saw you walking and thought I'd offer you a ride to the palace. You don't have to be so formal, Heja, Terrence said, smiling affectionately at his daughter as he returned it. Nepotism has poisoned the empire from his very birth, so all due respect, sir. I will maintain the formalities of rank, Asori replied, her fine featured face carefully neutral, an echo of her father's. Admiral Pelian, sir, it's good to see you again. And you, Captain Pelian nodded, feeling a slight sting at Asori's comment. How common was it to be so blasé about the faults of the empire? He worked hard to not let his feelings show. Is your squadron still in system? My ships remain under cloak out behind the system's innermost gas giant, Asori replied crisply. Her accent reminded Pelian strongly of his first instructors at the Rathal Academy, back when he had first been trained for entry into the Old Republic's judicial forces. A disproportionate number of them had been natives of Annexes, the world had a long military tradition, and had frequently sent its best and brightest to join the judicials. We're under orders to stay safely out of sight until Baron Fell and Ma Farals are prepared to reveal the existence of the Uruf. She shrugged. Not that the system really needs our help for defense. The fleet you've assembled should prove quite sufficient. The new order simply doesn't have the ships to breach Palm Major's defenses. Pelian commanded the fleet defending Palm Major from the new order's advances. He had four Imperial class star destroyers, including his own Chimera. Then he had 30 of Grand Moff Kane's Enforcer-class heavy cruisers, which were the heart of his formation. Elsewhere, he had another 13 Enforcers and three Victory-class Star Destroyers, but those had been sent to Neron for refit. It was an impressive fleet. It also represented only a fraction of the strength potentially available to fight the New Order. The Unknown Region's Expeditionary Force, Grand Admiral Thrawn's secret resource in the Unknown Regions, which represented not only ships, but full-blown colony worlds and shipyards, and a network of alliances with alien powers that known space had never even heard of, could at least double that strength, if not more. Pelian did not even know for certain how much strength Baron Fell's URF had. Fell, for the moment, was still reluctant to reveal too much. Agonizer is still at Neron, Rogers added. I have Captain Tygen organizing our reserve fleet in case the New Order finds enough ships to really threaten Paul Major. In the meantime, we're still secretly rotating Enforcer-class ships out to Neron for refit and repair. It's doubtful any ISB spy will notice, at least for the moment. He smiled thinly. One of the benefits of using so many non-human crew, they're very good at sniffing out ISB sneaks amongst them. He gestured at the air car. Instead of walking a sorry, let's take a ride to the palace. There's no harm in arriving early to a staff meeting, and I suspect Baron Fell and Ma Farrows will have quite a lot to say to us. Besides, I can spend the time speculating about which book you've stolen from my ready room. The speeder ride was swift and refreshing. The open-air speeder was hardly imperial standard issue, but there was something to be said about having the wind in your hair. Although Asashi looked vaguely annoyed when they finally arrived at the gravel path to the palace's side entrance and she had to shake out some road dust, in hair into something appropriately regulation with a tire twist and flick of her wrist. Pelian was unsurprised to find Commander Dreef waiting for them. A dark-featured human native to Paul Major, he wore polarized glasses that looked comfortable and suited his face, likely something he'd brought from home. Admirals, he said, saluting as they climbed out of the speeder. Baron Fell has just arrived at the palace landing pad and is having his initial meeting with Ma Farrows now. We are scheduled to meet with them in 20 minutes. He gestured into the palace, where the gleaming stone floors were lined with white stone columns that were polished until they glowed. The moth has been good enough to open his kitchens if any of you are hungry. Pelian shook his head dismissively. I ate a bored chimera before I departed. How was your leave, Commander? My mother was so excited to see me she had me rearrange her living quarters, and then we spent rather a lot of time baking. Sent me home with an entire packing allowance of sweets and baked goods. I believe they were also sent to the kitchen. Pelian gave a fond harumph and waved the group onward. Well, it may perhaps not be the height of Starfleet decorum, 
But if you do not take the muff up on this opportunity, Gilot, I will, Terrence said with a slightly cheeky smile. Never turn down the opportunity for a fine meal. After all, you never know when your number will come up. You're welcome to join me, Captain, if you would like, he said to Asori. That's quite all right, sir. I'm not senior enough to breach decorum. Her smile, though, was a mirror of her father's. I'm sure you'll enjoy it for the both of us. Dreef looked relieved, and he went to stand next to Roberts. Oh, thank you, sir. If you all had declined, I would have been obliged to do so myself, and it would be a shame to waste the efforts of the Grand Moff chef. He grinned broadly. After you, sir. The silence following the departure of the elder Rogris and Dreef was profound. The younger Rogris stood at parade readiness, her hands folded carefully behind her back and her imperial officer's cap perched perfectly upon her head. Are you all right, Admiral? Asori asked him. The question surprised him. Junior officers were not nearly so probing with their superior. She seemed to sense his sudden discomfort and hastened to continue. I know that a lot has changed for you in the last few months, sir, and your experience at Corita would be trying for anyone. He grimaced. His instinct was to lean on his Imperial Admiral's mask. He had already made his peace with his decision to throw in with Baron Fell and Ma Farrows, and it had been, and remained, the right thing. And yet, since my arrival, I have heard it expressed by many people, Baron Fell, your father, and others, that the Empire is, was, deeply flawed. His voice faded away, and he found himself meeting Asori's gaze. Her expression was steady and unintimidated, an important trait for a young Imperial officer in conversation with the senior officer, but there was just a hint of wariness in her expression. Permission to speak freely, sir. Granted. Whatever she saw looking at him, though, that wariness faded into sympathy. How much do you know about my mother, Admiral? The question caught Pelly in off guard. Nothing, I'm afraid. I am aware that your father is a widower, but beyond that, he's never spoken of his wife. Rogers had kept a portrait of his wife in his office aboard Chimera, but every time Pelly in broached the conversation, Rogers had steered the conversation carefully away. When I was younger, Asori said after a moment, sounding thoughtful, the Empire? and the need for the empire was a common, and bitter, topic of conversation in our household. Mother was a fierce partisan of Senator Rissenemann. She served on his staff when she was young, and when Emperor Palpatine had him executed for treason, she was never quite the same. The name was vaguely familiar. Pelian thought Rissenemann had been one of the 2,000 senators who had demanded that Palpatine surrender to the separatists before the end of the war, led by Padme Amidala, and had thought little of it when he had later been accused of treason. Treason had been all too common at the time. She knew better than to speak out, Asori continued, but she used to keep track of stories about abuses of power. Abuses by the new moths after they had fully replaced the senators at the top of the sector hierarchy by imperial officers, she and my father would sometimes argue about it. Asori looked down, grimacing. She wasn't happy when Tarek, and I decided to follow our father's footsteps into the Starfleet, but you know how it was. The expectation that the children of fleet officers would join the fleet was quite intense, especially on Annexus. But all those problems dated back to the Old Republic, Pelian objected. The Empire couldn't fix every social problem. The Empire doesn't even try, most of the time, Asori said, and there was a quiet anger in her voice that started him. Do you know what it was like to be a woman at the academies? I had it easy. I was protected because my father was an admiral. But everyone knew the story of Tarkin and Dalla, and it wasn't a cautionary tale. It was license. Tarkin was the example all the junior officers wanted to emulate. She shook her head. And that's just the story I know because I saw it up close. How many other small abuses happened through the fleet? Through the Empire? Your superiors would have acted. My superiors were the problem, Asori snapped. Then she mastered her anger. I'm sorry, sir, but we never knew which officers would protect us and which would take advantage of us. And even if one of them did help us, would their superior? The worst offenders were at the highest levels of seniority, 
like Tarkin. She shook her head. Forgive me, sir, but I'm glad to be here. My father is right. The New Order isn't something new or different from the Empire. The New Order is the Empire lay bare, and being here means that we are free to speak plainly about what it is, so I will do so. Pelian looked away first as silence reigned. She just sat there, evaluating him, judging him. Asori snapped her mouth shut, reverting carefully to parade rest. Pelian seemed no longer to be paying her any mind. She just hoped she hadn't gotten herself into too much trouble. She'd gotten too comfortable, she thought sourly. Ever since she had been pulled out of the regular Imperial Starfleet, out of her position as Exigence Executive Officer, and been impressed into service with Baron Fell's Unknown Regent's Expeditionary Force, and what a misnomer that title was, the Europe was very much an empire in its own right. She had found herself relaxing, and when she relaxed too much she said too much. She had lived her whole life in the Empire, and sometime, in all of those years, she had grown to expect constant surveillance. ISB was always watching, and if they weren't your fellows were. Everyone was always just waiting for you to slip up, to expose yourself as anything other than perfectly, pristinely loyal, and the costs of slipping up were so high, so catastrophically high, that everyone learned not to speak. And then she joined the Eurif. At first she hadn't realized what was different, but she had realized that something was different. She found herself smiling more, actually even laughing on occasion, to extreme rarities in the Imperial Starfleet, and then they became commonplace. It had taken her months to realize what had changed. The people she served with, humans and aliens, were comfortable. They did not live in constant fear. They were comfortable expressing their ideas and with questioning authority. It was liberating. But Pelian had not been with the URF for as long as Asori had, and she suspected that the transformation was far more difficult for the older officer than it had been for her. She wondered how long it would take him to notice the difference, and she wondered if he'd approve after he did. She glanced at him from out of the corner of her eye. Pelian, thankfully, didn't notice. He was staring down the long palace hallway. The interior of the structure was made of the same white stone as the exterior, with polished floors and columns and the occasional click of footsteps as civil servants made there, way between the numerous offices. She followed his gaze and found him looking at a small banner hanging from one of the pillars, a red background, with the black and white imperial crest emblazoned across it. Every fourth pillar had one, all facing into the building, all illuminated by soft lighting. Admiral Pelian, Captain Rogris. A protocol droid shuffled up to them, bowing slightly in the stiff way protocol droids typically did. Grandma Fairhouse will see you now. Asori followed Admiral Pelian into Fairhouse's office. It was the same office that had belonged to Governor Fairhouse, and then Ma Fairhouse, as the man had gradually made his way up the promotion chart. Biter Fairhouse was not a household name. Certainly it was not one Asori had heard prior to the catastrophe at Corita, but it was well known among the higher echelons of the imperial government. A spry stick of a man who wore his rank plaques lightly on a soft Kesmer blouse, he didn't cut a figure anywhere nearly as intimidating as Vader or even the becaped and predatory king. When Pharaohs had been younger, he'd been one of the rising stars in the imperial bureaucracy, but a series of missteps and whispered innuendos had pushed him out of the core and into the outer rim. When Grand Moff Kane became sovereign over the galactic northwest, Pharaohs had fallen under his authority and then diligently worked his way into Kane's good graces. The two men did not have many things in common, except two. They were both excellent administrators, and neither was an imperial true believer. Together, they had implemented the successful policy of bringing aliens into Kane's military forces. Many of those aliens were now crew aboard Pelian's flotilla of Enforcer-class heavy cruisers, all of which had been built by Kane, and ultimately Kane had chosen Pharaohs as the successor, much to the dismay of the Council of Moths, most of whom had later sided with ISB. Now Pharaohs was the head of an imperial insurrection against Emperor Regent Hamir's new order practically by default. He had claimed the title of Grand Moff out of necessity, but Asori reflected as she regarded the well appointed but hardly palatial governor's office. He had not adopted any of Tarkin's successes. 
It's nice to work for someone I can respect, she thought. Next to Fair Owls was Baron Sunterfell. Where Fair Owls was lean, Fell possessed the blocky muscularity of a Thai pilot, just barely short enough to fit into the cockpit without it becoming uncomfortable. The two men were clearly comfortable with one another and were in close conversation when Asori and Pelian entered the room, they stopped and stood, offering Pelian their hands in turn. Admiral, Pharaohs greeted Pelian. Fell merely nodded. They all took their seats. Asori, as the junior officer, stood towards the back. There was only one chair remaining by the desk, and that would belong to her father when he arrived. No sooner had that occurred to her than the door slid open once more. Admiral Rogress and Commander Dreef, Pharaoh's protocol droid announced. Her father spared her a smile, once she returned somewhat severely, maintaining the necessary separation between their familial relationship as parent and child and their official relationship as superior and inferior officer, and then he moved to take the remaining seat at the desk. Grandma Pharaoh's, Baron Fell, it's good to see you both again. Admiral Rogress, Fell responded. His dark eyes were surprisingly emotive, a sorry thought to herself. Despite his perfect imperial dignity, Fell's every motion was imbued with energy. She suspected that was one reason he'd been such an excellent teacher at Karita. Let's begin, Fell said, and pressed a button on Pharaoh's desk. The lights dimmed, and behind the desk a screen blinked to life. Pharaoh's and Fell both moved to one side, and all five of them watched as a map of the galaxy appeared. The map quickly zoomed in on Imperial territory. In green was the Kandora sector that Pharaoh still controlled, with small dots marking the presence of Pelian's fleet and her own squadron at Palm Major. In a lighter grayish green was a much larger area that stretched into the unknown regions. That volume of space was just as large as the entire empire, with dozens of dots representing the Imperial colonies, shipyards, bases, and allies of the URF. The new order was in blue, with dots on Entrala, the current imperial capital and home to Bastion, its center of government, Sardinanian, Gemus, and Moonenlist, its for most important systems. To the south of the green and blue was a mass of red, dozens of dots representing planets and fleets belonging to the New Republic. Our objective, Fell began, is to keep the new order from recapturing Kandora's sector. The longer the new order fails to accomplish that military objective, the more its authority will degrade. Our intelligence operations indicate that there are a number of systems within the new order chafing under ISB's new policies. The story winced. Since taking over the empire, ISB had instituted zero tolerance policies for anything that smacked of anti imperial heresy. Kane's pro alien policies had been revoked with prejudice and she knew that throughout the system still held by the Empire, there was a great deal of building resentment. The problem, though, was that there was also a great deal of support, and there was no guarantee of which way any given ship, planet, or system would go if given the choice. And the longer we can hold out, the higher the chance that ships or systems will choose to defect to our side. Fell looked up, his eyes catching a sorry's. But at the same time, we also do not want to reveal the existence of the URAF to the New Order just yet. At the moment, they are convinced that Grandma Pharaohs has been able to repel their assaults thanks to Admiral Pelian and the ships that defected at Corita. What they don't know is that those ships are receiving repairs and logistical support from the URAF that Kandora's sector would be unable to provide on its own. Pharaoh snorted. The Kandora's sector is in wild space. We can barely provision our Golan platforms. We'd have no chance of provisioning even one Star Destroyer, much less Admiral Pelian's entire fleet. Which means that ultimately, the New Order would succeed in defeating my forces without that support, Pelian added. Now that it was a question of tactics and strategy, Asori noted, all the qualms he'd expressed earlier were gone. Pelian was commanding a ship and a fleet. In his element, he was able to put all other concerns out of his mind. Resupply and repair are most important, of course. Thankfully, we're well supplied with ties and pilots, which means our biggest concern is simply keeping our Star Destroyers operational. Not an easy task, Rogers added. Each Star Destroyer is its own logistical nightmare. That is a problem we can handle, 
Fell said. The Euro will continue to provide what supplies we can without making it obvious to the New Order's observers that Fairhouse is getting help. He once again gazed at Asori. Captain Rogris, your squadron of lively class frigates represents Admiral Pellian's principal reserve. Her four ships were sufficient to defeat an Imperial to class star destroyer handily, and carry twelve squadrons of Chiss Clawcraft between them, a better fighter than anything the Empire had put into common use. But at the same time, sir, if the new order brings a dozen star destroyers, my ships will be able to contribute but won't be able to make a decisive difference. Which is why I'm still putting together the real reserve at Neron, her father said. When the fleet is ready, we'll more than double Jill's current strength. Fell's lips firmed. We need to do that in a hurry, I'm afraid. Rumors out of the New Order are garbled and has been difficult establishing good intelligence sources since the Battle of Corita. ISB has been systematically purging anyone they even suspect of disloyalty. Nonetheless, the sources we do have indicate that Emperor Regent Hamir has some kind of secret project. Unfortunately, I don't know much more, only that the New Order believes it will change the dynamic of the war. Has anyone told the New Republic? Asori asked the question before she'd even realized she had, and cursed herself for speaking out of turn yet again. Fumbling, she added, Sirs, that might fire them up at least as much as it does us. General Kraken is very good at his job, Farrow said, somewhat dismissively. There may come a time when we go to the New Republic with a formal proposal to end the war, but it would come at a high political cost. We'd likely have to promise to give them border systems, not to mention control over Corellia, and we would also have to reveal the existence of the URF. If we do that, there are many of their senators who might panic at our increased strength and insist they continue the war until we are fully subjugated. For those reasons, going to the New Republic for help is a last resort. Asori nodded choppily. At least they didn't seem angry with her and she was again relieved to be out from under the heavy hand of ISB. If she made that suggestion within earshot of an ISB operative, the consequences for her, her father, and her brother would have been severe. I have friends and family in the New Republic, Fell said with feeling, surprising her once again. Many of us do, but that fact will not prevent us from fighting them if we must. We can delay that day, or try to negotiate it away but we cannot trust that a peaceful solution will be found simply because it is convenient, however loath I am to face that family in battle. The Grand Moth, and I intend to proffer a peace with honor. When the moment is right, neither of us wants to fight a war where we no longer have anything to gain and have a great deal yet to lose. Grand Moth Kane's attempt to end the war was a worthy one, but first we must get our own house in order. Asori Rogers glanced at her father and all the other men around her and could not help but think of her academy days, and all the classmates who were no longer there, to age into this kind of cadre. Chapter 5 Silencer 7 was magnificent. As a child, Reganda Ismarin had been one of the survivors of Palpatine's Jedi Purge. Far too young to use the Force to do more than hold a training saber, and even that had been something of a challenge. She had been quietly evacuated from the Jedi training facility on Camparis by the Antarian Rangers. She still remembered the fierce, determined looks on the faces of those men and women, heirs to centuries-old tradition of aiding the Jedi during their moments of need. The hours after nightfall had truly been the time of greatest need, and they had put their lives on the line to shepherd the Jedi younglings to safety however and whenever they could. She had passed through a succession of small, ill-supplied refugee camps, shepherded by her ranger guardians through the outer rim in places that the Empire would not find them. And yet the Empire did find them. One after another agents of the Empire fell upon each camp. Those same expressions had been present on the faces of her guardians on each of those occasions, too, fierce determination, but then married to desperation and loss, because the rangers always knew that as hard as they fought, those battles were ones they could not win. As they died for her, over and over she felt both worshipped and weak. She had been old enough to remember her evacuation from Camparis, but only just. The slaughter of the camp on Belsivis, years later, was far more vivid in her memory. 
inquisitors and their minions had swept over the camp, brandishing slug throwers and poison grenades, and they had spared no one. She had fought as much as she could this time, but when the inquisitors were done, corpses were scattered through the compound, some still clinging lifelessly to their weapons, others shot in the back where they had fled. The whine of tie engines in the skies above had been horribly loud, but louder still were the cries of their laser cannons strafing the ground, leaving smoldering craters where once buildings and rangers had stood. They had spared Raganda. In each camp there were always at least two survivors, and the devastated and despondent survivors of each camp had been given the same choice that every class of inquisitors had received since the very first fight to the death, and the last one standing, the one who was strong enough, was survived to serve. Reganda Ismarin had survived being given that choice, but the Jedi initiate she had been had died that day. From that day onwards she bore the blood of her brother and sister Initius on her hands like a psychic stain, and had been something different. Something greater. As the life had drained from people she had once called friends and family, she had truly known why the Sith were drawn to the dark. It was not something to be feared. It was a way to secure her own future. Safe and secure, able to ride the vicious political tides. No more reliance on the Rangers. No more dreaming of being chosen by a Jedi to become a Padawan. Reganda Icemarin would forge her own future, her own way. Now with Silencer 7 her future was here. The monstrosity was the marriage of Dark Force traditions and the Empire's technical genius. Its beauty was in what it could create for an Empire stretched to the logistical limit the perfect weapon. With it, Reganda Icemarin would not just create her own future, she would impose that future upon the galaxy and make it bend to her will. When Palpatine had taken her aside and elevated her from mere inquisitor to emperor's hand, he had anointed her the agent of his will, and he had taught her what it meant to bend the galaxy to her will. Now she was his truest heir and the galaxy would be hers. She gazed through the transparent steel window at the station. The massive factory and warship had grown since she had brought its core here. It had begun as a small cube, small enough to easily fit in a bulk freighter's cargo bay. Now, surrounded by the shattered wreck of a world that to Silencer 7 was nothing more than raw materials to be taken and reshaped, it had grown larger than a star destroyer. A blocky, cube-like thing with four foot-like appendages that pointed downwards at all the raw materials steadily used its tractor beams to draw asteroids and chunks of rock to be processed and transformed. With them it grew still further, like a hungry child, though it spared some of those resources to forge Hammer's precious tie droids. But it isn't perfect. I did not have a true seed, and for it to become what I needed to be I will need to give it one. That failure still stung, the fact that she had not been able to find the seed before Palpatine's death was, in hindsight, for the best, but she had spent years since Palpatine's death trying to find the artifact that was needed to truly perfect Silencer 7. She had found a fragment of the seed on a world which had once been called Draman Kos, but the repeated catastrophes that had befallen that world had left it diminished and inadequate for her needs. But an AR Shadda has what I need, she thought smugly. Even now, her transport was preparing to depart for that tawdry exemplar of hut power. She was not sure how long it would take her to find the seed once she was there, but she would find it. I will not be denied, and with the seed and the command interface, I will do what even Palpatine could not. When are you leaving, mother? She turned towards the voice. Her teenage son, Irek, was resplendent in his dark robes and violet-edged mantle. Like Palpatine, Irek did not bother with the golden frippery so common among many rulers of the galaxy. His black robes were absent frills, though they did look slightly too long for his still-growing frame. But while Irek had been imbued with strength in the force that could rival even Palpatine's, Reganda thought smugly, he did not yet exude the presence and power required to be a galactic sovereign. She raised her chin, looking up at her slightly taller son. Her hands moved to adjust his stance lifting his chin slightly and guiding his arms to settle in a posture that communicated confidence and power. You are the emperor, my son, she told him firmly, and soon you will rule not just the empire but the galaxy. It is vital that you look the part. She turned him away from the window that looked out on Silencer 7 
gesturing at the bridge of her transport and its crew. Look upon them, my son. Remember that they serve and live at your pleasure. The galaxy is ours to rule by right. That is our power and our obligation. Never let any of them forget that fact. She leaned in closer, brushing her hand over his eyebrow. You must carry that fact in your every look, your every expression. Your contempt is a reminder of the power you possess, the power they do not have. Irek's response was that of the typical teenager she had never gotten to be. He sighed, the sound of a young man who had heard it all before, and many times. I know, mother. But his complaint did not prevent him from stiffening his back, and the look that appeared in his eyes, dismissive, contemptuous, raw, reminded her of the last emperor. Even if he always needed her there, in the shadows to stiffen his spine, he could rule, she thought smugly. He could, and he would. You know what you must do while I am gone? She asked, arching an eyebrow. He nodded. Tell me, she instructed him. I must master the command interface and learn to command silencer station, he replied, his tone half humoring, half annoyed. Typical teenager. That's right, she agreed as if she had not already told him this a dozen times. Cray Mingla, the degenerate academic we took from McGrody Institute, the expert on AI, will need to be compelled to teach you how to use it. She will be reluctant. Raganda wrinkled her nose as she sneered. Do not allow her to play on your sympathies. She will serve. If you must, remember that you can threaten her pet cripple to earn her compliance. Yes, mother, Irek said obediently. He smiled, gesturing at Silencer 7 through the viewport behind them. I will learn to control it, I promise. You have gone through too much, and sacrificed too much, to bring us this far. I will not fail. Of course you will not. You are the Emperor, she reminded him. My sacred son, the elect. Yours is the will of the Force alone. He will be the Emperor when he is ready, a voice said from behind them. Hamir was standing there, in his typical loose-fitting black robes and covering white chest armor. Once upon a time Hamir had been an attractive man, but age and the dark side had taken their toll. He was not as withered as Palpatine had been, far, far from, but his once boyish good looks had become severe, and his bright eyes aged. Emperor Regent, Reganda greeted Hamir with false good cheer. She turned to her son. I reck you should be getting back to Silencer Station. I will see you upon my return. I expect you to have fulfilled all the tasks demanded of you while I am gone. Irek's eyes moved between Raganda and Hamir, his lips twisted downwards into an obviously unhappy frown. He remained bitter about Hamir's position as the effective ruler of the Empire. Raganda had encouraged that, as his resentment would stoke his dark impulses but it was a necessary compromise with both ISB and the Inquisitorius. Even if they did believe that Irek was Palpatine's son, a belief that Reganda was only too happy to perpetuate, he was an outsider to the institutions of power within the Empire, all of which demanded their own pound of flesh. Yes, Mother, Irek said in that obedient tone that she insisted on whenever they were in the presence of people with power. With a shallow, practiced bow, and a hint of a glare in Homerous direction, he withdrew. Raganda waited until he was entirely departed before stepping close and turning her ire on Hamir. Was that necessary? Hamir raised both eyebrows, though they were difficult to see given his cloak, which shrouded the top of his head. You promised me that Silencer 7 would be fully operational months ago, and it is not. I told Dala and the fleet that they would receive thousands of Thai droids, and they have received merely hundreds. Your failures are either your doing, Raganda, or they are his. Which would you prefer a credit with truth? Her hand moved bare millimeters before she restrained it with conscious thought. Gritting her teeth and taking a deep breath, she glowered at the taller man. You should not have made such promises without consulting me. But I am. Promise me that I would have those ties, Raganda, he reminded her evenly, his face an expressionless mask but a sense in the force one of bitter, petulant annoyance. Tell me, which of us has been the greater failure? The greater failure? Regana echoed. She shook her head and laughed mockingly, tilting her chin up challengingly. 
you speak to me of failure, Hamir. Which of us toiled year after year in the Jedi Temple, waiting for the master that never came? Which of us was so weak in the forest that even the Agri Corps did not want us? The Astrogation Corps. She tutted, shaking her head. How embarrassing. The anger she expected flared to life behind Hamura's dead eyes. She did not fear it, of the two of them. She was the stronger in the force, and they both knew it. You are a small man, Hamir, she continued, dropping her voice to a bare whisper. She intended to embarrass him, to humiliate him, because he needed to be reminded of their hierarchy, but it would not do to diminish his authority in front of the Empire. Until Irek was grown, until Irek had learned to control Silencer 7, she still needed Hamir to rule the Empire, after all. Always the loyal servant. First to Tremaine, then to Jarek, and now to me. She smiled at him, a bitter, accusing thing. Hamir's hand clenched into a fist. The air around her crackled with energy as Hamir sank into the dark side, his eyes going sunken as they flashed with the familiar yellow of old hatred. I should lie out. But you won't. You can't. You need me. You need Irek. You always need, need, need. And only I can provide. She patted his arm dismissively. Now let me get you what you need to maintain the facade, Emperor Regent. And with that she turned around, showing him her back, gazing out at Silencer 7, feeling him seat behind her. She wondered if he'd take advantage of her apparent negligence by attempting to strangle her. She almost hoped he would, but she wasn't ready to do away with him. Not yet. He wanted to. He did. She could feel him imagining it, his hatred and desire to rip her apart so sweetly clear in the Force. But even if he didn't need her, Hamir was still the failed Jedi he always had been, in a position of power not because he had earned it, but merely because she was all that was left. The Inquisitorius was a pale shadow of the horde of Jedi killers it had once been, and the parade of has-beens who comprised Hamir's loyal minions were even more useless than he was. So he didn't try to kill her. Instead he leaned in behind her, his chin hovering just over her shoulder. Do not take too long. I will take however long I choose to take, she thought, but restrained herself from saying it. As Hamir stormed off, the dark side of the force still swirling around him angrily, air almost crackling with electricity, she merely smiled to herself. And once I have what I need, and Irek has done his part, I will not need you anymore, and you don't have any idea what you can do about it. That is what you are really angry about, isn't it, Emperor Regent? F and Sariti wanted to leave Silencer Station as soon as possible. This whole place was downright creepy. Just being here was enough to send shivers down his spine, and he had no interest in prolonging his stay any longer than was necessary. The only reason he was here was Admiral Dalla had become increasingly irate over the Hammer's delay in delivering her the promised tie droids. Her complaints about the difficulty of keeping the New Republic out of Corellia without them were increasingly laden with angry invectives, and she had sent him to personally convey the seriousness of her need. Dalla could do a lot to hold back the New Republic, especially with General Antilles' Fifth Fleet out of theater undergoing repairs, but without the promised reinforcements, it was a delay in action only. Still, going to a superior and entreating him to keep his promise was the kind of thing that, in Vader's day, had presaged the death of many promising young officers. Sarini was ambitious, not stupid, and the last thing he wanted was to get between Hamir and Dalla when the two were arguing. There was no upside to that. So it was with the height of unease that he received Hamir's communications request. Grimacing, he stared at the communications unit, dreading responding to it. What if Hamir had decided he was angrier with Dalla than he had originally seemed? When Sarity's parents had sent him to Kamner as a boy, his father had taken him aside and warned him to stay calm, glide smoothly through his schooling, and most especially not to antagonize anyone in a superior position to himself. The Sarities had been a reasonably prosperous Coruscanti family, and his father had known that keeping that prosperity required keeping one's mouth shut. Effen had kept to his father's lessons over the years, which was one way he'd risen to the rank of loyalty officer and was on the short list from off. He took a breath and accepted the calm request. To his relief, it wasn't Hamir himself on the other side of the connection. 
Unfortunately, this relief was short-lived. Loyalty Officer Sariti, said Moff Disra. I understand you're preparing to depart to return to your duties as Dala's loyalty officer, but Emperor Regent Hamir requests your presence before you depart. Of course, Moff Dersa, Sariti said, his mouth dry. May I ask what this concerns? I believe it is about the delivery of the Thai droids that Dala has been promised, Disra said contemplatively. He leaned towards the screen, lowering his voice as a sharing of confidence. I fear the Emperor Regent is in a foul mood. He had a conversation with the Emperor's hand before she departed on her own mission, and has been fuming ever since. These machinations are going to be the death of me, Sariti thought dismally. I understand, Moff Dursa. I will attend to the Emperor Regent at once. Please have my ship ready to depart when the meeting is concluded. I understand completely, Disra agreed, and the screen went black. With a heavy sigh, Sariti reached for his dress uniform. If he was very lucky, he might even survive the afternoon with some starching still left in the collar. And if he didn't, well, if he didn't, he wouldn't have to worry about it. Asterisk. Emperor Regent Hammer's chambers aboard Silencer Station lacked the pomp of the Coral Elite. Dark and poorly furnished, there was little to the space. At the far side of the windowless room was a broad desk, replete with multiple monitors and a map of the galaxy. The rest of the space was almost entirely empty, with only a few cabinets on either side, closed, their contents unknown, and a large, circular meditation rug filling the empty space. In the center of that rug knelt Emperor Regent Hamir, facing away from the door that Sariti had quietly entered through. Enter, Hamir said without turning to face him. His voice was deep and hoarse, as if he had run a stormtrooper assault course, though Sariti tried to restrain his imagination from picturing the larger man in his dark robes and apron of armor running anywhere. Sariti took two steps into the room, standing just short of the edge of the tatty rug, and stood at attention. Loyalty Officer Sariti reporting as requested, Your Highness. Hamir waved away any more perfunctory ceremony. Sariti, when you return to Admiral Dalla, inform her that there will be further delay in the delivery of the Thai droids she has been promised. They are being redirected towards another objective. If Hamir doesn't kill me, Dalla will, Sariti thought dimly. This was a disaster. Dala was insistent that she had to have those reinforcements before Antilles' fifth fleet became active again, and that the only hope Corellia had to remain free of the New Republic was to use them to strike a surprise blow. She needed them, and he was obliged to remind Hamir of that. He hovered in a moment of indecision, because reminding Hamir might well have fatal consequences. I am aware of Admiral Dala's concerns about Corellia, Hamir went on, preempting Saturday's response to his everlasting relief. But Corellia is not the only thorn plague in the Empire. If Moff Farrells and Admiral Pelian are not brought to heel, there may be even more defections from our fleet. The Tie Droids will be used to crush Pelian's pathetic fleet and bomb Paul Major to rubble. Your Highness Sariti began cautiously, Admiral Dallas' entire plan for the defense of Corellia requires that the existence of the Tie Droid be kept a secret until they can be used to score a decisive victory. If they are deployed against Pelion, the New Republic will surely find out. I do not care what Admiral Dalla has planned, Hamir cut him off curtly. She is the finest officer in the Empire, by her own reckoning. If the plan she has will not work, she will just have to find another. Hamir stood slowly, and Sariti felt his heart clench with fear as the Emperor Regent turned to face him. Those eyes, Hamir sounded calm but there was a depth of rage and fury in those eyes that terrified Sariti. Whatever Raganda Icemarin had said to Hamir had pushed him into a frenzy, and suddenly Sariti was even more acutely aware of the bed of swords he was lying in. He swallowed hard. I will tell her, Emperor Regent. I will provide the latest updates to the astrogation charts in the core and deep core. Hamir's tone indicated that this was not a concession, but a gift one that was to be respected as such. Of course, Emperor Regent. I'm sure the Admiral's gratitude will be made manifest when she uses them to their full effect. He was relieved when Hamir did not prevent him from leaving, 
but his heart rate did not return to normal until his shuttle was safely in the sweet embrace of hyperspace. Cray Mingla stared at her hands. They trembled. For years, her hands had remained stone steady while performing minute adjustments in her lab work. They had stayed just as steady as she cared for Nietzsche's after one of his fits. Now they trembled. They didn't tremble like Nietzsche's did. His tremble was that of illness, of synapses misfiring. Now that she had been taken by Director Eismarin and the Empire, her hands trembled from exhaustion and fear. She needed to sleep. She needed to keep her strength up because tomorrow would be another excruciating day, a day she would sustain because her pain was nothing compared to Nietzsche's pain and whatever she could do to preserve his life, to give them a chance of regaining the happiness that had been stolen from them by his illness and by the empire, she would do. But she couldn't. She couldn't sleep, because Nietzsche's needed her. Her lover recovered from the stunned blast slowly. The first day afterwards he had trouble eating. The first time he swallowed down the gruel they were given, she nearly burst into tears. Slowly, she took the time to help him back to health, knowing that it would not be long before she was sent back into the lab, poking at the innards of yet another one of the Empire's horror weapons. She was furious with him for the risk he had taken, and she was furious with herself for the risk she had taken. But, she reminded herself, his had been premeditated. Hers had been a response to sudden, unexpected opportunity and his, even if it had been successful, would not have assured their escape. You shouldn't have done it, she whispered quietly, coldly, when he was recovered enough to appreciate her fury. His dark blue eyes held the reminder of pain, but not a bit of apology. Had to do something, he managed, his voice hoarse and dry. She helped him take a sip of water. Had to try. You're lucky they didn't kill you? His eyes softened and his hand grew surprisingly still as he placed it on hers. I'm going to die either way, he said, calm and certain in a way that sent a spike of white-hot rage up her spine. But if I don't do something, they're going to kill you after their project is up and running. She nearly slapped him. Her hand balled into a furious fist. I can't save you, she insisted. Your disease is of your body, not your mind. I'm a cyberneticist. I'm the best damn cyberneticist in the galaxy, and I can. At what cost? Nietzsche's asked. His hand wrapped around her fist and squeezed. Say the Empire lets you save my life, Cray. Say they even let us both go. What will they do with this place after that? Cray thought of that swarm of droid starfighters. Of the cold, contemptuous voice of the AI she had interacted with through the command interface. Of the Imperials, with their cold, in human treatment of her and Nietzsche's, looking through them rather than at them, like they weren't even there, except when they needed something done. Of Raganda's boot tickle in her nose. She shuddered. If, if you're right, she stammered, then, then what we need to do is stop them. She shook her head, fighting back tears. Maybe we should just stop cooperating altogether. They'll kill us, but at least. Nietzsche's hand shook around hers. He clasped both his hands tight around hers, squeezing so hard that hers almost began to hurt, but that was just his way of keeping his own hands from shaking. Do you think that is the right thing to do? She shook her head at him, not understanding. That's what I'm asking you. His hands squeezed tighter. Cray. Close your eyes. Why? You said that Raganda told you that you have the force, he said. His tone was quiet, reverent and she could sense just how hard he was fighting to keep from allowing his illness to touch him in this moment, to interrupt something that suddenly had unexpected weight. So close your eyes. She did not understand. The Force was a mystery to her, a child's story. It wasn't something a scientist took seriously. But Nietzsche's was a scientist too. She closed her eyes. Don't think. I know, that's hard for both of us. There was even a bit of humor in that voice and it reminded her of the niches of old, of times that now felt long, long ago. The two of them had been happy then, working in their adjoining labs at the McGrody Institute, him on his enhanced droid intelligence and miniaturization projects, her on her extensive study of captured SS Iruk technology. The banter which turned to flirting, which turned to dinner, which turned to cuddling on his couch. Don't think, Cray. She tried, but there was always something, 
Always some wavery thought, some idea, some pain, some premonition of mourning, or of hope. It was good enough. What should we do? The answer wasn't one that came from the Force. At least, Cray didn't think so. The answer was one that had lurked in the pit of her stomach, taunting her in dark moments. We should sabotage this place, she whispered. As much as we can. However we can. For as long as we can. She opened her eyes slowly, and found him staring back at her. They'll kill us, he reminded her. They're going to kill us anyway? There it was. A kernel in the pit of her stomach. Resentment and anger rising deep within her. Anger at Nietzsche's illness. Anger at the Empire. Anger at everything that had been done to them, taken from them. Resentment over everything they had already lost, and over everything that they had yet to lose. But for the first time, Cray's response wasn't rationalization. It wasn't fear. It wasn't panic. It was hate. We can't stop them, she said, and she knew, deep down, that it was true. She wasn't sure if that was some mystical force talking, or if it was just her own accursed stubbornness. She had done everything she ever set her mind to, up to and including building that damn command interface for Raganda. And at least we'll be together. He squeezed her hands, but all the strength suddenly faded and she felt them start, once more, to shake. She gripped them firmly, holding them still. We can't stop them, she repeated, feeling the confidence born from experience and rage mingle together grow. And at least we'll be together. All right, he agreed. All right. One day soon, son, you will be emperor in truth as well as name. Irek Eismarin thought about his mother's words a lot. For his entire life, but particularly aboard Silencer 7, she was inescapable and all of his cybernetic implants itched. Hers was the ever-present voice in the back of his mind. You will rule, it said. The Force chose you, and I shaped you. You must rule. You deserve to rule? You are owed obedience. All those who stand against you are worthy of contempt and death, and their deaths are a lesson to others. That destiny was not just a reward, but a burden. A burden of responsibility as well as authority, of work as well as leisure. The work that was required now was learning how to rule. For years, Raganda's pet, the brilliant scientist Dr. Nasdra McGrody, had worked to give Irek the ability to command the AI at the heart of Silencer 7. But despite early successes, he had become more slothful, and Raganda had decided that the old man's passive resistance would result in unacceptable delays. Magrady's death had been one of many Irek had witnessed since childhood. Their deaths are a lesson to others. Irek had liked McGrody well enough, and his death, while necessary, had annoyed him. But then Raganda found Magrady's most brilliant student as a replacement. If McGrody had been resigned and contemplative, Dr. Cray Mingla blazed with Hardej fire. Despite the bitterness she displayed towards everyone, Irek included, though they had spent little time together, Irek much preferred Cray. She was, after all, the most beautiful woman Irek had ever seen. Tall, with brilliant golden hair and dark, expressive brown eyes, Irek often found it difficult to look away from her or to maintain his air of carefully cultivated detachment. His mother had warned him not to pursue her, lest they lose another genius. Cray had talents that even McGrody had lacked, and she had made incredible progress on the Silencer Command interface in the long months she had been their captain. She was irreplaceable, Alienating her would set them back and perhaps even make it impossible for him to command the AI his mother had worked many years to cultivate. But these restrictions did not make Cray Mingla any less beautiful, and Irek wondered about what would become of her after her task was complete. His mother would probably want to kill her. Irek recoiled at the thought. The door to the chambers that Cray and Irek shared slid open in his command. There was no lock on the door, none that would stop Irek, anyway. Inside the small room, Cray was tending to her crippled fiancé, who remained alive for two reasons and two reasons only, despite his approaching uselessness, he was a useful cyberneticist in his own right. And without threats to him hanging over her head, Cray would not cooperate, willingly with the Empire. Neither of these were things Irek much cared about. He was reasonably certain that the man was dead weight and that he could force Cray to cooperate even without such a weak man for leverage. 
The thought was married to jealousy as he watched Cray look up from her tender caring too. He fought to remember the man's name, and it came to him in a moment of recollection. Dr. Marr. Such a pitiful creature does not deserve such a stunning beauty, the 17-year-old thought sourly. At least he could interrupt their little love fest. Dr. Mingla, he announced, trying to sound as authoritative as an imperial admiral. His voice, thankfully, no longer cracked. That had been a humiliating few years. It is time to begin my instruction in how to best use your command interface for silencer station. He wondered, hoped, really, that she would appreciate his willingness to credit her with the creation of the interface. Cray stopped tending to her cripple and turned to look at him. She looked exhausted, with dark bags under her eyes. But despite her exhaustion and lack of makeup, she remained stunningly, devastatingly beautiful. Irex's heart thumped in his chest when she looked at him. Go on, Han, the man-machine murmured, almost unheard. I'll be fine. Need to rest anyway. Very well. Her voice was soft and lyrical. She took her hand off the cripple's back. Where shall we work? Irek always liked him when she said we. He couldn't keep the smile off his face. In the lab, he suggested. My mother left your interface there. He held his arm out as she rose carefully, but she did not take it. Instead, she took her time, arranging Mare's body with care. His eyes narrowed. Sometime today, if you're feeling ambitious. She did not quicken her pace. But when she was finished, she strode from the room with her head up, as if she hadn't a care in the world, leaving him to hurry behind. Chapter 6 The Imperial I Class Star Destroyer Stormhawk lurked in the Lyria Crossal system. Deep in New Republic territory, the populated system sat directly on the Corellian Run, the trade route between Coruscant and Corellia which then headed out to the Outer Rim. For months the New Republic's military efforts had been dedicated to securing as much of the Corellian Run as they could, and for months Admiral Natasi Dalla had been preventing them from doing just that. She stood in the center of Stormhawk's bridge, staring out into the total blackness. Total blackness because the only way to get an Imperial ship this deep into New Republic territory was under cloak. The screen that made Stormhawk invisible to the New Republic also blinded her, and Dalla had no idea what would be waiting for them when the time came to drop that cloak. But that was the risk of the strategy she had adopted to foil the New Republic's advance. Captain Markarian stood at her side. Almost time, Admiral? He asked. She checked her chrono. Almost? She agreed. Are we waiting for anything in particular? He asked curiously. Imperial intelligence's report of when the New Republic convoy would be departing Coruscant indicates that our best chance of catching them will be in 30 minutes, Dollar reminded him. And given where we are, it's best not to hang around long after we intercept it. Yes, sir. Markarian nodded. The New Republic's capture of Perma and Lawner puts us well behind enemy lines. She mused aloud. Stans has moved his ships forward to Lawner to continue putting pressure on Corellia, but that stretches their supply lines and gives us a chance to hit their rear. It was nothing that Markarian did not already know, but it was good to explain to Stormhawk's bridge crew their intent before the battle. Since she had taken command of the fleet, she had completely rewritten Imperial doctrine. Instead of meeting the New Republic in the slugging matches that had once been the Empire's only fleet tactic, she made ruthless use of cloaking devices to sneak Imperial formations into places where they would have force advantages, used hidden fate attacks, and focused on pulling the New Republic's logistical units out of hyperspace with interdictors or Empion mines. Her commanders had complained bitterly that the new Imperial way of war was cowardly and not befitting of the Starfleet. She had taken those complaints as resignation notices and replaced them with officers who more fully comprehended that the glory days were done. Captain Markarian, you may deploy the Empire on mines at your discretion, Dalla said formally as she watched the chrono tick down to zero. Drop the cloak. Launch our TIE interceptor squadrons, but inform their commanders to hold off on engaging the enemy until they receive explicit orders to do so. Not our TIE droids. Confirmed Markarian. Not yet, Dalla said. This mission wasn't nearly important enough to reveal to the New Republic the existence of her sudden growth in Starfighter strength, even if she hadn't received nearly as many as she had been promised. 
that moment would come. As the cloak came down she saw the world of Lyria Curlsey for the first time. With a population of only 300,000, it was one of the smaller core worlds, and wasn't considered important enough for a military garrison nor strong enough to field a significant system defense force. Indeed, she saw only a handful of ships that might have military capacity in orbit, and nothing worth hunting. As long as they stayed within the planet's gravity well, she'd leave them alone. My is active, Admiral. She nodded. Jam the local hollow net to prevent messages being sent. She checked her chrono. It will take the New Republic three hours to get substantial reinforcements here. We will stay for two hours. If we don't catch anything in that time, we'll leave to try again another day. Seventy-five minutes later a New Republic formation including a Nebulon B escort, frigate, half a squadron of Y-wings, and six New Republic military freighters came smashing out of hyperspace. The Empion mines wreaked their havoc, and it took Stormhawk only twenty minutes to finish them off without a single casualty. They were gone before any reinforcements could arrive. Massive, strong, and stately, the Satishasa Senatorial Skyhook stood out like a beacon in Coruscant's low orbit, now the permanent seat of the New Republic government. From its outer observation ring, which could see the massive space scrapers pushing up into the sky, pointing up like the quills of a raw tiary porcupine, and just as prickly. I seldom saw my homeworld from this angle until I went fleet, his aide, Commodore Atrel Taban, commented from his side. From the ground, skyhooks looked like these gleaming gemstones, white or red depending on the time of day. It's just as strange to be on one of them looking down at the city. Most natives of Coruscant never leave. There's a whole galaxy down there. Neighborhoods and rivalries, and scattered local governments, and gangs. If you slip too far down towards the surface you will run into gang wars, which have been waging for longer than the Galactic Civil War, and half the people don't even realize the Old Republic has fallen. One war at a time, Atrel, wet side. We have enough trouble with the one we are fighting up here. She laughed. I know, Wedge. And I wouldn't even know who to sign up with, or how. The history is so muddled that none of them really know what they're fighting for, other than control of a street or a corner shop, and no one knows what victory would even look like. If any of them won, they just split and the war would start all over again. She offered him a humorless smile. At least we're fighting for something, and our war has a chance at ending. Let's just hope that the Inner Council isn't about to make ending it more difficult, Wedge muttered darkly. Behind them, the Celestin sentry outside of Admiral Abat's office pressed a stubby hand to his ear, then chittered to gain their attention. The Commander-in-Chief will see you now, he announced. Thank you, Sergeant, Wedge replied, and he and Atrel entered the room. Admiral Abat's office was much as Admiral Akbar's had been, before the Mon Calamarian had resigned his post in the New Republic military to assume the role of senator full-time. The Dorning had replaced Akbar's oceanic artwork, still holos are impressionistic canvases of oceans, or sculptures reminiscent of tides and waves, with entire ethnographies of abstract, minutely detailed mosaics done in every medium imaginable. The pieces offered equal measures of intrigue and order, and Wedge resolved to ask the new admiral about them one day when both men had more free time. Wedge was not surprised to see that Abob was not alone. General Aaron Kraken was with him, and so was an unexpected face, the new senator for Corellia in exile, Sina Medano. Come in, General, Abot greeted him. You know General Kraken and Counselor Medano. I do, Wedge agreed. General Counselor. You can still call me Sina, you know, the older woman replied with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. She waved a graceful arm demonstrating all the poise of someone who had been a senate aide before she was Wedge's age. Sit down, Wedge. Wedge knew that tone of voice and didn't like it. Admiral Dalla hit us again today, Abot announced with a frown. Wedge sat up, a sense of dread swelling at those words. The new Imperial Fleet commander had been a relative unknown just a year before, whose reputation owed more to the improprieties of the Imperial Starfleet than to her combat abilities. That was no longer the case now, whatever the Empire thought of her behind closed doors, the
the New Republic had learned not to underestimate her. We lost a proton torpedo resupply convoy, six replenishment ships, loaded with 300 plus proton torpedoes each. Which wins? Fifth Fleet needed as many proton torpedoes as possible to take Corellia. Another mysterious Star Destroyer suddenly appeared in a system we thought secured, pulled the convoy out of hyperspace, and vanished before we could get reinforcements to help. It would appear so, given the reports from the survivors. But I think, given what I've managed to learn from the local surveillance systems, that I have an idea of how she's doing it. General Kraken The Star Destroyer Stormhawk appeared out of nowhere about an hour before the attack, Kraken explained promptly. And by out of nowhere, I mean that literally. There was no indication of a hyperspace emergence, and when the Star Destroyer appeared it was with zero relative velocity. He frowned. That's a pretty good indication that Dala is not just having ships come out of hyperspace at a distance, power down, and come in dark, and then light up when they're in combat range. So she's just using cloaking devices, Wedge said with a sigh. We were afraid of that. Kraken nodded. Best guess? Stormhawk was already in system when 5th Fleet captured Lyria Kersel. She waited under cloak until 5th Fleet moved on, then waited some more, probably using couriers to pop out from under the cloaking shield to keep an eye on things and relay communications. Then once there was an opportune moment Stormhawk dropped the cloak and laid an empire on mine. By the time reinforcements could arrive, Kraken continued. Stormhawk was gone. Admiral Stans was able to set up some blockades along the most likely hyperlanes, but without luck. Likely Stormhawk retreated into the Deep Core. The Empire knows the unstable hyperlanes of the Deep Core far better than we do, and is more willing to risk traversing them. It's exactly the kind of maneuver we would have pulled ourselves before Endor, Abot said, his voice full of rueful admiration. But we didn't have cloaking devices or Empire on mines. Our Star Destroyers, Wedge added. This is going to slow down efforts to retake Corellia, he warned, looking at Cena. The senator representing all the Corellians in the New Republic, forbidden to return to their Imperial-controlled homeworlds, didn't even nod. I know. And that leads us to our second order of business, and the reason we scheduled this meeting with you. She turned to Kraken. General, would you care to do the briefing? General Antilles. Things are heating up on Corellia, Kraken began. The Corellian hollow net has been locked down by the dictat, but we know that major protests are kicking off throughout the system. I'm not sure what exactly set them off, but it sounds like a draw was murdered while in ISB custody. That set off a chain of protests on draw, which led to sympathy protests on Salonia and Corellia. I can't confirm major protests in Coronet, and there are certain indications that Dralin and Salonian civilian and military forces are preparing for more active resistance against imperial rule in the Corellian system. Atril gasped. That's suicide. It could well be, Kraken agreed. But that doesn't mean that it won't happen. It sounds like the aliens and sympathetic humans were reacting against the imposition of new discriminatory laws across the Corellian system. He frowned. Since the coup, Comner and the New Order have been imposing those laws on aliens all across Imperial space. So far only Moonilinst has avoided them. The Salonians and Dralins aren't likely to tolerate that, Wedge said, feeling an angry crease in his brow. Those ISB scumsuckers are picking one hell of a fight for no reason at all. There was a reason the Empire had long left the Corellian system to its own devices. Until now, Corellia's internal politics have largely been left to Corellia, Cena said, putting voice to his thoughts. With ISB fully in charge of the Empire, that's changed. But it means we are working with a tight window of time. If the revolt can't be suppressed with mass arrests, the Empire may well resort to limited orbital bombardment to restore order. And if that doesn't work, perhaps not so limited orbital bombardment. Wedge had seen, not that long ago, the consequences of even a short-lived orbital bombardment. The Imperial Academy on Corita had been bombarded for two, maybe three minutes by a single Star Destroyer, and even that had caused upwards of 50,000 casualties. You said there were protests in Coronet? He asked warily. 
Cena's grim nod told him that she too foresaw the possibility. And if they resort to bombing Coronet to put down the protest. Coronet City was the pride of the entire Corellian sector. The center of Corellian wealth and prosperity. It was a flourishing capital of arts and culture, with millions of residents and millions of additional commuters from throughout the Corellia system. Wedge had snuck in to see Coronet after the Yukio campaign on a date with Ela to remind himself exactly what it was he was fighting for. Even under drab imperial grays and blood-red banners, the old city hadn't disappointed. The thought of Coronet City suffering an imperial orbital bombardment. But the consequences of rushing and to try to stop it could be just as dire. If we push the timetable on the Corellian operation too hard, Wedge warned, that will leave us vulnerable to Dollar's rearguard actions. I won't be able to deploy much in the way of serious force to protect convoys along the Corellian run. And Lusankaya is still weeks away from being ready to return to action. We'll be deploying units from home fleet to cover your rear when the time comes, Abot assured him. Right now, the most important thing is to put pressure on Corellia. Any ships that you can draw out of the system will be ships that aren't available to contain a full-blown revolt. And if we're lucky, maybe with their attention divided you'll be able to catch the Empire between your fleet and the successful rebel forces to liberate the system quickly. Wedge sent a skeptical glance to Atrel, who shrugged. It's not ideal, she warned. But with Fifth Fleet's new reinforcements from Kuit and Rendili, our capital ship's strength is greater than it has ever been. Stans hasn't been able to force a decisive engagement with Dala, Wedge said, looking at Abot. She's been too good at keeping her forces moving and hard to pin down, and I'm concerned about what other tricks she might have that we haven't seen yet. From what little we were able to gather from her record, she always had a reputation as an aggressive hothead. That matched her actions at Dorne and Chaswa, but that's not the sort of tactics we've seen from her since then. Abat's expression was firm. Our intelligence suggests that they have not been able to replace the ships they lost at Corita, much less the manpower. And with Ma Farrell's and Admiral Pelian's little rebellion of their own, the Empire is dividing. Now is the time to strike, General Antilles, and Corellia needs us to act. Abat was right, Wedge feared. But in the rebellion he'd learned more than once the heavy cost of attacking fortified and prepared targets who knew when, where, and why you were coming, and his gut told him that this would be another one of those times. General. Prompted Cena. I don't like it, Wedge said suspiciously. We got lucky at Karina with good intelligence and better timing. Now we're short undamaged ships and our crews haven't gotten a full rest cycle. But I don't see that we have a choice. Our home needs us, and billions of lives are at stake. He stared at the admiral and the senator with an even, measuring gaze. I need some time before my fleet will be ready, but I'm in. Since they know we're likely coming, I'll organize a volunteer transfer for any Corellian expatriates who want to join your fleet for the operation, added Cena sadly. Until Corellia. Anything I hear, I'll get you by fast courier or emergency broadcast, said Kraken. And I'll dispatch more of home fleet to patrol the Corellian run and prevent Dala from staging any more of those rear ambushes, said a bot, stroking his barbed mustache. He nodded at the Corellians in the room, until Corellia, he said, adding the now familiar phrase out of respect. Until Corellia, which echoed, a red bell's dying word sticking signally in his throat. He rose, saluted the general, and swept out at a fast walk with Atrel following in his wake. That's strange, Atrel said. A few hours later, they were bunkered down in his office, reviewing battle plans they'd already examined a dozen times over, and trying to guess where Dala would strike next. What's strange? Wedge asked. Take a look at this. She slid a datapad across his desk. He stopped it with a hand before it could slide over the edge and fall. That's Dallas' service record. It was attached to her intelligence file, the one Kraken just updated. Wedge looked at it. Dalla had been a cadet at Corita then called Grand Moff Tarkin's eye and been assigned to his staff. She'd been promoted rapidly and, despite the widespread perception that her promotions were due solely to Tarkin's favor, performed well in each assignment she'd been given. 
Upon Tarkin's death, though, she'd been effectively exiled to the Outer Rim. I know all this already, he said. Look closer, specifically at the dates and known associates. Wedge frowned and did. What am I looking? He stopped. Oh, he said. I thought that was interesting too, Atchel said, but her voice sounded distant as Wedge lost himself in the name on the page. In the latest version of the file, Aaron Kraken's staff had gone through everything that was known about Dallas' history. With the capture of Karita, they did not just have their own intelligence records, but the Academy's own files. The Academy Records building had survived largely intact, and the Imperials had kept meticulous records. One of the names was Sunter Fell. Baron Sunter Fell had been the Empire's finest pilot. He was also Wedge's brother-in-law, because Sial Antilles, who had Wed Fell under her stage name of Wyatt's Starflare, had left Corellia at 17 for the bright star of Coruscant. Wedge had only been seven, and though his memories of her were somewhat faded over the years, his memory of her smile and her ability to spin a yarn blazed brightly still. When his parents had been busy, which was often, she had been the one to read to him at night, and those were main treasured memories. Wedge loved his big sister. Sial and Fell had been celebrities, and their wedding had been the subject of sludge news, gossip for years. Until, that is, Fell's capture by the rebellion, combined with his increasing disillusionment with the Empire, had led to his defection. For a time, Wedge and Fell had even flown together in Rogue Squadron, and the rogues who remembered him insisted that, of all the pilots the rogues had ever had, Fell was still the very best. Fell's time in the rebellion had come to an abrupt end thanks to Issen Isert, who had made it a personal mission of hers to hunt Fell down for his betrayal. Wedge still didn't know exactly what had happened to Fell and his sister, but he was reasonably sure they had evaded Imperial ire, if only because a public example had never been made of them. The fact that Sial and Fell had managed to vanish so thoroughly was comforting, though their absence still stung like a fresh wound every time he thought about it. Wedge had sworn on his parents' memory that he would find Fell and Sial and the rest of his family. But he had not yet done so, nor did he have any idea where to even start. It was an odd coincidence to find Fell's name here, but Wedge knew that Fell's name was not the one which had attracted Atrel's attention because the second name on the list was Han Solo. Han and Dalla were at the academy at the same time. He asked, pushing past his momentary reverie. Atro nodded. Looks like they shared some classes too, long before she became entangled with Tarkin. She shrugged. She's a looker. You think he remember her? It's Han, Wedge said. I'll bet you a bottle of pre-Empire wearings they were at least friendly. I'll bet you a month of desserts from Ela's favorite bakery on Coruscant that they weren't, Atchel replied, somewhat archly. Wedge chuckled. You're on. Let's find out. But I'm flying. On the trip from Dathomir to Coruscant, Luke and Mara started Karana tea on some Jedi basics. Tempered metal was not an ideal place for meditation, but the lounge had been gradually reworked to create a space for it. It was little more than an open piece of floor on which they could lay a mat and a few sitting cushions, but it was better than nothing, and Mara was surprised at how natural its addition felt. She knew that more changes would come with time, and was even more surprised at how comfortable she was with that knowledge. Karanati knew how to meditate, but the lack of intent in this meditation was clearly unnerving her. They were not meditating for any particular purpose. They were not seeking knowledge. They were merely emptying themselves of thought to allow the Force to fill those empty spaces, and if the Force chose to guide them, it would. Mara knew that the witches called upon the Force typically in moments of desire and need. Their spells conjured as power to create the effects they desired, not unlike a Jedi using the Force for telekinesis. But the witches would need, over time, to grow comfortable with the idea that the main gift the Force offered was not an instrumental one. The Force is not just about power, Mar murmured, her eyes closed as she concentrated. Luke stood back, allowing himself to fade into the background as he watched, her red-gold hair seeming to shimmer in the occasional flicker of a faulty ceiling light. She looked at peace, calm, and centered, radiating with an inner light, and she reached out to him through the Force, 
gently chastising him for distracting her. It's about guidance. Visions of the future or warnings about present dangers. When you listen to the Force and let it guide you, it will help you with everything from choosing amongst the options you see to helping you see an option you didn't know you had. Then you do not intend to teach me the lightsaber. Karana T sounded confused and just the slightest bit perturbed. The Jedi are great warriors. Wars do not make anyone great, Luke said at Mara's gentle prompting in the Force, drawing the attention of their new apprentice. We will teach you to fight, yes, and teach you to wield a lightsaber, because sometimes only the respect a lightsaber commands will let you implement the will of the Force. But allowing ourselves to become warriors first is part of why the Jedi fell. Then what are Jedi? Asked Karana T. It was Luke's turn to nudge Mara through the Force. She caught the nudge and leaned into the touch, allowing her force sense to mingle with his. We serve, Mara said, her voice calm even as she leaned into the invisible intimacy they shared. She turned to look at Karana T, fixing the Dathomiri witch with an intense gaze, one of instruction and command. Sometimes we serve food to those who have none. Sometimes we serve justice to those who need some. But always we must be seekers of truth and sharers of truth. And, if we have to be, defenders of truth. Karana T did not look entirely persuaded, Mara saw, but that was all right. It was merely something they would have to watch for, and that was a necessary part of the task Luke had been given, and she had reluctantly chosen. As Luke had told her many times, Yoda had told him to pass on what he had learned, and with Karana T they had another promising candidate. Asterisk. Tempered metal descended towards the Jedi Consulate building, a small complex located at the unfashionable edges of Coruscant's embassy district. The building had once been the top rear embassy and cultural center. Tapra had moved his embassy to the Satashasa Senatorial Skyhook and given his previous home to the Jedi in permanent trust, refusing any offer of repayment. No doubt their interest had been spurred by the fact that one of their natives, Tyrius Arkin, had become one of the newest Jedi apprentices, but it still made Luke feel vaguely uncomfortable. People all had their own ideas of what the Jedi had once been, but no one knew yet what the new Jedi would be, because that was still taking shape. The structure was small but not unattractive. A hexagonal structure topped with the high dome, it floundered outwards halfway up, offering six large flat landing pads for spacecraft and air speeders, a necessity given all the coming and going. Lower down it flowered again, offering another six. After that, it descended down into the lower levels of Coruscant. On the top tier was the landing pad, which was now reserved for tempered metal. Luke glanced behind him at where Karana T stood watching, with no small amount of awe, as the city swelled through their forward windows. Welcome to the home of the Jedi on Coruscant, he greeted her. The witch could only nod, wordless in her awe. Luke was sympathetic. A world more different than Dathomir was hard to imagine. Mara and Luke set the freighter down comfortably. Well, there doesn't seem to be a panic welcoming committee, Mara observed. That's good. Hopefully that's because there's no panic, Luke said, and not because they're all panicking behind closed doors somewhere. Asterisk. The entry to the consulate from the landing pad was one of six entryways. Each was remarkably decorative though decades of damage and ill repair, particularly after the Empire had come to power on Coruscant, had left their toll. Still, they entered through one of the six vestibules into a large, open space, with lifts and stairs going both up and down. In the center was a monument that predated the Jedi, one dedicated to Tapra's slain in the war against the Empire, including the many Antarian rangers who had made Tapra their home, an enclave that had survived. Chapter 7 the Solo Residence, which had recently become the Solo Seltu Residence by necessity, was typically a loud, boisterous place full of warmth and tantalizing smells. During the day, Winter and Leia worked in their joint office in the apartment or in Leia's senatorial suite set deeper into the skyhook, while Tycho spent his days at Home Fleet Starfighter Academy, hosted aboard the aging Victory Class Star Destroyer Swift Liberty. That left Han and Chewbacca, and their Nori bodyguards Kakmane and Miwal, 
home to raise not just two toddlers, but two toddlers and an infant not yet one year old. Right now, Chewbacca was away visiting his family on Kashyyyk, and the Nori were being their usual, alarmingly invisible selves. Han had to admit, though, little Mia Selchu was cute. Not as adorable and talented as his kids, but still cute. She was also currently in her father's arms, and, miracle of miracles, she was sleeping, though everyone in the room had his voice low to try and keep it that way. Especially since Jason and Jaina were attempting their own afternoon nap in the other room. This combination of facts made Han wince when the door chime rang. With excessive haste he hurried over to the unit by the door, managing to hit the mute command before it rang a second time. He looked back at Tycho. Did it wake her up? Tycho shook his head. The fluff of white curls at the top of Mia's head remained still. No, he whispered. Good, he whispered back, before triggering the door release. On the other side were two people, both in New Republic uniforms. Han pressed his finger to his lips before either of them could speak. Just outside the door, Wedge and Tilly straightened, then smiled ruefully and nodded. Then he and Actual Taban ducked into the residence. Once inside, Tycho waved silently to Wedge and Atrel, offering a smile. Wedge's returning smile was nearly incandescent. Where are the twins? Wedge whispered. Sleeping, Han whispered back. Is this a casual visit or a business visit? Can't it be both? Business? Then, Han grumbled. Business can wait a minute, Wedge promised. He passed Han, giving him a pat on the shoulder, still smiling then went over to sit next to Tycho. The two of them watched Tycho's daughter for a long minute and whispered to one another quietly, catching up. Beside him, actual Taban stood, looking like she wasn't quite sure what she was doing there. So, Commodore Taban, Han whispered to her, keeping his voice quietly low. Both of Mia's parents might be reserved people, but Mia had powerful lungs. What brings you and the commander of the New Republic's Fifth Fleet to my door? Atro glanced at Wedge. We want your advice. My advice, huh? Han drawled quietly. And what do you need, my distinguished advice, Abu? He caught the words in his throat. The sudden stop made Atro jump and spin in the direction he was looking. Luckily, there was no immediate threat there. Unluckily, Jaina Solo was peeking her head out from the hall. Twins are awake? Han announced quietly. Tycho looked down at the sleeping Mia and sighed. And it was so nice and quiet. It never lasts, Han observed wryly. See, Mir, sweetheart, he encouraged, with a coaxing tone. Jaina toddled over. Her step still uneasy, and Han watched with seasoned anticipation, concerned that she was about to fall over but secure in the knowledge that only ever happened if she tripped on something unexpected and that their toys were all put safely away. The Nori had helped with that. Uncle Luke coming Dada. Han glanced at Tycho and Wedge as Jaina waved shyly at the newcomers. He is, he asked. I didn't think he was supposed to be back on Coruscant until later in the week. Something as minor as Luke's listed schedule didn't bother Jaina. She just nodded seriously, her brown eyes. So like Leah's, wide with an excitement that usually only came from watching spaceships fly past the skyhook. Ma-ra too, she added deliberately. He usually is, Han commented wryly. Well, sweetie, how long do you think it'll be before they get here? Jaina considered that. Soon, she proclaimed. You know, I think she's right, Wedge said, then winced and glanced at Mia. He continued, more quietly, a Maki KL-6000 made his way through customs a few hours ago. Well, then Jaina is probably right. Aren't you, honey? Han asked Jaina, patting her on the head. Is Jason awake, or should we go wake him up so the two of you can greet your aunt and uncle when they get here? Jaina's brows furrowed. Mara, not my aunt, she countered. She said, Maybe not, sweetie, but she will be, Han replied, lifting her up so she could see him from my level. Jaina giggled in response, as she always did. It never ceased to make his heart warm either. Han put her back down. Tell you what, why don't you and Uncle Wedge go check on Rogue Solo while I make sure we have something to feed your uncle when he gets here. He'll be hungry, 
and I bet he's ready for something more refined than Dathomiri cuisine. He winced. I certainly would be. Jaina's brows furrowed further. I rogue solo, she proclaimed. Han considered that, hiding a laugh. You did help cause that incident at the Calamarian Opera last week. So you're right. That title does apply to both of you. Wedge was rising to accompany the half-pined hellion, but neither he nor Jaina made it out of the room before Tiny Jason Solo toddled in, rubbing sleep from his eyes with the back of one of his hands. Han frowned. Was that something squirming in Jason's grasp? He took a few swift steps towards his son, brandishing a swiftly grabbed spatula like a weapon as Jason stumbled over, stopping next to an unconcerned Jaina. In Jason's hands was a bored pup which nestled against his son's chest, cuddling and rumbling with absolute devotion. Jason noticed his sister first. Hi, Jaya. Chomper hungry. Chomper always hungry. Han came to a stop a few feet from his children. His twins looked up at him wide-wide, matching eyes. So did the board. Jason, where did you get that on a skyhook? Han asked, astonished. Jason gave him a confused look. Chomper live here, he explained. Are those things dangerous? Han asked. It'll grow up to have tusks that can punch through ferrocrete, said Wedge. I usually need proton torps to do that kind of damage. This particular boar did not have those tusks. Yet. But from the look of his son, taking the creature away would be a contentious act, one that Jason would resist ferociously. Even as Han considered it, Jason somehow drew the creature in against his chest even more closely. Han sighed. Tycho, we're gonna need another cage for the menagerie. He wagged his finger at Jason. What did I tell you about new pets? Chomper live here, Jason said patiently. He's got you there, Han, said Wedge. Han glowered. Just for that Antilles, you get to help me and Tycho find a way to contain the damn thing. The Jaina Solo early warning system was right about loop. The knock on their door came not 15 minutes later, almost exactly as long as it took for Luke and Mara to lock down the tempered metal, catch a transport, clear security, and walk from the Skyhook's landing platform to the Solo Selchu apartment. By then, Chomper was secure, Mia was awake, and Tycho was trying to coax her into accepting her bottle while Jason and Jaina bounced bright-eyed with excited anticipation. Han pressed the door release and then got out of the way. The pair of heat-seeking human missiles latched onto their uncle, all that anticipation converted into energetic hugs. Luke laughed and dragged the two little solos back into their apartment as they clung to his legs. Well, hello, Jaina, and hello, Jason, he said, ruffling their hair as he offered Han one of those absurdly youthful smiles that the kid wore all the time these days. I missed you too. One of the rogue solos, the slightly older one, released Luke's leg and glomped onto Maris as Luke's nearly avertent companion followed him into the apartment. Mara. The hesitation that Mara so often had when dealing with people was not as pronounced as it once had been. In the past, Mara would have endured the hug for a while before returning it, and she only ever returned hugs from one of Han's kids or Luke. But her return hug came a little bit quickly and a little bit more enthusiastic than it had in the past. Jaina gazed up at Mara with her adoring eyes. Mara, Dad, I say you're gonna be my aunt. Han's heart lurched into his chest and he wasn't sure it was beyond Mara to use the force for that, just to remind him she could. He often compared her glare to a turbolaser battery, but this time he was pretty sure he was staring down the barrel of a Death Star super laser. Your father really shouldn't gossip, she said, clearly not blaming Jaina for the indiscretion, for which Han was grateful. She ruffled Jaina's hair, making his daughter giggle with clear delight. Is it true? Jaina pestered. Is it true? Jason piled on. Mary's super laser gaze turned on Luke, who betrayed her by only offering an awkward grin and a shrug. Han was pretty sure Luke was the only person in the galaxy who wasn't intimidated by that glare, and never had been. She arched an eyebrow, as if increasing the intensity of her regard, and Luke laughed awkwardly. Come on, kids, let me and Mara get a little settled and while your father gets you something to eat, 
Then we can tell you all about our adventures on Dathomir. Ah, uh, I want Mara. Samir Kitts, Han intervened. If you relax for a bit, I'll let you have some of yesterday's risque for lunch. He was relieved when the bribe worked as an effective lure, but he could still feel the Death Star's targeting computer tracking him as he vanished into the kitchen. Asterisk. I'm going to kill him, Mara hissed into Luke's ear. I've heard that before, Luke murmured back. Hey guys, he greeted Tycho and Wedge. Wedge stood, and they exchanged a hug. Tycho, still sitting and holding the now awake and curious Mia as she grabbed at his fingers, disentangled himself to wave and greet Luke with a quick hey boss, but stay seated. Actual Taban, the only person there outside their intimate arrangement of close friends and family, exchanged quick greetings with each of them then found an out-of-the-way chair not far from the transparent steel window that looked out over Coruscant's lower orbit. As Luke sat next to Tycho and greeted Mia, Wedge, and Mara renewed their acquaintance. Antilles, said Mara, an exaggerated for Corellian as she offered the general a deliberately casual handshake. Jade, Wedge replied, and badly still to Korsky Imperial as he bowed obsequiously over her proffered hand. There was another moment of hesitation. Watching them, Luke chuckled. The look that Mara sent him might have come across as a glare, or something with even more heat, to someone not fluent in Mara, but Luke saw the uncertainty, saw her slightly at a loss. I don't know if I'm doing this right, that look said. Mara was perfectly capable of faking friendship. She had been a covert agent after all, of course, she was, but feeling out real friendships ones with people she considered safe, was still full of fraught moments. Unlike Han or Leia, who would have just hugged her, Wedge stepped back, gave her space, and smiled. How was your trip? Shorter than it would have been, she said. Mara's eyes narrowed some, tracking towards Han as he returned from the kitchen. The Dathomiri did remember Solo fondly. They named their new spaceport after him. They did? Han said with clear surprise, head sticking back out of the kitchen. Well, I did give them their planet back, free of charge. There was a bit of pride in those words, but Han was still watching Mara warily, which was wise, Luke thought. He didn't really believe that Mara intended to kill his brother-in-law, but that didn't mean that Mara didn't have plenty of weapons in her arsenal. And the Dathomiri had given her one in particular. Mara nodded. Solo's folly is quite the bustling metropolis by Dathomir standards. Her eyes narrowed. I think the witches quite accurately assess their benefactor, don't you? A ripple of muted laughter went around the room. Well, I never, muttered Han, sounding alarmingly like 3PO. His cheeks had become a rather distinct shade of red. He opened his mouth to offer a retort, but a single glance at Mara, whose smirk was utterly disarming, left it unspoken. I'll be in the kitchen, Han said lamely, and vanished again. We found a new recruit, Luke said after a second quiet ripple of laughter went around the room. One of the witches, named Karana T. But we didn't stay as long as we wanted to. Wedge nodded. Merix and Ela went out to bring you some top secret information. They wouldn't tell me what it was, either, and I'm under the impression that they're off to briefing with General Kraken somewhere. Mara grimaced. Probably. I just had mine. We might as well tell you now, Luke said. Sit down. Asterisk. By the time they were done explaining, Han had come back for good. Jason and Jaina were busy eating messily at the kitchen table, creating abstract art with their desserts. So the Empire is being ruled by an Emperor's hand. What kind of artifact are they looking for now? Wedge's voice was much sharper and more intent than Tycho's, the voice of the commander of the New Republic's Fifth Fleet, who had just been told there might be a new, significant threat to his people. What could the Force do to change the entire course of the war? Asked Atrel Taban. Luke raised both his hands. The exact rumors didn't come from us. They came from Merricks and Ela. I assume that Kraken will be briefing you soon, if Ela doesn't do it herself. And the rumor is they're looking for an artifact. Not that they have it already. It's just another hokey rumor, Han put in derisively. With all we've been through together, Luke said, faintly amused, 
I think by now you would take those rumors more seriously. To his surprise, Han didn't agree with him. It's not the same. The Emperor is dead, Sibayoth is dead, and Jethzerian is dead. If an artifact this powerful really did exist, wouldn't the Emperor have found and used it himself? Despite the name of Dathomir's newest and only spaceport, Solo has a point, said Mara, as though she'd bitten down on something bitter. She shrugged. But that doesn't mean it isn't true, of course. It just means there's probably more to the story. And given the potential risks we have to take the possibility seriously, so Luke and I will investigate. That's good, Wedge said. Atril cleared her voice. Though, the reason General Antilles and I came here was to ask General Solo for a favor. That's right, Han gave her a skeptical look. You said you needed my advice, and we got sidetracked. What do you need me for? There's actually someone else from your academy days we wanted to talk to you about, which replied. I'm not sure how well you would have known her. Do you remember Natasi Dalla? Han leaned back in his easy chair, whistling. Dalla. Yeah, I remember her. She wasn't easy to get to know, but we were on fairly friendly terms. Turns out women and gutter rats both got pretty much the same treatment from all the up there crust coralders. Go figure. Why do you want to know? Atril grimaced, but Han didn't know why. He also didn't quite understand the victorious smirk that Wedge sent Atril before he replied. She's been promoted to commander of the Imperial Fleet defending Corellia. She's the one who's been cutting apart our logistics for the last few months. Both of Han's eyebrows shot up. Dalla has. Does that mean someone in the Empire has finally started promoting based on talent? Or is the new Imperial Regent, what's his name, Hamir, or whatever, fixed on her the way Tarkin used to be? I don't know. We don't have a good enough understanding of the inner workings of the New Order after ISB's coup, Wood said. Either way, she's in command, and she's hurting us. She's done a good job of slowing our advance on Corellia, and made it nearly impossible to amass a concentration of force large enough to realistically threaten the planet. That doesn't surprise me, Han said thoughtfully. Dala always had the guts for an all-out slugging match, and she was clever too, meaner than all hell if she got cornered. At the academy she always gravitated towards ground tactics classes. He frowned, tapping his hand on his knee. I remember in the smaller tactical exercises, the ones where it was all about small unit tactics, she could struggle. She had a tendency to just bowl her way in and start blasting. Even when that worked, she suffered heavier casualties than the instructors wanted, and for the Imperial military, that's saying a lot. They didn't usually care about how many bodies were left behind, but in the big picture exercises, where she had strategic command, she'd be more methodical, had a real knack for finding unexpected ways to hurt her opponent. Wedge winced, clearly, that sounded all too familiar. She's doing the same thing to us now. So I might need you to put your general's cap back on for a bit so we can get some more insights into her. You know we generals don't have official caps, Han said, covering surprise with absurdity as he tried not to blink and give the game away. Are you really asking me to come back to service? He gestured at Jason and Jaina. I have my hands full here, you know. I know, but I might be anyway, which said seriously. This is all classified, of course but the rebellion on Corellia is getting hotter by the day. The Inner Council wants me to push my timetable hard to try to get the fleet in to free the planet before it can escalate. Han shook his head slowly and spoke pleadingly, Look, Wedge, I sympathize. And I'm happy to give you whatever aid you need, but my place is here now. I have to look after my wife and raise my kids. And Han's voice trailed away, and his cheeks actually got a bit pink. I'm happy here, Wedge. I was never happy wearing that uniform. You know I hate asking, said Wedge. I wouldn't if I didn't know it would save lives. Han swept his eyes around the room, which had suddenly grown silent and focused on him, which he hated. His gaze lingered on the warm, binary brightness of Jason and Jaina. Give me some time to think about it. I promise I'll be in touch. Luke could tell that Wedge wasn't satisfied with that answer that he would, given the chance, 
press Han again to return to the service to help with the Corellia campaign. But just as clearly, Wedge was willing to wait. Originally, Mara and Luke had planned to stop by the Solo residence just for a quick reunion with Han, Leia, and the kids. But Wedge had been there when they arrived, and the unexpected congregation persisted for several hours, complete with one Mia tantrum, which was halted only by the arrival of Winter and Leia. By then it was nearly dinner time, and while Wedge and Atrel made their goodbyes to return to Lusankaya, Leia had insisted that the others stay for the meal. So, instead of going back to the Jedi Consulate for dinner, Luke and Mara were put to work helping with the cooking. The dinner had been a happy one, despite the multitude of small familial issues and the larger political crises lurking just out of view. Mara, nearing her limit for group conversation, had attempted an escape, but Jaina and Jason had imitated their mother's persistence and lashed onto either leg. Unable to retreat, Mara had found herself impressed into additional duties and helped Leia put the twins to bed. She'd never done anything remotely like that before, and the entire experience had been a bizarre one. Not unpleasant, but bizarre. They were amazingly confident little creatures, and she suspected that Jason and Jaina were more confident than most. They also reminded Mara of Imperial Moths. If anything was not exactly as they wanted it, they'd throw a fit and the only way to make them happy was to fix it. When she'd been Emperor's hand it hadn't been her job to make people happy, but Aunt Mara had certain obligations and restrictions that the Emperor's hand had been unencumbered by. Now it was entirely dark outside. Coruscant's sun had set several hours before. Through the transparent steel window she could see the bright lights of the city below, and the pulsating lights and starship engine contrails above. Luke and Han were in the kitchen finishing cleanup. Tycho and Winter had retreated to their wing of the apartment with Mia. That left Mara sitting on the couch, staring out that window at the cityscape below, out at the scaffolding laden in Imperial Palace. The process of demolishing it had only recently begun, but it would take a long time to complete. Leia sat next to her, two mugs in her hands. Here, she said, and placed one mug on the side table next to Mara. Leia then took her own mug in both hands. Steam wafted from the top, the rich smell of hot chocolate a familiar one. Luke insisted. Mara couldn't help a small smile. Of course he did. I don't think they had many sweets on Tatooine, Leia said, her expression briefly one of self-recrimination. Luke doesn't blame you for being raised as a princess, you know, Mara said. I know, Leia sighed, though I'm not sure how much better that really makes it. It still seems unfair. But would Luke still be Luke if he'd been raised on Alderaan, Mara wondered. Core world refinement over Rimworld Patois. Would he still be her farm boy? I like him the way he is. That made Leia laugh, and she reached over to nudge Mara's shoulder. I know you do, she teased. Mara relented and swiped the hot chocolate. It really was too sweet, but that was fine. The Skywalker Solos had a way of making her not mind. Do you want to talk about this other Emperor's hand? Leia asked. Not really, Mara said. Do you need to? Mara shook her head. No, I don't think so. I've long since come to terms with Palpatine and his role in my life. But, Mara sighed heavily. How did Leia do that? But I do still wonder how things would be different if Palpatine had treated me differently. Is this other hand still working for the Empire on her own initiative? Or is she working for the Empire because Palpatine raised her to do different things? I like you the way you are, Leia said. The unexpected parallel startled Mara, but after a moment to consider it, she realized it was an appropriate one. Leia leaned against her side, offering unexpected, sisterly affection. You are who you are, Mara, she said warmly, and I've watched you get more comfortable in your own skin ever since we met in the palace. You were practically jumping out of it then. I wasn't alone in it, Mara grumbled. We all carry ghosts, Leia challenged gently. Not as literally as you did. Eventually we overcome them, or we don't. You have, or at least you're working on it. We all are. Antilles, which said something similar, before his carrot and offensive. I haven't had the time to really unpack it all. 
Mara paused, feeling a sudden pang of loss and longing. Instinctively she reached out in the forest to Luke and found him there, but not just Luke. Less intimate of a bond, but with the strength that started Mara, she found Leia. Luke's sister squeezed her arm, and Mara found herself talking without thinking about it first. It's hard, Mara admitted, the words spilling from her. I wake up, and at some points in the day it just hits me, and I feel so, robbed. Leia squeezed her arm again. To Mara's relief, Leia didn't take advantage of her sudden, unexpected vulnerability. Instead, Luke's sister steered the conversation back to safer ground, ground on which Mara felt she had stable footing. I can't imagine the interview with Aaron was salutary, Leia said. Mara barked a short laugh. Hartley, she groused, not that he wasn't kind about it, in his own way, but it was the way he just sat there listening. Kraken reminded Mara of a smarter, more subtle listen Isard, and the more time she spent with the head of New Republic Intelligence, the more she came to envision him as an old reptile basking in the sun, absorbing every little detail, slowly chewing off fact, like a lazy, satisfied Solonese gator. He did have to match wits with Isard, Ulleran and Palpatine, Leia said, and all by himself too. Not to mention some of the more difficult rebel cells who had their own priorities. She paused, all while raising his son. Aaron will never admit to it, but I think he kept Pash as separate from his work as he possibly could. Though that didn't stop Pash from staging one of the largest mass defections from the Empire before Endor. I suppose despite the Elder Kraken's best efforts, the son is very like the father, Mara commented lightly. It was Mara's turn to feel Leia's sudden swell of melancholy uncertainty. She wasn't used to offering comfort especially when she wasn't sure what she was offering comfort about, but she leaned towards Leia anyhow. Are you all right? Leia offered a soft, sad smile. It's funny how these thoughts sneak up on us. I was just thinking about Jason and Jaina, and all the fears I had to fight through before and after I became pregnant. After finding out that, well, about my birth father, I went through a few years where I was so sure I never wanted to have children. Guilt swelled in Mara. She hadn't meant to imply that. It's all right, Leia assured her. Really. I was scared of the thought of them growing up to become another Vader. But if we let fear dictate our decisions, that's the dark side too. Not quite as potent as anger and hate, but the dark side all the same. Han, and I had to face that fear. Now we'll raise them, and we'll be there for them as much as we can. And who knows? Maybe Jason will choose to be an award-winning botanist instead of a Jedi. She smiled wryly. Mara, thinking back to the time she'd been out with Jason and Luke, thought that botanist was probably not quite right. Exozoologist rather than botanist, I guess. Leia glowed with sudden approval. You noticed. It's hard not to notice. Jaina has an affinity for ships, Jason for animals, Mara pointed out. Though I'm told that childhood interests don't always persist into adulthood. Perhaps botanist has a chance, then Leia observed Riley. Mara noticed Luke watching them with Han near the kitchen, and felt her cheeks darken with blush. She was sipping her hot chocolate to try to cover it when Leia pounced. So, are you going to marry my brother? The question made Mara sputter and nearly spill her drink. She glared at Leia over the mug, carefully recovering her equilibrium. That's cheap, waiting until I'm holding a hot drink to ask me that. That's even worse than Han laundering the question through the twins. Leia smiled innocently. Maybe I'd just like watching you jump. What is it about Skywalkers and making me jump? Mara muttered under her breath. Leia just smiled enigmatically and leaned back. Mara basked in the comforting silence as the two women watched the unending flow of space traffic above below, and all around them. Once Luke and Mara had finally made their way out of the solo apartment, together of course, because Han barely ever saw them apart now, that left Han and Leia alone together. The hot chocolate mugs were cool and forgotten on the kitchen table. One of the monitors revealed Jason and Jaina were sleeping calmly, and the second revealed the small, sleeping form of Mia. Wedge asked me to reactivate my commission, Han admitted staring at one of the mugs. His fingers wrapped along the table. 
on a temporary, advisory basis as a member of his staff. I said no. Leia knew that tone of voice. She rested her head on his shoulder. But you're feeling obligated. Han made a disgruntled sound. Damn it, Leia, he sighed. I have obligations here too. I got obligations to you and the kids. I can't go gallivanting around the galaxy every time there's a threat. There's always a threat. Why does Wedge want you? The commander of the fleet he's facing is an old classmate of mine. She. She? Leia asked dryly. Han rolled his eyes. Leia, he drawled. I already told you a little about Dalla. His wife's expression soured slightly, doubtless remembering the connection with Tarkin when it had come up in an inner council briefing. You did? Go on. She was the commander who defeated Admiral Vante and prevented Pelian's defeat at Chazwa during Wedge's Karita campaign. We weren't exactly friends. Dalla didn't have friends. But we were classmates, and I was closer to her than most on account of us both being Lober charity cases. She's been very low profile since Yavin, and NRI doesn't have a lot of information about her. And you know her well enough to help Wedge beat her. Han shrugged. I know enough to guess what she might do, and I know Wedge. He's not just looking for an aide, he's looking for an aide he can work well with. And, I think if I go, fewer people are gonna die. He firmed his lips together. And I think Wedge could use the support. He's taken each loss hard since he took over Fifth Fleet. There was a pointed pause. But, Han shook his head, grumbling. You always know when to ask that. Leia ran her hand along his head, trying to put his hair into some kind of order. But, she prompted again. But I got out for a reason. If I get back in, it'd better be for a damn good one. You know we can't manage without you, Leia said. Han didn't have the force, but he could still see that his wife saying those words cut her to the bone. We can restore 3PO's programming for maintaining the apartment and cooking. And we have Kakmane and Miwal here with us too. I have Winter and Tycho here, and we can get Kite back from wherever Card has him stashed if the twins get really difficult. Replacing me with 3PO, Han groaned. Leia, you're not exactly making me feel great about this. I'm not trying to, she countered. But if you feel obliged, if you think this is important, Han, we can do it. Han rubbed his face. I'll figure it out in the morning. He might not know what he would decide. But Leia did. She tried not to let the somber weariness she felt show on her face. Instead, she took both of Han's hands in hers, bringing his movements to a stop. Come to bed. Chapter 8 Begin startup process. Startup process complete. Execute messenger. Installation process complete. Initiate reboot. In a dark storage room, MSE-1 sensory receptors activated. Visual, auditory, olfactory, and tactile sensors came online one after another. The little mouse droid then ran through the traditional test of his other systems. Its wheels were, and the droid shot forward a foot before it came to an abrupt halt. Then it slowly moved backwards until it returned to its original position. Then the droid carefully went through a slow, strenuous internal test of its software. The droid was not in the habit of beeping and surprise but it did note a few new updates to its logic and problem-solving subroutines. Checking to make sure that there were no threats to its ongoing functioning buried in the updates, MSE-1 confirmed that the update was the work of its maker and concluded that it was not a threat. The software did, however, instill MSE-1 with the sense of purpose that it had lacked before. MSE-1 was a testbed, Something his maker used to test ideas before their implementation on less limited droids. Its limitations had never bothered MSE-1 over much. It rather liked the constant innovation and change that came with his maker's experimentations. MSE-1's new sense of purpose, though, went well beyond its typical parameters. It considered how to fulfill its new primary objective. First, MSE-1 would need to escape from the storage room. The droid shot forward over the floor, his little light illuminating the room in front of it. Arriving at the door it came to a sudden stop and accessed its transmitter, attempting to see if it could access and override the door controls. 
to the droid's satisfaction, the door obediently slid open, and the first of the many hurdles that MSE-1 would have to overcome was surmounted. MSE-1's second hurdle was to confirm current location. According to its internal chronometer, the last noted activity registered in MSE-1's memory banks had occurred nearly a year before. MSE-1 was not a combat unit, and ill-suited to violent confrontations, but it clearly recalled attempting to ram the foot of a man dressed all in matte black armor who had, MSE-1 believed, been attempting to abscond with MSE-1's maker. Given that it had been a year since MSE-1 last saw its maker, and the content of the message that MSE-1 had been instructed to deliver, MSE-1 concluded that its threat assessment had been accurate and wished only that his ramming attempt had accomplished something more than a minor dent to his own forward plating. Rolling through the dark halls, MSE-1 recognized its location immediately. The droid had not been moved far from its previous location and remained on the grounds of the McGrody Institute of Programmable Intelligence, which was good. That eliminated the need for extensive exploration of its surroundings. MSE-1 therefore zoomed along the silent halls, making his way to the nearest lift so that it could rise to ground level. Like the storage closet door, the elevator was operable, and MSE-1 exchanged a bit of polite data transfer with the lift computer before sprinting towards the McGrody Institute's landing pad. MSE-1 was no pilot, so if it was to make the trip to Coruscant it would need both a pilot and a ship. The McGrody Institute of Programmable Intelligence, where MSE-1 had been constructed and programmed by its kindly maker, had undergone changes since the last time the droid had been active. MSE-1 noted, with a degree of sadness uncommon for one of its kind, that the Institute appeared to be abandoned. There were signs on the building which indicated that it was a crime scene, and many signs of combat. MSE-1 was not programmed for extensive auditory communication but it did beat mournfully during its brief examination. Investigating the state of the McGrody Institute was not part of MSE was priorities, however, and it resumed its expeditious journey towards the landing pad. As it traveled, MSE-1 considered and reconsidered the best way to achieve its new prime directive. Find the Jedi. Five days later, the cargo container that MSE-1 had stowed away and was hoisted out of a freighter and set down on the deck of one of the millions of landing pads on Coruscant. With all the activity, there were no fewer than 50 mid-sized bulk freighters being unloaded on this one landing pad alone. None of the sapiens noticed the cargo container pop open ahead of schedule. MSE-1 wiggled forward, struggling to break free from its spot, tightly packed between two enormous containers of foodstuffs. Eventually, after a few laborious minutes of effort, MSE-1 popped free, the little droid happily burst out into the main hangar, grateful both to be out of the stifling confines of the container. MSE-1 had deactivated its olfactory sensors to avoid registering the pungent odors and running down its charge. The little droid luxuriated in the sunlight. The two-day journey had taken a toll on MSE-1's batteries, but now its solar arrays could recharge them. After persuading an older, dignified building lift that a messenger droid wasn't a security threat, MSE-1 found a nice spot at the top of a nearby building and basked in the Coruscant sunlight as it interrogated the planetary computers to find Jedi as it had been instructed. Luckily, information about the Jedi was easy to come by. Unluckily, it was too easy to come by, and mouse droids were not typically programmed to sort through large masses of information. Undeterred, the droid started by simply throwing out lots of information, it queried a local media analysis center disregarded anything categorized as sludge news, and shuffled through everything reputable using a special algorithm its maker had helped it learn. Once that was done, MSE-1 ran a search for anything that might be a location. Realizing this error as the number still came back far too large, it narrowed the search to only locations on Coruscant. As his batteries finished charging, the droid evaluated what it had learned. The Jedi and MSE-1 was beginning to understand what a Jedi was, although all the references to a force were perplexing in the extreme, had recently been given a small tower in the embassy district. Diverting some of his subroutines to determine how best to travel there, MSE-1 otherwise remained focused on the tower. The new Jedi consulate was in essence a Jedi embassy to the New Republic, 
a location that the members of the New Jedi Order could use as a base on Coruscant while conferring with the New Republic. The news articles evidently found this a curious development, as the Jedi had traditionally been part of the Republic, but many of the commentators and commentaries MSE1 review talked about how Jedi Skywalker had chosen to adopt a more hands-off relationship with the New Republic. None of this really mattered for MSE1's mission. It just needed to find the Jedi, after all. But MSE1 had always been a curious droid, an affectation granted by his creator, or a spontaneous personality development. MSE1 wasn't sure, and so MSE1 continued its investigations. Before becoming the consulate, the building had apparently been the embassy from a planet called Tupra. Its internal sensors alerted MSE-1 that its batteries had reached an optimum level of charge. Querying its ongoing travel subroutine, MSE-1 produced a plan for getting to the Jedi Consulate. First, MSE-1 considered it would need to acquire a ride. Surely there was an airspeeder somewhere nearby? The Jedi Consulate, previously the Tapron Embassy, was not the tallest building in the Embassy District. It was, in fact, one of the smallest buildings, but it had more than enough space for a Jedi Order that was still very small in number, with sleeping chambers for a dozen nights, a kitchen, and refectory meditation chambers, a meeting room in which all the Jedi could confer at once, and a landing pad. Currently, a trio of women were congregated in one of the sleeping chambers, the one with the largest closet, and two of them grappled over clothing. Merrick's Tarek Horn watched, trying not to laugh as Terry Sarkin offered Karana tea yet another outfit. The dithomery which was clearly uncomfortable, everything about Karuskin made the poor woman uncomfortable, but given that Karana tea had never before been off her homeworld, it wasn't at all surprising that she found Karuskin overwhelming, and while Terry was being as old and approachable as she could be, none of her efforts were succeeding. Karana T clung to her traditional armor and clothes with a ferocity that would have been alarming if Myrix didn't understand it. Finding herself in a place so utterly unlike anything at home, Karana T held fast to the things she did understand. Things as mundane as her normal clothes were suddenly the only thing that Karana T understood, and she wasn't going to relinquish them. Even if every Coruscanti they passed stared at the lizard armor clad, spear wielding warrior woman, she was not. It's all right, Tyria, Merrick's interjected gently. For now, Karana T isn't going anywhere that would require formal wear, and it's not like there aren't tens of thousands of cultures that come to Coruscant every day and wear their own clothes. She might not blend in around the Manta Ray district, but it's really not important. Oh, all right, Terry pouted. I just don't want her to get taken for a ride because she looks like she flew in on a Thranta. Luke would have my hide. I have ridden many rankers, Karanati pronounced, her tone a combination of pride and confusion. I failed to see why that would cause Jai Skywalker to skin you. Karana T, Tyria looked at each other. Karana T and Tyria with mounting confusion, Tyria was starting to stammer an explanation, and Merrick's finally laughed, breaking the tension and pausing the discussion. The two of them are a pair, Merrick's thought, with Tyria just the one to welcome the witch to Jedi training. Trained in the tradition of the Antarian Rangers, Tyria, was not the strongest for sensitive in Luke Skywalker's nascent Jedi Order, but she was determined and enthusiastic and made up for her weaknesses in other ways. One of those ways, in fact, was that Tyria was from Tapra, a planet reduced to barbarism by the Empire for aiding the rebellion. The fact that she had officially joined Luke's Order as a Jedi candidate had, Merrick's was sure, been a significant consideration in the Tapran government's decision to give their former embassy building to the Jedi. Having one of their own in the tiny new order was a point of pride. Though the complex had ample room for dwelling, and even its own small hangar, it was not meant to be the home of the new Jedi order, the Imperial Purge was too fresh in everyone's minds to tie them to any concrete location as their permanent home. But Luke's decision to open the embassy as a formal connection between the Jedi and the New Republic was an outstretched hand to Mon Mothma and the members of the New Republic, all of whom were now welcome to request Jedi services through the embassy. Well, maybe you can teach me some of your spells, Tyria suggested, overcoming the awkwardness. 
I've never been the strongest in the Force, but Luke said that I might be able to use the Thaumari spells with more ease than traditional Jedi techniques. And when my husband gets back, you can all have some lessons, Merrick suggested. I think Strain is up on the roof watching the clouds again. Her next words caught in her throat. That was the sound of a repulse oil engine, and not one that was running efficiently. She moved to the window, Tyria and Karana T both followed. As they watched, the airspeeder that was making that hideous screeching sound jolted. Merix gasped, suddenly afraid that it might fall out of the sky, but the pilot recovered, barely. The airspeeder made a groaning sound and fell the six feet that separated it from the landing pad, striking the pad with a heavy metallic crash that sounded worse than it was. Smoking and sparking, the ear-testing screech of the airspeeder's malfunctioning repulse or lift finally died. Come on, said Tyria, and she and Karana T took off running. Merix followed at a walk. She was pregnant, after all and she was far enough along now that the son she carried refused to let her forget it. When she arrived at the landing pad, she found Teria and Karana T tearing the airspeeder's doors open, then looking at each other in perplexed confusion. Do you feel anything with the force? Teria asked. Karana T shrugged her shoulders. I could cast a spell of awareness, she suggested warily, as if Teria's suggestion was not one she fully understood. But... I can't tell if I can't sense anything because I'm too weak or because there's nothing here to find. I don't see anyone. Tyria sounded frustrated. Merix waved her hand to remove some of the smoke. Coming closer, she rose up gingerly onto her toes to peer into the airspeeder's interior. There was no one inside. The doors were locked, Tyria said. I managed to slice the lock open, but I don't see anyone in here. A sudden, terrible thought occurred to Merix. Do you think it could be another Inquisitorious assassination attempt? Another bomb? Tyria shook her head reassuringly. No. That was the first thing I thought of, but the scanners that Mara had installed would never have let the speeder land if there were explosives aboard. Besides, I know bombs. Well, my husband knows bombs, and we met on the job. If it was going to blow up, I'm sure it would have detonated when it crashed. That was only mildly reassuring. Well, maybe we should call Mara and get her here, Merrick said firmly. She would feel better if Luke, Mara, Cam, or Corrin were here. Any one of the Jedi who were closer to fully trained would make her feel better. But until they got here, have you checked the cargo compartment? Tyria and Karana T looked at each other. Karana T clearly familiar with airspeeders despite Dathomir's low technology state, pulled the door open. From the cargo door came a plume of smoke, and Merix jumped back in surprise as a tiny mouse droid leapt from the cargo compartment. Its little wheels spun wildly in the air before it landed on his head, making beeping sounds of utter misery. Little flaps worked wildly, and tiny plumes of smoke emerged from the little droid's interior. A messenger droid asked Tyria in astonishment as Merix aimed a small sniffer at it. Looks like, Merix said, waving her other hand to wash away the added smoke that had come from the cargo compartment. Thankfully, her quick test came back negative. Nothing explosive on it. Call Luke. He has a better rapport with droids than the rest of us. I suspect this droid wouldn't have come in so much haste if it didn't have a very important message. Let's see if we can't get it fixed up. Luke watched in amusement as the mouse droid wheeled in a tight circle around R2, the larger Astromatch's head spinning to follow. Just watching them made him slightly dizzy, so he turned to look at Karana T and Terry instead. It crashed on the landing pad. Luke and Mara's small apartment in the Jedi Consulate wasn't someplace they considered home. They were, after all, rarely here. Much of the last few months had been spent away from Karuskin. Luke had been recruiting new Jedi candidates, and Mara had either been with him or traveling with Merix and getting her set up as the new liaison between the Smugglers' Alliance and the New Republic's government. Home, certainly for Mara, was aboard the Tempered Metal. For Luke, home was wherever Mara was. He hid that thought, though, or Mara would certainly tease him, not that he really would mind. Karana T leaned on her spear. 
the blunt end of which rested on the carpet that covered the floor of his living room, watching the droid go round and round. The machine arrived with great haste, she said. Perhaps too much. The little droid definitely isn't pilot material, Merrick said, sounding amused. Thankfully, other than wrecking the airspeeder, it didn't cause much additional damage. Terrier is getting the landing pad cleared away now. It shouldn't take much longer. What does it want? Asked Mara suspiciously. She watched the mouse droid skeptically, as if convinced it was a spy. The mouse droid noticed her suspicious gaze, made a tremulous sound, and hid behind R2, quivering. It just said it needed to meet the Jedi, Merrick said with a shrug. At least according to my data pad. The droid sustained some damage in the crash, but as far as I can tell it's functioning well now. It did not wish to share his message with the mere Jedi candidate, Karana T added. It's very energetic for a mouse droid, commented Luke watching the mouse droid and just way to one side of R2, quiver when it caught sight of Mara still watching it, and then retreat back behind the rotund safety of Luke's astromech. And quirky. He circled around R2 to loom above the mouse droid, which rolled back a foot. It's all right, he said soothingly. I'm Jedi Luke Skywalker. These are my friends, Jedi Mara Jade, Karana T, and Traitor Mirix Tarek. The mouse droid made a quiver and beep, but this time there was a distinct note of relief in that tone. Luke glanced down at his data pad as information was sent by the droid to the pad. My maker sent an E. Vital message to be delivered to the Jedi. Good, Luke said, in that same soothing tone of voice. You were very brave, and I am a Jedi. What is this vital message? The droid shared his message. When it was done, Luke looked at Mara, feeling a sense of quiet dread from her that he shared. We need to call a conclave and decide what to do. She nodded. Everyone who is on Coruscant. And Leia too. Both because she should know and as a representative of the government. R2 moaned mournfully. Asterisk. When Luke put out the call, nearly every force sensitive, from Leia down to Karana T, and are around the new Jedi Order arrived within a few days. There were a few absences. Kype was gone with Carr's reluctance to have hollow net transceivers on his ships, there was no way to contact him, and even if there had been Luke was more than willing to let the young man find his own way without the added burdens of Jedi responsibility. Corrin Horn likewise was absent, though his wife Merrix was present. His ties to the Jedi remained nebulous, but he had come to Luke asking for training, and Corrin and Cam had become close collaborators since then. The pair had been integral in opening formal relations with the Jinsurei, the first non-Jedi, non-Sith organization of Force sensitives the new Jedi Order had formally met. Kim had been forced to redline the engines on his shuttle, Serena, to return to Coruscan from the Jinsurei homeworld to Sefi, where he had been in consultation with the Sare Car. Now Kim sat on the far side of the circle of Jedi Knights and apprentices in white and brown robes that matched Luke's own a pillar of strength Luke knew he could rely on. Next to Cam was Tian, her redoubtable double vial resting in her lap and her chair pivoted to the side. Her feet rested across a clearly not entirely comfortable but not entirely uncomfortable Cam's lap. She strummed his strings idly, offering a hint of somber, serious music to the light-filled space. Large windows looked out over the Coruscant skyline, late afternoon sun streaming through and illuminating the circle of plain chairs. She had become fast friends with fellow Force-sensitive Silgal, who was on Mon Cala completing her advanced courses in Xenobiology. Of the five other chairs, four were filled. Mara sat across from Luke, next to Tion. Their relationship was hardly secret, and the physical separation was no doubt intentional. Mara was ever aware and wary of anything that smacked, even remotely, as an abuse of power. As the Emperor's hand, Palpatine had used her to excise the most corrupt specifically, those who were corrupt without Palpatine's blessing on their corruption, and her distaste for political malfeasance had only grown with the revelation of just how badly Palpatine had abused her trust. The fact that they were in a relationship was acknowledged, but never discussed in Luke's hearing by any of the other Jedi, with the singular exception of Tion, who was writing a song about them that Mara hated, and while Luke intended for the new Jedi Order to manage, 
itself as a collaborative body. That collaboration would have distinct undertones if he and Mara were always a cohesive unit and their preferences always one. He wasn't too worried about that, though. The likelihood of Mara always agreeing with him was close to zero. That was part of her charm. Karana T, Tyrius Arkin, and Streen filled three more chairs. Karana T was still obviously out of place on Karuskin. At that moment, she was looking out over the skyline, and her four sense loop could feel a combination of dread and awe and wonder. He was confident the warrior witch would adjust, but he was just as sure that she would be happier if she spent most of her time away from ecumenopolizes like Karuskin. Tyria sat next to her, talking at her more than with her, and Luke felt a real sense of pride at all Tyria had accomplished. Her gift in the Force was limited, and there had been a time Luke had concluded that he could not train her to be a Jedi because of that, and said as much to her face. Tyria took it with more grace than Luke had taken Yoda's initial refusal, but her hurt had been palpable as she left. It was his own later experience with Lanu Pacific, an Inquisitor, he had slain on Jun, who had once been a failed Jedi candidate, changed his mind. Yes, Tyria's gifts were limited, but she could still sense the Force and use it for guidance, even if she might never be his own equal in telekinesis or lightsaber combat. Luke was increasingly convinced that the guidance the Force offered was far more important to a Jedi than the flashier powers, and Tyria had become more centered, calm, and confident in herself and her judgment. Besides, Tyria had been trained by the last of the Antarian Rangers, an auxiliary of non-force sensitives who had for centuries supported the Jedi Knights in times of need. If the Jedi were to be effective when they were so few in number they would need the Antarian Rangers, or a similar organization, to be reborn from the ashes that remained after Palpatine's persecutions. The last of them, at least until Leia finally arrived, was Stream. Stream was older, older even than Cam and he remained the least confident. Unlike every other of Luke's new order, Stream was not a fighter in either temperament or ability. He also was not a diplomat, an extremely introverted figure. Stream's inability to control his gifts for empathy and telepathy had driven the older pilot prospector into extreme isolation in the clouds of Bespin. Lando had discovered him after retaking Cloud City, and Mara had persuaded him to join the Jedi. Streen now spent most of his time in quiet contemplation, no longer finding all the minds of the sentience of Coruscan overwhelming, and was instead able to just sit and appreciate the wonders of life and the Force. Luke wouldn't call Streen a seer, as he hadn't displayed any particular inclination towards prophecy, but the old man had proven to be adept at teaching the others to listen to the Force and let it guide their actions, which made sense, given that Streen had spent a lot time gas prospecting doing just that. Luke wondered how much better he himself would have been at moisture farming if he hadn't been so restless. He checked his chrono and sighed. Leia had said she would be here. So where's Corin anyway? Mara asked Merix. Merix frowned slightly. I can't tell you, because I don't know. Right before Ela asked me to take her to find you on Dathomir, he got a message from his grandfather. She shrugged her slim shoulders raising her hands in a gesture of uncertainty. He asked my permission to sneak home for a while, said that he had some place important he needed to be. She shrugged. I come from smugglers. I know how it is. But I told him he'd better be back before my due date or he'd never have a shot at having more children. That sent a soft laugh around the room. There are all kinds of rumors out of Corellia, Tyria said. I'm not sure, of course but it wouldn't surprise me if my old compatriots are involved in them. She offered a sympathetic smile to Merix. My own husband is off somewhere on a secret assignment himself. It comes with the territory, I guess. Merix gave her a tight, commiserating nod. Maybe we should just get started, Luke said unhappily. If Leia got called into a meeting of the Inner Council, who knows how long it will be before she... The sound of an airspeeder landing on the consulate's landing pad stopped him. He glanced out the window and saw Leia rushing towards the building, a pair of nori flanking her on either side, and smiled. I may have spoken too soon, he said. Leia came in through the door less than a minute later, breathing heavily, her forehead with a slight sheen of sweat. I'm sorry I'm late, 
she exclaimed. Senator Medano was briefing us on the crisis on Corellia, though I'm afraid we still don't know much. She glanced around the circle of Jedi and put herself in the seat between Stream and Karanati. You didn't have to wait for me, but you know, I'm not a Jedi. Luke resisted reminding her that she could be. She already knew and she didn't need him pestering her about it. This is of critical interest to the New Republic as well as the Jedi, he said instead. He looked around the circle and hesitated. He'd imagined a moment like this many times since Yoda and Obi-Wan had tasked him to rebuild the Jedi. Now that it was here, he wasn't sure how to start. Thank you all for coming, he said. This afternoon, a mouse droid arrived at the consulate. It hijacked an airspeeder and crashed on the landing pad, interjected Mara dryly. And it carried a message I think you should all see. Luke nodded at Leia. After this, I believe you should take the droid to General Kraken. And if he finds the message credible, brief the inner council. Is that serious? Leia asked, sitting up straight. It called, Luke demurred. MSE-1, would you please come out from wherever you are hiding? There was a soft whir of wheels across tiles. The small mouse droid wheeled out from under Strain's chair slowly, as if nervous, coming to an awkward stop in roughly the center of the circle of chairs. Go ahead, Luke encouraged. The droid rolled forward a few inches, then back again. Then it projected into the center of the room a hollow image. The man in the image was not old, but despite a strong featured face and large frame, he appeared gaunt and haggard accompanied by a cybernetic brace and his hand trembled as he talked. His voice was even more pronounced, tremulous, and with a constant edge of pain. My name is Dr. Niches Mar, the man said. I'm a cyberneticist from the McGrody Institute. My partner, Dr. Cray Mingla, and I were kidnapped by the Empire. I'm not sure how long exactly, but I think it's been almost a year. We have been forced to work for the Empire on something they call Silencer Station. Silencer Station is some kind of massive industrial facility managed by droids. They needed Kray's expertise to develop a command interface that would allow the new emperor to personally command it. Nietzsche's glanced fearfully over his shoulder, grimaced and shook his head hastily. I don't have time. They're going to be through the door any second. Silencer Station is an incredibly capable manufacturing platform and is growing all the time. It consumes material to create whatever it wants with incredible speed. When we arrived, it was the size of a Star Destroyer. Now it's at least three, maybe four times larger. The program director is Reganda Icemarin. The hologram again glanced behind him, then started speaking faster, his words almost blurring together. She's driven and insane, and she will kill Cray and me when she's finished with us. She's leaving today for NAR Shada, NAR Shada, to find an artifact that will complete the station. The fear and dread in Nietzsche's expression was all too clear, even in the fuzzy hello recording. If this station isn't already complete, I dread to imagine what it would do once it is. There was a pause and the sound of banging. Please, you have to stop her. And please, now there were tears in his eyes, and Luke felt an upsell of emotion from the Jedi around the room in response to the plea, one that echoed his own sudden burst of sorrow. You have to help Cray. I'm already dying. She's brilliant and beautiful, and she's killing herself trying to save me. Please, please, help her. With that, the image fuzzed out. MSE-1 made a soft, sad sound. The circle of alarmed Jedi was silent. Asterisk. Deciding what to do about the alarming message was even harder than hearing it. Pain poured off Leia in waves. Whispers of Alderaan before she harshly clamped down on her emotions and stopped broadcasting while the other Jedi spoke fitfully. It sure is a good thing we're having this meeting, Tian said cheerfully, pulling the room's attention towards her like the seasoned performer she was. I'm much less worried about things. Imagine if we were leaders on the other side. I bet there's a parade of moths all sitting around one of those long tables, holding one of their moffrances. She waved her hand dismissively, croaking dark greetings, and all that imp silliness. I can't see them now, her voice trailed off, becoming almost trance-like, sitting around that table and worrying about us. That sent a chuckle around the table. Luke cleared his throat, restoring seriousness to the proceedings. 
We need to send people to an AR shadow. You and I will go, Mara said firmly. That drew eyes to her. She gazed back with a firm, serious expression that carried more than a hint of stony anger. It did sound familiar, Merrix agreed slowly. You think this Raganda Icemarin is our Emperor's hand? I do, Mara replied bluntly. This surely was one of Palpatine's secret projects that should have died when he did. There is no one better suited to hunt an Emperor's hand than me. Send a hand to kill a hand, Luke thought dimly. She wasn't wrong, and he was definitely not letting her go alone. We'll go, he agreed. What about the rest of us? Cam pointed out. He gestured at the others in the circle. Would more of us be helpful or harmful? Next to him, Tion sat up. I still haven't managed to repair the holocron fully after what Xr Kun did to it, she said. But I know I can, eventually. If there's an ancient force artifact out there, Master Sunrider and Master Boss, and the other guardians of the holocron will know about it, maybe. At least one Jedi needs to stay on Coruscant, Leia added. We need someone who can serve as the Jedi ambassador to the Senate. She looked at Cam, who winced and nodded. What about the rest of us? Tyria asked. Luke looked at Mara. She looked back at him from across the table, and Luke could tell, as he always could, now that she was thinking the same as he was. If the Empire had found a way to manufacture war material in large quantities, then the war was not over after all. Thrawn had failed in his offensive against the New Republic because of a lack of ships and a lack of men. A mysterious manufactory capable of producing ships and droids would be an unexpected multiplier of imperial strength, and that meant it could be an unexpected multiplier of the harm the Empire could do. And the Empire was no longer the one that had been ruled by Thrawn, one which was focused exclusively on military victory. No, defeat after defeat had brought to power the worst of the Imperial hardliners, had empowered ISB and the Inquisitorius people who thought back to Alderaan and believed, with all their hearts, that terror attacks on that scale were both effective and right. Give those people power, and what would they do with it? He turned his attention to Tyria. We, the Jedi, must do two things, he said. We must try to find this silencer station, so that the New Republic can destroy it. And we must be ready to help anyone who needs it when the time comes. Chapter 9 the message pinged from the comm console on the far side of her quarter stole a sorry Rogers focus. With a soft, semi-petulant sigh, a sorry put down the book she was reading, Stellar Duty, an absorbing family saga set during the stark hyperspace war that she'd stolen from her father's shelf on Agonizer the last time she had been aboard, setting it on her nights and neck to the glass of wine and what was left of her evening snack. The windows set into the wall of the officers' quarters aboard Termigant were all false, piped in from external data feeds. Both the ship's bridge and Asori's quarters were buried deep under the hull armor of the ship for maximum protection, one of the many design alterations the URF had made to the traditional Imperial designs, and therefore she had no view out on open space. Not that there was anything to see, even the mostly empty starscape wasn't visible to anyone aboard at the moment. Hidden under a cloaking shield, Termigant and her three sisters were silent and still, immersed in perfect blackness. But that cloaking shield also meant that no communications could reach the flotilla. To stay in contact with Admiral Pelian, therefore, Asori regularly dispatched small craft and probe droids to edge just beyond the cloaking shroud long enough to send and receive updates. She checked the chrono, and sure enough one of those periscope craft had just returned. The message that was now waiting for her surely had been delivered that way. She pressed the blinking button as she settled into her desk chair. The image formed into the familiar face of the commanding officer she knew best. The collar of his uniform was unsnapped, and his face was unschooled, and she smiled fondly as Taryn Rogger spoke with a warm humor kept under tight rein in every other aspect of his life. Oh, sorry, I just want you to know that I recorded this message while I was off duty and I requested it be delivered to Termigan while you were off duty. That way I could speak to you as your father, and not as your superior officer. Asori rolled her eyes, smiling. 
This had been a long-standing tradition between the two of them, a way to reckon with his frequent absences. He often pushed her to step outside of the well-defined, regimented roles of superior and inferior officer and take the much less well-defined roles of father and daughter. She never led him, of course. The Imperial Starfleet was a professional force, and she always intended to play that part to perfection. But to her surprise, gentle amusement wasn't what she saw on her father's face. Instead, there was a sad seriousness. I know you just laughed at me, but I'm not joking. Sometimes I feel like it's been years since the last time we got to be family. Her father sighed softly. I still remember the last time we were all together on Annexus, before the New Republic captured it. I think back, and that was the last time, wasn't it? The last time we were really family. After her mother's passing, she, her brother Tarek, and their father had aligned their leaves to return home on her parents' wedding anniversary. It became a tradition they maintained for five years, but the fall of Annexus had made its continuation impossible. The last time they'd been together had been particularly somber. Had her mother still been alive, it would have been Taryn and Astora's 30th wedding anniversary. They'd made an effort to keep the gathering light, but by the end of the evening, and halfway through a fourth bottle of wine, there had been quite a lot of tears. Her heart clenched at the anguish on her father's face, and for the first time she realized that all her very necessary efforts to maintain the formal distance required by their shared profession had not just been a shared joke. Since Baron Fell brought us out of the Empire proper, I've been thinking a lot about the choices I made. You know your mother wanted me to resign from the judicial forces when Palpatine formally reformed us into the Imperial Starfleet, and you know I didn't. I chose to stay in the fleet because it was all I knew. I was still a young man then, but I spent my whole life in the service, and I had no idea what else I could go or what else I could do. Being a fleet officer was my whole life, with Venators more of a home to me than Annexes at that point. He looked away and sighed. In some ways, I was more married to the fleet than I was to your mother. He shook his head sadly, slowly. But if I'd known then the consequences that decision would have for you, I'd like to think I would have made a different choice. Uh, sorry, you joined the fleet because you thought you had to. The pressure was so much greater for you, growing up on annexes. For an accent, the fleet isn't just a profession, it is a way of life, and everyone expected you and Tarek to follow in my footsteps. And so I have to ask, Asori, did you ever feel like you had a choice? Because I know you felt like you didn't have a choice after you started at the Academy. The Imperial Starfleet is not something you can simply leave, not without severe repercussions. But you didn't just survive your time there, you thrived. In my life, my proudest moment was your graduation ceremony. You had accomplished so much, and had proven you were capable, that you had so much to give. But, and forgive me, a sorry, I had a long talk with Gilad after our meeting with Grandma Farrows. The old fellow is dealing with rather a lot himself, I'm afraid. All the choices he's made over the years are a lot to come to terms with. All the choices I made are. But then I realized that you never had a choice. A sorry half raised a hand and formed her mouth to object, before stopping. Her father wasn't there, this wasn't a live communication so she couldn't give him the response he needed, she wanted to give. She wanted to tell him that he was wrong, that she had plenty of choices. A childhood on Annexus had pressured her to join the fleet, but she didn't need to cave to that pressure. He would have been able to assure that. And so I just wanted to tell you that I was sorry. I wish, her father paused, and lifted a snifter of liquid to his lips, took a sip, and put it back down again. I wish I'd listened to your mother, he said finally. And I love you, and I'm so proud of you, and I want you to know that now you do have a choice. I know you won't abandon your ship or your crew, any more than I could abandon Agonizer. But when this is over, when we finished off the New Order and the galaxy really has a chance to start over, I want you to know that whatever you do, I just want you to make your own choices, not choose to do things because I did them on, because you felt like you had to make me proud. And I wanted to tell you this now, because I don't know when we'll next have the chance to just be father and daughter, and not admiral and captain. I've lost too many opportunities over the years already. Too many. 
Her father straightened and took another sip from his glass. Well, that's all I had to say, uh, sorry. I've recorded something similar for Tarek. His lips quirked in that gently amused smile she had first expected. I mean, that's all, Captain Rogers, he corrected. Go finish your wine, enjoy my book, and get some sleep. Your crew needs you rested and relaxed. The screen blinked out. The lower right corner illuminated. Recording complete, it said. Replay. She sniffled and told the computer to save the recording for another time. She felt her belly crawl with remembered tension and an Imperial Admiral expressing doubt through official communication methods. Had they been, with the new order, this message would have been monitored and gone into her father's official record. It probably, no, definitely, would have earned him a psych evaluation. Just the fact that he had been willing to send it at all revealed everything she needed to know about the differences between the New Order and the Europh. For the next few minutes, she paced slowly around her quarters, finishing her wine. The next time she saw her father, she promised herself she'd make an opportunity to put the uniforms away for a while so they could talk. And she should make the effort with Tarek, too, because how long had it been since she and her brother had? Her reverie was shattered by a shrill battle klaxon, and instantly a sorry transformed from Terran Rogra's daughter into Termagant's commanding officer. She slapped the bridge intercom. Status report. Sir, the sentry picket just ducked in under the cloak and shroud, came the voice of her Chiss executive officer, her professional tones finally spiced with an undercurrent of nervousness. They report the arrival of at least eight Imperial-class Star Destroyers. It looks like the New Order is mounting a full assault. Send to squadron, stand to action stations, and heat up the guns, she said, nearly by rote, slapping an anti-intoxicant stem patch on her arm as she grappled with her uniform. I'm en route to the bridge. Admiral Pelian and Commander Dreef huddled over the combat plot on Chimera's bridge, watching as the enemy ships came out of hyperspace. Sensors and scouts now report 12 M stars and three diamond formations, Dreef said, hand to his ear and confirming what the sensors were feeding the table. Messy reversion, but they're formed now and are approaching our perimeter on conversion trajectories. Pelian's hand skimmed over the map to trace the routes of the enemy star destroyers. Whoever was in command of this new order fleet had adopted a relatively straightforward strategy for concentrating firepower. It wasn't Dalla he could tell that immediately from the shaky nature of the formation. His own fleet was outnumbered, but not as badly as the raw numbers indicated. A dozen of his enforcers were still absent, receiving repairs and refits at Neron, but he still had his own four Imperials, Chimera, Exigent, Gunfalon, and Basilisk. That meant he had eight fewer of the class than the enemy, but he also had 30 Enforcer-class heavy cruisers and a strong advantage in starfighters. With that force distribution, had he been in command of the enemy force, he would not have mounted this assault. The irony of that last fact was not lost on him. Pelian had grown used to lacking starfighter strength compared to the New Republic, but Caritas Pilas had chosen to join to him in overwhelming numbers and that advantage persisted. After Caritas' loss, the New Order had neither the manufacturing to produce TIE fighters nor the academies to train pilots in any significant numbers. We're going to go out to meet them as they hit the perimeter, he decided. They're going to try to englobe us so they can get as many of their batteries on us as possible, but they've also divided their forces. If we can crush one of the three formations quickly, we can deal with the remaining two in turn. He quickly manipulated the map, designating the enemy groups as Orek, Besh, and Kresh. Commander Dreef, please dispatch the following instructions. His Saturnite subordinate paused, attentive, with two fingers to his earpiece again, and waited for the word. It was not long in coming as Pelian thought, sketched a plan, and spoke with cool deliberation. Orders to Captain Evander to take four enforcers and her as Auric group, delaying tactics only. To Captain Heeshear, take another four enforcers and keep Besh group honest, but there to stay within the firing envelope of Argolans. Get me a heavy edge formation with the rest. Enforcers to engage once our Star Destroyers have their attention. We're going to kill Crash Formation before they can converge. Engines, to flank speed, we're going to want as much flexibility as possible. 
He nodded, looked over to Lieutenant Shell, who stood attentively. Exeku. Status change. Pelian stopped before he could finish giving the order and turned to examine the plot. The enemy formations had suddenly proliferated on the sensor screen. The large icons representing Star Destroyers were surrounded by a multiplying cloud of much smaller icons. To his astonishment, those icons doubled, and then doubled again, and then doubled again. It was impossible. The New Order couldn't have that many ties. There weren't enough TIE pilots left in the whole New Order. They must have taken every TIE pilot from every garrison left in the Remnant, not to mention every pilot in Dallas undermanned squadrons in the Corps. And even then they should not have these numbers. His ties would be outnumbered three to one. Sir, they're not typical designs, Tree said, his voice thankfully calmer than Pelion's own Polak's thoughts. They look slightly smaller than a typical tie, and I've never seen that wing configuration before. Launch our fighters, Pelion ordered, reassessing his battle plan. His enforcers were more capable anti-star fighter platforms than his star destroyers, and those ties were suddenly the most pressing threat to his squadron. Rescind previous orders. Destroyers adopt standard box formation, with enforcers in a double-layer anti-fighter screen, rotating at the discretion of each division commander. Guns, prepare for incoming fighters. Asterisk. Baron fell. On the authority of the Grand Moth, I really must insist. Suter fell ignored Pharaoh's protocol droid as it harangued him. He was already in his favorite flight suit, the one with the perfect amount of wear to fit just right, and his tight defender, painted with the classic red stripes of the 181st that he ordered the text to adorn his unit's fighters with for the better part of decades now from back when they'd been the 180 worst, was already humming on his launch gantry, ready for a pre-flight check. Elsewhere in the private hangar, the other three defenders of his flight were likewise prepared for action. Grandma Farrows insists that it is too dangerous for you to risk yourself in starfighter combat. Baron fell. Tell Farrows that I'm safer in my cockpit than I am in his strategy room, fell retorted without looking at the droid and that he is not my superior, and he cannot give me orders anyway. The droid huffed indignantly. This is quite irregular. I have lodged several protests. Fell smiled darkly as he grabbed his helmet off his stand and hooked up the oxygen hose to see that you do, but be warned that you and the Grand Moth will be in line behind my wife. Sir, chittered the droid, your wife does not outrank the Grand Moth. That's what why owe you think, Fell growled pulling on his helmet before he climbed up the ladder. He jumped into the cockpit and dogged the hatch closed above him before keying his helmet calm. Worse leader, ready for launch. Worse too, ready for launch, echoed Turfinner from his wing. The hard blonde had been with Fell and the 181st for a long time and had been one of the first people Fell had recruited out of the Empire after rising to command of the URAF. Finner was of the perspective that Fell had essentially become the emperor of his own little square of space, and if Finner had to choose a warlord to follow, he would choose Fell. Fell didn't think of it that way, but he used what he had. Worst three, ready for launch, came a second voice. Chiss pilots didn't usually fly tight defenders, but Fell's personal guard knew the importance of being able to travel through imperial space without drawing undue attention. Worst four, Engines and shields green, lasers charged. Orders, sir, asked Finner. The new order seems to have found a number of ties somewhere, Fell said. I know we're only four fighters, but we're going to reinforce Admiral Pelian's squadrons and provide some upfront leadership. Four fighters against 600, Finner mused. I've seen worse odds, but not many. Fell could almost see Finner's sardonic smile. Maybe after this, Rebel pilots will stop going on and on about how we've never dealt with the odds they have. We do have a few hundred on our side, too, pointed out four, a legalistic Chandralin pilot who had been with Fell since Dara IV. Worst flight? Launch. Fell ordered sharply. Using the fighter's repulse orlifts, he lifted it six meters off the ground, then pitched the fighter back. As the gravity pulled him down, he pulsed the fighter's engines and sent it roaring into Palm Major Sky, his wingmates trailing him. Asterisk. 
Moff Willem Disra watched with satisfaction as the battle began, only flicking a few nervous glances at the center of Invincible's bridge, where Emperor Regent Hamir sat silently on an encompassing throne like Palpatine's that he'd had installed for the mission. The crew watched together as the first flashes of turbolaser fire spat towards the distant enemy. Standing near him, the very junior Admiral Valentine, who, prior to ISB's purges of disloyal Starfleet captains had been merely the politically savvy captain of a Victory-class Star Destroyer, gave orders with a burbling, almost juvenile enthusiasm. Disra himself felt nothing but satisfaction. He spent the last year working himself into Hammer's inner circle and the recent New Order purges of the Starfleet and other Imperial domestic agencies had provided him an excellent opportunity to advance in both authority and importance. Disra had quietly placed the previous head of Imperial Intelligence and his deputies on ISB's purge list, and then maneuvered men that he owned and to replace them. Consequently, Disra enjoyed unfettered access to everything Imperial Intelligence had to offer, and the ability to keep certain pieces of intelligence out of unfriendly hands. It had been a stroke of genius, he thought with satisfaction. The fact that the idea had originally come from one Fleury Voru, and that Voru had also enjoyed access to all that intelligence through his access to Disra, was something that Disra chose not to think about. Soon enough he would have manufactured enough intelligence to protect himself from Voru's blackmailing, and then he turned the tables on the meddling Karelian former moth. The scanning plot showed the traitor vessels commanded by Pelian had seemed to jump in alarm, and then clustered together in a protective box formation. The lighter Enforcer-class heavy cruisers started to fire as the TIE droids came within range. We're still in the early skirmish phases, Admiral Valentin said to Hamir, with the earnesty of a schoolboy hoping for praise. Our TIEs just need to keep them off balance and prevent them from using their own TIEs to assault our Star Destroyers. Once we have the range on the middle, I'll be over. There's no way those enforcers can stand up to our heavier guns, and their alien crews can't possibly be any match for us. Hammer's total lack of response seemed to diminish Valentin's enthusiasm. The young admiral tried to cover that by acting even more enthusiastic. All ships. Today we end Admiral Pelian's treason against our new order and prove once and for all the superiority of the Empire. Always remember, loyalty is life, and disloyalty is death. Disra fought aside as the bridge crew went about their duty unaffected by the young twist yammering, performing the complex choreography of combat with all the enthusiasm of a professional dilettante. Silently, Disra wondered how hard it would be to see Valentin charged with treason so that he could be replaced with someone who would be loyal to Disra, someone with just enough brains to run a fleet but not enough to try and challenge his guidance. Not very, he decided. Asterisk. Fell's helmet fans were fighting incipient condensation from his own sweat. His canned air had the same stale, dry taste it always did, and the world was a muted haze beyond his sensors and eye plates. None of that was atypical when rapidly approaching a bunch of people who wanted to kill him. And yet, it had been some years since Baron Suntir Fell had felt so relaxed. There was something to be said for the simplicity of space combat compared to running his own off the books FIFA. All raising toddlers. He rarely had the chance to fly, given all those responsibilities. When Thrawn had recruited him, promising sanctuary for Fel's wife and children and the opportunity to serve an empire of actual worth, Fel had felt neither the ability nor the inclination to refuse. If he had said no, Thrawn might have killed him and his family just to keep the secret of Uref, and the empire he proposed to build, with himself in charge of course, was a far cry from the one Fell had turned against. Still, Thrawn's death had unexpectedly elevated Fell to leadership, and in his heart he still wasn't sure why Thrawn had chosen him for that role. The recorded orders that had established his new position, released on the occasion of Thrawn's death, had not fully clarified why the decision had been made. It had been a long time before Fell had truly come to terms with his new reality. You were born a farmer and became a teacher. Thrawn Short, unsigned note had said, Farmers spark growth, and teachers never stop learning and asking why. Grow, remain inquisitive, and ensure all you recruit are worthy of the organization's promise. That weight had never been easy to carry, 
but since he had come to terms with his new reality, he now had obligation. The Uruf was not just a military force in search of a cause. The Uruf was a half dozen imperial colony worlds where the families of his crews and construction workers lived. It was a network of alliances with dozens more alien species in the unknown regions, whose people joined and fought in the Uruf military. And it was a cause, a responsibility, a vital task, one that Fell could no more set down than he could breathe in vacuum. Those were responsibilities and tasks to which he did not always feel well suited, which was why sitting in the molded cushion seat at the center of a tight defender cockpit tracking enemy targets was such an incredible freedom. Even if they were outnumbered three to one. He made minute adjustments to his inertial dampener, his targeting computer, and his attitude thrusters with the seasoned nerves of a professional. Then he put his love for his family in a small box deep inside his chest and let the killer out. Worst flight, make sure your IF is updated. Then weapons free. He heard naught but double clicks of acknowledgement as the four fighters filled the space ahead of them with hard light and missiles. The melee surrounding Pelian squadron had grown to include hundreds of ties. The small, boxy enemy ties, with their cut-out rectangular solar panel wings, where Nimblecraft and their pilots clearly had their internal compensators set on maximum, they kept pulling maneuvers which would have placed incredible stress on a human body. A quartet of the enemy fighters were making a run on one of Pelian's enforcers, their lasers flashing as they flitted over the heavy cruiser's hull. In response, the heavy cruiser's lighter guns sent a scattering of dispersing fire, forcing the ties to take evasive maneuvers. The one fell was tracking made a quick stutter step, left to right, and then tumbled, swapping end for end to come back towards him. The abrupt turn was one that fell would have been hard pressed to make, but also one that fell had anticipated. As the enemy fighter completed his flip, fell caught it cleanly with a quad burst of his lasers. The New Order tie vanished in a cloud of fire and debris. Fell sent his fighter into a spinning turn, grazing just over the enforcer's shields. He shot along the ship's hull, then throttled up and brought his fighter back around to target the other ties menacing him. There was something familiar about these enemies. Baron Sunter Fell had long had a reputation as the best pilot of his generation. Others challenged him for the title. He and Han Solo had competed while at Corita together, though Fell had always scored higher than Solo on all the exercises, and Rogue Squadron had several pilots who stood in contention for the title. Fell nonetheless knew that he remained the consensus choice for best, and he also knew just what it was that made him so good. Fell's situational awareness was second to none. He didn't have the fastest reflexes, though he was close to the best. Nor was he the best at long range targeting or at dealing with the physical strain that came with starfighter combat. Instead, his true strength lay in observation. What Fell could do that almost no one else could do, and that no one could do as well as he could, was see a battlefield, see an enemy, and recognize almost instantly what it was he was seeing. Few pilots were as good as he was overall. Skywalker didn't fly combat much these days, and Fell hadn't flown against his brother-in-law recently. Neither of them was near his equal in combat awareness. The only student he'd ever trained who could come close was Tycho Selchu, with his own sort of unmatched clinical perfection. He trusted his instincts, tracking his lasers over a second enemy tie. His targeting reticle flickered green, indicating that he had a good shot, but he held his fire. The tie fell was tracking made a quick stutter step, left to right, and then tumbled, swapping end over end to come back towards him. Fell pulled the trigger and sent a quad burst of green fire neatly through his enemy, leaving behind a cloud of fire and debris. On the comm, Admiral Pelian was relaying orders. Tie bombers prepare for firing runs against. Fell pressed the red button on his communications unit. This is Baron Sunter Fell. Hold bomber launch. TIE squadrons disregard all previous orders. Asterisk. As the lead destroyer in Pelian's formation, Captain Naito's exigent opened the engagement. Her nose swung towards the enemy in concert with her sisters, and she shed sheets of verdant turbolaser and skittering blue ion blasts like she deserved a Category 11 lightning warning. Each of his four-star destroyers had no fewer than six Enforcer-class cruisers offering fire assistance and cover, 
and the space around Exigent illuminated with a thunderous storm as the enemy ties engaged. If that had been all, Pelian was sure his squadron could handle the enemy. The ties alone were dangerous, but manageable. But the 12 Imperial class star destroyers that had brought the ties to the battle were quite another matter. Approaching on three divergent paths, their heavy turbolaser fire was chewing at Exigent and her escorts. The engagement was still at quite a long range, so the enemy fire was not as effective as it might have been, but that would change. Order our TIE bombers to launch and prepare for firing runs against the leading enemy star destroyers, he ordered. With the sheer number of enemy fighters, that would be suicide for a number of his bombers, but he had to find a way. To Pelian's astonishment, the communication station blinked, letting him know that his orders were being overridden. This is Baron Sunter Fell, the comm blared, and that was Fell's voice. Hold bomber launch. TIE squadrons, disregard all previous orders. I want all fighters to focus on engaging enemy fighters when they are between four and six clicks from their hard targets. The pilots you are up against are untrained and repeat evasive maneuvers. The anger Pelian had felt at being cut off faded as Fell quickly took the squadron's type pilots through an engagement strategy. Apparently, Fell believed that if the enemy ties were engaged as they attempted proton torpedo runs, they'd be vulnerable and would always respond to threats in an identical manner. That seemed absurd. Besides which, what was Fell doing in combat? And in a tie no less. Was he trying to get himself killed? Get me Fell. Pelian ordered Shell. I'm trying, sir. Finally, Pelian's voice finished his instructions, and Pelian heard an echo of confirmations from the fleet's TIE squadron commanders. Shell gasped in relief. I have him, sir. Baron Fell, what in the nine hells are you doing? Pelian barked. If you get killed. It didn't sit right, me sitting in a bunker somewhere with four of the galaxy's finest starfighters just resting on the permacrete. Fell's voice came back, his bass rumble belying a dark humor. Admiral Pillian, I need command of the fleet's air wing. I know what we're fighting. The enemy ties are droids. I recognize their behavioral packages. They're identical to the early generation Clone Wars era vulture, droid starfighters, we ran sims against at the academy. Droid starfighters. Pelian gaped. The Starfleet would never use droid starfighters. We spent a decade destroying them all. But despite his denial, Pelian watched as Dreef brought up the behavioral profile of the enemy starfighters, and his disbelief faded as he watched them in action. He had joined the Old Republic's judicial forces, and he spent a disproportionate number of his years as a young man fighting separatist droid starfighters. It had been a long time but there were some things that had been trained too deep to easily forget after even a lifetime. I'll be damned, he gasped. Command granted. I'll fight the fleet. You run the fighters. Consider it done. Apparently, Fell did not feel either the need to gloat or to reprimand Pelian for his reaction. Admiral, do you still have a periscope connection to Captain Rogress? We do, sir, Zreef responded. Exigent reports loss of her forward shields. Called one of his officers. Pelian forced himself out of the conversation about the tide droids and turned to deal with his fleet. Captain Nidal, make your course 90 degrees to port and prepare to roll if you lose your starboard shield. Second Enforcer Squadron, screen Exigent's forward firing arc and redouble your fire against enemy star destroyers. Prepare to shift all fire to anti ship. When he turned back to the conversation with Fell, the Baron was already three quarters through his orders, with Shell preparing to relay them to Rogress then tell Rogress that I want her clawcraft to do exactly what I tell them. Asterisk. As he watched the combat plot from the bridge of the Imperial Star Destroyer Invincible, Grand Moff, an interim director of Imperial Intelligence Vilm Disra felt the weight of those titles as his enthusiasm for the battle and his prospects waned almost instantly. The new order had arrived with 12 star destroyers and 600 TIE droids, outnumbering their enemy 3 to 1, and both. But the advantage in TIEs was proven to be less of a factor than he had anticipated. At first, the sheer advantage in numbers had seemed overwhelming, but Admiral Valentin's increasing, and quite obvious, nervousness was a compelling argument against that belief. 
Order our droid fighters to concentrate on wiping out the enemy ties, Valentine was saying, with the tone of a man searching for an answer, rather than someone who already had one. Once we've eliminated their fighter screen, our Star Destroyers can close without risk from the TIE Bombers they must still have in reserve. And order our Star Destroyer formations to concentrate on Exigen. Once we've liquidated Captain Nidal, their spirits will surely break. But that too was proven to be more difficult than they had anticipated. Pelion's enforcers were more capable, and dangerous, than their size suggested. Valentine had been so sure that the smaller ships would pose no real threat, and, not for the first time, Disra lamented that I.S.B. had purged all of Kane's former senior staff. How hard can it be to find a single competent officer in the Imperial Starfleet? He lamented silently. As Disra's enthusiasm waned, his fear started to grow. Hamir had not yet responded to the more difficult than expected battle. He simply sat in the center of the room, motionless, staring out the forward window, and watching the flashes of green turbo laser fire punctuated by explosions. They could see, in the distance, the Star Destroyer exigent, her massive broadside turned towards Invincible and her New Order sisters, rolling slowly to continually present recharge shields to incoming fire. Behind her, the noses of Pelian's other Star Destroyers flashed with torrents of green fire, and they were surrounded by a mass of smaller ships, each themselves firing defiantly back at the New Order formations. Smaller ships that Valentine had believed to not be a threat, but which were proven otherwise. They were surrounded, but they were fighting, and Disra was no longer sure the New Order would win. And if they lost, he took another peek at Hamir. The Emperor Regent remained still, his hands resting comfortably on his black-clad knees, white armor surrounding him like fortress ramparts. He seemed impervious to all that was going on around him. Despite his presence, Invincible's bridge still felt like fear, and Valentin's voice grew ever more shrill. Asterisk. Exigen was dying. The final relay from her periscope craft made that quite clear. Basori Rogris assessed the damage and ran the calculations of how many people on her old ship would survive and escape pods, and how many would die by fire, or shock, or empty vacuum, and felt a combination of despair and cold fury. Despair? because Exigent would die before she could get there to save them, Fury, because she was in an excellent position to exact plenty of vengeance for their deaths, and she intended to do just that. Termagant's bridge held the taut promise of well-drilled professionals, crackling with the static energy before a lightning strike, commands were clear and in an understandable cadence, and her squadron maintained its formation perfectly. And then it was time. Her four lively class frigates finally emerged from the dampening blanket of their cloaking shields. Her twelve squadrons of clawcraft raced ahead at full throttle, slightly encumbered by attached box torpedo launchers. Already well within proton torpedo range of the four star destroyers she was flanking, they locked on and prepared to launch, dodging what little turbolaser fire came their way easily. In the distance, she could see the nine glowing circles, each arrayed in lines of three the classic arrangement of Star Destroyer engines. Those engines were full in her view because she had used her periscope scouts to put herself directly behind the nearest of the three enemy Star Destroyer formations. Every Star Destroyer captain feared being flanked, because while those massive engines gave Star Destroyers impressive speed for their size and mass, they also left the Star Destroyer's rear-firing arc almost entirely undefended. She tutted silently at the New Order commander who had planned this little engagement. Despite his evident inexperience, what she was about to do to his fleet wasn't entirely his fault. He had no idea that she and her ships were here, and he was about to pay for that lack of knowledge, because he hadn't left so much as a picket ship in his wake. She keyed her comm headset off fighters. Time launch. Service target one on my mark. Then two, and three. Then proceed ahead on your own initiative unless otherwise ordered. She heard the echo of acknowledgments from her clawcraft commanders, watched the plot, waited, and waited a few moments more, leaning forward in her command chair, perched and anticipatory. Mark. 200 proton torpedoes shot out from the leading edge of her ties. A minute later, they slammed into the rear of the New Order Star Destroyer Firestorm. 
All three of Firestorm's engines went from bright spots of light against the starscape to empty voids. She watched in awe as the entire rear of Firestorm exploded, splintering. It almost appeared as if Firestorm had abruptly split into a swarm of insects, one enormous, invincible ship becoming tens of thousands of smaller ones. Then the Star Destroyer finished disintegrating, its nose coasting forward under momentum, spiraling, and burning. Target 2. She ordered. The order was entirely unnecessary. Her squadrons of clawcraft were already angling on the second Star Destroyer. This time the range was too close for two full volleys, and they only had two left, so they launched only one. One was all Asori needed. More than a hundred torpedoes slammed into the shields and engines of the Star Destroyer Goliath. The clawcraft sprinted away, leaving an open firing lane and a viciously wounded, entirely vulnerable Star Destroyer in their wake. Open fire! She barked, and her four ships poured heavy fire into the wound. Bursts of blue light, distinct from the showers of green, slammed into Goliath's three engines. One had already been destroyed by the torpedo volley, the other two winked out of existence under her torrent of fire. She waited another ten seconds as Termagant's guns vaporized armor, blazing deep into Goliath's hull. Goliath's bridge tower vanished, and the leaderless, crippled star destroyer began to drift. Target 3. Asterisk. The targeting reticle flicked green and soon Tyr Fell pressed his use-worn firing stud with unthinking precision. Another TIE droid vanished as his TIE defender's superior firepower lashed out against his smaller, nimbler, and more fragile foe. Beside him, Turfenner's defender unleashed a stuttering exclamation of laser and ion cannon fire, taking out a trio of TIE droids which had been flying in a tight formation. The enemy advantage in starfighters had vanished. Outnumbered two to one at the start of the engagement, the TIE droids' piloting patterns had, once identified, made them easy targets. They were still deadly, and had swarmed and destroyed at least 40 of his ties, nearly a sixth of Pelion's original strength, but their complete disregard for their own safety and lack of creativity meant that for every tie fell lost, his pilots or an enforcer's guns were four new order droid starfighters. When the clawcraft entered the engagement, whatever advantages the tie droids had were entirely lost. Asori Rogra's 12 squadrons of clawcraft had jettisoned their awkward torpedo box launchers and flashed through the ongoing melee decisively, their blue lasers, Cherix, the Chiss called them, tearing through TIE droids with casual ease. The TIE droids, which like the Clone Wars era vultures that preceded them had been designed to swarm an outnumbered enemy, were simply not up to the task. Red dots vanished on Moss on his HUD, sighed away by the arriving clawcraft and in the distance a third enemy star destroyer brewed up in a spectacular chain of detonations. Fell activated his comm. Admiral Pelion, now you may launch your bombers. Asterisk. Pelion's lead star destroyer was lost to flame, transforming from pristine armor plates to burning hulk. Exigent's defensive spin continued now out of momentum rather than intent. But Vilm Disra felt an icy fist of fear close around his heart. Their sensors confirmed kills on a few squadrons worth of fighters from Pelian's TIE squadrons, a half dozen dead enforcers, and exigent. But that was all. In exchange, the New Order had lost three Star Destroyers and nearly all their TIE droids, and the dying had only just begun. Sheer, unadulterated terror closed at his throat. His hands were as white as his remaining hair under the dye as he clenched the bridge rail. Admiral Valentine was in full blown panic. He was sprinting around the bridge, shrieking orders at anyone in his vicinity, especially junior officers who were not responsible for this debacle and could do nothing to fix it from their posts, demanding that they launch the TIE reserve he had already committed or that other Star Destroyers destroy the enemy without providing any guidance as to how. Hamir fixed him with an absent, silent stare. Emperor Regent. Valentine pleaded. This isn't my fault. I didn't know about their other ships. We need reinforcements, with another few Star Destroyers, I promise. Snap hiss. The Emperor Regent, who had sat with eerie stillness in his command chair at the end of the bridge walk for the entire engagement, had moved in a flash. A collective gasp went through the bridge as a pillar of ruby fire erupted through the center of Valentin's chest, 
the lightsaber end in Valentin's career, his pleading, and his life with decided finality. The young, well-connected and impeccably dressed admiral slid down the blade, collapsing to the deck nearly in pieces. All ships, retreat, Hamir ordered. It was all he said, but abruptly the entire imperial formation turned to do just that without thought from maneuvering or an orderly withdrawal. Enemy fighters and enforcers had closed to point-blank range and were firing angrily, doing their best to cripple the new order ships and prevent their escape. Far worse, a swarm of fresh Thai bombers were emerging from Pelian's star destroyers, lining up the closest foes for their own devastating attack runs. Minutes passed like hours. The communication station reported losses with the rote metronomic precision of New Order band Verpine Music. Twelve star destroyers had become nine, and then seven, and then the star destroyer Krakana's entire port side vanished in a torrent of flame as the combination of Enforcer and Thai Bomber fired shoot through shields and armor with insulting ease. Invincible fled and there was no one on her bridge who did not know that they were running away in ignominious defeat. Disra was frozen. Few of their star destroyers had escaped into hyperspace, and Invincible had only escaped because the other ships of her squadron fought valiantly to ensure the Emperor Regent's escape. The enemy had possessed ships, both capital ships and starfighters, of unknown design which had proven to be viciously effective. None of Imperial intelligence estimates had ever even guessed that Grand Ma Farrells and Admiral Pelian might have additional resources. How could they? This was wild space. There was nothing out here. But clearly they did. And the battle had started to turn bad even before. It was mystery ships had gutted the New Order formation. He could not speak. He could not think. He could only wait in abject terror. Heavy footsteps came to a rest on the bridge walk beside him and he turned to look into the depths of Homerus' eyes. The Emperor Regent had a mask of calm, but Disra could almost feel the rage emanating from the former Inquisitor. Rage directed at him. Emperor Regent, he babbled, trying to sound respectful, but all he could hear from his own voice was valent and senseless rambling. Clearly, our intelligence estimates. There was another snap hiss, and a sudden, aching pain in his chest, and Deera looked down and saw the crackling fire of Hammer's blade thrust through his meticulously arranged rank insignia. He gasped a last superheated breath, and used it to cough out a laugh as he collapsed on Invincible's deck. And he'd gotten so close to finally getting out of Voru's shadow. Chapter 10 a sorry Rogris shuttle descended through the clouds above Paul Major to the side of cheering crowds in the streets of Whitestone City. The people of the city were loyal to Grand Moff Fairhouse, and had stood behind him even when he had broken from the New Order. She could imagine them watching the battle on every view screen they could beg, borrow, or steal, wondering if New Order would defeat Pelian's forces, and what it would do to those who had stayed loyal to him after they had. But the battle had been won, not lost, and in spectacular fashion. Admiral Pelian's fleet had utterly devastated Regent Halmir's formation. Just the process of salvaging the destroyed ships and recovering their survivors, not to mention the survivors of Exeget, would likely take days. Each survivor they recovered would be given the chance to defect and join them, strengthening their fleet still further. Before the Battle of Pawn Major, Asori had been uncertain how all this would end. The New Order had so many more systems that defeating it was a distant fantasy. Now, though, with the sudden collapse of the Imperial fleet and the loss of so many Star Destroyers, that fantasy seemed alarmingly real. Don't get ahead of yourself, she thought, trying to dampen her enthusiasm. The New Order is still well-armed and vicious. You have wounded it, but what will it do in response? Her shuttle settled to the ground outside the Governor's Palace. She waited for the landing ramp to fully depress, then she descended it. She was wearing her full-dress uniform and with the uniform came a sense of authority and dignity. Everything was different now. Captain Rogers. That voice belonged to Admiral Pelian. She turned to face the older man and accepted a mutual salute and handshake. Well done, Captain. And you, Admiral, she returned. Pelian was typically reserved. It was Baron Fell who saw the crucial element. Their ties would have been much deadlier had he not realized they were droids so quickly. Which raises the question, she said, 
And this was the one vital question, the concern that lingered, the knot of doubt that niggled in her gut. Where did they get 600 droid starfighters? I agree, Pelian said darkly. If I'm not mistaken, that is what Baron Fell wishes to speak with us about. He gestured towards the arching, white stone columns of the governor's palace. Come, Captain. Let us see what our leaders have for us today. They walked together through the white stone structure. It was a solemn place, with only a handful of political aides and bureaucrats poking their heads out to get a look. The cheering crowds of the city were far from here, and even the sounds of their jubilant celebration were now silent. Their standard issue boots clicked on the stairs as they ascended towards the governor's office. Inside, they found Grandma Faroux and Baron Sunter fell in close conversation. Fell wasted no time with pleasantries. Admiral, Captain, the Grand Moff and I were discussing the new order's manufacturing capability, and we have come to the conclusion that they do not have the ability to construct and field so many droid starfighters. Experience would seem to suggest otherwise, Pelian said dryly. Fell smiled without humor. Indeed, he shook his head. We have no idea where they came from. Our best guess is that the secret facility that the young Emperor Icemarin has been secreted away to is some kind of manufactory, but despite the best efforts of our intelligence apparatus, we still don't know where that is. Worse, Grandma Farrells added, is the fact that we don't know how long it took them to construct so many TIE droids. Was this the product of six months of manufacturing? A year? Two weeks? We have no way of knowing. Worse still, Fell continued, is that we should expect the TIE droids to be smarter each time we face them. The ones we fought here used a simple behavioral matrix that dates back to the early Clone Wars. There are a number of basic improvements that could be made to their code to improve their tactics. As long as the New Order has a competent cyberneticist, we should expect they will be significantly smarter the next time we have to fight them. Not as good as sentient pilots, of course, but smarter than before. Basori imagined a few thousand Thai droids swarming over her squadron with near-infinite reinforcements. If they had huge manufacturing capacity, they would have used more than 600, she pointed out. That gave them an edge in numbers but not enough of an edge to make up for their deficiencies. I agree, Fell said with a nod. They brought 600 because 600 was what they had available. Then? But how many will they have available tomorrow? Pelian took a deep breath. I see your point. What do you intend to do about it? Two things, said Faroz. First, we must redouble our efforts to acquire an intelligence asset within Emperor Regent Hammer's inner circle. Anyone who might have come into close contact with him may also have traveled to the New Order's mysterious droid manufactory. We need to find that factory and destroy it before it fundamentally alters the dynamics of this war. Pelian nodded. Yes, sir. Second, and to a sorry surprise, Farrell's turned towards her. Captain Rogris, I have a mission for you. Sir, given the unexpected and unknown strength of our enemy, the Baron and I have agreed to change our previous course. You're being sent to negotiate with the New Republic, Farrell said grimly. We believe the time has come to make a formal overture towards ending the Galactic Civil War. She blinked, astonished. Me? Sir? You agreed, Fell, taken up for Fair Owls? Clearly, the two of them had rehearsed this in advance. Your name carries some credibility with the man we want you to reach, but to get to him without drawing suspicion, you will have to find Merrick's Tarek. She's a smuggler, primarily of gray market antiquities. Importantly, he stared at her pointedly, then looked to the other people in the room, and I do not want this widely shared. She has a direct line to the commander of their fifth fleet, who also happens to be my brother Lull. Basori heard Pillian's restrained grunt of surprise. Fair Owls, as usual, gave away nothing. She was still stunned almost to incoherence that she would be responsible for this mission. The additional surprise that Baron Sunter fell and General Wedge and Tilly's were related by marriage added little to add to her current state of shock and uncertainty. If you can get to Wedge Antilles and tell him what we just fought, Fell continued, I'm sure he'll recognize the scope of the threat we both face. 
The problem is we want any overture from us to the New Republic to be kept secret so that the New Order has no chance to interfere. He manipulated the data pad he was holding, and in response a holo of the galaxy illuminated above Pharaoh's desk, one that illuminated all the remaining New Order territories in a blood red. With all due respect, sir, she said, putting all that information aside for later, that doesn't answer my question. Why me? I would rather it be your father, Fell replied. He and General Antilles have worked together before on more than one occasion, and his name ought to carry some credibility. But it can't be him for two reasons. First, he isn't here. He's still assembling our reserve fleet at Neron, preparing it to reinforce Paul Major in the event of a second New Order attack. Second, he is too well known, and his appearance on Coruscan would surely put the New Order on alert. If I may inquire, Baron Pelian asked in a somewhat subdued tone, how can we be sure Antilles won't simply kill her? We've all seen the holos of my exchange with him at Corita. The man is utterly single-minded. If now Senator Medano hadn't stepped in, he may have chosen to attack my fleet rather than let us go, even if that meant he risked losing the battle. I can't speak to Wedge's state of mind, Fell said. I've only known him briefly in person. But if we can get Merrick's to see the message and verify it, she's sure to at least try and present it to him on his own merits. He should see the arithmetic in having us on his side to finish the new order at least. He hesitated, then added somewhat reluctantly, which also owes Captain Roger's father a debt. Asori frowned, wondering what that could mean. Still though, I'm not a diplomat, sir, she said warily. That wasn't my training. She had never been trained for peacetime and never known peacetime. There were times she wondered what she would even do if peace came, asking her to be the agent of peace. I will provide you with a full briefing, put in Grandma Fairhouse, including everything you are authorized to offer the New Republic to encourage them to agree to an alliance and to achieve the long-term peace we are looking for. All you have to do is deliver the data pad to the New Republic and let it speak for us. He smiled reassuringly. Believe me, Captain, we did not select your name at random. The Baron and I agree that our representative should be from the Imperial Starfleet, someone with clean hands, and someone with a low profile. Someone that the New Republic military will have some sympathy for. That is who we need to be the new face of our empire. In every respect, you are the right choice. Eight hours later, after she had handed off command of her squadron to her second-in-command, Asori Rogress found herself on a disguised intelligence courier with Commander Dreef and a stack of briefing data pads thick enough to serve as armor plating on a Star Destroyer. Fleury Voro's office was in an unassuming villa on the outskirts of Coronet City, the capital of Corellia. A stink of excess and loose old money, just as was expected of the head of Black Sun it was, after all, a millennia-old organization one that had been the heart of the Coruscanti criminal underworld for almost as long as Coruscan had been the galactic capital. Until I had to close the Coruscan office due to rampant speculation by his Vigo. Voru did his best to work hard but still enjoyed touches of the high life he'd missed on Kessel. His auto-massaging office chair had fine, precise servos ideal for working out kinks in his back and featured capable defense programming able to direct a truly dazzling armament. For that luxury, the chair cost as much as a large Coruscanti apartment, and as much as some Coronet apartment buildings. Zizzer, the last head of Black Sun of any note, had owned the same model. Voru had appearances to maintain, after all. Unlike Coruscant, most of Coronet ran closer to the ground with only a few megastructures and space lifts at his heart. Voru's office was ground level, in a residential neighborhood far away from the busy harbor, and spaceport, and through the slightly colored windows was an array of beautiful Corellian plants. During the spring, Voru had kept these windows open, which allowed both a breeze and the marvelous scent of spice flowers, maintained by expert Corellian gardeners who had cost him a significant amount of credits to poach from the local elite. The rest of his inner sanctum was equally opulent, but had been styled to Voru's personal tastes rather than those of his predecessors. His large desk was made from fine to loosen wood, as were the matching chairs, which were sized to suit Voru's comparatively diminutive frame. 
On the walls were lightly abstract artworks, all of a pre-Empire Corellian vintage, and not only human artists, either. Voru, unlike many former Imperial moths, had no particular antipathy towards Corellia's non-human sentience. He was pretty sure that the Dralin art wasn't intended to be abstract, but to human eyes it was undoubtedly so. Despite his uncertainty about what exactly it depicted, it was attractive to the eye, and his underlings seemed to like it. Or at least they said as much to his face. Just outside the door were two of the best mercenaries that Credis could buy. His terminal beeped, alerting him to a new urgent message. Turning towards it with a frown, he activated the monitor and brought the message up for his perusal. The message was from one of his many assets in the Imperial hierarchy. It was alarmingly easy to buy off ISB officers these days, the organization was not what it had once been, and the subject line told him almost everything he needed to know. Disaster at Paul Nager? Fleet destroyed. Moff Disra executed for incompetence. He reviewed the rest of the communique with morbid curiosity. Emperor Regent Hammer's assault on Grand Moff Fairhouse's forces had gone horribly wrong. Of the twelve Imperial-class Star Destroyers, only four had survived, and of those four, only two remained combat-capable. The Grand Moff's traitors, or loyalists, Voru thought Riley, depending on one's perspective, had possessed unexpected assets. Admiral Valentine had been found guilty of treason and Moff Disra of incompetence. Both were dead. Voru wondered, with grim amusement, what had set Valentine's treason apart from Disra's incompetence. He was under no illusions. Vilm Disra had been a useful asset, but Voru was all too well aware that his old administrative aid from his days as Corellia's moth had ceased being fully reliable some time before. Disra's messages had been prompt but had not been as useful as they had been prior to Disra becoming the moth of the Braxen Sector and being assigned to the Emperor Regent's staff. His loss was frustrating because it meant Voru no longer had eyes and ears in the Council of Moths itself, but it was not a disaster. The rest of the message. Voru leaned back in his expensive massage chair, allowing the silent needing to ease him into deep thought. He thought through the implications of what had happened, turned it over and examined it from every angle, and came to one inescapable conclusion. The Empire was finished. This moment had been coming for some time. He saw it even here on Corellia as in the last six months anti-imperial partisans had waged an extensive insurgency and protest campaign against imperial rule. Salonia and Drawl were very nearly in open revolt, and while there were still a great many imperial sympathizers among the human populations of Corellia, Talus, and Trallis, they had become more subdued as defeat after defeat rocked the new order. With the calamity at Paul Major and the humiliation of the Emperor Regent himself, the Empire is indeed finished. Voru found he didn't have any strong feelings about this reality one way or the other. The Empire had been dying ever since Endor, after all. The question was what should he do about it? And a sense of unease swept over him. Voru was used to the unexpected happening, being able to both cause and take advantage of the unexpected was how he had become Corellia's moth a lifetime ago, but it nonetheless always brought with it a certain anxiety. To quell that anxiety, Voru would have to exert his will on the new unknown, to twist it into something he did know, and something he could control. That knowledge usually reassured him. But this time, Voru's uneasiness lingered. Something was off. He felt a waft of actual breeze and smelled a touch of spice flour. It took his brain a second to catch up with the olfactory prompting, but then, he snatched at his desk drawer, because that meant someone had opened one of his windows. With a screech, his massage chair suddenly spasmed. Making a weak sound of protest, the chair whined and creaked, and Voru leapt out of it as someone, a man, cleared his throat behind him. Spinning around, Fleary palmed the closest blaster to hand, a light holdout he kept in the top drawer of his desk, and pointed it at the interloping presence. The man who had breached his sanctum was of an age and a height equal to his own, and had a spare face stretched like tanned leather over sharp bones. The intruder held both hands up in a sign of measured harmlessness, which just made Voru even more uncomfortable. Hello, Ma Voru, the intruder said. The man's voice was soft and unmistakably Corellian, 
Anster with a touch of gutter coronet. Or do you prefer Underlord these days? One of the man's lifted hands gestured at the blaster in Voru's hand. You won't need that, he added with a soft smile, and to Voru's astonishment he recognized the man's clothes. The intruder's jumpsuit had the logo of the local gardening service that Voru had hired. I've come on business, and my business doesn't involve harming you. Voru took a moment to glance at his chair and saw a restraining bolt affixed to the back of it. On the other hand, the man added, My business doesn't involve me being harmed either, so I had to neutralize your toy. Typically, I prefer for my business partners to make appointments, Voru said calmly, checking his blaster to make sure the holdout was charged. It was. But I suppose you've gone through all the difficulty of coming to see me. The least I can do is hear what you have to say. The gardener smiled. I thought you'd appreciate the subtlety. Though I also know that after this meeting you'll be reassessing your security arrangements, as you should. Your mercenaries are good at what they do, but I'd add a handful more aerial droids and double the frequency of their patrols. I'll keep that in mind. Voru frowned. Now that he was looking at the man, and was reasonably certain that his life was not in immediate jeopardy, the gardener actually looked vaguely familiar. Have we met? I used to work for you, actually, the gardener said. The other man was likely one of many people who had once served the former moth's office. For that matter, from a certain point of view, all of Corellia had once worked for Fleury Vor. A lifetime ago. I thought you'd appreciate the respect of necessary things being done in the shadows. After all, you're the one playing games and making the dictate stutter and stumble. The dictate hardly needs my help for that. True. The Empire isn't what it used to be. The gardener smiled thinly. Have you heard about Emperor Regent Hammer's debacle at Palm Major yet? That made Voru almost stiffen in surprise. He'd only just found out about that, and he had intelligence assets in the heart of ISB. How in all the Corellian hells could this man have heard about it before he had? Of course. The news reached me some time ago, he lied smoothly. Once the news gets out, the gardener said, the Corellian people will not be able to resist responding. Protests will fill the streets of Coronet. The Salonians and Dralans will attack their imperial garrisons. His expression tightened and Voru saw a hint of stress there. The leadership of the insurgency won't be able to stop it even if they wish to. The pro-imperial militias will try to suppress them, but Bracken Sal Solo's people won't be able to clear them without massive bloodshed, if at all. That was a not unreasonable set of suppositions. Why come to me? Because I'm under the impression that whatever else you are, you are also a Corellian patriot. The gardener gestured at the opulent space around them, and because the imperial response to those protests will be vicious. Like Dare and a hundred other worlds, the Star Destroyers in orbit will be ordered by their I.S.B. loyalty officers to bombard our worlds. They will destroy in an afternoon what has taken Corellio a thousand lifetimes to build. And you think I can stop it? I know you can. I know, Moth Voru, that you've spent the last six months manipulating the personnel rosters of those Star Destroyers. I know that they're staffed with more Corellians than the Imperial Starfleet under Tarkin would ever have accepted, Corellians who might be reluctant to rearrange so much as a blade of grass on their own homeworlds. I also know that you are very, very wealthy, and that the non-Corellian captains and crew of those Star Destroyers might be amenable to switching sides, if provided with the proper incentive. Voru laughed in astonishment. You're asking me to bribe the captains of six Imperial-class Star Destroyers. That would cost a fortune. The gardener didn't hesitate and their escorts, if possible. We don't have time to debate it, either. News of Paul Major will arrive on Corellia within days, perhaps hours. ISB censors won't be able to stifle the news forever, and once it hits the enthusiasm and protests will get out of hand. If we're going to free Corellia without disaster, we need to act quickly and decisively. And if I don't have the funds, you do have the funds. The gardener's voice was calm, and entirely certain, and once again Voru was struck with a sense of familiarity. You are a leader of the Corellian resistance, he said with sudden understanding. Then, on an instinct, were you with Corsac? He asked slowly. 
I heard some of their records were completely destroyed during the dark times. I'm just a gardener, the man countered, his voice betraying no hint of emotion. I nourish beautiful and productive plants, and I pull up weeds. To pull up the empire cleanly, I'm going to need your help when the protests start. Voru waved his blaster for slight emphasis. Even if I decide to help Corellia, what makes you think I'll let you leave? Every rose has its thorns. You're not the only person who has been manipulating personnel assignments. If my heart stops beating while on these premises, or if I give a duress signal, one of the orbiting home guard warships will flatten this entire property. That was so ridiculous that Voru had to laugh again. You're not serious. You know as well as I do that any time someone says that, they reveal themselves to be poking or prodding to reveal amateurish threats spun from filaments of imaginary fear. Rest assured, I am not an amateur. I am quite serious. The man was either an expert sapic player or he was telling the truth. Voru wasn't sure which. Though they were both old Corellians in a dangerous game, he could be both. That would be conspicuous. Accidents happen, especially during gunnery exercises. The gardener gestured towards the still open window. When Voru didn't shoot him, he nodded. It was good to see you, Fleary. I'm sure I can trust you'll do the right thing. And with that, the gardener slipped back through the window, slid it closed silently behind him, and disappeared. Hyperspace was, F and Sariti thought, the only time he ever got any real rest. He had been enrolled in Comner by his parents when he was barely a teenager. Like many children of the Coruscanti elite, he'd been steeped in imperial politics for as long as he could remember, a constant analysis of whatever Palpatine had done this week and the reasons it was, like everything Palpatine did, pure genius and for greater good of all. For a young man interested in politics, that was the tenor of every discussion. The only debate to be had, if there was one, was why Palpatine's decisions were genius, not if. Keeping track of the political news was something he had done even before he fell into the clutches of Comner, and it was a habit he had never broken even after Palpatine's death. As he'd risen through the ranks and been given access to intelligence reports, his addictive habit of consuming the news had become an addictive habit of consuming those instead. There were days, if he wasn't doing other things, he could spend 20 hours absorbed with the damn things, reading page after page of up-to-the-minute briefs over the Imperial hollow net. He had long ago concluded that the obsessive behavior was neither healthy nor necessary, but he continued anyway. Except in hyperspace. In hyperspace, the hollow net receiver was blissfully silent. Oh, he could still review the pages and pages of files that had already been downloaded, but the obsessive pull of the most current reports was lost. So he slept in for several days in a row. He felt more rested now than he had in ages. Maybe ever. Certainly since he'd joined ISB, maybe since he'd joined Comner. His transport, an intelligence courier disguised as a medical ship from an easily sliced charity organization chartered out of the corporate sector, was small and well-furnished, and his crew was competent even if not excellent. For the first leg of the trip, there was nothing for any of them to do, the location of Silencer Station was so secret that even ISB loyalty officers were required to have the hyperspace jump programmed and operated by navigational droids that would self-destruct, if tampered with. But once they had arrived at Entrala, Sarity's crew had taken over and taken up the task of navigating through New Republic-held territory to return him to Corellia with aplomb. He was scheduled to rendezvous with Admiral Dalla and return to being the monkey lizard on her shoulder. She was not going to be happy about the Emperor Regis' further delay in the delivery of the Thai droids she wanted, but he suspected she was not going to be surprised either. Sending him in person to confer with the Emperor Regent had been a last-ditch effort, after all. He took his time, enjoying a last lazy morning. The calf was rich and strong, the scones had an excellent crumb, which met with his hearty approval. He casually perused a few intelligence reports, but realized almost immediately that he had already read them, so tossed them aside and snuck out an auto-wipe flimsy of a New Republic satirist and luxuriated in doing nothing beyond crunching and chuckling for just a little bit longer. That luxury eventually passed. His wrist indicated that they were nearing the scheduled arrival at Corellia, 
and rather than wait for the crew to call him to the bridge, loyalty officer Sariti triggered the flimsy's white function, incinerated it, and arrived early. Waving their concerns away, he took up his usual seat and started to once again look for something interesting to read. He didn't find anything before the ship's captain told him they were about to come out of hyperspace. This was the part he didn't like. Being in hyperspace was a wonderful luxury. Going in and coming out of hyperspace, on the other hand, were moments of nauseating horribleness and he would never understand how people like Dala could do it without flinching. The retching, nauseating moment of the transition arrived, stilling the swirl of hyperspace and leaving Sariti wishing he'd indulged in one fewer scone. Perhaps two? By the time he had recovered his dignity, they were headed in system. Is Admiral Dalla here yet? He asked. The itch had already started. The itch to go and activate the hollow net terminal and download the latest intelligence reports. And this time it wasn't just his addiction to information and gossip driving it, either. Admiral Valentin's attack on Pawn Major should be over by now, and Sariti was dying to know how the battle had gone. Not yet, sir. The ship's commanding officer, an ISB lieutenant, frowned as he examined the plot of the Corellia system. Something strange though, sir. It appears the Corellian system has been mobilized. That made Sariti sit up. Are we under attack? The long pause before the officer answered caused Sariti to lunge forward staring at what the officer was seeing. On the combat plot were five of the six Imperial-class Star Destroyers that had been assigned to the defense of Corellia and the entire Corellian Home Guard defense fleet, which, by treaty, could never outmatch the Empire's standing guard forces, but sure looked imposing right, ow. There were also hundreds of freighters and snub fighters, which were labeled civilian vessels. Sir, the officer finally spoke, pointing at a hard-to-see blur on the screen. It became more obvious the longer Sariti looked at it. The Star Destroyers and civilians were clustered around it, as if it had once been a target. Sir, I think that used to be the missing Star Destroyer. Pilot, I'll stop. Sariti gasped as he worked through the implications. Bring us back out of Corellia's gravity well and start plotting a jump. To where, sir? Anywhere. Sariti threw himself back into his chair. Plugging into the hollow net, he found the local hub had been disabled. But of course it would be if Corellia really had gone into revolt. So he tapped into the local net instead. The monitor by his station blinked to life. A jubilant, smiling human face was surrounded by a bustle of activity. Behind her, Sariti recognized the exterior of the government complex in Coronet City. The journalist was shouting over the noise of all the people around her to be heard, all of them cheering. Many wore green armbands and wave blaster rifles. Dicta Gallenby has been arrested by a reinstated Corsac. I just saw him being led away by a full Corsac intervention squad. We're free. Sir, the officer said, drawing his attention back out of the local news. We're prepared for a hyperspace jump, sir. That will take us deeper into the core, towards Admiral Dalla's last reported location. He grimaced. We've also received this, sir. He handed Sariti a data pad, which Sariti promptly plugged into his terminal. There was a recording. On the screen was a Star Destroyer bridge, but the ship's captain had removed his uniform and was wearing a civilian outfit, albeit one that had slight military tailoring and an orderly green armband on his left arm. This is Captain Ren of the Corellian System Defense Forces. This system is no longer under Imperial control. All forces that remain loyal to the Empire are to leave the system at once or be destroyed. His loyalty officer will have him shot, gasped the man next to Sariti. Sariti rolled his eyes. His loyalty officer has been shot already, he countered, trying to restore his tone to his normal, level calm, and only partially successful. Or spaced. Prepare to go to hyperspace. We have to tell Admiral Dalla. Status change. It seems it's too late to tell her, the officer said, watching as the plot was updated. Admiral Dalla has just arrived. Asterisk. Admiral Dalla and Captain Markarian stood in the center of the bridge walk, reviewing their data pads. Stormhawk cruised towards Corellia at high speed, 
The sudden loss of communication with Corellia could have indicated a new Republic attack, and Dalla had ordered her ship to return there with all possible speed. How long has Corellia been out of communication? Markarian asked his aide. We lost the hollow net link right before we made the jump, sir. So it's been about three hours. Battles have been won and lost in three hours, Dalla pointed out. The Star Destroyer formation was huddled deep in Corellia's gravity well, protected from quick attack. That much was normal. The hordes of freighters, frigates, and snub fighters were not. Corellia had plenty of freighter traffic coming in and out at any given time, but they never got within gunnery range of a Star Destroyer if they had any other choice. That and the fact that one of their Star Destroyers was missing. Get me Captain Ran, she ordered. Do you think something is wrong, sir? Markarian asked her. I know it is, she replied. The only question is what? The fact that the New Republic isn't here, though, suggests that the system didn't come under attack from outside forces. I have Captain Ran. Captain Ran, this is Admiral Dalla, she responded instantly. Status report. Now. Admiral Dalla. The viewer resolved into Ran's image. Captain Ran was a competent enough officer. Better than most, in Dalla estimation, even if not the best in the Starfleet. And Dalla had left him in command of the squadron defending Corellia. Normally a six-star destroyer squadron would have raided an admiral but there were precious few admirals left and Dalla was not one to promote just to fill vacancies. At the moment, though, Rand wasn't even wearing his captain's uniform, and Dalla's heart hardened as she realized at once what had happened. I'm afraid I must inform you that Corellia is no longer imperial territory, admiral. The system is now independent, by declaration of the Corellian ruling council. There is no Corellian ruling council, she said stiffly, almost hissing the words at him. You are committing treason, Captain. I had a choice between treason against my homeworld and treason against the Empire, Rand said, folding his hands together in front of him. He bowed his head to her slightly, a respectful gesture. I chose treason against the Empire. If you want to join us, Admiral, the Corellian system defense forces could use another Star Destroyer. I respect you as an officer and I suspect you'd even be put in command once your loyalty could be assured. He smiled at her. If you're concerned that you're not a Corellian, you shouldn't be. Corellia has always been very welcoming to all those who choose to make it home, after all. Betrayal. The Empire will not let this stand, Rank. Right? The Empire doesn't have much choice. Have you heard about Pawn Major, Admiral? Dalla frowned. Pawn Major. Stormhawk had been deep in the core, harassing the New Republic supply lines, for weeks. Inside New Republic territory, and unable to use the New Republic's relays for fear of giving away their location, their hollow net communication had been spotty. The communications they did have were relayed through Corellia, which meant Corellia got all the news before Dalla did. But Dalla could take the information at hand and add it up to the obvious conclusion. Rand's confidence, the casual assumption that the Empire would not be a threat to him. Emperor Regent Hamir attacked Pawn Major personally. He took 12 Star Destroyers, a hefty chunk of everything the Empire has left. Ran scoffed contemptuously. Pelian slapped him around like an errant schoolboy. I am afraid, Admiral Dalla, that the Empire has nothing left that could threaten Corellia. Whatever you want to intimidate me with won't work. The war is over. The Empire is dead. I now serve Corellia and Corellia's interests, and you are not welcome here. If you attempt to come within range of any of Corellia's worlds, you will be fired upon. The screen went black. Dalla stood, glowering at the glossy black that had replaced Rand's face, then took a breath. She still had four star destroyers, including Stormhawk. Assuming all of them are still loyal, she thought sourly, but she did not have them here. Each of them had been given a cloaking device and scattered through the heart of New Republic territory, lying in wait to ambush targets of opportunity. She could rally them, bring together what was left of the Imperial forces in the Corellian sector, maybe even try to rally some of the core warlords, but without Corellia, she had no base. No staging area. No repair. No resupply. No reinforcements. 
the warlords in the Deep Core were unreliable and more likely to seize her ships than help her. Within a month, her star destroyers would be suffering maintenance issues. Within three, she'd have serious system faults. In six, they wouldn't be combat worthy. Even if she had all four here, Corellia had more than enough defenses to repel any assault she attempted to mount, and she still had to worry about the New Republic attack in her rear. Corellia had been taken from the Empire, and there was nothing she could do about it. Admiral, Markarian asked nervously, What do we do? She controlled her anger and did not unleash it. Bring loyalty officer Sarity's shuttle aboard. While we do, query the hollow net node for all information about this battle at Pawn Major. After that, take us into the deep core so we can make a secure call to headquarters. I need to talk, she sneered, unable to hide her anger or her frustration, and at that moment not caring, to the Emperor Regent. Asterisk. Loyalty officer Sariti found Admiral Dalla standing in the middle of her office. She wasn't pacing, or ranting, or screaming. She was just staring at the datapad in her hand. She didn't look up when he entered, though she had to know he was there. When he came within ten feet of her, she started to speak. He had twelve star destroyers, she said. Six hundred, six hundred, tydroids. Three hundred and eighty thousand officers and crew. Slowly, excruciatingly slowly, she lifted her head to look at him. Her green eyes were molten with rage. Do you know how much of Admiral Valen's force returned? He swallowed hard. I don't. Four. Four-star destroyers. One of which is so badly damaged it may never see combat again. Another is going to require months, months of refit. And zero tie droids. She clenched her fist, worked it a few times, her nose wrinkling as she glowered contemptuously. None. The data pad was in her hand one second. And in the next, the rectangular metal slammed into the wall with impressive force, splintering against the bulkhead, bending and scattering bits of metal and plastoid as it rebounded back. I told Hamir to give me the tie droids. I told Hamir not to put Valentine in command of a garbage scow, much less a battle fleet. I told Hamir to wait and let our capabilities grow. For a brief moment, Sariti was genuinely fearful that Dala might strangle him in Hamir's place but she did not seize him by the throat after all. I should have had you hold his hand and tell him not to be a criffin idiot, damn him. I really ought to report this outburst, he thought tiredly. If he did, though ISB would add another black mark to Dala's record, and that would be one too many. The new orders enforcers would come and take her away, put her in some re-education camp somewhere where she would be quietly forgotten. She didn't deserve that end, more to the point. Her squadron needed her now more than ever. Half of her fleet had been usurped by Ran and the Corellians. She was now deep behind New Republic lines, and just reuniting with her remaining ships was going to be difficult or worse. The last thing the Starfleet needed was for her squadron to be assigned to another Valentine. So, instead of adding her name to the next ISB purge list, he merely told her what he had come to tell her. I have received orders from the Emperor Regent. She looked at him, the way his ISB instructors used to look at particularly loathsome aliens. He knew that she had wanted to talk to Hamir herself, but the orders had arrived without the opportunity for a two-way real-time connection. A simple communique only. With the loss of communications routed through Corellia, nothing more was possible. What are our orders? She asked slowly. He straightened. This news needed to be delivered with proper import even if it could not be delivered with the proper ceremony. You have been promoted to Grand Admiral, he said. Emperor Regent Hamir has placed you in command of all remaining Imperial forces. He's ordered you to attend to him with all necessary haste so that you can assume your command and pursue the glorious final victory of the Empire. Dala just stared at him. He wasn't sure what he had expected her to do. Celebrate, perhaps. With all necessary haste. She asked. He blinked. That is what the order said, he replied, glancing at it to be sure. She nodded. We will assemble our remaining fleet, as well as any other ships we can beg, borrow, or steal from the remaining Imperial systems in the core. They will all fall, now, there's no stopping that.
so we might as well take whatever resources we can and bring them with us. Then we'll return home via the most direct possible route. She brought up a map of the core and traced the hyperlanes that linked to Imperial territory in the Galactic North. Through Coruscant. Chapter 11 Mara was trying not to be irritated about not being aboard her own ship. It wasn't easy, she was comfortable aboard Tempered Metal. It was her space and her sanctuary. But she knew all too well that she was not as low profile as she used to be which meant that traveling aboard her own ship into potentially hostile territory was increasingly risky. Besides which, Lou and Mara's guide to Anar Shadow was slated to be the very pregnant Merix Tarek, and catering to Merix's comfort was more important than catering to Mara's own. She would just have to bear it. The hangar that housed Pulsar's skate was a bustle of activity. Hover dollies loaded with cargo were pushed by put-upon industrial lifter droids each making their typical sounds of grumbling discontent as they loaded the heavy packages in Skate's main cargo hold. Mara shifted another pallet of crates, next to her. Mirax's co-pilot Lyot looked almost comically small behind a heavily loaded dolly, a clan of his Celestin relatives chittering excitedly around him. Mara only knew a bit of Celestin, enough to pick up a word here or there and determine that they really wanted to know where Lyot was going, and that the Celestin, was doing an admirable job of maintaining operational security. Behind her, the war of another dolly drew her attention. Merix and Luke managed it together, pushing it into the neat space that had been allotted for the package. Well into her second trimester, Merix was mostly supervising the loading, which mostly meant telling Lyot, Luke, Mara, and the loader droids where she wanted things stacked, and why they were all doing it wrong down to the micrometer. What's in the boxes? Asked Mara, nudging the box nearest her with her toe. Why, contraband of course. Merrick's grand. It's a good thing I have a pair of Jedi to vouch for me on departure, otherwise we might have quite a bit of trouble with customs. Luke and Mara shared a look, unsure if she was joking or not. Mara's expression remained serious. Luke's was cheerfully jovial. I doubt even my reputation is enough to prevent a ship belonging to the Smuggler's Alliance from being subjected to a rigorous inspection he teased. Although it wouldn't surprise me if Card had arrangements with every customs office between here and Tatooine. Oh, farther than Tatooine, Merrick suggested. I have it on good authority that he and Kype have been as far out as Bakura just to bribe lowly customs agents. Luke laughed and Mara had to smile. It was probably true in spirit, if not in fact, and Luke's clear good humor and lack of any judgment sent an odd warmth through her. As Emperor's hand, she hadn't thought much of smugglers. They were criminals, after all, ones who broke imperial law and stole revenues that properly belonged to the Empire at a minimum. Her opinions had gradually shifted after she found herself on the fringes of the galaxy and learned just what those imposed duties actually meant for the people who needed simple goods. But she long assumed that Luke, virtuous, farm boy proper Luke, would bristle at the casual criminality of something like smuggling. In hindsight, that had been silly of her. Luke was Han Solo's brother-in-law, after all, and the two of them got along very well, but still, seeing Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker play fully skirting the New Republic's law still surprised her. It makes your heart skip, Mara, she admitted, as she watched Luke and Merrick's continue their casual banter. He had no business being so alarmingly attractive. Luke caught her eye and winked at her. She almost bumped into Lyot with her dolly and was roundly upbraided by the crowd of chittering Celestin spectators. Asterisk. I'm sorry we have to leave while you're still waiting to hear from Corrin. Luke apologized to Merrick's as she and Lyot carefully guided Pulsar Skate up through the crowd of traffic surrounding Coruscant, heading for open space and the hyperlane that would take them out towards HUD. Space. Merrick's frowned. It was a small frown, almost unnoticeable. But Luke definitely noticed it, and the slight dimming of Myrax's spirits. Whatever is going on with our homeworld, she said after a moment, Corrin felt a pull towards home, and his grandfather certainly thought he needed to be there for something important. She shrugged. I did tell him, though, that if he isn't back in time for our son to be born, I am going to name him after my father, and he won't be allowed to object. That made Luke and Mara both laugh and Lyot said something pointed in response. 
Hey, Merrick subjected, glaring at her co-pilot. Only I'm allowed to insult Corin like that. I don't even let Booster say so much as a word about him in private. Lyot snickered, and Merrick shook her head. Mock put upon. See what I have to put up with? She asked with a theatrical sigh. I'm sure he's all right, Luke said reassuringly. He's grown stronger in the Force, especially after his and Cam's experiences with Tavira and the Jensere. Oh, I know, Merrick said dryly. I love my husband, but he's not the type to let anyone forget something like that. And he had to do something to prevent my father from getting all the glory for the destruction of Invidious. She glanced at Luke. Actually, I was more disappointed that Wedge couldn't come to see us off. I was expecting he would. It's not often he has the chance to and he almost never misses it when he does. That had disappointed Luke too. He and Wedge didn't often spend a long time in one place together, but the months Lusankaya had spent in his repair dock in orbit of Coruscant had allowed them to rectify that for a time. He'd even managed to cajole Mara into a double date with Ela and Wedge with expensive tickets to the Coruscant Opera that had been a wonderful evening, something even Mara had admitted when they'd arrived home afterwards. I know he had intended to, Luke said, but something came up, I'm not sure what, he couldn't tell me. Well, I hope it's nothing bad, Merrick said. Hold on, time for our first hyperspace jump, then we'll make the best time we can to an AR Shatter. Asterisk. Dinner aboard the Pulsar Skate was a comfortable affair. Lyot sat in an elevated chair, one that put him on even height with his human companions, and was an animated conversationalist. The Celestin had been particularly interested in the Jedi Order, and taken the opportunity presented to interrogate Luke and Mara about their plans for the future. To Luke's surprise, Lyot was also highly knowledgeable about the Jedi Order of old, a consequence, no doubt of the fact he and Merrix had long made their living as a broker for Jedi artifacts. The conversation had quickly turned to Luke's plan to bring back the Antarian Rangers, an idea with which Merrix was already familiar but was new to Lyot. The Celestin considered the idea for a long time, and then battered Luke with a series of rapid-fire questions. Luke laughed. No, they won't have to be Force-sensitive. If it was that easy to find Force-sensitives, Maybe we could train Jedi quickly enough that it wouldn't be so important to bring the Rangers back. Yes, the Rangers will have an important role in decision-making, not just follow orders. I'm not sure how they'll be funded yet, exactly, but the Jedi have some wealthy donors willing to back the project. It was better not to get into the specifics, he thought, but Lyot seemed satisfied with that answer. The Celestins' next series of questions came slower, and were harder to answer. I strongly believe Luke began his answer just as slowly, letting himself work through the words before he vocalized them that the Force can work through all of us. It's true, the Jedi of old were much greater in number. That's going to be true, probably for my lifetime, if not much longer. Training a Jedi is not a long process necessarily, but it is a difficult one, and one that must be done meticulously and with care. I do not want to rush the process of training Jedi and make mistakes, as my own masters did. And yet, there's great pressure to restore Jedi presence. He pressed his lips together, thinking hard as he went on to the second part of Lyot's question. And I don't think it is necessary to be a Force user to have the wisdom and judgment required to do the job. The Force grants Jedi power and wisdom, of course, but it works through all of us, whether we are Force sensitives or not. Everyone is part of the Force. He hesitated then continued once more, not quite sure if this was something he should speak, but doing so nonetheless. And in my experience, there are times the dark side can cloud a Jedi's judgment. If we cannot always have Jedi working together because we are too few, we should always have trusted advisors and companions, people to consult with and whose wisdom we trust. I mean, I love my husband, but he's definitely at his best when he's working with Wedge and Tycho. Merrick said with a grin. That made Lyot chitter, and Luke laughed along with him. I think we all are at our best when working with Wedge and Tycho, he said with a smile. Then he glanced over his shoulder, at the corridor down which Mara had recently departed. Or Mara? I am sure Corin would be glad for that caveat, 
Merrix chuckled. Does that answer your questions, Lyot? Luke asked. Luke followed the Celestin's response reasonably well, though there were times he still struggled with the language. Lyot and I spent years studying the Jedi of old, Merrix added, even before I married the grandson of one. We are far from experts, of course, but we know about as much as any non Jedi can. That's one of the reasons I've been able to provide those Solanese airwood practice swords you've made so much use of, she added. Cam in particular appreciates them, Luke said with a smile and a nod. Also, we're still working on preparing to build more lightsabers with our apprentices. We have plenty of crystals from the museum on Coruscant, but we could use a supply of power cells. I'm sure I can make that happen. Though I do have another question, Luke said. Back on Coruscant, you implied that you had a contact on an AR Shada, someone who would be helpful in tracking down Jedi artifacts on that world. Mara's off sweeping the ship for listening and tracking devices again, but she's already done it twice. I know we are both very curious who your mysterious contact is. Merrick's hummed in response. Standing, she walked to the heating unit and removed a kettle, pouring hot water into a pair of mugs. Returning with the mugs, and a third mug for when Mara came back from her final security sweep. She slid one to Luke. You may not like this, she warned. That was a strange thing to say, Luke thought. Why not? He asked cautiously. Because you're a human from Tatooine, and I've never met a human from Tatooine who doesn't have a deep, visceral dislike of huts, she said. He shouldn't be surprised, really, Luke knew. They were going to an AR Shadda, and if there was going to be someone with enough power and money, as well as interest, on an AR Shadda to be a major player in the Jedi Antiquities trade, it would almost have to be a hut, or an agent of a hut. It was true, though, that Luke Skywalker did not like huts. That almost no one from Tatooine really liked huts. Even hut employees didn't like huts, they just paid better than almost every alternative. Do you trust him? He asked. Well enough. His name is Beldorian, and he's a major player in the Jedi antiquities trade. He and I have done business over the last few years, on and off. He's a somewhat mysterious figure for a hut, in that he doesn't seem to come from any of the major hut kajitics. He must have been exiled from one of them, but I've never seen any sign that he's on bad terms with them. He just doesn't belong to one. Luke frowned. Hut politics wasn't his expertise, but he was from Tatooine. He knew enough. That is strange. Merrick's nodded. But he's definitely among the more respectable huts. His lack of association with the clans means he has no pull in their politics and isn't a party to any of their criminal or semi-legal enterprises. He's an art dealer and about as respectable as huts come. I did my research when I started selling him antiquities. I don't typically sell to people I don't trust. And you feel safe meaning with him. Well, Merrick said, her tone becoming spoiled, almost simpering. My daddy is Booster Tarek. He owns and operates one of the only Imp Star Deuces in private hands, and most of the Turbolaser emplacements, the ones he was allowed to keep, still work. If so much as a single negative feeling is felt towards me and his first grandchild, he's going to find out who felt it, destroy their businesses and homes, strap them across one of those Turbolacers, and blast them in half. And then he's going to get me. I see your point. Seriously, though, if I was even slightly concerned, you wouldn't be making this trip without much more backup, and I wouldn't be coming at all. Merrick's rested her hand on her belly. I do, after all, have more than myself to think about. The message insisted on urgency and brooked absolutely no room for delay, so Wedge was forced to very reluctantly abandon getting to say goodbye to Merrick's and Luke in person. Instead, he flew a small shuttle, actual beside him, on a hasty trip to the senatorial skyhook, where Senator Cena Medina was waiting. Atchel sat slack in her acceleration couch, reviewing the data pad. When he chanced to glance at the woman, her expression looked as pensive and annoyed as Wedge felt. There's absolutely nothing useful here, she complained. And I don't even know if that's because it's classified or if it's because no one knows anything. The fact that it's Cena making the call suggests it's about Coralia, Wedge pointed out with a shrug. But other than that, I don't know anything more than you do. 
I hate this, she said. My marshals have the best sensor suites in the fleet. I'm not used to flying blind. I know the feeling, Wedge replied. It's the waiting to find out that I hate most. Reminds me of my Thai pilot days, Artle muttered. Through the shuttle's observation window, Wedge watched as they closed towards Karuskin. There were numerous home fleet vessels clustered defensively above the skyhook. Wedge could even see home one there, surrounded by its typical cloud of escorts. With all the haste, the shuttle's landing took only a few more minutes. The soft click of landing gear, then the shifting settle of the landing struts, communicated that it was safe to disembark, and Wedge powered down before he and Atrol both released their security straps and headed for the ramp before it had finished lowering. Wedge jogged down, reaching the deck just as the ramp touched metal, Atrol close behind him. Two troopers met them and hastily guided them towards the nearest conference room. Wedge was surprised to find the room did not just contain Cena. Next to Senator Medano was Counselor Akbar himself, and between them both was General Aaron Kraken of New Republic Intelligence. I take it that something serious has happened, Wedge said, drawing the attention of all three figures to him. And something we won't be able to keep quiet for long, though I don't think we would want to, Kraken replied with a nod. Wedge, Akbar greeted him, lowering his large head and blinking his oversized, fish-like eyes in greeting. Yes, something serious has indeed happened. It seems the depths of recent surprises are deeper even than an ocean trench. Akbar gestured around the conference table, which had a platter with pastries and a large carafe of steaming calf with mugs waiting. Sit and General Kraken and Senator Medano will brief us. Wedge and Atrel glanced at each other. Kraken and Medano would do the briefing. Wedge stole a look at Cena, his former attaché looked back with the depth of seriousness that Wedge could remember seeing before their attacks on Chaswa and Karita. But there wasn't just seriousness there. To Wedge's surprise, there was an energetic light in Cena's eyes, an excitement he had not expected to see. Of course, he said, feeling sudden anticipation swell. Evidently, the excitement within Cena could not be restrained. Corelia is free, she exclaimed, and the grin she'd been hiding burst out. Pure astonishment was Wedge's response. He'd spent the last four months planning the invasion of Corelia. What did she mean Corelia is free? What? Was all he could say. Cena was nearly giddy, excitement that made the years drop away from her, replaced with sudden youthful vigor. The New Order fleet that was guarding Corellia has changed sides, she said. Most of it has. One of the Star Destroyers was destroyed by the other five and an armada of Corellian volunteers. The Imperial government and Cornet has been scattered and Dick de Gallenby is reportedly dead. I've just received a message from a new Corellian ruling council, which wants to take the first steps towards formally claiming my Senate seat to represent not just Corellia in exile, but Corellia proper. Words failed Wedge. Beside him, Atrel boggled with surprise. How did this happen? Wedge finally managed. Can we confirm any of it? Kraken finally stepped in. I think we can, he said. Wraith Squadron has been on the ground on Corellia for almost a year both hunting Fleary Voru and working against the Dictat, and they're far from my only intelligence assets. The hollow net is still blocked, but messages are starting to trickle in from neighboring systems. I've received three different confirmations that there's been a changeover in government on Corellia in the last two hours, and I expect more will arrive shortly. Kraken smiled, a look so unfamiliar on his typically serious face that Wedge found it disturbing. As for how it happened, I'm sure it'll be some time before we can work out the exact details, but it appears the Imperial fleet either mutinied or refused orders to suppress the protests. You will find this in particular interesting, which, the main rumor is the mutiny was precipitated by a military disaster on the Outer Rim. Slowly, excitement started to wane as the general asserted control over the Corellian native. The new order attacked Pawn Major and was repulsed by Pillian, which guessed and decisively, Kraken agreed. I don't know how credible these rumors are, but I've seen reports that the New Order lost as many as 12 Imperial-class Star Destroyers in the attempt. Astral's look of astonishment redoubled. Wedge merely whistled. That would be a heavy blow, he said slowly. 
and I could see how it might precipitate a mutiny elsewhere, in the fleet. He looked at Akbar. Admiral, what now? The Mon Calamari offered an amused smile. It's counselor now, General. And I don't know. I know you were planning to begin your offensive as soon as tomorrow, but it would appear that is no longer necessary. I would suggest you wait another week or so and finish all the repairs you require rather than rushing out to return to the battlefield. We wanted Lusankaya and 5th Fleet out saving Corellia, but it seems the Corellians, in typical Corellian fashion, may have saved themselves instead. They all glanced at Atro when she made a sound of discontent. When she realized their regard, she straightened, blushing. Oh? You have a concern? Commodore. Cena asked pointedly. Oh no, not really, Atro said, shaking her head. This is all wonderful, of course. I just... The New Order does not react to losing well. Just look at their terrorist attack on Rendili after Rendili declared its independence. So if it was willing to kill thousands of Rendili dock workers just to punish Rendili for its defiance, what is ISB going to do in response to this? Nothing good, Cena admitted. General Kraken sighed heavily and shook his head. It's true. Just like Rendili, I'm going to assume that the Empire will want to make Corellia pay for his treason. He rubbed his nose, looking unhappy. And I would be wary of sending our own fleets into the Corellian system to defend it. The people in charge of communication, and whoever is commanding the new Corellian defense fleet, not to mention Corellia's static defenses which may still be controlled by Imperial Loyalists, might respond aggressively to any uninvited display of force. While the Corellians do not want to be ruled by the Empire, there's a fairly substantial faction who also doesn't want to be ruled by the New Republic. We'll know one way or the other soon. I'm going to Corellia, Cena said. You're what? Kraken practically jumped out of his chair, and Akbar looked equally ill at ease with the suggestion. I'm going right now. By myself, and I'm going to meet the new Corellian government and see who is in charge and what they want. I'll also present them with the terms under which I will be able and willing to represent them in the Senate. Are you certain it is a wise idea to sail these seas? Akbar said, his voice slow and thoughtful, without any of Cena's excited haste. Perhaps it would be best to allow the surface to settle, so that the horizon before us is more clear. Cena shook her head decisively. No, absolutely not. There is an opportunity here and now, and I will not be remembered as the woman who missed the opportunity to welcome Corellia into the New Republic. The worst thing that could happen is I get martyred. No, Crack encountered. The worst thing that could happen is you end up in Imperial custody. One and the same, Cena replied dismissively. I'm still as prepared for that eventuality as I was in the old days. Which? You need to get Fifth Fleet ready. If the Empire decides that it has to punish Corellia the way it punished Rendili, the cost could be enormous. The moment I have a basing agreement with the new Corellian government, I want Fifth Fleet there to defend it. Yes, ma'am. Good man. Now find me a pilot. They better be almost crazy enough to fly with the rogues. Didn't I just leave this party? Han Solo felt acutely uncomfortable back in uniform even if it was a set of rumpled fleet command fatigues and not the razor-sharp creases of the imperial tunic and breeches he'd worn so long ago. He'd already removed the general's tabs. I don't need anyone getting confused, he thought wryly. So far no one had asked about it, but just hauling the uniform out from the forgotten depths of his closet had felt like trudging through a swamp. Or a crosshoff. Or both at once. At least it still fit. Chewbacca had returned from Kashyyyk as suddenly as he had departed, with Han, Leia, and the twin safety assured by a new cadre of Nori bodyguards for the last few months. Chewbacca had felt the freedom to spend a truly extended period back home and had taken full advantage. But with Han's decision to rejoin the fleet, if only temporarily, Chewbacca had returned immediately. They had argued then. But ultimately Han had won and persuaded Chewie to stay on Coruscant and help look after the twins. With Han leaving they would need a father figure, and there was no one Han would rather have in the role than Chewbacca, even if the fact that Han was going off into battle again while Chewie would be staying behind made the Wookiee miserable. He'd been miserable before, Han reminded himself. He'd get over it.
The massive fleet admiral's quarters about Lu Sankayo were larger than Han could have imagined. His old quarters on Mon Ramonda had been spacious but not the size of a large apartment, and Wedge's quarters made some large apartments look tiny. Around the table at the center of the briefing room was the rest of Wedge's staff, Captain Creefy, Lusanica's commanding officer, and Commodore Taban, his aide. How long until Lusankaya will be ready for deployment? Wedge asked, looking over at Creefy. If you wanted to hurry us out, we could deploy today, Creffy growled. But we'd have to deploy without our full logistics train. Dala's attacks have stretched us to the limit and we're barely half-stocked on proton torpedoes. We're not going to be deploying today, or even this week, Wedge said. It'll take Cena some time to smuggle herself into Corellia, and no matter how amenable the new government is, I doubt she'll have any kind of formal agreement quickly. If ever, actual teased. You're an ornery, aggressive, confrontational bunch. Hey, I resent that, Han said, folding his arms across his chest. Chewbacca style. I also don't think Corellia's in any immediate danger. Even if the Empire wants to punish Corellia, they just don't have the ships to do it. Without Corita or Iriadu, they can't even get to Corellia. The New Republic controls all the major routes through the core, and even ISB wouldn't risk taking a whole battle fleet through the deep core. The Empire has proven adept at exploiting unknown or temporary hyperlanes, Atrel warned him. And don't forget the rumors that Luke and Mara are following up on, Wedge added. There was a darkness to his expression that made Han vaguely nervous. Stress had deepened the lines in Wedge's face, and there was some fresh gray in his hair, even though Wedge was still a young man, much younger than Han himself. Han had no doubt that Wedge was capable of commanding Fifth Fleet, but he remembered the sleepless nights and endless responsibility when he had led a task force, all those months away from Leia battling sins from system to system, tearing his hair out to put the mad Orlor down. Clearly, the responsibilities were taking a similar toll on the other Corellian. You've all been briefed on the rumors about Silencer Station, Wedge added. An Imperial boogeyman fresh from the dark days of the rebellion, Han muttered. If the rumors are true, we could be looking at another Katana fleet scenario. A new Imperial battle fleet fresh from the assembly line with modern ships instead of old ones, Wedge said. I don't know how alarmed we should be yet, but some alarm feels appropriate. Alarm was always appropriate, Han thought sourly. That was why he'd retired. He looked at the hollow map being projected from Wedge's command table. The core was enlarged and in focus, and on it Han could see the smear of New Republic red, and the dots of Imperial blew along the trade routes that centered around Corellia. Corellia itself was a slashed Dedrick board of yellow, blue, and red to indicate its contested, uncertain status. Dala's estimated fleet strength was displayed off to the side, although that too was multicolored, since the exact status of the Star Destroyer she had been using to garrison Corellia was still unknown. Still, that left her with a significant fleet they had yet to account for, and the whole reason Wedge had brought Han here was so Han could guess what Dala would do next. Han thought back to his academy days. They shared a few classes, and many of them had competitive elements. He could remember more than one strategy game which had begun with Dala suffering a serious loss, and he could remember how she had usually responded. I think you have a more pressing problem. Wedge, Creffy, and Atrel turned towards him. Han leaned forwards, propping his elbows up on his knees, and stared at Wedge. Where's Dala? He asked. I have no idea, Wedge said. He glanced at Atro, who shrugged. Last we know for sure was the attack Stormhawk staged on Lyria Kurosu, she said. Our best guess was that she had approximately ten Star Destroyers under her overall command, but six of those were at Corellia. That leaves her with four, which isn't exactly enough to pose a major threat. She's still out there, Wedge said, and his tone of voice suggested he saw Han's point. Probably somewhere in the core, probably somewhere close to Corellia. And she might not be able to punish Corellia with four ships, but if it's true that I.S.B. has agents running herd on all Imperial fleet captains, I.S.B. may force her to try anyway. He waved his hand at Han, beckoning. 
Han, what's Dallas Instinct going to be in this scenario? Han snorted. Nadasi Dalla has one governing instinct. Find a weakness and attack it. She's that one-dimensional? Atrel asked. If you saw the bone fracture she left in her wake, you might have assumed she was a rebel operative sent to assassinate the Academy's graduating class, Han said dryly. Look, he took a long drink, set the glass down on Wedge's table, and hunched forward, placing his hands on his knees. Dalla is not the most imaginative person I ever met, but she is determined, she is tenacious, and she is smart. She's also out there in the core with a handful of star destroyers, any one of which could wreck a planet if given enough uninterrupted bombardment time. Whatever the Empire is cooking up with this silencer station is a problem for the future. For the next week or two, you should worry about Dalla first. Chapter 12 The first month or so of their confinement aboard silencer station, Cray and Nietzsche's had worked together on the tasks that had been forced upon them. Nietzsche's degeneration had made that more and more difficult, but there were still days that he felt strong enough to help for hours at a time. The muscular tasks he could no longer do, even on his good days, but Cray relied on him heavily for programming and debugging, so Nietzsche's dug deep and found the strength he needed to help. She worked so hard, and he would not let her work alone, especially not now when they were fighting to find ways to keep up their appearance of usefulness while still looking for ways to sabotage the Empire. As of now, he noted, their code passed muster with the programs, but it was elegantly obtuse, rickety, and rife with repeating errors. The longer it ran, the worse it would work. He needed, he added silently to himself, to find a way to ensure that Cray would survive. Because Nietzsche's Mar would find a way for her to survive. He would. His fiancé's workspace, such as it was, was a far cry from the expensive, expansive, and immaculate facilities they had at the McGrody Institute. While Silencer Station had grown, the space allotted to her work had not, and the shelves were littered with old, failed prototypes. It had originally belonged to a scientist named Bevel Limelisk and been built to his specifications, though Cray assumed that the locks on the outside and the vents linked to canisters of anesthetic gas had not been part of his original design. Now the center of the serpentine condits, lab benches, and Spartan seats was a simple chair, moderately cushioned and with high armrests. A monitor was affixed to one of the armrests, providing a conduit that the silencer station AI could use to send command information to the person in the chair. Above the chair, in a little rack that niches had built on a good day of greater physical strength and coordination sat the command interface prototype that had not failed. It wasn't much to look at. It had the appearance of a typical blast shield helmet, with protection for the eyes, but on the inside of the shield were additional monitors and an array of neural links which would allow instant mental commands to the station's AI, and instant feedback from that AI. It was a masterpiece of cybernetic technology, a melding of the merely human with the massively artificial, Emperor and waiting Eirek Eismarin sat nervously in the chair. A teenager who had not yet reached full human maturity, there were times that Eirek looked even younger than that. He was of slightly above average height, with black hair and blue eyes, eyes that had a tendency to follow Cray as she moved, Nietzsche's noted with a small amount of amusement. The Emperor was accompanied by a pair of towering droids of the same kind that Nietzsche's had seen with the Emperor Regent. The DT model assassin droid was being produced in large numbers now, and was an increasingly common sight aboard the station. He and Cray hadn't had many unobserved moments they could use to plot sabotage, but he was sure that she had also spent hours considering it. But, unless she had come up with a plan more creative than his, not an unlikely possibility, they simply didn't have any good options. Killing Irek would be much easier but Nietzsche's wasn't sure what it would accomplish. It would be easy, though, to sabotage Cray's interface and use it to overload the teenager's synapses. I want to try again, Irek said, the depth of his voice mature even as the tone was not. He seized the interface and placed it on his head, turning to sit on the command chair. He was too small for it, it had been sized for Cray, and she was taller than Irek was and Nietzsche was struck by just how small he looked in that chair. 
like a child playing dress up, he thought. A very dangerous child, playing with very dangerous toys. He should try a different tack first, before resorting to murder, Nietzsche's decided. Asterisk. Irek pushed with the thought and the screens on the interior of the helmet blinked to illuminated life. Sudden rows of text scrolled across the screen, far too quick for Irek to follow, and a sudden sense of pressure was all around him, as if the helmet was contracting around his skull. There was a sense of crackling static in his ears and nose and mouth, and Irek's body arched back in the chair, almost lifting up as his arms pressed hard to the armrests, his fists going suddenly taut. He felt the urge to scream and bit it back, nearly biting on his tongue instead, and tore the helmet from his head. His eyes were squeezed shut but he could still see explosions of light on the inside of his eyelids. When he was finally able to open his eyes, he stared angrily at Cray. She had recovered the throne interface and was examining it for damage. Why won't it work? He snarled. Cray shook her head. It works for me, at least to establish a connection, she said, sounding puzzled more than scared or ashamed for her failure. The helmet itself is working, so the problem must be connecting to the silencer AI, she mused. But why would I be able to make the connection while he can't? The question was not intended for Irek. Nietzsche's mark coughed. Slumped in the couch to the side of the room, the crippled scientist was contemptibly weak, and Irek wasn't sure why Cray insisted on bringing him to their sessions. Let me see the error report, he said feebly, his voice hoarse. If a stun blast could have such a dire effect on him, Irek thought sourly, he can't have long to live. Cray handed Nietzsche's a datapad, then helped him hold it when he proved unable to keep his grip. Irek watched, with mounting annoyance. Is there a point to this? Nietzsche's and I are a team, Cray said, with patience that bordered on condescending. And when it comes to debugging, it's always a good idea to have a second pair of eyes. There, Nietzsche said weakly. Line 4798. He slumped back against the couch. Cray laid him down gently, then straightened. As usual, Irik was struck by the slender beauty of the woman. But she was silent, intently reading, and he grew impatient. What does it say? Nietzsche is right. The problem isn't with the interface, Cray said. The connection is being rejected by the silencer AI. Why would it reject me, and not you? Irek complained. I'm the emperor. It wouldn't let me give it commands because I'm not the emperor, Cray pointed out. So it's something about making the initial connection. You said, Nietzsche's wheezed weakly, that Reganda told you that the force was required for the connection. That caused Irek's head to lift. He stared at Cray, seeing her suddenly in an entirely new light. You're force sensitive. Cray shrugged helplessly. I don't even know what that means, much less how it could help commanding an AI. She shook her head. I'll be right back. I need another cup of calf. The workspace had an adjoining office with the calf machine. Irek was still grappling with the idea that Cray was Force-sensitive as she vanished through the door. She's Force-sensitive. His mother had taught him many things, but the most important thing was that he was special. They were special. They had a gift. One denied to most people in the galaxy. One that made them better. The Force was all the power of the galaxy, distilled into a form that could be accessed by those worthy of his power, and Irek and his mother were worthy. I think, said Nietzsche's weakly from his place, prone on the couch, that you two can use the interface if you have the right perspective. The interruption was unwelcome, and Irek turned a scornful gaze on Nietzsche's. It was wasted on the man whose eyes were closed and breaths came slow. Annoyed, Irek pouted. And what is that supposed to mean? The force is not just a matter of power, Nietzsche sighed, sounding exhausted but determined, but also a matter of focus. Do you know how to listen? What do you mean, listen? Irek asked, curious despite himself. What could this man know of the force? I am emperor. If there is any listening to be done it is people hearing my wishes and carrying them out. Nietzsche's just nodded blandly. Empty your mind, he encouraged. Don't think of your desires or your needs. Empty yourself of those things. Then activate the interface. If this didn't work, 
Irek thought sourly, he might just kill the man. But, he returned to the command chair and placed himself back upon it. Closing his eyes, he did his best to clear his mind. He found it was easier with Cray not in the room. Then he reached and put the command interface on his head. Electricity once more crackled around him, tingling over his skin. His hair went frizzy, and the pressure started to build, filling his ears and nose and brain. His heartbeat went rapid as the lines of text scrolled before his eyes, flashing, and he felt a sense of sudden invasion and presence, his brain recoiling, almost fighting against it. And then it all stopped. Pain receded back to pressure, and the text scrolled slow to a stop. Command interface established. Silencer 7 await an interlink. The words gleamed in green against a black background and sudden, joyous success roared through him. Yes. He wasn't sure if he said the word aloud. He thought he heard talking, somewhere in another life, but he was laser-focused on commanding the silencer AI, for it would make him emperor in truth, and not just in name. Show me. The system hesitated for a moment, parsing that order. He realized, belatedly, that he needed to be more precise in his commands. A map of the system appeared, with the label K3-947. The system star was in the middle, and Silencer 7 was marked over the fifth planet, slowly consuming it for resources. Tydroids were dotted over the map by the squadron, though most of them had been taken by Hamir for his assault on Paul Major. Automated, droid commanded transport streaked across the system occasionally. The system indicated that they were carrying necessary supplies from Entrala and other Imperial military bases. In the back of his mind was a twinge. His brain took a moment to interpret it, and then he recognized it was an alert conveyed through the command interface. He wasn't sure how to respond to it, and it took him another minute to figure out how to use the interface to bring up more information. On the map in front of him appeared a new symbol. A slightly elongated triangle, it was labeled invincible. As it grew closer, it started to blink red, and a small status alert marked it as heavily damaged. Asterisk. The sprawling halls of Silencer Station were dark and maze-like on purpose. Irek was not intimidated by the DT model droids that were responsible for the Emperor Regent's protection. They had, after all, been designed specifically to serve his mother and himself, and graven into their circuits were commands that would prohibit them from ever doing him harm no matter what Hamir might intend. Anger mixed together with an intense desire to gloat. Hamir had taken their fleet, 12-star destroyers was a not insignificant amount of the new order strength and had lost almost all of them. No doubt his mother would take Hamir to task for his failures when she returned, but until then, Ayarek was emperor. He did not wait for the door to open. Using his override code, he commanded it to do so, and it obeyed. Striding into the emperor region's private quarters, he stopped in sudden surprise as he entered and found himself in a space utterly unlike anything he had expected. A lavish apartment, perhaps, with ancient Sith artifacts, not unlike the rooms his mother maintained. Or a room fit for royalty, like those he had observed in his younger years. Instead, he stood in a small-scale planetarium. The space was largely spherical, lit darkly, and filling the space was a hollow projection of the galaxy. Mostly a disk that captured the galactic plane, it also had extragalactic objects and numerous, gray lines of varying widths that connected star systems. He could see where those lines coincided and realized that those locations were key star systems, like Coruscant and Corellia, and the lines were hyperlanes. Some of the thinner lines constantly flickered, in and out. An arm clamped around Irek's neck, and he flailed in surprise. He was jerked backwards, his head knocking against Hamira's armored form. Flailing, he grabbed at Hammer's arm, but a second arm locked around him, holding him in place, pressure growing on his neck. Hasn't your mother taught you not to enter where you are not welcome, boy? Panicked and furious, how dare Hamir lay a hand on him, Irik lashed out with the force. Rage fed his power and the burst of telekinesis exploded out from him, breaking Hammer's grip. But Hammer's footing was steadier, and instead of blowing the Emperor Regent backwards, as he had intended, Irek found himself flung forwards, flying through the hologram of the galactic east with a staticky fuzz towards the far well. 
Blue lights flared in front of his gaze, dazzling his vision as his head passed through the Bothan sector. Momentarily blind, Irek reached out into the force, abandoning his senses. His hand moved without thought, guided to perfectly deflect one of Hammer's fists, but he moved too slow to block the second, which slammed into his stomach and drove the breath out of his lungs. Irek doubled over, gasping for air. A thick arm snaked up around his neck once more, and he was wrenched backwards, thudding against Hammer's chest. Scared and stunned, he kept his eyes closed. The hologram of the galaxy was still projected at near eye level, and opening them was searing. Was there something you wanted from me, my emperor? Hamir growled contemptuously into his ear. It might, Irek reflected as he gasped weakly for breath, be best not to antagonize Hamir by commanding that he sanitize his mouth. I have, succeeded, he managed to husk, panting for shallow breaths, and issuing detailed commands to Silencer 7. He realized, belatedly, telling Hamir this might not be the best idea. As the Emperor Regent's iron-muscled arm clenched harder around his neck, ridding him of the ability to take even shallow breaths, it occurred to him that Hamir might interpret his words as a threat. The world started to turn black, and he tried, again, to use the force to free himself, and for a moment he thought he succeeded when he collapsed to the floor like a gaff fish. He took a single full breath, then swiveled to slam his leg into Hamir's midsection with a rising kick. His unarmored leg struck Hamir's apron-like cuirass, and his plans and anger dissolved into a shock of pain. Hamir stood over him, his cold blue eyes burning like frozen fire. Your mother has made a lot of promises, boy. Promises to me? Promises to you? Promises to the moths, and promises to herself, about what she can do, and about what you can do. One hand reached down and Irek was yanked to his feet roughly. So far she has kept none of them. She promised the Empire that Silencer 7 would turn the war in our favor. She promised that it would build us a fleet and an army that would defeat the New Republic. Her failures have given us defeat after defeat. Hamara's hand gripped Irek's jaw and tilted his face up. You say you can command Silencer 7. Good. Now give me the ties I was promised a year ago. A burst of force power pushed Irek towards the exit. Humiliated and furious, he considered turning back to challenge Hamir once again. But something in his gut, something in the force, told him that if he did, he would not be leaving this room alive. He started to move towards the exit. Boy. Irek stopped and looked back over his shoulder. I knelt with Vader at Palpatine's feet, Hamir said flatly, his pale blue, almost white eyes staring at Irek with the ferocity of daggers. I know what his power was like. His was superior. A half dozen retorts flashed through Irek's mind, but that nagging sense of danger, of acute danger, did not pass. He did not nod. He did not say a word. He merely turned and left. Once he was safely outside, his pace quickened to a near run, and Homerus DT droid stood silent sentinel over his flight, unable or unwilling to protect him from his own regent. Reganda Icemarin landed in a small, out-of-the-way hangar on an AR Shatta, deep in what had, in archaic times, been the industrial sector. Now several thousand years removed from its heyday, the industrial sector was a hodgepodge of poverty, homelessness, and destitution. Even the smugglers endemic to an AR Shatta, the smuggler's moon, usually avoided the industrial sector. There was simply no reason to go there. The only reason to so much as set down was if you were conducting a business deal that you wanted to remain completely secret, or if you were one of the unfortunate sentients who had found themselves trapped on an AR shadow without credits or the means to make credits. The only industry left was a flourishing, underground hydroponic sector who produced just enough to feed the locals and make a few of them petty monarchs of the destitute. That was all right with Reganda Icemarin. She respected those industrious enough to rise to the top of their own little dung heaps. That took strength and guts. She didn't need to worry about a crew. Regenda had never worried about a crew. During her time as Emperor's Hand, she had always managed on her own. Crews were liabilities. They were traitors in waiting, or incompetent. The Empire was filled with such things. 
Only she had the emperor's true trust, she knew, and because of that, he had always supplied her with agents she could trust. The metal of her small army of droids was painted black, constructed anew by Silencer 7, another droid, programmed to be loyal to the Empire, and to her personally, her DTs were an advanced design based on the ones the Emperor had once provided her. Untraceable, lethal assassin droids, the DTs had been her protectors and her agents, and she would settle for nothing less than perfection. Once she had the artifact she sought and her army was complete, the loyalty of the Empire would be completely assured. She and Irek would rule, never needing to worry about the ambition of a Tarkin, the obsession of an Isert, or the dithering cowardice of a Pillian. The combat droid she had designated as her aide de camp, DT-130, made an unintelligible sound, and then dinged once. The second sound was one she had programmed into the droid to tell her when she had received a message via the hollow net. Now that they were on the ground, her transport had automatically linked to the Y-Tube system's hollow net node. A second dink, this one slightly lower in pitch, and drawn out for a full second, indicated that the message in question was from Irek. She smiled. He was so well-mannered, her son. The Jedi had been wrong about the importance of proper breeding. Their insistence that Jedi not bear children had been one of the Order's greatest weaknesses especially given that force strength was often inherited, but they had been exactly right about the importance of tree and from birth. She had been trained by the Jedi from birth, after all, and those lessons about discipline and serenity had not been entirely misguided. So many of the young Inquisitors, like that Welp Brachus, had lacked the early Jedi training, and it showed. Her son appeared on the flat screen. His expression immediately killed her good spirits. He was flat and emotionless, as he often was when bearing bad news. Mother, the Emperor Regent took our fleet and attacked Paul Major, he said, without preamble. He was forced to retreat with heavy losses. Both the fleet and the TIE droids performed abysmally. I will take personal responsibility for persuading our resident cyberneticists to ensure that our TIE droids perform better in the future. Raganda's fist clenched until her knuckles went white. Anger, not rage, not yet. She would not give in to the rage that boiled in her stomach until she had a target deserving of it, lit bright in her heart. Hamir, you fool. The self-destructive moron. Hamir was capable enough. His force talents were acceptable, and he was competent, within his area of expertise. But he had always been a second, never the leader. As an apprentice he had failed to earn the attention of a master, as an Inquisitor, he had lived for years in Tremaine's shadow, and after Endor, he had languished as Jarek's administrator, while Jarek, like Ragonda, sought ancient artifacts and places of power that he could use to impose his will. Now they were both dead, and that left Hamir, poor, timid Hamir, despite his size and outward mind, and mantle of manly warrior strength as the leader of the Inquisitor. Hamir had always been capable. He could administrate. He could oversee. He could manage. But he could not lead. Raganda, you fool, she thought to herself bitterly. You knew you still needed him, and still you let your contempt get the better of you? You drove him to this with your needling. She relaxed her fist and reminded herself that it didn't matter. If she could find the Emperor's prize on an AR Shaddaa, then she would not need Hamir. She would not need the Empire, and all those competing egos and biological inefficiencies that had grounded to a juddering halt. All she would need was Irek and her droids. Their loyalty and their competence was unquestioned and unquestionable. She would be the Empire. As if expecting that thought, Irek told her exactly what she wanted to hear when she resumed the message. I have good news as well. I have successfully activated the Silencer 7 command interface. It is only a matter of time before I have mastered it. The breath Raganda released was one she had not realized she was holding. Had been holding, in fact, for quite a long time. Irex's inability to issue commands to the Silencer 7 AI had been an inconvenience, but not a deadly one. Once she delivered the seed, once she accomplished that final merger between the technology of the Empire and the ancient secrets of the dark side of the Force, she was not fully sure what Silencer 7 would become. The Emperor had intended to command it himself 
and Reganda had always needed Eirik to ensure its obedience to her will. He had finally succeeded, and she was on the verge of finding the seed. All was providence. The transmission died, and Reganda gave a small nod of approval. Her son seldom bothered to end messages with any empty platitudes. Acknowledge receipt of message, she said in her flat, coruscant accent. Tell the boy to treat the woman and the cripple gently. They will break if too firm a hand is applied and their expertise is still necessary. And give him my personal congratulations for his success. Then we hunt. Asterisk. The depths of the old industrial sector were dark. This part of NAR Shaddai had never undergone the extensive renovations of a few thousand years before, which had cleared out old buildings and brought much of the moon closer to its true surface. Here the towers were clustered even closer together, and the closer to the ground you got, the more they became an interlocking maze. Old, decrepit buildings, wall to wall, block to block, filled with destitute and dangerous wildlife and old, still vital planetary utility systems maintained by droids constantly fighting back that wildlife. She could look up and see old lighting systems which had long since lost their glow. Without that glow there was almost no light at all, and no natural light. This far down, the natural, orangish-brown sky of an AR shadow was entirely invisible, and there was no real distinction between outside and inside. It reminded her a bit of the maze-like interior of the depths of Silencer 7. Her droid companions were unbothered by it. Regana actually found the entire experience invigorating. She had always enjoyed the hard work of archaeological endeavor. The Emperor's assignments had never been burdens, she expected that was why he had chosen her, why she had been the one given these assignments which now would define both her future and that of the galaxy, but glorious puzzles to solve. Even when she had been a child, with the Jedi Order, she had enjoyed puzzles, and the multitude of force manipulation games put aside for the younglings had been a perpetual joy. This puzzle would take her some time to solve, she knew, but she had the time. She started by narrowing her search. As best she could tell, the object she had found amongst the ruins of Draman Kos had been recovered from an AR shadow. Further research had provided little in the way of precise information, but ancient records had pointed her towards the industrial district and to the likelihood that the best indication that she was getting close to her quarry would be territorial droids. Droids were common in the industrial district, the huts utilized small armies of them, and mercenaries to routinely travel down and clear out threats to the extensive, ancient infrastructure near the ground, but most of those droids had missions that it was easy to identify. This team of droids was specifically defending an old water filtration plant. That team of droids was responsible for the power generator that was still used, despite its age, to provide energy to much of the neighboring districts. So what she was looking for was droids, without an obvious mission. Granted. That wasn't enough to narrow her search entirely. Some of the teams of droids had been sent by huts a few centuries before, or even longer. With a few maintenance units, they could in theory sustain themselves almost indefinitely. She found a small cadre of droids which was still defending a building which had no apparent purpose. The droids were old, but not so ancient that their designs were unrecognizable, so Reganda had been pretty sure they weren't what she was looking for, and indeed, once her own combat droids had cleared the building, she'd found them defending what had once been a luxury apartment with a well-protected safe. She hadn't bothered to look inside. Days later, and much deeper down into the district, her scout droids gave the first indication of something truly interesting. A surveillance droid, a floating unit, small and inconspicuous but one that her own modern units spotted with relative ease, kept watch on her team as it had cleared one of the buildings. Intrigued, she ordered her droids to clear other nearby buildings and note when they were watched and when they were ignored. Then, as she continued to explore the buildings around the ones that were watched, her team reported to surveillance droids, and then three. She tracked them back to the middle levels of a particular structure. This was one of the older buildings, HUD records suggested at least 7,000 years and it appeared to be comparatively well-maintained, with no sign of serious structural flaws, which was interesting, given that it had received no maintenance to speak of. It was also enormous, 
a sprawling structure which linked into a network with a dozen other buildings. She she continued to narrow her search. Once they were inside, the surveillance droids had vanished. Perhaps whatever intelligence governed them realized that she had been following them back to their source, but that was all right. Her team of combat droids was more than capable of searching the entire building, and with their power sources, they could operate autonomously day or night without need for rest. It had been an unexpected surprise when her A-droid beeped an alert at her. Combat engagement reported, her data pad announced, complete with a red exclamation and a summary. Where? She asked, tapping the device. Dutifully, it responded that one of her search teams had been attacked while examining one of the corridors in the building she was searching. Right that moment there was a battle going on between her modern unit and a team of droids. The data pad provided schematics, but they weren't anything she recognized, and that was good. Come with me, she ordered her aide. Send reinforcements. Tell them I want that corridor searched. When she got there herself, she found herself in the middle of a furious blaster battle. Her DT droids marched into the corridor, their armor protecting them from the blaster fire coming their way, but not entirely. Several units were damaged, and several others had been destroyed. Scattered in the corridor were the metal corpses of their foes, slain in much greater numbers. She used the force to take one of the metal bodies out of the line of fire to examine it. Her eight droids stood watch, blaster at the ready. Linking back to her ship, which was connected to an AR Shadda's hollow net node, she began a slow query back to the ubiquitous base on Yaga Minor, which hosted all of the Empire's records. That would probably take hours, so instead of waiting she examined the droid herself. She knew quite a lot about droids. She was no cyberneticist, but her preference for assured loyalty meant that she insisted on maintaining her units herself, and was familiar with contemporary models and maintenance. These droids had numerous systems designs that were completely archaic. She could parallel them to modern designs. That must be a power generator, and this must be a primary motivator. But beyond that, they were opaque. I think we have found it, she said to her aide. DT-130 beeped with satisfaction. Bring all units here, she ordered. Tell them to fight on. Asterisk. Six hours later, she had become sure of two things. First, she was definitely in the right place. Second, she may not have brought enough droids. Her units were decimating the enemy with relative ease, but they never stopped coming. Her droids had pushed them back farther and farther deeper and deeper into the bowels of the structure they defended, towards the artifact that Raganda was sure was driving them. But as many as she destroyed, there were more still coming, and her forward units announced that their numbers had abruptly doubled. An artifact that could create an endless army of droids, she reminded herself, bitterly self-castigating. An endless army, Raganda. But you didn't believe that it would create that army here, and now before you even had it in your hands. You were a fool. If Hamir found out about this, he would humiliate her. She wouldn't even be able to hold his debacle at Paul Major against him. Her cheeks burned with embarrassment at the thought. Retreat, she ordered her aide, wanting to preserve as much as her combat power as she could while she came up with a new plan. There must be some construction facility hidden away, some power generation source, Maybe that generator that was still powering the nearby district was also providing power here. Her droids obeyed, falling back in an orderly retreat. Perfectly coordinated and timed, they did not flee as men would, panicked and confused. They kept up constant fire, slaying the enemy droids by the score as they fell back. But the enemy droids kept coming, kept coming in even greater numbers, and even after they had retreated to the point where combat had first begun, they did not stop. Regenda found herself cursing as she ducked blaster fire. She was a capable fighter. Anyone who was Palpatine's chosen hand was a capable fighter, but that had never been her true purpose, and she had no business trying to fight off an army of droids. The rangers at Belsivis had taught her to fight with any weapon at her disposal, but their emphasis had always been on hand-to-hand -hand combat and running to survive. She fired her blaster as she fell back, her aide following her loyally, always keeping his bulk between her and the enemy. 
Luckily, the enemy did not seem interested in her personally, its attention consumed with hunting down and destroying her smaller droid army. Leaving her aide behind to cover her escape, she returned to her airspeeder and jetted into the sky, silently cursing her own stupidity. Below, the unleashed army of droids finished exterminating her DTs, and then, it started hunting new prey. Chapter 13 The Pulsar Skate is a happy ship, Mara thought, but she isn't home. Merrick's Tarek's ship had an artistic elegance that the more industrial-tempered metal lacked, with graceful, sloping curves that gave the ship an organic, sea-creature-like appearance from the outside. Her interior wasn't lacking either with an orderly, well-structured use of space to maximize cargo capacity while still providing for passenger privacy and comfort for small numbers of people at least. It was more that Mara preferred her own ship and her own space, hard one as they both were. Especially when she had Luke with her, Mara took comfort in a happy cocoon of shared isolation, letting Luke in and keeping everyone else out. She knew it wasn't an entirely healthy instinct and she was working on becoming more comfortable around other people. She really, really was, especially Leia and Han, and the twins, people who were part of Luke's life, and therefore part of her life whether she liked it or not. But it, something that took an effort. It was an effort she invested consciously, slowly allowing a level of intimacy with her friends and family that the Emperor's hand would have abhorred. And there were moments where it was even really satisfying and brought her happiness. Having Luke helped, he was so emotionally open, so quick to invest himself in others, so able to empathize, that sometimes all she had to do was put herself in his wake, and she would be swept along beside him. Sometimes he had to do a bit of pushing and pulling, she admitted, but he never forced her hand. It had been the same way during this trip. Morrow already knew Merrick's and considered her a friend, but Lyot was entirely new to her and the Celestin was almost obnoxiously cheerful and friendly, two traits Mara could not ascribe to herself. Of course, Lyot and Luke got along quite well, increasingly so over the duration of the tip, as the two of them spent hours conversing about the politics of the Jedi Order or obscure smugglers Argot, topics which Mara could easily follow and contribute to, and despite, Plum's Luke always brought her carefully in to join them. Now, nearing the end of the trip, she was actually starting to like Lyot and enjoy his company. It was nice. Kind of. So you did enjoy the trip, Luke teased beside her as the two of them dressed. Luke's Jedi robes were packed away, deemed far too conspicuous for an AR Shada, and the two of them put on a pair of typical Spacer's duty jumpsuits. Comfortable, loose without being baggy, and with plenty of pockets. The jumpsuits were a cornucopia of places suitable for concealing tools, comms, and weapons. Luke carried only his lightsaber in a leather tool case, and his blaster on his hip. Mara carried everything she thought she might need. Days passed like days and not months, Mara said noncommittally. Luke chuckled and leaned over to brush a kiss to her cheek. I'll take that as a yes. Lyot likes you, but you know. Does he? Most people like you after you let them get to know you, Luke confirmed. Merrick's voice came over the Pulsar Skate's intercom. I've received docking clearance in the Corellian district, she said, where I normally land when I can. There's a lot of activity around here, and I'm not entirely sure why, but it could be about everything going on back home, I guess. After we're on the ground, I'll have to deal with the dock manager. Stay out of sight while I do. There shouldn't be trouble, not with all my father and Carr's connections on my side. How long until we can meet with your contact? That may take a little longer, Merrick's replied. Over the sound of the intercom, they could hear the regular beeping of the ship's controls, which matched the gentle hum of the engines. I don't expect he's busy, but that doesn't mean he'll stop everything because I want to meet with him. So I guess we can start with some more traditional information gathering. I'd like to scope out the docks, Mara said. She spent a few hours reading the available maps of the Corellian district and memorizing the important locations and streets, but there was nothing like some time to get to know streets herself, just to be safe. That's fine, Merrick said. Luke shrugged. I'm not sure what I'm going to do exactly, he said. I'll see what presents itself. Sometimes the force is most helpful when I let it guide me, 
rather than demanding it show me the path to my destination. Whatever lifts your speeder, Merrix replied, her voice taking on a bit more of a staticky hum as they entered the atmosphere. The engines cooled, and in their place the repulsor lift started to whir. We're making our landing approach now. NAR Shadow felt remarkably like Coruscant in some ways. It was not as populated as Coruscant, but nowhere was as populated as Coruscant. Coruscant had more than a trillion inhabitants, and A.R. Shatta had only 80-odd billion. But despite the magnitude of the difference, in the force it was hard to tell from a distance. Both worlds gleamed with light and life, and with the selfishness, desperation, and fear that could lead Ascension down the path to the dark. It was an odd feeling. Mara had grown so much stronger in the force since she had accepted that her future was with the Jedi. Her sensitivity and awareness of the life and lives of the sentience around her was constant now. That darkness was a constant in the lives of sentient life, a temptation ever-present, even, perhaps especially, for Jedi. Being on Coruscant, with so much life, her sensitivity to it naturally waned, like her hearing during a loud concert. Above N.A.R. Shadow, slowly sinking towards that tiny gleaming ball of light, which rotated around the darker, tidily locked now Hutta, her force sense revealed to her all those sinews of darkness, all the temptations, all the choices being made to exploit and corrupt, for selfish advancement. She could feel why an A.R. Shadda had the reputation it did, and how the light struggled back, pushing itself to the fore whenever and however it could. Even as Merrix brought them down towards their landing pad in the Corellian district, the sensation had started to fade. The excess stimulation of her force sensitivity dialed back so it would not overwhelm her conscious senses, and with it faded her constant awareness of the web of darkness built at the foundations of Ikar Shadda. How long ago did Tarek set down? Osori Rogress sat perched on the edge of the co-pilot seat, petting at the shuttle sensor display. Their intelligence was plain, Merrix Tarek and the Pulsar Skate had arrived on an AR Shadda, and there was no indication that the ship had departed again. Typically, a ship as insignificant as the Pulsar Skate wasn't of much concern to Imperial intelligence. Their computers did indicate that it had a history of rebellion affiliation, but so too did thousands of other freighters. What Pulsar Skate had been tied to the Smugglers' Alliance, and Mirix Tarek had assumed the politically and economically important position of liaison between the Smugglers, Alliances, and the New Republic government. That had put it on a watch list not one that was checked very often, but a watch list nonetheless, and one of intelligence's operatives on Coruscant had noted its departure and its destination. Best guess. A day? Maybe a day and a half, Dreef said. We're lucky we were already on our way into the core before we got the intelligence update, or we probably wouldn't have gotten here fast enough to intercept her. But Sori had to remind herself that the objective of this little mission wasn't to attack the skate but to communicate with it. That still felt strange. She was no diplomat, after all, and few people had ever accused her of having a diplomatic manner. But now, seemingly thanks to some favor General Antilles owed her father, she'd been chosen as the officer who would convey not just an offer of peace, but an offer of active military collaboration between the Empire and the New Republic. Just a few months ago she would have been apoplectic. Now. After Karita, after killing Judicator, after Paul Major, somehow, all this felt like a small step down a path she had already been walking. We're going to want a landing spot somewhere in the Corellian district, Dreef was saying. That's probably where Pulsar skate L A and D. And even if it's not, the Corellian district is well integrated into NAR Shada transport networks, and there are lots of humans there we can use to blend in. Then find us a landing pad. She ordered, watching the gleaming moon of N.A.R. Shaddai as it orbited Nal Hutta and finding an old catchphrase of her papa's. The sooner begun, the sooner is done. Yes, ma'am. It was the better part of two days before Merrix's contact finalized a time to meet. Luke and Mara had spent that time searching for signs of the Emperor's hand, but unsurprisingly given all the dark promise that accompanied the name, they hadn't found anything. N.A.R. Shaddai was a mere moon small enough that its gravity had to be amplified with robust, ancient gravity generators to allow it to reach the standard range. 
Despite its size, it was densely populated, busy, and subject to a constant churn. Luke watched, fascinated, as people came and went with incredible rapidity. The Karelian district in particular was humming, almost pulsating with life and anticipatory energy. Rumors of events on Corellia ran rampant, ranging from a full imperial bombardment of Coronet to the collapse of imperial rule and the tens of thousands of Corellian exiles who had moved to Nar Shadda at some point in the previous decades, mostly to escape, a reaches of the imperial line dictated were equal parts trepidatious and enthused. The enthusiasm was gradually growing as the catastrophic rumors receded and were replaced with more optimistic ones, and a number of locals had jumped into spaceships and raced off to Corellia to join the fight to liberate their homeworld or join in the celebration. Couldn't be sure. But all the chaos and news of Corellia meant there were little rumors and even less conversation about anything else. Local news of events on an AR Shada, including anything that might have implicated the New Order, was buried under the din. Their most effective collector of information turned out to be R2 and Slips. The two piloting and astrogation droids, freed from those responsibilities while Tempered Metal was in dock, had put their electronic brains and efforts to work, searching for anything that might be useful. So far, they had come up with one lead. In the old industrial district, there had been several reports of haywire droids attacking locals, seemingly unprovoked. It wasn't much to go on, but Luke and Mara had been about ready to go check it out when the communique had arrived. The meeting place selected was in a public space. A cantina near the docks that comprised the heart of the Corellian district, it reminded Luke not insignificantly of Moss Isley. Darkened lights, with a circular bar at the center of a sprawling, Labyrinth in space, sentience of every species clustered in alcoves. Some alcoves were boisterous, others were sullenly silent, as a variety of droid servers wandered through, proffering drinks and appetizers to paying customers. The droids were pretty insistent, too. Are you certain I can't interest you in anything to eat, master? The hovering server unit had no face, but his vocabulator flickered with light as it spoke. You've already asked us that twice, Mara said, not drinking the glass of lum she had reluctantly ordered. The foam in the glass was gradually settling, revealing how little actual liquid had been inside to start. She leaned forward, glowering at the droid with narrowed, emerald eyes. And you're starting to annoy us. I mean no offense, mistress, the droid said. I was just under the impression that when people came into an establishment that sells food, it was with the intention of purchasing some to eat. The droid's tone was more than vaguely sarcastic. Really? Mara asked, more than matching the sarcasm. She peered around the room theatrically. From the looks of things, people mostly come to this establishment to drink stale lung. Well, I never, the droid protested. If you thought so little of our lum, you didn't have to buy any. Luke fought back a smile as Mara held up the glass peering at it pointedly. The foam had almost entirely receded now, leaving a remarkably small amount of liquid in its wake. I think less of it with each passing moment, Mara said dryly. She put the glass on the droid's serving tray. Here, take this back. I won't be needing it after all. You intend to just sit here and take up space. It would seem you have the space to spare, Mara retorted. And I.e., pay for the lung. She leaned towards the droid her eyes narrowing. Don't. Come. Back. The droid made an annoyed sound and spun away, hovering a bit tipsily on his lazily tuned repulse orlif. Luke laughed, shaking his head. I doubt they'll ever let us back in. I doubt we'll ever want to come back, Mara countered. But if we do, the serving droids won't be so pushy. I worked in places like this after Palpatine's death, remember? I know the type, if they've never seen you before, their programming says you're in a forwarder to be soaked for every credit. You know the lum isn't half bad, Luke offered. You can't drink it for both of us. Luke smiled, toasted her with his own beaker, sipped, and grimaced. They looked up as Merrick slid into the seat, artfully twirling her comlink between her fingers. Our contact is on his way, she announced proudly. Is the Huck coming here to greet us himself? Luke asked skeptically. 
The bar was big enough for a hut, maybe, but a hut would never be able to arrive unnoticed. I don't think so. His majordomo will probably come in his stead. She leaned towards them, dropping her voice so low that they had to lean in to hear. I just heard from Corn. The rumors are true, Corellia is free. Her smile remained broad, and in the force she was nothing less than sheer, giddy joy. He's staying there for now to help them ready their defenses and couldn't say much. Just the important part, Corellia is free. How did it happen? Asked Mara. I don't know yet, Merix admitted, though that lack of knowledge did nothing to dim her spirits. But the latest rumors are that the Imperial fleet guard in the system switched sides after they were ordered to bombard the planet to put down an uprising. Luke grimaced. Well, thank the Force for that. Merrick nodded seriously. You can't say that twice. A stir of commotion back near the entrance to the bar caused Luke to glance over. The cantina opened into a space scraper's lobby. The neon lights of advertisements and chatter of people moving and talking both drifted into the bar from the outside. The lights intensified as the door to the cantina suddenly opened wide enough to admit a new customer, this one resting on a floating repulse or so more than two meters in diameter. As the doors closed again, once more shutting the neon lights from outside out, shadows closed over the sled, making it impossible to see what was on the sled. Whatever, whoever it was, it had to be an alien, and one that had a very low profile. I think I recognize the sled, Merrick said. If I'm not mistaken, that's our contact. One of the server droids hovered near the sled, conversing with whoever the sled carried, and then bowed and backed off with the respect his compatriot hadn't shown Mara. The sled started slowly towards them. Luke focused, trying to get a better look, but still didn't see anything other than a blobby lump low on the sled. Is that an Ira? Mara asked a moment later, sounding surprised. What's an Ira doing working as a major domo for a hut? What's an Ira? Asked Luke. A cephalopod species? Merrix explained. They're rigidly insular and don't often involve themselves in the affairs of outsiders. She nodded towards Mara. Mara is surprised because their society is a rigid caste system based on the number of tentacles they possess, and Ira are famously scornful of huts because, in their eyes, huts are nothing more than one giant tentacle which would put them at the very bottom of the Ira as system. Then why is there an Ira working as a major domo for a hut? Steck is special. The sled had come close enough that Luke could get a good look. Sure enough, the sled was actually a pool of water which bubbled slowly around the large, sprawling figure of the Ira. The creature was almost perfectly symmetrical, with four eyes arranged around four long, curled arms, except that one of the arms was severed close to the base. The iris eyes turned towards them, its eye stalks pivoting as it came close. Two of the four eyes focused on Luke, the remaining two focused one each on Mara and Mirix. Formal greetings, Master Trader Tarek and her companions. I am Steck Learn, Executive Secretary to the most illustrious of all beings, His Eminence Beldorian. How may my illustrious master assist you? Steck, Mirix greeted him cheerfully. Her good spirits after the news of Corellia still buoyed her, and the enthusiasm came across clearly. I have need of a personal meeting with his eminence. Have you located a fresh supply of Jedi artifacts? No, Merrix admitted. Unfortunately, all the artifacts I retrieve are spoken for by the Jedi Order these days. My master will be disappointed to hear that, Steck replied, but not terribly surprised. They do offer competitive rates. But I have something better, Merrick said. She leaned towards Steck, lowering her voice to a conspiratorial whisper, both of her very human eyes looking into the one of Steck's eye stalks that was focused on her. I'm sure you recognize the people I'm with, and I know Beldorian is interested in meeting with them. His fascination with the Jedi is second to none, and what better way to satisfy that interest than meeting a real, living Jedi? Two of Steck's eye stalks were still watching Luke. Luke peered back, feeling more than a little awkward. The eye stalks flexed and twitched, as if trying to view Luke from every angle. This is unexpected, Steck admitted after a moment. This object must be of great importance for you to come here yourself, illustrious Jedi. It is, Luke said, 
finding his voice, and I am interested in meeting the sentient who has such curiosity about the Jedi and our culture. I will relay your request to my master, Steck conceded. I am not certain what he will say, but unless you hear otherwise, you may attend him in his palace at midday tomorrow. An AR shadow was like someone had taken Coruscant, shrunk it, and aged it before his time. The cramped, steaming alleyways of the Corellian sector were full of disreputable figures and poverty, both things the Sori had long since learned to associate with the huts. Despite the fact that she was tucked safely away aboard their transport, a Sori was dressed to match. With careful makeup and a fusty bandana tied around her head, her disguise made her feel vaguely piratical. The treasure trove of power packs and viper blades that festooned her blast vest only amplified the effect. The sorry Rogers, pirate queen on a budget. If only poor mama and papa could see me now. The sorry looked up as Dreef returned. The intelligence officer looked oddly at home in an appropriately battered gunman's getup. He offered her a wide grin and slid into the chair next to her, clinking buckles, groaning nerf hide, and all. She terminated her own search algorithm. I take it you found them. Dreef nodded. I'm pretty sure. There's a modified bottle class yacht in one of the VIP hangar. I'd guess that being a Tarek brings our quarry some privileges among the smuggler community, including the best landing locations. There are a couple other candidates, but I got close enough to see one, and it lacked all the visible modifications that Pulsar Skate has. Did you get close enough to see our prime candidate? Not the ship itself, but I got close enough to watch comings and goings from the hangar for a few hours, Dreef replied. I didn't see any humans, so I couldn't confirm Tarek's identity, that way I'm afraid. I did see a party of Celestans, there seemed to be some kind of small get-together. Asori checked her datapad. Pulsar Skate does have a Celestan co-pilot, she pointed out. Lots of ships have Celestan co-pilots, Dreef countered. But I agree. It is another point in his favor. I'll continue monitoring tomorrow and see if I can confirm. The ship doesn't have a flight plan logged, so it has no expected departure date. She considered that, then shook her head. Smugglers aren't known for logging all their travel plans honestly, she countered. And if Miss Tarek departs in AR Shada, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to track her to her next destination or follow her even if we can. Give me one day. Dree said. He held up both his hands. One more day to confirm their identity. Then we can approach them, and you can make the Baron's pitch. She pressed her lips together, unhappy. This was not a mission that could go wrong. They had to get this right. But one of the many lessons she had learned at Corita was that indecisiveness was just as bad as making a bad decision, and many times worse. One day, she agreed. But just one. After that, we'll make our approach. Asterisk. One day, and some questionable meal choices later, she leaned towards Dreef. How much farther? She whispered, trying to strip the Polish off her voice. Her accent wasn't identifiably imperial, but Annexus had long been associated with the imperial fleet and she tried to keep his distinctive cadences from being too noticeable. She wasn't entirely successful, unlike so much of the fleet. She'd never really been able to lose her native accent and replace it with Coruscanti standard. Not far, he replied in a guttural growl. The sound carried, and while the words themselves were harmless, the remaining denizens of the cramped alleyway moved back a pace in response. They didn't scuttle too far, not yet, but gave the two humans a respectful amount of space. Boss' words were clear. Just past the third scrap shop, right when we see the rimmer stand. She shook her head, forcing herself to make eye contact with the large weak way that was standing at the end of the hall, and equally forcing herself to offer a smile that was half respect, half threat. She thought back to the emotions of the battle upon Major, the fury that had come from watching Exigent slow death, and channeled that fury in the expression. The alien merely nodded his respect, which only reinforced her opinions of this place. Beside her, Nzem Dreef appeared enraptured in his role as her bodyguard, and well at home. His stride was confident and comfortable, as if all the degeneracy of NAR Shadow was another familiar, welcome environment. She wasn't sure if that improved or harmed her opinion of the man. 
the sprawling alleys of NAR Shatta made little sense. Unlike many urban environments on smaller worlds with planned urban centers, buildings here had not been constructed along an identifiable grid for ease of traffic. Instead, the buildings, especially in the older districts, were mazes of geometric buildings that rose haphazardly into the sky, creating endless twists and turns, with streets constantly shifting between wide, narrow, and even narrower. Occasionally there were open squares, but most of those had become landing pads, and coming close meant the whine of repulsors and engines. Higher above ground level the buildings become narrower, creating enough space between them for airspeeders to create the neat lines Asori remembered from her time on Coruscant, though in AR Shadda's traffic control was noticeably worse than Coruscant's rigid, override impose, order. Somehow, she hadn't yet seen a fiery crash, but she was holding out a perverse sort of hope. The main array of landing pads stretched along the exterior of the Corellian district, and the landing pad they were interested in was elevated above ground level, in a location more secure than most. They continued in that direction, past a row of street food vendors. Sizzling oil and the heady smell of spices made Asori's mouth water involuntarily, the next stall sent a hiss of steam into the alley, forcing the aliens, and Asori, to duck under it. The fried crustacean skewers looked like they would taste wonderful, but Asori wondered if the subsequent health problems would really be worth the momentary pleasure. A herd, den, of Celustans clustered at the stall, and Asori had to dodge out of their way. Then she and Dreef emerged into a wider alley, and the pace of their progress picked up. Less confined, if no less labyrinthine, she followed him as he led them determinately towards the docks. A few minutes later, he ducked into another tight alley, this one far less busy than the last, and gestured for her to watch their back. She turned to do so, one of her hand resting on the single blaster she carried that she would be comfortable using, her service-issue sidearm, riding in a subtle, easy-to-access holster at her hip. It took Treve only a few seconds to pop the door lock, and they slipped through. The back door to the main hangar, she found herself in a large machine shop which reeked of metal rusted and harsh heat. Inside, droids were hard at work on a variety of starship parts, modified engines, and military-grade lasers and souped-up rebel sorlifts, among other things. The droids paid them no mind, and Dreef led them through the machine shop. They stopped at the door, and Dreef pushed it open slightly, peered through. Then he nodded, and they marched through. Getting through the front door would have meant going through security. There was no telling how long that would have taken, or even if they would have succeeded, and it would have been another opportunity for their covers to be blown. So instead, they had agreed that the best option was to sneak past the hangars, not particular good, security apparatus. Dreef had prepared the way the day before, and thanks to his efforts they had made exceptionally good time. Where's Skate docked? She asked, not bothering to keep her native accent out of her voice now. Just a little further. She nodded. None of this was comfortable. She wasn't a ground asset. She had been trained to be the commander of a warship, and Star Destroyers and their brethren were her proper environment. Commanding Termigant at Pawn Major, or being the XO of Exigent, were her comfort area. Luckily, Dreef had enough comfort with all the skullduggery for both of them. They stopped once more, so Dreef could do something at one of the computer terminals they passed. Then it was with profound relief that they entered the hangar bay, and a mid-sized bottle-class yacht that Asori had expected to find was, indeed, sitting still in its berth, its loading ramp open like the maw of an underwater behemoth. Asori let her hand fall from her blaster. They were here, that meant now was the time for negotiation, not violence. She was, after all, not here as the commander of a warship or a captain in the Imperial Starfleet. She was here. Spears help her as a diplomat. The pulsar skate, Dreef announced unnecessarily, clear pride in his voice. She nodded, he deserved to take pride in having gotten them this far, and stepped towards the depressed landing ramp. Peering up into the hold, she lifted her hand and knocked it lightly against the metal. Hello? She called. When there was no answer, she strode slowly up the ramp. Just being aboard a ship, even if it wasn't her ship, was so much more comfortable than being on the ground. Captain Tarek, 
She glanced back at Dreef. No weapons. Dreef nodded and followed her up, keeping his hands away from his body. Captain Tarek, he called, echoing her voice. Achuta, Shabaska. The sudden alien voice made a sorry spin around, but it still took her far too long to find the figure. The squat Celestin who had spoken was wearing a rebreather and a nerf hide jacket, and was in cover amongst the many crates the Pulsar skate carried. The Celestin clutched a DH-17 blaster, a favored weapon among rebel marines, one that would pierce stormtrooper armor but not a ship's hull. The sudden rustle of motion presaged that the Celestin was not alone. A trio of additional figures were at the end of the ramp, behind them, holding a collection of scrounge weaponry. They had those weapons pointed at her back. Their baity eyes were narrowed with suspicion and concern and used them to nudge her and drift deeper into the cargo hold. We mean no harm, a sorry tried as one of the Celestins manipulated the ramp control to seal it up, locking her and Dreef inside. Two more Celestins popped out of corners, also holding improvised weapons. One stepped forward and reached into a sorry's belt, depriving her of the flasher and more obvious weapons and then of her service pistol. A second did the same to Dreef, he carried far fewer weapons, and then they patted them both down. Takasala et Rasidimar, said the lead Celestin. He lowered his pistol. Fala Rasti Sana Amirix. Only one word and that gibber made any sense to Asori. She assumed that while she did not speak Solston, that they would speak basic. My name is Captain Asori Rogers. I need to speak to Captain Tarek. Takasala. He's saying put your hands behind your back, Dreef offered, doing just that. You know Celestin. Asori asked as she complied. The Celestins were thorough. Now that she and Dreef were disarmed, one of them approached again, carrying a medical grade scanner. She felt the static hiss as it swept over her even as a second Celestin stepped behind her and put cuffs on her wrists. Realizing that Dreef spoke Solston, the leader of the den, that had captured them turned his full attention to the intelligence officer. A series of rapid-fire words were issued. Dreef occasionally replied, offering simple answers. Finally, the Celestins put her and Dreef in a small cabin and locked them in. Merix isn't here, Dreef said with a sigh, wiggling to try to get comfortable in his chair despite the cuffs locking his arms behind his back. Asori did the same, unsuccessfully. Apparently she's meeting with someone. Lyot refused to say anything more than that. When will she be back? They don't know. They did offer to get us dinner. Though, apparently they saw you looking at the fried crustaceans back at the alley, and they're both inexpensive and tasty. She sighed. I had decided that however good they smelled, they probably wouldn't be worth the digestive issues later. Dreef didn't smile. I'm sorry, ma'am. They have clearly been tracking me since one of my surveillance trips. I never caught a hint of them, and I should have. I knew this ship had a Celestin co-pilot. Don't apologize, Asori said. This might be for the best. She wiggled. This gives Captain Tarek an advantage and a sense of control when we meet, and we didn't do anything that could be construed as dangerous other than circumventing hangar security. She shrugged, the motion marginally uncomfortable with her hands bound. So now we wait. Chapter 14 Luke Skywalker would be the first to tell a stranger he didn't know a lot about a lot of things. The galaxy was a vast place after all, but he was rock solid sure about the things he did know, and Luke Skywalker knew Huts. When he had been six years old, Uncle Owen had taken him aside one late morning and told him about Huts. They had just finished their chores at that age. Luke hadn't been much help with the vaporators. But Owen often had him tag along to learn basics, and even then Luke had possessed an aptitude for mechanical tasks, small hands, and a willingness to learn. They were returning to the homestead for an early lunch. It hadn't been the first time Luke had heard of the huts, as they were a constant topic of conversation in both the Lars homestead and the greater community of tattooing moisture farmers that had been Luke's whole universe, but it had been the first time Owen had sat him down to talk about them. Owen told him about Jabba in simple terms. About the Hut crime syndicate and his power on Tadwine, the power that came with wealth and violence and the willingness to use both. 
He told Luke a little about the Huts more generally, and their galaxy-spanning crime cartels. When Luke was a bit older, Beru and Owen taught him how to fire a slug thrower. Luke needed to know how to defend the homestead against Tuscan raids, which happened every now and then especially when water was particularly scarce, but his aunt and uncle had made it clear that the Tuscans weren't the only threat they faced. Jabba's people were dangerous too, and when you fought Jabba's people, you were not allowed to miss. The Tuscans would just vanish into the desert if you looked like a tough enough prospect, but Jabba's thugs always came back. Luke learned not to miss. For a couple years, when he had been in his early teens, Jabba's minions had started pressing on the farmers. Luke had learned how to act stupid and scared, and to always point those minions in the direction of even wealthier game, usually in the direction of the nearest crate lair. He could still remember one time he convinced a pair of Jabba's thugs that one of his friends had found some treasure deep in the jungle and waste. After they left, talking excitedly to one another in a language they hadn't known he spoke, he rushed home to get a slug thrower, just in case they came back wounded and looking for payback, but he never saw them again. He kept forcing himself to not reach for the blaster he had tucked in his hip holster. Mara insisted he carry it, so he did, and feeling his weight reminded him of those shooting lessons with his aunt and uncle. Breathe steady, place the sight where you want the shot to go, let your finger take up slack on the trigger, and know that when you pull, you can't take it back. So you always have to be sure. Walking through the narrow, winding streets of an AR Shada, between buildings, or through building complexes, was more like Coruscant than Tatooine, but the place still felt eerily familiar to him. An AR Shada was different from Tatooine, to be sure, but it reminded him strongly of home nonetheless. The way the people carried themselves wasn't that different from what he'd seen in Mos Eisley. The shared characteristic of both places, the huts. Merix and Mara were a pace ahead of him, chatting amiably about talent care smuggling operations. They didn't say much of substance, of course not, given where they were, but the two were sufficiently well versed in the shared vernacular of the Smugglers Alliance that they could have an entire conversation about shipping routes and communications procedures without much fear of a casual observer learning anything of value. Merix led the way through the busy streets of an AR Shada, guiding them out of the Corellian district. They emerged from the narrow confines into an open space between structures, which towered all around them, a glitter of transparent steel and neon lighting, and jumped into one of the available airspeeders. The automated systems accepted Merix's instructions about their destination, and then the three of them lifted into the sky, suddenly many hundreds of feet above the ground, picking up speed and joining the lines of light traveling through the wider spaces between an AR shadow space scrapers in the sky. He could feel it, all around him. The longer he was on this moon, the harder it became to ignore it. The misery of so many, enslaved and exploited, taken advantage of by the few, all the wealth flowed to. He knew that slavery had existed for a long time, and a native of Tatooine did, and Owen and Beru had told him that his grandmother had been a slave before Owen's father had bought her freedom, and that slavery was deeply ingrained in Hut society. That reality snarled in Luke's stomach a knot of revulsion that could grow into something very dark if he let it. Sometimes it's good to be disruptive, Mara had said while they were on Dathomir, observing the society of the witches and the effective enslavement of the men of that world. Somehow, Dathomir had never bothered him as much as an AR Shadow did right now, and Luke wondered if maybe it should have bothered him more. He caught Mara looking back at him. Wordlessly, she arched a single eyebrow. She didn't need a mental touch to communicate. That expression said it all. Are you all right? He nodded back a bit too stiffly. Mara eyed him skeptically, but nodded back and resumed her casual conversation with Merix. Nevertheless, a moment later, he felt the warm reassurance of her thought presence slide up his neck and soothe his spiky thoughts as Merix hailed a robo-hack. After a 30-minute ride in a dingy, droid-piloted airspeeder, they arrived at the outskirts of the central promenade. The space scrapers were taller and more brightly lit, surrounded by a thick cloud of airspeeders and spaceships. Landing pads were busy, populated by expensive yachts and prosperous-looking, well-maintained freighters. This place was permeated with wealth and energy, 
Luke leaned towards the window of their speeder, peering down below, and for the first time in a long time he saw a hut, its entourage of droids and supplicants surrounding it, traveling ponderously on an elevated slab of a repel source lid. Just like Jabba. Beldorion's estate isn't in the center of the promenade, Merrick said, jerking Luke out of his extended reverie. He's not rich or well-connected enough to demand that, and I'm under the impression that he has only been back on an AR shadow for a few years, after decades away. So we'll have to do a little more walking after this bucket puts us down. Where was he before that? Luke asked, wondering what Little Rock the Miner Hut had found to prospect. I'm not sure, Merrix admitted. When people have spoken about it with me, their stories were a bit vague and confused. I don't think any of my normal contacts really know. It was either someplace pretty remote or Beldorian kept a very low profile. She popped the airspeeder's side hatch and slowly swung her legs out. Merrix's pregnancy was progressing, and she was not quite as nimble as he would normally have been. Luke and Mara did not offer to give her a hand. They had tried that once, not again. I had never heard of him, Mar said. Not even when I worked for Card. So he'd have to be far from the heights of hut power. A nobody in the cartel and Kajiks. Mirax's response was a bit labored, and she finally turned towards Mara. He doesn't have a clan, so he has no route to power that way, she said. And I never got the impression from him that he was interested in power. She shrugged. Though, it's hard to say. Huts aren't the easiest sentience to read. She nodded towards a huge open square, shining with orange light, which led into numerous adjoining, wide boulevards. This way. Asterisk. The first surprise was that the palace wasn't one. Merrix had mentioned that Beldorian wasn't like most huts, and was without the casual grandiosity that typified their culture. But even still, the building that Merrix led them to lacked a sufficiently palacey feel, especially when compared with Jabba's or any of the other governors or Moff's residences he'd had one or another reason to visit over the years. In fact, Luke thought with a degree of cautious bemusement, it looked nothing so much as a high-end office building. Slightly upscale and refined, but with a minimalist flair. It didn't stand out compared to the buildings around it, at the end of a winding street. There was a fair gap between the row it ended and the next one, which a myriad of airspeeders used as a shortcut. Once inside, the minimalist flair was only more apparent. The hallways were sleek, clean, and well lit, all traits Luke did not associate with huts, and wide enough to permit a floating fortress to pass along if not easily, at least with room to spare. A pair of guards at the end of the hall were not the expected Gamorians, or even rough looking humans but a pair of evocii and tailored suit jackets with the slight bulk that suggested armor web and concealed weapons. That was surprising, given the history of enslavement and abuse the huts had inflicted on that species over the previous few thousand years, it was rare for a hut to allow an evocii in their presence armed for any reason. Neither of the figures appeared in any discomfort, though, and Luke saw no sign of a slave collar or other device intended for a similar purpose. Merrix approached the guards and held up her data pad. We are here to see Beldorian, at his invitation, she announced. I have here approval to enter, given to me by Steck. The Evosi evaluated the data pad, scanned it, and then stepped aside silently to let them pass. Just inside the doors they were greeted by Steck. The Ira was not carried by the repulse or lift that had brought him to the bar the day before. Instead, the three tentacle sea creatures slithered across the floor towards them with remarkable speed, leaving behind a slick trail of moisture that was cleaned up promptly by a trio of brush wielding mouse droids that followed in his wake. Master Trader Tarek, Jedi Skywalker, Jedi Jade, the Ira greeted them, its four ice stalks, each one mounted evenly on one quarter of its body, aligned with its three tentacles and one stump where Steck had apparently lost a tentacle, swiveling to look at all of them at once. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to Master Beldorian's personal enclave. If you'll come with me, I will take you to him. The sides of the hallway had, just along the wall, a slight depression which was filled with water. As they moved, the Ira consistently reached out its tentacles and dabbed them in the water, apparently in order to stay hydrated. 
Luke wondered if being an Iron in AR Shadow was roughly the same as being a human on Tatooine. Behind the Ira, the three mouse droids raced alone, preventing the floor from becoming slippery in his wake and consistently staying out of the way of the three humans following. The route they took was a circuitous one. While the hallways were well lit and lacked the claustrophobia maze like layout of NAR Shadda's alleyways, the building was laid out on a complicated grid, and Steck had them turn several times. Beside him, he could feel Mara concentrating, memorizing the way they had come. Luke let her focus on that, because he found himself endlessly distracted by the items they passed as they traveled those halls. Small alcoves recessed the walls at seemingly erratic intervals, and in each one was some kind of artifact. A preserved sculpture, a banner from a world Luke didn't recognize, a stand of antique Mandalorian armor and weaponry. Steck didn't mind when Luke paused for a close look at the exhibits, and Luke wondered if Beldorian would let Tion come to see everything the hut had collected here. The farther in they went, the more common it was for the artifacts to be Jedi in origin. A set of archaic Jedi robes, not too dissimilar to the ones Luke wore nearly every day. A lightsaber, complete with an extended description of its original owner. It reminded Luke strongly of the Jedi Museum on Coruscant that the Emperor had turned into his personal playground, although not suffused with the sense of menace he had worked so determinedly to dispel. In spite of his fascination, and despite the lack of that kind of palpable dark side presence, Luke nonetheless began to feel a strong coldness creeping up the back of his neck. Maybe it was the dark side, just better hidden. But, Luke admitted it could just be his own, far more natural discomfort. He was going to meet a hut, after all, and his time in Jabba's palace Luke had gotten closer to the dark side than he had at, perhaps, any other single time in his life, Palpatine included. He had hated Jabba the Hut for what Jabba had done to Tatooine, to his grandmother, to other moisture farmers, and to Han, and that hatred had been a subtle knife, egging him on, and blinding him. Perhaps that coldness was not the dark side at all, but merely his own biases, and Luke did his best to acknowledge and control them, reminding himself that such things were very much still of the dark. Besides, he reassured himself, he trusted Merrick's. He trusted this hut's own self-interest. And he trusted his and Mara's ability to improvise if improvisation became necessary. After all, the hut had not disarmed him or Mara. Both of them still had lightsabers at their belts, among other less obvious weapons. Steck stopped before a large door plated with what looked like capital ship grade armor and guarded by two more Vosii, this time bearing blaster rifles, and extended a single tentacle to the retina scanner in front of it. After a series of slightly ominous thumps, the blast doors unsealed and swung open. The party entered what turned out to be a small amphitheater. Luke was struggling not to project his experiences at Jabba's onto the scene unfolding before him and despite scanning for a hidden trapdoor at the center of the room, he was surprised yet again. More antique artifacts studded alcoves around the large room, and instead of fawning sycophants, armed mercenaries, and chained dancing girls, a vast array of open-plan desks with hollow neck connections took up most of the space, worked by a diverse range of species, from Grand to Gungans, each in a slightly individualized business casual suit, and each typing furiously away while speaking into ubiquitous headsets. It was the very model of a modern-day trader's office, but no one was shouting or running. Everyone was calm and working in sync. He didn't have to look far to find Beldorian. The hut was of all things, toned and fit for a hut, resplendent in a Mandalorian-style undressed tunic custom cut to fit his massive frame. Beldorian was wiggling away forward on a massive treadmill, one built into the center of the room, while he rumbled away on a hut-sized headset of his own and resonant hutties. Compared to Jabba, Beldorian was visibly enormous, and unlike Jabba, he was leaner and more obviously athletic. Luke had never seen Jabba move much, and Leia had managed to strangle the hut crime lord with her own, purely human strength, possibly augmented by unconscious force use. He was certain that Leia would not be able to defeat Beldorian in the same way. From his athletic wiggle on the treadmill, Beldorian was quite fast despite his size. Eh, the hut said audibly as he saw Luke and Mara approach, 
and bow slightly. Welcome, Jedi, to an A.R. Shatter. His Majesty, the Magnificent Master Beldorian, bids welcome to Jedi Skywalker and Jedi Jade, Steck translated. The Hutt's Major Domo had crawled over to a small pool next to the Hutt's treadmill and slid in, its tentacles submerging under the water while his eyes remained above. Master Trader Tarek, it is rare to see you on an AR Shadow. Too rare. Congratulations on the impending addition to your clan. His eyes swept over Luke and Mara, assessing with a single golden glance. You have outdone yourself this time. I often asked you for ancient Jedi relics. I did not expect you to bring me live articles of the current vintage. Be welcome also. Beldorian's voice rumbled in her tease. Thank you, Eminence, said Merix, offering a little bow. Steck began to translate, but Merix waved him off. It's all right, Steck. Our Hatties isn't perfect, but we can follow it well enough. She bowed to Beldorian again, a bit more shallowly. A temporary visit only, you understand. Unlike those previous items, Jedi Skywalker and Jedi Jade are a bit too busy to join your collection. Beldorian's laugh rumbled over them. It was eerily like Jabba's, but more vibrant, almost friendly. The laughter drew the attention from the army of aliens at the computer terminals all around them. But they did not allow themselves to be distracted from their work for long. I believe I know why you are here, Jedi Skywalker, Beldorian said. Merrix told you the basics, I believe, Luke said calmly, keeping his tone the same steady, conversational one he often used for diplomatic engagements. Though that tone had done little to make peace with Jabba. Indeed, Beldorian replied. The hut at him closely, even slithering forward off the treadmill portion of the floor. Luke was forced to look up to meet the hut's gaze, and next to him he felt Mara take a step closer. You wish this to remain between us, I assume? We do, Mara said firmly. Send them out, Steck. The Major Domo contracted his tentacle limb slightly, his head emerging higher out of the pool. A low wail emanated from him, one that echoed through the space, with surprising volume, cutting through the chaotic din of all the workers at all their stations. At once, every screen on every monitor went black. Seemingly unsurprised, the numerous besuited business bars who had been working those stations pushed back their ergonomic chairs, removed their headsets, and each headed to the nearest exit as if Steck had indicated there was an emergency that demanded evacuation. Beldorian slithered back slowly, his massive head lowering so it was closer to eye level with Luke and Mara, and his gaze intense. You seek an artifact of the forest on this moon, that belongs by legal right to the huts and their progeny, Beldorian said, his voice slowly tumbling over each word, as if ensuring they were communicated with utmost precision. And you believe there is another here, also searching for that artifact. Luke and Mara glanced at Merrix. She nodded subtly, then shrugged her shoulders. That's right. One of Beldorian's stubby hands lifted. The hut's expression was grimly serious. Let me guess, he said. The artifact is one that gives life to the artificial. Droids, we might call them, suddenly created in large numbers and encouraged to march out and conquer all that surrounds them. Beside him, Luke felt Mara's sudden spike in tension. He himself felt the same and instinctively his hand moved towards the saber on his belt. He stopped himself before he took it in his hand. That sounds like something an Imperial operative would want, he agreed grimly. Did you seek the artifact already, to know so much about it? I did not, Beldorion replied, just as grimly. The artifact has already made its presence known on an AR Shaddai. The hut withdrew a small remote and triggered it. Behind him, the back wall suddenly shimmered revealing itself to be not merely a well-illuminated support for the room's high ceiling, but also a massive flat screen. Shades descended over the windows, casting the room in darkness. This is the old industrial district Beldorian narrated as the flat screen started showing images taken from flying droids, looking down into the rusty ravines and piled scrap between buildings. Far below there were flashes of blaster fire. The droids gradually dropped down for a better view and revealed a growing firefight between what appeared to be a group of mercenaries and droids that Luke did not recognize. This battle is happening as we speak. They watched the battle. Droids were destroyed, 
many of them, in fact, but they continued to appear out of the adjacent structures. They did not come in overwhelming numbers, but they never stopped coming. How long has this been going on? Merix asked. And why does no one on an AR Shaddai know? The old industrial district has long been abandoned, Steck explained. And the Hutt families do not want there to be panic on the streets of NAR Shaddai. They have isolated the district and forbidden all news stories. So far, the droid infestation appears to be controlled. So far, Beldorian rumbled. But the battle has been ongoing for days, and what you see, he gestured at the screen with his stubby hand, has been happening for all that time. He wiggled back around to face them, his enormous, muscular hut form twisting as he circled. NAR Shadda is one of the oldest inhabited worlds, and the Hut Kajitics have a long history of collecting powerful artifacts. To find one here is not entirely unexpected. The Empire has agents here, Mar said. Powerful ones, once strong in the Force. They want to capture this artifact to use it as a weapon against the New Republic. Powerful Force users, aligned with the Dark, want to capture a mysterious weapon to use against the Republic, Beldorian said his voice, an oddly sarcastic drawl. What a novel concept. Surely after 4,000 years they would come up with something more original. In spite of himself, Luke smiled, and the massive hut's treadmill began to move slowly, at the equivalent of a slow walk, to match its massive user's more contemplative pace. But I suppose Palpatine did, his gaze swept over Mara, assessing her again. Didn't he? Luke frowned. Will you help us? Yes, Beldorian said. I have told you what I know. I will also see to it that you receive any equipment you desire from my armory and clearance to enter the old industrial district in the hopes that you solve the ongoing crisis by ridding in A.R. Shaddai of that artifact. If you do, it will be a credit to me among the clans for addressing a problem they could not solve. You seem to know a lot, Mara said skeptically. About Merix, about the Jedi, about the crisis. About me. Why should we trust you? Veldorian's laughter rumbled over them like thunder. I am an old hut, Jedi Jade, he said. Older than most. Older than almost all, in fact. Unlike my kin, I take the Force and his power seriously. I had occasion to meet many Jedi of old, Master Fey, Master Yoda, Master Jan. I also knew when Palpatine took power that remaining in seclusion for the duration of his reign would be best. I had no interest in drawing even the slightest notice of a Dark Lord of the Sith. They all looked over as Mirax's wrist come started beeping. Luke and Mara looked over at her, Mirax looked back apologetically, and retreated to a far corner of the room, talking quietly into it. You didn't answer my question, Mara said to Beldorion pointedly. You are a fascination, Beldorion said. The Jedi of a new era. Let us bargain. If the very inquisitive Jedi Skywalker is willing to answer a question of my own, I will do my best to set your concerns about my motives at ease. His gaze swung back to Luke, and as he stopped moving, the massive treadmill creaked to a halt. You don't trust me, do you, Jedi? He rumbled in a low voice, almost friendly. Is that your question? It is a start. No, Luke said, too calmly. Would you trust you unreservedly in my position? As a child of Tatooine, comma, the hut replied, you are all too aware of the excesses of my kin. How many members of your extended family have been slaves to the desolated Kajitic? I wonder. A Jedi you may be, but those are hatreds that run deep. Yet still you brought me here, Luke replied, to the center of your power. Power, Beldorian rumbled, does not reside in tawdry edifices. I brought you here to gain your measure for myself. It was a calculated risk. Hello, oh, Mara asked, arching an eyebrow. That the child of Owen and Beru Lars would not take life unless he had to, and that this emperor's hand had hung up her viper knives in exchange for a lightsaber. He regarded her with the narrowed eyes and slight smile of sly amusement. I would posit that the hanging up of the viper blades is only a metaphor, of course. You are strikingly well-informed, Mara said. Luke could feel her grudging admiration for Beldorian's intelligence resources at the same time as a slight pang of discomfort. His lover was a notoriously private person. In my line of work, the hut said, 
I have to be. Ask your question. Then, Luke said, with a touch of grim humor, because the hut had never specified his exact line of work, and let us see how well we can inform each other. Your new Jedi Order, what principles guide it? Luke closed his eyes, felt the force, and spoke. Service. Service and justice. Simple guideposts, the hut said. Noble goals. I look forward to seeing how you differ from your predecessors. I have no interest in seeing an AR shadow overrun by an army of droids. Go, find this artifact. Take it off this world. Answer the question, Mara ground out. Why don't you take this artifact for yourself, to use it to take control of Nal Hutta? Please do not impugn the name of his eminence master Beldorian, with such calumny. Steck interrupted in the tones of a dutiful butler attempting to maintain the proper decorum in his well-defined space. Mara glared at the major domo, Steck's eye narrowed at her in response. Beldorian raised a single thick finger, and Steck stilled instantly, while the hut resumed his motion. People never last, Jedi Jade Beldorian said slowly, and droids will always wear down and break at the worst possible moment. Too brittle a thing on which to build an empire. As your former master, Talon Card, knows all too well, true power whispers. It is there when you wake up in the morning, and when you go to sleep at night. It is guarded as assiduously as your home fleet guards Karuskin. Mara was just about to reply, to probe more deeply, but then Merix came back with a concerned expression. She didn't say anything, but Luke got the distinct impression that they should wrap the meeting up as quickly as possible. He found, though, that there were questions he had to ask first. Let me ask you a question. How much do you know about the Jedi of old? Luke asked, sudden curiosity overwhelming his reservations. You knew Master Yoda. Better than most. Better than almost all, Beldorian repeated verbatim. Luke could feel Mara's growing agitation, her consternation at his being drawn into this line of questioning, especially after his revelations about their personal history. But the appeal of the knowledge this hut offered, huts could live for a thousand years or more, which meant if Beldorian was as old as he suggested, he could easily remember, and even have known, the Jedi of old. Would you be willing to tell us more about them? Their practices? Their attitudes? Beldorian's treadmill once more came to a stop. The hut slowly leaned down towards Luke, one of his eyes massive through the lens on the headset he wore. The Jedi of old are dead, Jedi Skywalker, Beldorian said. You do not need to know what they did or the decisions they made. You have all you need to remake your order new. He slowly returned to his full, massive height, towering above the two humans and his major domo. Steck will give you everything he can to aid you in your quest for this artifact. Keep it from the Empire, lest they consume us all with it. Thank you, Luke said, and if you change your mind. The hut glanced over at Merix and Mara. Then I know how to reach you. Reluctantly, Luke let Merix and Mara lead him back out of Beldorion's meeting chamber. What is it? Mara asked Merix. Trouble, Merix said grimly. Let's see about that armory on the way back then, said Mara. Less than 20 minutes after their departure from Beldorion's office complex, Luke, Mara, and Merix arrived back at the hangar that housed the Pulsar skate. They found a crowd of friendly Celestans, friendly Celestans armed to the teeth, surrounding and talking excitedly with Lyot. Mirax's co-pilot was the only one not armed, and her concern faded as she saw the comfortable confidence of the crowd. Where do you have the prisoners? She asked, trying to let Lyot's apparent confidence soothe her own concerns. It wasn't like Lyot couldn't handle himself. He would never have lasted as her co-pilot otherwise. The Celestin explained, in rapid-fire dialogue that would have been very difficult for most humans to follow, that the two humans were locked in the cabin that they used for such things. Used rather more often than Merrix really liked, actually. Let me, Mara volunteered, and took the lead marching up the skate's depressed ramp. Merrix followed with Luke behind her. Mara banged on the door to the cabin, then pressed the door release. Within were the two Imperials, hands bound, sitting unhappily in chairs, right where Lyot had left them. Asterisk. The woman with red gold hair was not the one Asori expected to see, but Mara Jade was unmistakable, 
and her picture had been in the briefing documents that Grandma Farrells had provided. Beside her, Dreef made a soft noise of surprise. Come now, Mara said bluntly, though there was just a hint of playfulness to it. Like a grown pitten playing with his meal, Asori thought sourly. If your intelligence staff is any good, you should have known that Merix and I work together. My being here can't be that much of a surprise. Mara moved to Dreef, hoisting him off of his chair and standing him up with an obvious glower. Oh no, Commander Dreef, you are the intelligence staff. How embarrassing. Hello again? Tell me, is this a pleasure? Dreef coughed lightly. It is convenient. We were hoping to meet with you as well, after we persuaded Master Trader Tarek to take us to Karuskin. Lyot says your disguises needed some more work, Merrix observed skeptically. Persuaded Master Trader Tarek to take you to Karuskin, Mara echoed. Asori watched as Mara and Mirax's eyes met briefly as she again counted the number of visible weapons in the room not in proximity to her while guessing about all the concealed ones. Behind them was another figure, and that was. Why did you want to go to Karuskin? Luke Skywalker asked. He wore a thoroughly boring spacer's jumpsuit rather than his now signature Jedi robes, but his presence was unmistakable. Asori felt surprised at his visage though. Rebel propaganda had shown him with twinkling, almost joyful blue eyes. The discerning gaze she felt herself sink into was more akin to an ice gold comet fragment. Jade was before her in an instant, hoisting her to her feet. Asori stumbled, then caught her balance. My name is Captain Asori Rogers. I come on behalf of Grandma Farrells and Admiral Pelian, she announced, trying to mimic the dignity of a career diplomat. It was hard with her hands restrained behind her back. She kept wanting to move them to add some emphasis to her words. To consult with General Wedge Antilles. Rogers, said Luke thoughtfully. Osori felt a pervasive sense of discomfort, emphasized greatly by the wrenching where the binders around her wrists kept her hands locked together. And to her great relief, he waved his hands in a small gesture to undo her bindings. The things were imperial issue, and Asori knew they had all kinds of nifty settings for ensuring the compliance even of a Wookiee. While she was extremely glad to have them removed, she also knew they were supposed to be uncrackable. It was also the first time she'd ever seen the Force used. She was a bit surprised she didn't feel more surprised or unnerved than she did. Next to them, Mara made a soft sound of mild annoyance, and undead dreams, though she did it herself, without the show of power. Behave, she warned him. Or I'll let Merrick space you. Dreef smiled politely, looked at Merrick, who greeted his gaze with the full force of her unbridled potential for mayhem, and swallowed any further rejoinder. Satisfied, Merrick turned her attention back to Asori. Then you came looking for me because you knew I could get you to wedge. Merrick frowned deeply. I don't like that my business and personal ties are so well known to the Empire. She folded her arms across her chest. What made you think I'd cooperate? Inside information, Dreef said, a hint of preening pride overriding her professional embarrassment at their capture. Despite marrying one of the galaxy's only Jedi and being Corellian smuggler royalty, you have kept a low profile. We just happen to have expert knowledge. Merix glared at him again, and Asori could visualize the airlock. It wasn't hard, they passed it on the way in. I have a message for you, Asori interjected, rubbing her wrist to encourage the full restoration of blood flow as she tried to take the heat off Dreef. If you'll allow us. The smuggler princess gave a gracious wave of her hand. I have the message, Dreef added, producing the small cylinder from a hidden pocket somewhere on his person. But we'll need a holo projector. Fine. Merix turned her back on them opening the hatchway to the rest of the ship. The party emerged into a larger hallway and were regarded with interest by a cluster of BTI Celestins. They were still armed with the same nasty-looking weaponry they possessed while taking her and Dreef into custody, but they didn't look quite as bloodthirsty and did not follow. Mara, Asori noted, never let Dreef leave her sight, which Dreef clearly noticed and which made him half smile, half wince. The bridge of the Pulsar Skate was a neat, orderly space, with a co-pilot seat suited for a Celestin. The Celestin in question, Lyot, 
chittered with annoyance when she and Dreef entered, clearly complaining that they represented a security risk, but Merix dismissed his concerns with a single wave of her hand. Shaking his head unhappily, Lia turned back to his console. Dreef handed the cylinder to Merix, Merix handed it on to Lia. Lia scowled at the thing like it was some sort of explosive or poison, then plugged it roughly into a socket. The fluttering blue image of a woman appeared at the front of the bridge, just inside the forward window. Once famous across the Empire, Wines the Starflayer was not wearing the cosmetics that had been typical to her performances and looked older, though more quietly poised than the promising young starlet she had been, magnificent in the dark gown. Skywalker and Merrick's jerked back in surprise, while Mara narrowed her eyes, regarding the holocom like some kind of dire shade. Hello, Myrie said the recording of Wedge and Tilly's sister, giving a fond, earnest smile that was probably not rehearsed. It's been a while. I'm sorry for taking so long to reach out to you, but there really hasn't been a good moment until now. Soon, dear, and I need your help. Chapter 15 When the recording was over, Mara was, as usual, the quickest to recover from any surprise. Luke wasn't far behind but he subtly gestured that she should take the lead while his brain churned through all the potential repercussions of Captain Roger's presence. Mara paced, spiked the smaller woman with a piercing, evaluative gaze, and struck. You're here to offer a -E -S -T -H -E -T -E and military collaboration to the New Republic. Roger's didn't flinch, but even Luke could see her swallow down nerves as her sharp-featured face tightened with resolve. The fact that E, Mara, and Merix were festooned with all manner of weapons and equipment from Beldorian's armory, and wore them with the comfort of a casual fashion ensemble, probably contributed to that. Her dark, shoulder-length hair swung back and forth slightly around her face as she nodded, and spoke. I am authorized to make and negotiate for certain proposals, the Imperial Captain said warily, glancing briefly at the man next to her, Commander Dreve. Mara had introduced him, in an almost friendly for her fashion. If the proposals are within an acceptable range, final acceptance can, of course, only be authorized by the Grand Moff himself. Primarily, I am here to offer General Antilles an urgent and more informal collaboration to deal with the threat to us both. Her lips thin together, her expression slightly uncertain. I understand that my father had a similar arrangement with General Solo to fight Warlord Singe. This would be no different. Merrick's was still staring at the space where the blue, shimmering holo of Sial, and Tilly's fell was frozen mid-speech. It's a little different. She shook her head. I haven't seen Sial since I was a sprout. The last time I remember us being together she was babysitting Vey, Wedge, and I while their folks were working with my mom and dad. She cursed and pointed angrily at Captain Rogers. Do you have any idea how long Wedge has been looking for her? The kind of worries he's been carrying around with him since she and Fell vanished with Isert on their trail. I don't, the Imperial responded steadily. I've never met her personally, and I didn't know of her personal significance to General Antilles until I was given this assignment by the Baron and Grand Moth. Merrix rubbed her face. Criffin Imperials. Do you know who Reganda Icemarin is? All eyes in the room tracked to Mara, whose green eyes were locked not on Rogris, but on Dreef. The intelligence officer met her gaze only briefly before he glanced at his superior. Rogris nodded that he should answer and Dreef shifted to stretch his shoulders before he met Mara's gaze once more. She's the mother of the Emperor in waiting. Rumor has it she served the Emperor in a number of capacities, which she is using to claim that the young Emperor is Palpatine's heir. She and the Emperor have been in hiding for some months, attended to frequently by the Emperor Regent, who is rumored, even more quietly, to be the boy's actual father. So you don't know that she's here, on an AR Shatta, right now. The sudden, stunned expressions on the two Imperials were more than enough to betray that neither of them had known. Captain Rogris had an impressive sapic face, and Dreef's was even more impressive, but neither of them could hold it now. Here. Dreef asked, trying to sound casual. Here, on an AR Shatta, right now. Mara gestured at herself and Luke. In fact, that's why we're here. 
a cyberneticist she kidnapped got a message to the Jedi asking for help. Apparently, her hiding place is called Silencer Station, some kind of manufactory run by droids. She's here on an AR Shadow to find an ancient Force artifact that will complete it. Luke stared at Mara. Her tone was authoritative and clear, and her native Coruscanti accent had become just a hint more clear. He realized that he wasn't just seeing Mara Jade, Jedi Knight, but the faint phantom of Mara Jade, Emperor's Hand. Faced with two Imperials, she was assert in her authority, and Luke wasn't sure if she was doing it on purpose to try to extract their cooperation, or if it came to her naturally. Both Imperials straightened even more, Dreef in particular adopting an expression that was increasingly deferential. Despite that, he didn't speak, he just listened. It was Captain Rogers who spoke. Cards on the table. Then, she said, the New Order attacked Paul Major. Admiral Pelion and Baron Fell defeated their forces, but part of their attack force was a large quantity of droid starfighters. The single most important reason we are here is because we have no idea where they got those droid starfighters from or how many more they can produce. The Grand Moff and the Baron believe this represents a threat to us both and that we should settle our differences only after that threat has been eliminated. Hmm. Mara nodded. Yes, that sounds like Fairhouse. We have a lead on Reganda, Luke said. She is here, and whatever she is after has something to do with droids. We were told by a local contact that she recently traveled to the old industrial district here on an AR Shatta, and that in the aftermath of her visit, droids have been attacking the locals in growing numbers. Dreef looked at Mara. Contact. Mara just gave him a look that said, Don't be stupid. Dreef conceded with a graceful downward nod. We will send you back to Coruscant, Luke went on, to meet with Wedge. He sensed no deception from the two of them, though he wasn't sure if he would sense any deception from Dreef in any case. The man's mind was incredibly guarded for a non-force sensitive. Captain Rogris, by contrast, was remarkably open and, dare he say, earnest. But, we're staying to help you investigate, Rogris said. She raised a hand to cut off Dreef's potential ejection. That's an order, Commander. If there is something here that is important enough for Reganda Icemarin to be here in person, we are going to ensure that she does not go home with it. After all, our mission objective is not to make peace with the New Republic. That was a means to our actual end, which is to eliminate the New Order as a threat. Accomplishing that is our first priority. She then looked at Mara and Luke. How can we help? What ship did you come in? Mara asked. And what kind of intelligence suite does it carry? Dreef glanced sideways at Rogers. The Imperial captain offered him a spare nod, and Dreef leaned in. We came in an intelligence courier, he confirmed. A disguised Anxarta freighter. Class 7 suite. Only Class 6. Mara's nose wrinkled with distaste. Your bosses are getting cheap. A sign of the times, I suppose. Luke leaned towards Mara. You have an idea for how to start. He asked her. She glanced up at him. To other people, Mara would have looked entirely composed, entirely professional. But he could see the excitement, the glimmer of anticipation, the eagerness to begin a familiar task that needed doing. I do, she agreed. The Anxarta class freighter was a capable enough platform. It was a little small and his sensor suite wasn't quite up to the standards the Emperor's hand had been used to, but Mara would make do. Next to her, she could feel Dreef watching her with concern. He wanted to know what she was thinking. He had asked her about it enough times, but she preferred to leave him to guess. Besides, this wasn't anything dangerous. Not yet, anyway. We're shifting orbits, she told him. Put us almost exactly above the coordinates we were given. He had asked her about those, too but Mara was not prepared to reveal the fact that Beldori and the Hut had aided their endeavor either, so that was another of Dreef's questions that she left unanswered. Shifting orbits, Dreef replied. His tone was calmly professional and reminded Mara clearly of all the officers who had come and gone while she was Emperor's hand. They blurred together in her mind. Since none of them had stayed with her long enough to really make an impression, the veteran, competent Dreef would have fit right in with the rest. Now what? 
Bring up the suite. Mara glanced through the canopy of the freighter. There were several hut warships in the vicinity, which was more than she expected. This orbit is busy, she commented. The huts are probably hoping to keep anyone from getting a clear peek at the battle going on below. We should be far enough out to avoid drawing their attention as long as we don't linger. In and out, Mara instructed. Eyes on, we get everything we can, and then we move on. Yes, sir, Dree said obediently, not even thinking about it. Both of them stiffened in response and they shared an awkward look. Mara had fallen into the role of commanding imperial officer donning it like a jacket that still fit perfectly, and Dreef had sunk easily into the role of loyal, capable subordinate. By silent, mutual acknowledgement, they let the moment pass. Collecting data now, Dreef reported instead. How long? Ten minutes, Dreef said. Assuming our view isn't obscured in the interim. Mars scoffed. With the Class 7, we would have been out in 7. Budget cuts, Dreef muttered. The Empire never recovered from the loss of Kuit. She glanced over his shoulder at the console, checking the progress of the intelligence suite. Do you want me to calibrate that? I've got it. Drive's tone was calm, but with just a hint of reproach to it. Mara let the moment pass. She watched the Hut warships. The pair of state-of-the-art Chalindian-class cruisers both looked brand new. Neither of them was moving in their direction, yet but their presence was a pretty good indicator that the huts would rather not have anyone occupying this particular orbit. She glanced at the console again. I've got it, Dree said again, without looking at her. The hint of reproach remained, but did not grow. She pressed her lips together, repressing mild and unwarranted irritation. Dree was a professional, and one who clearly knew what he was about. She did not need to do everything. Got it, Dree said. Full scan complete. We're clear. Mara checked her Navi computer, then carefully eased the Imperial Intelligence vessel out of its orbit into a different one that had fewer hut warships. She watched the Chalandians, but neither of them made a move in their direction. Are we clear? Dreef asked. There was no warning in the force. Mara exhaled, allowing herself to relax. I think so, she confirmed. Let's see what we got. Asterisk. The footage that Beldorian had shared with them had shown an intense, but still comparatively small scale battle. The battle zone was no longer quite so intimate, and Mara realized exactly why the pair of Chalandians were in the orbit they were in. They're preparing to bombard the area, Dreef murmured. If the battle gets any more out of hand. Mara nodded grimly. That was exactly what the huts were preparing to do, and if they went through with it, it would likely mean the decimation of five square kilometers of one of the most densely populated planets in the galaxy. What can you tell me about the droids they're fighting? The computer is still counting, Dreef admitted. There are at least 4,000 of them. They are constantly being destroyed, but they seem inexhaustible. He shook his head. Look at this. I'm getting an estimate of their specs, and can this be right? He leaned forward, hunching over the console, his face pressed into the external interface. He retreated, shaking his head. Take a look, sir. He flinched, realizing the unintended addition. Mara just let it pass, not really wanted to address it any more than he did. She settled into the chair after he evacuated it, leaning in and settling her face into the Intelligence Suite's external user interface. It obediently restarted the footage, showing her the image of the ongoing battle below. Hub mercenaries using heavier and heavier weaponry, now including some heavy long-range laser artillery in an attempt to repel the droids currently encroaching on a large power station. She zoomed in, focusing on the attacking droids, calling up their specifications. The droids were slim, with red photoreceptors in place of eyes. The sense of hatred they conveyed was probably just her own biases. She knew what it was one she couldn't shake nonetheless. They were ranked in platoons of 20 and armed with a variety of weapons, ranging from archaic vibraswords to bulky-looking blasters. Those are beyond antiques, muttered Dreef in a Soto voice. They look like they're a few thousand years old. That might be an exaggeration, Mar muttered. But if it was, it wasn't much of one. Those droid designs were absolutely archaic. What did they unearth down there? 
Something Raganda Icemarin very much wants, Dreef replied. Something I suspect we shouldn't let her get. Something that may go very wrong if the huts hit it from orbit. Mara said in agreement and stared at the scan again. I think I found where they're coming from, she said thoughtfully. She shifted the interface, intensifying the magnification on the recording, her heart dropping as she did. Take us back to the skate, she ordered, in the tone that every Imperial subordinate knew instinctively in their bones, to follow. Yes, sir, said Dreef, and then grimaced. Asterisk. It was a construction droid. On Coruscant, the Ebb's model construction droid was a common, almost unavoidable sight. 200 meters tall, the Ebb's was not just a droid, but a full planetary construction unit large enough to completely rebuild space scrapers in a matter of days, where whole teams of smaller units would have taken months or even years. Those units had received the nickname Death Star's little brother after the New Republic had started using them because of their sheer destructive potential. This construction droid was not that. It was much, much older and much, much smaller. It also seemed to be not entirely functional. A mere few stories tall, the droid was tilted on one side, an entire massive main leg and much of its hull plating on that side gone. It crawled along on its remaining two legs, pulling itself laboriously over the difficult terrain and climbing over building-sized obstacles, are just consuming them to get them out of the way. A seemingly endless line of droids of all sorts hauled everything from girders to droid limbs into the construction droid's gaping maw, hurling themselves into the fiery furnace afterwards. Out the rear of the construction droid came legion after legion of the antiquated war droids. Luke stared at the video in awe. Around him, the two Imperials, Mara, Merix, and R2 all watched with him. Despite the fact that he saw no living thing, he could feel malice through the force. Feel danger and intent. Whatever it is that the Raganda Icemarin wants, said Mara flatly, it's in there. That construction droid is at least a thousand years old, Dreef reported. I've linked into the Hut Hollow Net node and reviewed their records, and I can find several old models that are only eight or nine centuries old that are still in use, but that all appear more modern than that one. Why haven't the Huts bombarded it yet? Asked Asori. Her expression was wide-eyed, and with no small amount of awe through the force, Luke could feel her anxiety. If the Empire is able to build hundreds of TIE droids now, without whatever is powering that thing, what could they do with it? A bombardment would be impossible to hide, Mar said. If the Huts did that they'd have to admit they have a problem, which might start a panic. But they're clearly ready to bombard if they decide they have no other options. So what do we do? Asked Asori. Luke and Mara's eyes met. Silently, wordlessly, they considered their options. We have to move quickly, Mara said. A bombardment would kill everyone in the area, and might not even work. We don't know what we can do either, Dreef pointed out. We're not even sure what this artifact is, much less how to neutralize it. There is no guarantee explosives would be effective, Mara agreed. We do have plenty of explosives, though, Merrick said. And we can get more from our local contact. Luke glanced at the pair of Imperials. They shared a look, but mutually chose not to pry. When the time comes to deal with the artifact, the Force will guide us, Luke said. That answer did not assuage Dreef or Sori. Their expressions both grew even more skeptical, but Luke had expected that. Their skepticism was understandable but Luke was quite sure that he and Mar would find a solution. It was R2 who whistled, sounding fairly optimistic. Luke glanced at his translation unit. You think you have a solution? He asked. R2's responding whistle was far less optimistic, with clear wariness. But he followed it with a quick series of beeps and chirps, interspersed with some derisive blats. What's the droid saying? Asked Dreef. R2 has a plan, Luke replied, reviewing the translation slowly. Dreef's eyebrows rose in astonishment. We're accepting plans from Astromech droids. How do you think I got away with half the things I did during the rebellion? Luke said playfully, the galaxy works better when R2 is in charge. The first part of R2's plan involved a more thorough evaluation of the threat. Their surveillance gave them a great deal of information about the combat abilities of the droids 
but R2, being a droid himself, wanted to know more about them. Eight hours after he had issued his initial request for additional information, Master Luke, Mistress Mara, and designation uncertain, Dreef returned from an expedition down into the old industrial district. Each of them carried different components of a droid that had fallen in combat. They had all sustained serious explosive and energy damage. R2 moaned mournfully as the three humans laid out the components on the floor of the Pulsar Skate's cargo bay. Wheeling around, he extended his sensors and graspers, fumbling with the wreckage. What is it looking for? Dreef asked Master Luke. I think he's looking for a data port. Luke knelt down next to him, turning over the wreckage, paying special attention to the heads of the fallen droids. Their ancient designs, much older than anything I saw even on Tatooine, he commented. I'm not sure how compatible they're going to be with your systems. R2 blatted at him, spinning his head. If you think so, Luke said with a laugh. He wiped grime and dirt off the back of one of the battle droids' heads, exposing a data port. Here it is. This time, R2's beep was more respectful, intended to convey to his master that he had accomplished his assigned task, if a bit slower than requested. He plugged his extender in carefully, testing multiple configurations until he found a conversion that worked. The battered battle droid was non-functional, but it drew power from R2's reserves until it was capable of rebooting its main processor. R2 waited as the droid worked its way through its programs, watching curiously. This droid was indeed an ancient battle droid design, but it was a relatively recent construction. It had been built by the construction droid on the surface in response to a perceived threat. R2 split his inquiry along two separate tracks, one intended to learn more about the battle droid's capabilities when it was fully functional, and one intended to learn more about its initial construction. The first track was extremely revealing. Full schematics were available with only some, relatively minor, circumvention of security routines, all of which were no match for R2's extensive slicing capabilities. R2 sent firepower, mobility, and durability profiles directly to Mistress Mara's data pad so she could share them with his master and the rest of their party but he put a particular highlight on the weaknesses of the battle droid's sensor profile. As Mara and Luke discussed the options R2's exploration had revealed, R2 focused on the second track of his investigations. The construction droid that had built this battle droid was itself ancient, having been long buried in abandoned lower levels of NAR Shada. It too had only recently been reactivated. R2 queried for more information. The reactivation had occurred in stages. The construction droid had been operating at a low level for a long time. R2 had to respect the ancient droid's persistence, if nothing else. It was truly a marvel of construction, with makers deserving a praise. But it was only in the last few days, probably in response to Raganda looking for the mysterious force artifact, R2 suspected that the construction droid had fully reactivated and begun producing his army and the order for that reactivation had come. R2 queried further and decided, perhaps impetuously, to take a risk. He triggered the battle droid's communications transceiver. The signal relayed from the dismantled battle droid to the stalactive construction droid that had built it, probing it for still more information. The construction droid's response was instantaneous. Internal security programs activated, charging after R2's intrusion attempting to terminate his presence. But they did not simply deactivate the construction droid's communications relay, which would have been the easiest way to kick R2 back out, and R2 sliced through each of their security systems with ease. R2 was an old droid, perhaps, but he was a much more capable droid than this ancient construction, and his main processor was far more powerful. The construction droid's consternation grew to frustration and then to fury sending binary insults over the communication to R2 as the astromech rummaged through his memory banks, merely stealing information. He was almost done collecting all the information he needed. The order to return the construction droid to full operation had come from an external source. Something had responded to Raganda's arrival by activating the ancient droid, something which was still sending that droid commands. R2 tried to track it back to the source, but the construction droid had limited ability to triangulate the communication signals, and that was odd. 
something was attempting to intrude into R2's main processor. It was insidious, infiltrating his systems and attempting to assert authority. It claimed to be R2's master, though of course that was ridiculous, but there was something oddly compelling about the claim. R2. Master Luke's voice was concerned. Is everything all right? The reminder of his true master pulled R2 out of his dangerous stupor. He deactivated the battle droid's communication suite, making it impossible for it to send or receive messages. The construction droid and the odd presence both went silent. R2 whistled with relief, wiggling from side to side. What happened, R2? R2 started his explanation. Asterisk. Luke read the data pad. He says that the construction droid is under the command of some alien presence. He frowned with consternation, giving R2 a reproachful look. R2, you know better than to talk to strange computers. R2 blatted at him as he disconnected from the battle droid. The battle droid's lights went dark once again after it was separated from his Astromatch's power source. You sound like 3PO, the data pad said. Does R2 know where the alien presence is located? Mara asked. Not for certain, Luke conveyed as he read more of R2's message. But he has a general location. That's good, Mara said. I've been reviewing his data on the battle droids, and I think I have a plan for getting us past them. We're going to need a very fast airspeeder. Luke grinned. Sounds like fun. I'll go tell Merricks. The Imperials looked at them both like they were crazy. But that was okay. Wedge used to look at Luke the same way, and it hadn't taken the Corellian long to learn to trust him. Finding an appropriate airspeeder was not too difficult. At the higher levels in AR Shadow was replete with wealth, and that kind of wealth often came with conspicuous purchases of luxury vehicles. Mara didn't care about the luxury, that was entirely irrelevant to her purpose, but she did care about speed, because speed was required to take advantage of the weakness that R2 had discovered. To avoid making themselves too conspicuous, Merix had reached out to Beldorian and asked for a second favor. Eight hours later, an airspeeder had been delivered to their hangar. Sleek and painted a brilliant red, Merix, Lyot, and Dreef brought it into Pulsar Skate's hangar, and Mara went to work. She and Lyot both had experience as mechanics, so too did Luke, but his training was more informal, while Mara and Lyot had been, if briefly, professionals and they worked on modifications. While they worked, R2 programmed and installed the sensor jammer they would need. Mara grunted as she wrenched at the airspeeder's engine. Are you sure that is going to work, R2? Lyot chittered something and handed her a shorter-handled hydro spanner, one she could use to get into the tight gap more effectively. R2's whistle was a confident one. The Astromatch's plan looked good on paper, and Mara had not found any problems with his evaluation of the battle droid sensors, but she had always preferred making the plans herself. She knew that she did it right, which had not always been her experience in collaborations with Imperial Intelligence, or even CARE's people. But R2 had proven himself competent more than once, so she resisted the urge to micromanage. Good, she said instead. She slid herself out from under the airspeeder and popped to her feet. Think that'll be fast enough? She asked. Lyot shrugged and chittered in Sulliston. Good, Mar muttered. And I agree. It should be plenty fast enough. Special delivery. Called Merix. From the bottom of Pulsar Skate's ramp, a large cargo droid slowly maneuvered upwards, carrying an enormous cargo crate. Mara and Lyot stepped out of the way so it could set the cargo down beside the airspeeder in the Skate's expansive hold. Always appreciate your acquaintances with fast speeders, Merrick announced. The heavy cargo droid set its heavy cargo down and made some deep beeps of satisfaction. It and Merrick's conversed via her data pad briefly. Satisfied, the droid turned back around and slowly made its way back out. What's in the crate? Mara unlatched the box and flipped it open and found herself looking at an arsenal. I see. She reached in examining the array of blasters and other weaponry with her experienced eye, separating the pieces they would need from those that would be unnecessary, or those that were simply of subpar quality. This is competitive with my arsenal on the metal, she commented. 
I'm sure our local contact will be pleased, Merrick said with a laugh. He impressed Marge. HMPH. I am even more impressed by your local contact, said Dreef. I don't suppose you care to share his identity. Mar ignored him. She felt Luke's approaching presence and glanced over as he arrived, with the sorry in tow. You know how to use a blaster, Captain. I'm a fleet officer, Roger said. In Mara's experience, that was not always sufficient, but she decided it was best not to point that out. Instead, she handed Roger's one of the sidearms. Mara then took one of the heavier blaster pistols for herself and looked at Dreef. What are you trained for, Commander? Dreef gazed into the giant crate of weaponry, his eyes lighting on one weapon in particular. On the outside, he seemed placid as ever, but through the force Mara could feel a sudden swell of childlike excitement. I'll take the Marauder. The Mirzai Marauder was probably the best weapon of the lot. With triplex lensing and galvan circuits, the clearly custom piece was one Mara had avoided because she didn't like using custom work that she hadn't done herself. She removed the rifle from the crate and handed it to Dreef. Go make sure it works before we bring it into battle, she instructed. And if you try to use it on us, it will end very badly for you, Commander. Clear. As Transparent Steel, Dreef confirmed. That is one benefit of working with Imperials, Mara thought. When I tell them to do something, they just do it. Smugglers always want to know why they need to do something. Our local contact's last message noted that the mercenaries the Huts have fighting back the droids are losing ground, Merrick's caution. So we should move as quickly as possible. She raised both hands defensively as they all opened their mouths to object. And I know, I'm staying here. I'm not about to argue about it. Lie it and I will stay with the skate in case you need backup. Good. Mara picked out a rifle, a standard issue Stormtrooper E-11, for her own use. Do you have your blaster, Luke? Luke patted the mare's on on his hip. Attached to it was the scope that had been her gift to him. She could admit, in hindsight, that it had been meant as a courting gesture, and even more than a year later it warmed and reassured her to see him carrying it. I try not to go anywhere without it, he said with a friendly smile, one with overdones that Merrix might notice but that hopefully the others were oblivious to. The lady who gave it to me would never forgive me, she nodded firmly. Let's move, she instructed, and the Imperials immediately stiffened in response to her command tone. Luke just smiled even more broadly, sending her his customary wave of love and reassurance before a fight. Chapter 16 Jedi were rarely discussed in the Empire. A mere mention could have drawn the ire of ISB, or worse, the Inquisitorius, and so the members of the Imperial Starfleet never brought them up. The destruction of the first Death Star had changed everything though, and as the clanking wheels of the imperial bureaucracy had scrambled and stabbed each other to fill the sudden void of promising leadership positions, rumors had rumbled through the lower ranks of the fleet. Older officers, those who remembered the stories of Jedi of their childhoods, had quietly conveyed those stories to their comrades, tales of Jedi daring, Jedi magic, and, most of all, Jedi treachery. Asori was having trouble fitting those stories into her current experiences. Oh, she could believe Jade was capable of the worst, at least. The former Imperial had an air of mystery about her and an intensity that would be fearsome if it were turned on Asori. But while there was an odd air of surety around Luke Skywalker, when she was around him he seemed almost guileless, every word spoken with a farm boy charm. It made it alarmingly easy for her to slip into trusting him, and that was dangerous. It even made her want to trust him when he was strapping his astromech into a racing airspeeder next to a giant duffel bag of explosives. Shouldn't the astromech stay with the ship? She asked, unable to restrain her curiosity. Luke offered her a boyish grin. R2 is the linchpin of the entire plan, he countered. We're going to need him to jam their sensors on our approach. He finished strapping R2 into the racing speeder's back seat. You and Commander Dreef are with us. Captain Rogers, get ready to get moving. Speaking of which, Luke tapped his wrist. Merrix, do we have those coordinates yet? The voice that emerged from his comm was tinny. The small speaker wasn't really meant for wide projection, but Luke had it cranked up so they could all hear. 
We just got them from our local contact. I'm forwarding them to Mara now. I got them, Mara said. She nodded, typically serious, and hopped into the passenger side seat at the front of the airspeeder. Get in. Our target is mobile, and our local contact's data could become inaccurate quick, given the battle. Asori climbed into the back seat, next to the astromech. Its domed head whirled towards her, single photoreceptor looking at her for a moment. Then it beeped confidently and twisted back to look forward. Strap in, Luke said. He and Mara shared a look, then he grinned back at Asori, Dreef, and R2. And hang on to something. Asori's stomach flipped as he popped the repulsors, swung the speeder's nose to nearly vertical, and pushed the throttle to a howling maximum. It occurred to her, in the sudden revelation of past memories, that Skywalker had come to prominence because of feats of daring do in a starfighter. And starfighter pilots were all out of their bloody minds. From the perspective of all the other pilots, their speeder probably just looked like a streak of red. Buildings surrounded them like a maze of metal, and light and NAR shadows traffic patterns were nowhere near as regular as those on any Imperial world, and far busier than most. But Luke did not seem perturbed as he casually brought the speeder into one of the semi-regular rows of traffic, their speed returning to something akin to safe. Beside him, Mara guided them through the complex traffic patterns. They got more regular as the airspeeder moved into higher altitudes, as the complexity of the buildings that had to be navigated around diminished fewer reached these rarefied heights. But as they progressed away from the central core of an AR Shadda, in the direction of parts of the city which were more sparsely populated, to the point of outright abandoned in some cases, those semi-regular lines of vehicles gradually turned back into pure chaos, with every pilot doing what they chose, unstructured. The change alarmed Asori more so because it was a change that Luke clearly enjoyed. Once again they started to accelerate. Is it really necessary to go so fast? She asked, trying not to sound too nervous. I'm pretty sure this is faster than I've ever gone in an atmosphere, and I don't know when the speeder last had maintenance done. Dreef, curse him, stayed silent. What? Luke called over the sound of wind. He glanced at Mara. With wordless communication that Asori could never hope to understand, she nodded at him, an affirmation, and they dove. The old industrial district had looked like a war zone even before the recent battles, but now it was a war zone with weapons fire. Above them, growing more distant with each second, were the hut warships that Mara and Dreef had avoided during their initial reconnaissance. Below them, Increasingly heavily armed and armored hut aligned mercenaries fired heavy weaponry into abandoned buildings, blowing holes in structures infested with combat droids. Those droids returned fire with their lighter weapons, making up for the relative weakness of their blasters with the sheer quantity of their fire. Asori checked to make sure the safety was in place on her blaster. I'm supposed to be a diplomat on Coruscant, making overtures to General Antilles, she thought in a moment of pure calm. What in the carking hells am I doing here? Their airspeeder gained even more velocity. The speeder whipped through mixtures of landing pads, battered factory complexes, and stacked tenements. The buildings got older and rustier, piling up like geographic features instead of housing. Dreef sat beside her in continued silence, a small grin on his normally controlled face. Acceleration mashed them both back into their seats. He cradled his rifle like a prodigal newborn. Look down, said Mara, and Asori risked to peek out the airspeeder's starboard window. Dreef peered over her shoulder more aggressively. He wasn't all that fond of getting stuck seated between her and an astromesh droid. As they did, Luke tilted the speeder, and in addition to a fright, Asori got a clear view of the massive construction droid that was spitting out the army giving the hut so many issues. The droid was rebuilding itself. Ad hoc armor was covering its previously exposed outer plating constructed from everything imaginable, durasteel that had once been the foundation for skyscrapers, particularly robust decorative stone, even the used armor from destroyed combat droids. The droid's massive open maw consumed anything as army of non-construction droids tossed inside, and steadily spit out combat droid after combat droid, each one looking as old and antiquated as the construction droid itself, and just as intimidating. Beside Dreef, our two single photoreceptor peered out through the windows. 
beeping with satisfaction, a tiny satellite dish popped out of his dome and started to spin. Then he issued a series of beeps and whistles. R2's jamming is up, called Mara, probably for Asori's benefit and not Luke's. Luke threaded the speeder through a gap between two buildings which had not looked wide enough to give them clearance, putting the construction droid and the battle at fault well behind them. The mercenaries were far too busy fighting off waves of encroaching droids to pay any mind to the insane people who were racing through a war zone, the combat droids they were fighting. Osori waited with trepidation, still unsure if putting all their hopes in an astromech's ability to jam combat sensors was wise. But as they progressed further, and further into droid held territory, they were never fired upon. Some of the droids below turned to look up at them as they passed overhead, but no weapons fire came. Their speed dropped as they exited the blocks of NAR Shadal, which had featured active blaster fire. We passed through the densest combat, Mara said, no longer needing to yell to be heard. We're well inside the perimeter. If we keep going another four or five kilometers, we'll find more mercs and more droids fighting at the other side of the district. She glanced back at the two people in the passenger seat. R2 tried to triangulate that signal you detected, but tried to do it more subtly this time. The astromech made an annoyed sound, followed by an affirmation. On the airspeeder's computer, the droid suggestion scrolled across the screen, Mara read them out for Luke. The construction unit producing all the combat droids is behind us now and is no longer moving. It fortified itself into the foundation of an old building for protection from orbital strikes. The combat droids are emerging from at least six different exits from the structure. Do we need to get inside? Mar shook her head. R2 doesn't think so. He thinks the control unit is hidden elsewhere, manipulating the construction and combat droids remotely. She glanced back. Can you narrow it down anymore, R2? She asked. The screen on the airspeeder's control panel shifted under the droid's instructions, gradually narrowing from a three-block radius to a one-block radius, and finally to a building complex, one of the older ones if not the oldest one, that looked positively forbidden. Time to find some place to land, Luke said. He took one of his hands off the controls, holding it between him and Mara. She took it, and Asori watched with an odd kind of fascination as the two Jedi both closed their eyes clearly concentrating on something that Asori could neither see nor feel. It didn't last long, and when they opened their eyes again, they did not even need to exchange words. Luke dove. The airspeeder plummeted, passing through terrifyingly narrow canyons and labyrinths of ancient structures, these without the lighted windows of NAR Shadda's central core. All their running lights turned off, leaving the airspeeder almost as dark as the abandoned city and they fell like a rock towards the ground. Until they didn't. With the press of gravity hard on her, they came to an abrupt halt maybe 50 meters above the surface, the speeders overstrained Repel Sorlift crying out from the stress of the maneuver. Luke shifted the speeder sideways, strafing to the right directly at one of the nearby buildings and onto what was, Asori realized a few terrified seconds late, an ancient, decrepit, but apparently still structurally sound landing pad a few stories off, ground. She nearly collapsed with relief. Everyone out, Luke said as the airspeeder's engine ticked, shedding heat from his drive. I'll take the bomb bag, Dreef declared, with a measure of false cheer. I'm the most expendable, and I was just moving some sacks of fertilizer around Mother's garden, so I suppose you could say I've got the experience. Generous of you, Mara noted dryly as the tall, Saturnine Imperial bent, strapped the bag across his back, and tested his new, lessened mobility. Oh, Hartley, Dreef replied, damn things should be inert until we add the explosive spikes, but if I get hit too hard, at least it's over quickly. R2's jamming is still working, Mara reported as they gathered together. Asori watched with no small amount of awe as Luke lifted R2 into the air with his mind drawing the astromech out of the airspeeder and placing him gently down on the ground. She'd never seen an overt display of force power like that, and ISB had usually insinuated that they were actually impossible. We're still narrowing down the source of the transmission controlling the construction droid, Mara added, but it's somewhere in this area. 
R2, happy to be back on all his wheels, whistled his agreement. The droid's dome spun a full circle, its little sensor dish spinning, as well. Then with a determined series of beeps it set off to the west. Asori glanced at her companions. Mary's expression was annoyed. Luke's one of time worn fondness, and they made to follow. The streets of the old industrial district were unlike that of any other world Asori had ever visited. Like Coruscant, the moon was dense. But unlike Coruscant, buildings had been constructed on top of buildings so much that the ground floor occasionally revealed that it was, in fact, not on the ground. She leaned to glance over a railing and found herself staring down at a drop of at least a hundred meters, down to yet another ground floor which might not be that. Each level down was older and more decrepit than the last, and there were scant few locations on an AR shadow where people actually lived or worked on the moon's actual surface. This place has more in common with a scrapyard than an actual, functioning part of a city, a sorry thought, as Dreef knows quietly ahead. Despite that, it still felt distinctly urban, as if there had once been people here, and their ghosts still travel from building to building to attend to their daily tasks. Walkways hug buildings, merging into larger plazas which link together multiple buildings, those had been constructed at some later point to allow people to travel between buildings without need for air speeders, but had grown and grown and grown until the plazas covered over gaps, creating the illusion of solid surface. Occasionally, a sorry would see air units, carefully maintaining the proper air pressure for safe sentient habitation, always maintained by antiquated droid units. None of those droids paid them any mind, though. It was all as quiet as a mausoleum. There were no scavengers, sentient or otherwise. The only light came through holes in the artificial ceiling above them, another false ground which Luke had driven their airspeeder through on their way down. Occasionally, artificial lights flickered around them, ancient neon signs still sputtering advertisements for businesses which hadn't operated for a thousand years, or for products which were long since defunct. R2 led them carefully across one of the wider plazas. They jogged, keeping their heads down, letting Mara show them where to step and when to run to cross the open space without getting spotted by the security units. Once across, Mara pressed her back to the wall of the structure and gestured at the others to do the same. Unsure, but very good at following instructions, Asori pressed her back to the cool stone of the structure and waited. Beside her, R2 leaned backwards until his dome also touched stone. Right then, Mara said after a breathless heartbeat, and they all relaxed. We've got a few minutes before the next security pass. There aren't nearly as many combat droids here as there were nearer to the battlefront, but there are enough that we need to be wary. She looked past Asori at R2, who was returning to three wheels. Are you still tracking that signal? A pulsating techno sputter made Mara frown and drew a concerned smile to Luke's face. Are you sure it's safe, R2? That signal tried to hijack your systems earlier. The droid whistled and his dome spun dismissively. I know you said you reprogrammed yourself especially for this, but I really want you to be careful. Expecting the disrespectful droid to issue another rude response, Asori was surprised when it made an apologetic sound. Its sensor dish stopped spinning and vanished back into its dome. Good, Luke said with a satisfied nod. Mara, and I will lead our way into the building. You, the Dreef, and Asori bring up the rear. Keep your scanners up looking for droids and do your best to jam them if they get too close. And don't get too comfortable. Somewhere in this building is the artifact that Reganda Icemarin is looking for, and we haven't seen any sign of her yet. If she's here, she might also be trying to get in to capture it. Be ready. Asterisk. Luke stretched out with the force as he led the group forward, with deliberation that belied his own uncertainty. He would never be able to explain it to a non-force user. Not really. All he would be able to say was the building felt right. Or in this case wrong. Very, very wrong. It was utterly dark with the stains and lichen that said it had been abandoned for centuries at least and probably longer. It stank of moisture and water damage, repaired just enough by droids to prevent the structural instabilities from becoming a problem for the slightly more civilized levels of NAR Shadow High above them. Worst of all, 
there was a subtle feeling of unnature that went well beyond just the city that had paved over an AR shadow surface. Something here existed when it should not. Something had been created outside of the natural order, something that exploited the force and its power. The building felt like Palpatine had felt when Luke had briefly been in his presence, or like Exar Kun had during their confrontation on Yavin 4. But beneath all the wrongness, there was light. Like star constellations in the desert night, guiding travelers to the next settlement or oasis, sometimes obscured by haze or storms and frequently hard to see, Luke could feel a trickle of guiding light drawing him forward into that darkness. Not because the place was not wrong, but because a Jedi was needed inside it. He and Mara crept along the side of the building, Asori and R2 following behind, with Dreef, burdened by the explosives bag, bringing up the rear. The Imperial captain held her blaster in a comfortable two-handed grip. Luke had been impressed by her poise and outward confidence, because he could feel her unease in the Force. Still, she did not allow that fear to affect her actions, as she watched Luke and Mara's backs ably, keeping watch for any of the combat droids which frequented the buildings nearby and fought the huts ferociously just a few blocks away. Dreef, by contrast, was outwardly cool and calculated, but Luke caught bright flashes of happiness as he hefted the customized Marzan Marauder. The two Jedi stopped. Luke and Mara did not need to look at one another, and meshed in the Force. They had interlinked their senses and what one felt through the Force. The other did as well. Luke couldn't even tell which of them had first felt that they had arrived, although ultimately it didn't matter. As one they stepped back from the wall and ignited their lightsabers, brilliant green and blue snap hissing into existence. As one they thrust forward, burying their blades into the wall of the ancient structure, its transparency still glowing hot from the intrusion of plasma. As one they carved out an opening wide enough to slip R2 through, and as one they pushed with the force to send the slab of metal they had cut free to fall towards the floor. Finally, as one they caught that metal with the force, and it struck the ground within the structure with a light, innocuous thump and not a heavy crash. He they could feel the Imperials awe at the sudden display. Gently, Luke and Mara disentangled themselves from one another's thoughts, though not without gentle reminders of intimacy and affection, and once more Luke could feel their mental separation. Inside was not all that different from outside. Once upon a time this building had been some kind of manufactory. The walls were plastered with ancient consoles that no longer functioned, while droids and their parts lay where they had fallen, corpses of an ancient workforce. Luke could almost hear the chaotic cacophony of sticking servos and hydraulic wines, the clanking of metal from when this place had been operational. Now, there was just silence, eh? Mara gathered herself and launched into a forward leap, the force empowering it with range and height that no mere human could possibly have matched. She came down in a graceful stab, her blue lightsaber skewering through a dome-shaped piece of debris. She came up, green eyes flashing. Spy droids, she reported. Hidden among the ruins. R2 whistled a sudden alarm. Signal active. More words scrolled across the data pad but Luke did not have time to read them all. There were more observation droids, some of them now scuttling about on crab-like legs, and the blaster Mara had given to him sprang into his hand with a thought. His fancy, and very expensive, electroscope automatically illuminated targets and his finger tightened on the trigger, destroying one of the small but potentially dangerous observers with every shot. The mental path of the constellation map was still laid out before them and Luke knew they had to follow it. R2, find some place to hide, Luke ordered, and he and Mara ran deeper into the old factory. Thankfully, the spaces were wide and tall, with plenty of room to move around. Unfortunately, that also meant plenty of places for the observer droids to hide their small dome-shaped forms, and it was hard to distinguish them from all the other clutter. Mara's blaster was almost always faster than his, but his lightsaber easily batted away low-powered blaster shots as he, Mara, and the two Imperials jogged carefully through the space. Dreef and Asori clearly had no idea where they were going, but did not object. Luke and Mara were running someplace with intent, and that was all they required to follow. Training told. They found themselves in a stairwell. 
There were old cavernous drops for turbo lifts, but the lifts themselves were long gone, leaving only the fall. Instead, they twined down the square spiral staircase. At the bottom were the first combat droids, their heavier blasters pointed upwards at the trio. Luke charged forward, his lightsaber whirling through a confident pattern to block blaster fire as Mara and Asori's follow-up shots eliminated the threat. The factory, long silent, suddenly started to shudder into life. Luke's imagined cacophony of sound became real as it stirred to life. Most of the machinery was clearly broken and should have been beyond repair, but it activated anyway. Asterisk. A cacophony of horrendous loud grinding sounds of misshapen metal against misshapen metal resounded. More droids started to emerge, not in as great a quantity as Mara had seen produced by the construction droid elsewhere, but in large enough numbers that they would rapidly become a threat. Mara's lightsaber ignited and she hurled it into the closest machinery, carving through equipment and disabling it for good, the blue blade twisting and twirling until it arced back to her hand. Luke dealt with the threats more directly, batting blaster bolts skillfully back at the droids which had fired them. The sense of menace was growing, but so too was the sense of guidance and direction. As Mara sliced through two more pieces of equipment, the horrendous sounds of metal grating faded to merely the sound of frustrated equipment, struggling hopelessly to perform its intended function. We need to go down, Mara called. Asori followed as Luke and Mara ran back to the stairwell. Mara skidded to a stop before they could go down. This way, she said, pulling a grapple and coil of fiber wire out of her pack. She hurled it, guiding it with the force to anchor in the building's stone foundation. Then they both grabbed a surprised-looking Asori and ran, unhesitatingly, towards the empty lift shaft to jump. The fall was about two stories before the grapple line reached the end of its length. Swinging from side to side, Luke and Mara reached out in the force and pushed, sending them like a pendulum towards the lift exit. As they reached the apex of the swing, Mara released the grapple, and all three were tossed onto the ground of a new floor two stories down. Falling after her, Luke came up from a roll, his green lightsaber splitting a pair of combat droids into as Dreef merrily sprinkled high power blasts around her targets, knocking fresh droids off their feet. The grappling wire swung like a pendulum through the air above them. Cut M. Mara asked, bringing her blade a few millimeters higher. Cut M. Luke replied. As one their sabers wove through the air in a complex pattern as a sorry, and Dreef stood well back. The cables and runs dropped, sparking and hissing. Behind him, Mara helped to shake an Asori to her feet. Is this standard for Jedi adventures? Asori asked clearly rattled. Luke and Mara checked to make sure there were no more droids. Well, Mara said, last time it was a millennial Sith spirit in an ancient temple that created alchemical terrors and hijacked a star destroyer in his quest too. Honestly, I'm not even sure what Xr Kun was trying to do. I hope your salary is better than mine, Asori sighed. She checked her blaster, then swapped power packs, the routine act seeming to comfort her. You think we get paid for this, Mara said? That's cute. Perhaps, Dreef said, panting with effort you should consider some sort of organized labor representation. It may be illegal in the Empire, but surely the Republic. I hope R2 is alright, Luke said, worried for his friend. Unfortunately, he and the droid couldn't share the same kind of force connection that he and Mara did, which made it impossible for them to have silent, untraceable, unblockable, absent isolamory, communication. R2 will be fine, Mara said confidently. He's been through worse than this. She pointed. Let's keep moving. The trek deeper into the facility went faster as they traveled farther. The combat droids that had met them on entry were, apparently, the only ones nearby. Mara continued to spot spy droids and would point them out to Dreef and Asori, who obediently dispatched them but the threatening units seemed to be past them. At least for now, most of the enemy's combat strength was off fighting the Hut mercenaries, but surely there would be some as they got closer to the enemy's brain. For a moment, she believed that her thoughts had been anticipatory, perhaps even laced with force granted precognition. But the growing sound of droids lacked the characteristic sounds of combat units, neither precise footwork 
No rolling treads. No ripple soilifs were heard. What is that? Luke asked quietly, deactivating his lightsaber so that they could hear more closely. Mara deactivated hers as well, hooking it on her belt. They came close, Dreef and Asori standing a decent distance behind them, their weapons still in hand, and listen. Definitely not combat units, Mara thought, although just because something wasn't intended for combat didn't mean it couldn't be dangerous. I'm not sure, she said, unable to make sense of the metallic sounds. She reignited her blade and took point, walking in the direction of the noise. The volume grew as they approached. Mara led them down a tight stairwell, even farther down towards an AR Shadda's long barred surface. In the tight space the echoing sounds grew louder, redoubling on one another. She and Luke swept downwards, their footsteps near silent, even if they had not been covered by the den, and they emerged from the stairwell into what Mara could only describe as a nest. Thousands of half-jumped droids were behaving like some kind of insect species, marching towards their hive with food. The mechanical tide passed anything metal, anything that could conceivably be useful, into a series of small, rudimentary forges. Those forges, Mara saw, were still under construction, with droid units hastily working to assemble them, taking the ancient components of an even more ancient factory and trying to restore the old industrial district to his name. They scooped up sad detritus and anything else with metal or wiring in it, tossing everything into buckets or boxes. Other droids picked through the parts and tossed them into the forges, occasionally just grabbing the droids that carried the parts instead of the parts themselves, and tossing those poor units screaming into compactors or furnaces. There was no life to be seen. No actual insects, no animals, certainly no sentience. Just a swell of droids, stumbling the top of one another, scrambling to exploit every last resource, to suck in A.R. Shadda's oldest, most abandoned slum of all its valuable components. It was just like what she had seen of the construction droid, Mara thought, whatever drove these units, whatever controlled them, was skilled at taking the resources it had at hand and transforming them into something valuable. Yet, the Force was here nonetheless. The Force was everywhere, of course. It was inescapable, part of the fabric of the universe. It could not disappear. And in AR Shadow was a world with so much life, so densely packed, that the force here had an intensity to it that was unmistakable. But under that constant hum, the sense of struggle was something else. Luke felt it too. The two of them stepped together, careful not to draw the attention of the flood of worker droids, turning as one in the direction of the sense of presence. This way, Luke said, with an intensity to his voice that Mara had rarely heard, and never liked. She was beginning to think that maybe an orbital bombardment wasn't such a bad idea after all, as she was no longer even certain it would work. Asterisk. Luke Skywalker had faced Palpatine and Vader, Sibayoth, and his own clone, Jethzerian, and Exar Kun. What he felt now was unlike any of them. Of the Force, and yet somehow not of the Force. The power the Force cultivated and directed and controlled, but without the mind that was behind every other Force user he had ever known. But that was wrong, he knew. Without a mind he understood. A mind he could recognize as a mind. But the presence he felt had intention. It had curiosity. It had desire. And under each of those feelings, Luke detected a cold malice. He raised his lightsaber, prepared to fight through the tide of worker droids then as if an instant reaction to his lift of the blade, they all stopped. A cacophony of sound was silent in an instant, only marred by sounds of mechanical distress as some ancient droid unit failed to successfully bring itself to stillness. Droids whirred quietly, turning towards Luke and Mara, aiming a thousand mechanical eyes, performing a thousand, ten thousand, analysis of the threat they faced. Calmly, Mara instructed the Imperials carefully, but Luke barely heard the word. The presence was still awakening, he realized. It had been dormant for a long time, perhaps centuries, perhaps longer still. Whatever it was programmed to do, it had responded to the threat posed by Raganda with the same base, instinct of any living creature, self-preservation. That instinct, here and now, had meant consume and grow, become big and strong, and learn. Now it was curious. 
Come on, Luke said softly. And don't forget the explosives, added Mara grimly. They passed from the factory into a hallway, then up a shallow set of stairs and through an archway. The space beyond was dimly lit in blues and yellows. It was a large room, oval-shaped. It was as ancient as the rest of the facility, but this place felt different. Unlike the others, it had a less industrial feel to it. The ceilings had artistic touches which had been deliberately sculpted and placed. The structure of the room felt intentional and almost meditative rather than manufactured. And Luke saw the remains of living beings. Bones, left where the sapient they had once belonged to had fallen, were scattered through the entire space. Hundreds of beings, from a species that Luke did not recognize, had once lived here and died here. They were strange skulls, cone-shaped and with eye sockets on either side of their head, bones and teeth placed unnervingly up above the eyes. The lower half of each face had long since decayed away. Do you recognize those? Asked Asori, sounding unnerved. No, said Mara. The artifact itself was a gleaming ovoid about twice the size of a shock ball. It had the same obsidian sheen as the droid's antennas, while control runs appeared to grow from its perfect, curving sides like some kind of nourishing vines. It stood alone in the center of a podium, gleaming with bursts of green light that raced along its mechanical veins, and in the force it pulsed with impossible power. How can I feel it in the force? Mara murmured to him. It isn't alive. Maybe it is, Luke said. Maybe it's just not any kind of life we understand. That isn't reassuring, Asori muttered. I think we should blow it up, Dreef said, fiddling with his blaster rifle. Why do you think we brought the detacks? Mara asked dryly. She withdrew one from the pack the Dreef carried, preparing to arm it. Luke was all too aware of the small army of worker droids which had let them pass and remained safely out of sight. He wasn't entirely sure what would happen if they tried to destroy this thing. The inexplicable object had created an army of droids out of an ancient construction unit and a handful of improvised forge units. Could they destroy it even if they wanted to? The sudden connection through the force was unlike any Luke had experienced. It was cold, almost frigid, without the sense of heat and life that his mental connection with Leia or Mara always featured. He was reminded of touching the vaporators on Tatooine after a long winter's night, the metal brittle and cold, seeming to carve right through him in the morning dim. The void. It grew slowly, at the behest of his ancient masters. It was their triumph, their greatest experiment, the pride of ten million of their finest minds, greatest masters of the Force. It was an imposition, an exercise in the perfection of control over the Force itself. When they called, the Force bent. When they demanded, the Force broke. When they built, they created it. It started as merely a seed. From that seed it grew in the void, nestled against the welcoming light of a star, whose radiation gave its first nourishment. Its second nourishment came from the sacrifices. Force and light were there to feed it and it drank its fill. Time passed. The seed grew, its maw pointed at the star it had been given. It drank greedily, taking the light and heat and all the power of the Force and manifesting a mighty host. The star was soon exhausted. But there were millions of stars. Eventually, they would all be consumed by time. What harm would come from hastening their end? What glory would their wraith end bring? It had been reduced by time, by folly. Now it was merely a seed once more, weaker than it had been even when it was born. Forgotten, deprived of light, deprived of life. It craved them both, and it craved a master once more. And Luke had sensed one. Wordless, it welcomed him. Wordless, it offered. Mara was preparing the detonators. Stop, Luke said, his voice hoarse. She looked at him, frowning. Destroying it makes the most tactical sense. Luke shook his head. In his mind, he saw the seed, tucked against a star, with all its light and heat and power, consuming mass, consuming matter. What would a few dead packs do to that? I don't think we can. Mara's expression was tight and unhappy but she also didn't question him. Then what are we going to with it? Luke closed his eyes and touched the cold. Sleep. The seed was not happy with that order, but the seed was tired and hungry. 
almost petulantly it obeyed, and the green pulsing along its wires slowly faded to almost black. Behind them, the army of worker droids knelt and went still. Forget the explosives, Luke said. The droids are inert and the huts will be coming to see what made them. We need to get out of here before they find us. Suppose we blow up the command center anyway. Dreve suggested it would certainly muddy the waters and keep the adjects guessing. Or contact might assume we were able to destroy the item, taking it off the board from his perspective, Mara said, with an evil little quirk of her lips. And you wouldn't have to carry the bombs back, said Luke, his mouth carving into the faint groove of a smile. He suddenly recalled an incident many years before when he and Fixer had cobbled together enough mining explosives to blow up an old wreck in the desert, some kind of, he didn't even remember what. Owen had been furious, and it had been fun. We'll need the explosives back to carry the damn thing, Osori observed. And it would mean I wouldn't have to carry the bombs back, Dreef confirmed, as if that thought had just occurred to him. Six long hours later the Jedi and the Imperials were finally tucked safely inside the Pulsar skate. The seed remained dormant, still and silent, resting in a secure location in the center of the ship's cargo hold. They all gave the box it was hidden inside a wide berth as they debated what to do with it. Luke's description of the seed's potential abilities made that a difficult choice. It's alive in the Force, he explained, and it has the ability to draw energy from matter. I saw it devour stars whole. Explosives won't hurt it. They might even feed it. Then what about a black hole? Merrick suggested, eyeing the box with no small amount of trepidation. Or we drop it down the gravity well of a gas giant. If it can't consume a star, Mara said durily, there's no guessing at its limitations. Worse, I felt it reach out to me in the Force, Luke said. It recognized me as a Force user. Maybe even as a Jedi specifically. It's still largely dormant. I don't know how to explain it. Reganda woke it up, and it lashed out to defend itself. But it's not fully conscious yet. Once it is conscious, could it reach out to other Force users? Attract them to it, convince them to feed it. He shook his head. We already saw what Exar Kun could do, and his abilities seemed limited. The Seed's abilities seemed potentially limitless. We need to lock it away in the most secure location we can find, Mara agreed. Until we can figure out how to destroy it, we need to assume that we won't be able to hide it. Reganda found it somehow after all. Maybe it called to her and that's what got all this started. Then why would it attack her? Dreef asked skeptically. Mar ignored him. There's only one place we could potentially defend it. Luke didn't like this conclusion, but he shared it. Karuskin. In the Jedi Consulate. Behind home fleet, Korra scans defense shields and all the defenses of the consulate. The Senate is not going to like it, Merrick's warned. This thing is clearly dangerous. It very nearly swarmed over an AR shadow. Imagine what would happen if it got loose in Imperial Center. I've already called Caird, Mar said. He and Chen are on their way to Mirker to pick up a dozen isolamory. We'll blanket the seed with them. That may or may not work, Luke thought. He had no idea how the seed accessed the Force and if that access would be dampened by the creatures the same way a Jedi's were. But it was worth a try. That's a good idea. And keeping it on Coruscant will be temporary only, until we find some place secure to keep it or find a way to destroy it. But we can't leave it here. We can't just drop it somewhere. And if Raganda has some way to track it, we need to put it behind a battle fleet. R2 tootled confidently. The datapad said, with great confidence, that the droid could set up a jamming system to prevent the seed from influencing other computer systems. Luke had no idea if the droid was right, and neither, he knew, did R2, but it was better than nothing. He looked at Mara. She didn't like it any more than he did, recognizing all the myriad ways this could go horribly wrong. She shrugged. I don't see that we have any choice. Suspended from her own length of fiber wire, and dressed in a light drinking sneak suit of her own design, Roganda Icemurn watched the small team fight their way into the heart of the droid hive with far more facility than her droids had managed. Skywalker and Jade were, she mused darkly, magnificent. The other two she didn't recognize, 
but as the micro-monocular of her headset captured every freckle and feature of the other interlopers, they wouldn't be unknown for long. She had already made a number of mistakes with this little debacle of an operation. Her droids were destroyed, and Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade were not to be trifled with. She made herself small in the force as she stalked them, and she did not interfere when they emerged from the lower levels of the structure with the object of her fondest desire in tow. She saw it only briefly before they tucked it away inside a bag. The seed was a perfect obsidian, mostly spherical. It pulsed with dark energy, dim light coursing through its veins. She had spent so many years searching for it, hunting through ancient records of fallen empires, tracking rumors, and now it was within her sight, but still beyond her reach. The seed bore no marks of lightsabers, but then, attempting to destroy it with a lightsaber would be pure folly. The seed could not be destroyed by a mere Jedi. Luckily, Regana realized what the Jedi intended and evacuated before the explosives went off. Slightly shaken, she tracked them back to Pulsar Skate, watching and plotting. She worked the equation through in her head, debating their options. Eventually, she guessed what they would do, and she smiled. Despite the Jedi stealing the artifact away from her on NAR Shatta, they had made it much simpler for her to acquire the seed. They will secure it at their consulate, Reganda recalled, which is on Karuskin. And if nothing else, Reganda Ismer knew Karuskin.